At the KOA weather station right now, 40 degrees. Stay tuned for the CBS Radio Mystery Theater. This is Dick McDaniel and KOA News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... When you come right down to it, there are three mysteries we experience which have much in common. The mystery of dreams, the mystery of hope, and the mystery of evoking imagination. Mystery theater best fulfills the last one, but it is the first two enigmas we will explore today. Hope, the fantasy of our waking hours, and dreams, those visions of both night and day to make our lives more bearable. It hasn't only been the money, Larry. Everything has conspired against my seeing Europe. It's a strange thing. I'm almost fated. If one believes in fate. I don't, Caroline. You are what you make of yourself. You do what you really wish to do. It's been my castle in the air. I'm almost afraid to talk about it anymore. Whenever I make plans, and it seems to come nearer, it all melts away. It's as if I were doomed never to leave this town. Our mystery drama, Tomorrow is Never, was adapted from a story by Henry James by James Agate Jr., especially for the Mystery Theater, and stars Marion Seldes and Larry Haynes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Caroline Spencer. Caroline teaches school, and sometimes her fourth grade students would wink and make fun of her. For Caroline might suddenly be gazing out the window of her classroom, looking far beyond the snow-covered New England hills, daydreaming of Rome or Paris, places she'd never seen. Today, at a party, she will meet Lawrence Stanford, a man who may change her whole life. Aunt Peg, thanks for inviting me over. Oh, Lawrence Stanford, don't stand in the doorway. Come in or it'll be snowing in my hall. First, let me thaw out. It's cold out there. Hmm, take your coat off. I will, I will. Be patient with me. Oh, I'm glad you braved the storm to come to my party. People are so rude. Hardly anyone has arrived yet. You'd think they'd have the decency to let me know. Oh, Aunt Peg, are you being fair? The drifts are three feet high. Not everyone is used to climbing the Alps like I am. Vermont is nothing compared to that. Well, so it's snowy. You'd think they'd find some other means of letting me know. <sighs> I see you've brought along your album of photographs, as I asked you to. I am just the person for you who will be fascinated. Oh, I don't mind showing my pictures in the slightest. That way I don't have to be witty or charming or even talk. Evidence of my travels. Talk for me. Well, stop talking now and join us in the parlor. Oh, Caroline. Yes, Mrs. Pegasus. May I introduce you to Lawrence Stanford? Lawrence, this is Caroline Spencer. Lawrence is my nephew and my neighbor when he isn't gallivanting about the world. How do you do, Mr. Stanford? A pleasure. Now, I have a special purpose in mind. Introducing you to... Lawrence, as young as he is, is a world traveler. Oh, how wonderful. There, you see, Lawrence? Here is a young lady to whom traveling is the ne plus ultra. Well, as Paganini said to the king of Prussia only yesterday, I just happened to bring my violin. <laughs> oh, stop <laughs> fooling, Lawrence. What my nephew means is that he brought a whole portfolio of pictures of the places he's been to. Oh, I understood that. Oh, did you? Aunt Peg, I think I hear someone at the door. Good. <laughs> Hopefully someone else has braved the storm to join us. Miss Spencer, whether you're ready for it or not, and whether I am or not, it's travel time for both of us. Let's sit over here by the fire. this page, uh, some pictures I took in Switzerland. Uh, 
You sure I'm not boring you? We've already been through half my photograph. No, not a bit. I'm quite fascinated. Please go. Oh. Oh, that lake is like glass. Mm. Have you been on the shore, too? That big building? Oh, that's the castle of Shalon on Lake Geneva. Yes, many times. Shalon. Isn't that where Bonavard was imprisoned? Byron wrote about it in The Prisoner of Shalon. You're quite right. Uh, that one picture brings back Byron and his poetry. Oh, yes. And more. I see. Well, if you can understand how art and literature and music are all part of European life, I'd say that you are well equipped to visit many countries, Switzerland, Italy, everywhere. But if you want to see Europe as Byron described it, you'd better make your trip soon. The continent is getting sadly dis-Byronized. How soon must I go? I'd uh, give you ten years. Oh, I think I can go in that time. <laughs> Well, you two have been sitting by the fire for an hour. Don't you want some tea? Can I get you a cup, Miss Spencer? Oh, thank you, yes. Just plain, no sugar or milk. Plain, no sugar, no milk. Cakes? And, Lawrence, come back here. I'll bring you both some tea. Are you sure, Aunt Peg? Besides, I may be taking up too much of Miss Spencer's time. <laughs> Why do you think I invited you here? Now, put that portfolio back in your lap, and I'll bring you both a cup. Mrs. Pegasus is a sweet lady. Yes. How do you know my aunt? Well, three of her little grandnieces are in my English class. Oh, oh, so that's what you do. You teach English. Well, with half a mind, really. Do you speak many languages? Well, after fashion, but well enough to make myself understood from Geneva to Rome. I envy you. Have you been over there many years? Well, it does mount up. Put all the visits together. And you've traveled everywhere. Oh, no, not everywhere. I... I love it, and happily I can indulge. All of this is like a fairy tale to me. I suppose it's all very expensive, isn't it? Europe? Well, depends how you go. Uh, the big ocean liners, they're expensive, but one can go third class. It takes no more than two weeks. Once you're over there, you can manage with very little. You can see a great deal if you spend it wisely. Well, I think I could. I've saved and saved, and I'm always adding a little bit to it. And I don't mind doing without things as long as... Oh, well. <laughs> There's that pot of gold at the end of my rainbow. Those countries. Their history. You must never give up that dream, Caroline. When your rainbow ends in such beautiful colors. You say that in such a kind way. I don't even mind your calling me by my first name. And yet we hardly know each other. Well, I didn't mean to be forward. My friends... Call me Larry. Oh, it's all right. I feel I can trust you. It hasn't been only saving up the money to go. It's been other things. I'm almost afraid to talk about it anymore. Two or three times, it's come a little nearer, and I start making definite plans, and then I talk about it, and it melts away. <laughs> I can't explain it, but I'm still possessed with a kind of madness to travel. Well, there's only one cure for it, and that is to make up one's mind and go. Keep believing, and you will. I've read and read. I've prepared my mind, I think, as well as anyone can. Not just Byron, but, but histories and guidebooks, Bedekers. Mm -hmm. And when I'm at long last there, when I put my foot on that ground, <laughs> I know I shall rave about everything. Well, as I say, the only cure is to go. Indulge in yourself. I've got a relative who lives in Paris. He's an art student. So it isn't as though I'd be completely alone. Yes, well, I'll be going back pretty soon. One has to. And I'll be looking for you, Caroline, and I'll expect to find you there. Well, here you are, you two. <laughs> two cups of tea. Lawrence, I believe it stopped snowing. Well, my dear... Meeting this young man is almost like an adventure with an explorer, isn't it? Oh, Mrs. Pegasus, you couldn't have given me a more enjoyable afternoon. I do appreciate it. Miss Spencer. Caroline. I'd, uh... I'd better circulate a bit. I'll, I'll accuse my aunt of inviting a very rude nephew. But if you do go abroad, remember... I shall be on the lookout for you. And I'll tell you if I'm disappointed. That was how I met Caroline Spencer. Almost three years went by. I was living in Paris. And in October, I'd gone to the French port, Le Havre, to meet my brother, Freddie, and his wife. 
I got there late. Their ship had already docked, and I finally found them at the Grand Hotel. Larry, how good to see you. You never get any older. <laughs> you wondered what happened to you. The train was late leaving the Gare Saint-Lazare, and then every farmer in northern France took it into his head to drive his cows across the tracks just as our boat train wanted to pass. <laughs> how is Elizabeth? Oh, not well at all. Not a good start to a vacation. Oh, what is it? Oh, you know, still feels the boat under her. But she's in the next room now trying to sleep. Well, aren't we taking the 4.30 back to Paris? It's unlikely, Larry. Better to spend the night here and when Elizabeth's had a good sleep, to uh, start off fresh tomorrow. Ah, but we'll see. Well, if, uh, if that's the case, Freddie, the first thing to do is for you and me to find ourselves a cafe on the waterfront and have a spot of cognac. At two in the afternoon, cognac? Freddie, my boy, you are in France, and when you get to Rome, I expect you'll do as the Romans do. But till you get there, while you're here, you'll do as the French do. Cognac at two. <laughs> Cheers. To your health, too, Larry. Oh, and to Elizabeth. Mm. Hope she's back on her feet by dinner time. Mmm. Good cognac, I'll say that for it. And cheap. Great Scott. Hmm? There she is. The little lady of the steamer. Hmm? Oh, you mean that girl at the farthest table under the awning? Was she on your boat? On deck from morning till night. She's never sick. I didn't tell you how rough the Atlantic can be in October. You know, every day she'd sit there, just as she's doing now, hands folded, looking out at the horizon ahead. Every single day is so hypnotized. Well, why don't you go speak to her? Oh, I don't know her. We never met. She talked to no one. You know, I have an idea. She's a, a Yankee schoolmistress on her first trip to Europe. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. I think I'll speak to her. Oh, I wouldn't, Larry. She's very shy. Freddie, Freddie, I know her. I'm sure I met her at a tea party at Aunt Pay's. Oh, well, matter of fact, I'm getting twinges of conscience about Elizabeth. I'll be starting back to the hotel. Well, I'll walk you back. No, no, it's just up the road. I can find it. Suppose you come knock at our door about six, and we'll see if she's well enough for us all to go down and have an early dinner. Good afternoon. Take your part. Oh, aren't you? Do you mind uh, if I sit with you at your table? So, so here you are in Europe. I hope you're not disappointed. Oh, it was you who showed me photographs of your travels. You're Mrs. Vegas's nephew. I remember that afternoon so very well. Yes, so do I. So do I, Caroline. The last thing you said to me was I'll tell you if I'm disappointed. And you're not. Oh, I can't begin to tell you how happy I am just to be sitting here in this cafe watching the people. It's, it's like a dream. I've been right here for over an hour, and I don't want to move. Well, if you're that enchanted with poor, prosaic Le Havre, you'll have no admiration left for better things. There are so many, so many more beautiful places just waiting for you. And why are you still in Le Havre anyway? Why haven't you gone on to Paris? Oh, it's quite a long story. It, it, it's because of my cousin, George. You see, he has all my money. It happened. Haven't you gone on to Paris? Paris. to be no end of oh, naivete. It's quite a long story. It, it, the it's best because of, of my cousin, George. Caroline Spencer you see, seems to be one of those. He has all my... But not so Larry Stanford who is beginning to feel compassion, if not care and conscience, for this neophyte innocent traveler. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I won't be as brash as that Broadway figure who once said, there's a sucker born every minute. But when Larry Stanford heard the young schoolteacher had handed over all her savings for a European trip to a mysterious cousin, he was apprehensive. He would have been downright appalled had he been able to overhear Cousin George two weeks before Cousin Caroline arrived. There is no other way. But, George, I don't think I can do it. My handwriting is terrible. Bertha, it will be good enough for this. I am supposed to be a French countess? 
If anyone can understand my handwriting, they would never believe it. I tell you, Bertha, it doesn't matter. She won't know the difference. Now, I've given you some nice, clean paper. There is the ink. Take up the pen and we'll begin. But, George, Sherry, why am I writing this letter? If your cousin, this Mademoiselle Caroline from America, arrives at La Havre in two weeks, why write her a letter? She won't receive it before her departure. Because, ma petite, I shall go to meet the ship when it arrives. And when I think the moment is right... I will give it to her to read. Now, write. Cher Mademoiselle, mm-hmm. I appeal to you as one woman to another. Woman to another. Mm. New sentence. Huh? Your wonderful cousin, George. Oh, you don't think much of yourself, do you? Brother, will you stop this nonsense and write what I tell you? Look. I don't know whether my cousin is rich or not, whatever. She's certainly better off than we are. All I'm asking is to borrow some money until my chef d'oeuvre, my big painting, is completed. Now, does that satisfy you? Then why this, uh, I appeal from one woman to another? What are you up to, Georges? I want to know. I have a right. We are husband and wife, aren't we? You don't trust me. And why do I have to be a countess? I work in a bakery shop in my spare time. That's honest work, (laughs) isn't it? You don't understand the romantic mentality of an American spinster. Now, shall we continue? When Caroline told me she'd handed her American dollars over to her cousin, I admit I was more than suspicious. I became alarmed. I can't say why, but it gave me a definite chill. And I suppose I looked uneasy as we sat together at that waterfront cafe. What a face you're making, Larry. Stanford. It's all right. I hope so, Caroline. Then stop frowning. No, I'm wincing at the thought that half an hour after you land in Europe, your funds should have passed into someone else's hands. Is this cousin... George? George. Is he, uh... Is he going to travel with you? Only as far as Paris. He's an art student. Yes, you told me that. He was an art student three years ago. I've always thought that so splendid. I wrote to him when I was sailing, but I never expected him to come all the way here to love. I mean, that's very kind of him, don't you think? Hmm. He's very kind and very bright. Yes. But you say he has your money. Where did he go? Just to the bank to change some of my dollars. He said I should wait for him here. I haven't minded it a bit. I see. And when Cousin George returns, are you going to Paris? Oh, George thinks I should stay here for a few days. Here? Poor man. Why do you say that? Oh, something's troubling him. He said when he came back with my French money, he'd have something important to tell me. And that we shouldn't really decide anything until he's told it to me. Ah, I thought so. He's been so thoughtful, so how can I not listen to him? Caroline, you did not come all this distance to listen to troubles, but to go to new places. Oh, I will, I will. I have it all planned. That's him. Hmm? Is he coming back? The tall one? Yeah, the one with the swagger stick and the red hair. And the velvet jacket. Don't you just love the velvet jacket? And the slouch hat. That's my cousin. I told you we'd be along. George, over here. How do you do? I'm Lawrence Stanford. I'm an old friend of Caroline's. Hello. Oh, you were on the ship with her. Oh, stand there, George. Sit down. Uh, he's got my chair. Well, that's another one, silly. Larry, please stand. Uh, no, no. I, I think I'd better be off. My sister-in-law didn't make the voyage too well, and I want to get back see how she is. Well, I was hoping to stand us all to a drink. Well, I'm afraid I haven't the time, but thank you. Caroline. In case I don't return to Paris this evening with my brother and sister-in-law, where are you staying here? I've put her into La Belle Normande. Isn't that a pretty name? It's a lovely old inn. Yes, it's a good place. I've been there myself. I know my way around, old chap. Au revoir. Caroline. Caroline, it's Larry. May I sit here? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, you may, if you wish. Oh, beautiful evening, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. 
Oh, my brother and his wife have decided to spend the night and we'll all go to Paris tomorrow. So I thought I'd come over to La Belle Normande and see if you were still here. Oh, I'm still here. Have you been crying? Me? Yes. Yes, I thought something was wrong. You're sitting here in the dark. Lots of stars in the sky. Caroline, tell me what happened. Oh, how can you tell? By the way, you've gathered yourself together as if you'd been hit and were trying to ward off any more blows. Your cousin gave you bad news, isn't that it? Between the time I left you this afternoon and now. You've had a very bad time of it. No, 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 not I. It's George who's been having one. He has great worries, and he asked me to... Oh, you won't be angry with me. Angry with you? No, never. He was in dreadful need of money. In warmth of yours, you mean? Oh, of any he could get. Uh, honorably, of course. Oh, of course, honorably. And mine was all that was available. And he has taken all of it from you. Well, I gave him what I had. Oh, great Scott, Caroline. Is that what you call his getting money honorably, all you had? He's just badly in debt. Yes, no doubt he is. But what was the rush to take yours? Well, I felt so much for him. Oh, yes, so do I. I hope at least he's going to give it back to you very soon. Oh, yes, as soon as he can. And when will that be? When he's finished his great painting. Oh, Caroline. Caroline, you can't accept that. Is his great picture. He's an art student. Where is he now? He's in the dining room having his dinner. Why aren't you eating with him? Oh, I wasn't hungry. I wanted to be under the sky in this little courtyard. Well, you do understand, Larry. Look at that beautiful little outside staircase and the fountain with a small statue. I have to stay out here as much as I can, soaking it all up. Breathing it. Caroline. Caroline, listen Where to me. Where else in the world could you find such a place? I, I don't know what to say to you. You see romance everywhere. And this man, this... This cousin of yours... Caroline, you're too generous. He made the debts himself. He ought to pay for them himself. Oh, he's been foolish. George admits that. He told me everything. He threw himself on my charity. It's not only for him. It's for his wife, the poor young thing. Oh, so he has a poor young wife now. Well, he married two years ago. Secretly. Oh, why secretly? She was a countess. Oh, you sure of that? Yes, she's written me the most beautiful letter. Asking you, whom she's never seen, for money? Asking me for confidence and sympathy. She's been cruelly treated by her family for marrying George. He told me that she's a beautiful young widow of a high-born count. I want you to read her letter. She begins by saying she appeals to me, one woman to another. Caroline, I'd rather not read it. See, they're going to have a baby. There's not enough money even to feed it. How could I refuse George? My dear Caroline, my concern is for you. I don't want you to be stripped of every dollar you've saved for this trip for such a... A rigmarole. But it's not a rigmarole. <laughs> then how could I enjoy Europe knowing George and the Countess are suffering? Oh, yes, the Countess. Look here, she signed it, Countess Berta. Mm -hmm. Oh, I shan't live any worse than I've lived. And besides, the next time I come, I'll go first to England to see Stratford where Shakespeare lives. You speak of next time. What of this time? You're being used unfairly, Caroline. You've worked... For that money. I don't know how many years. I'll be coming back. And I'll stay with George and the Countess. He said so. He insisted. And by that time, I'll have everything back that I loaned him. It's a loan, you know. You mean you're going home right away? Well, I've... I've nothing left for the tour. You gave it all up. Well, it's just a loan. George insisted on signing notes for all of it. Every dollar. Even though I told him with family... How large an amount, Caroline? Well, I've kept enough to take me back. Please, Larry, don't feel sorry for me. Fred, it's absolutely unbelievable. This so-called art student has taken that poor teacher for every dime she brought with her to see Paris, Marseille, Florence, Rome. Hmm. It's pathetic. 
A trip she's had her heart set on for years. Now, this man has shattered her dream and made her feel sorry for him in the bargain. He's made her believe he was doing her a favor by accepting her savings. I tell you, I'm so angry, I don't know what to do. By the way, how's Elizabeth? No. <laughs> Better. Yeah. After a good night's sleep, she'll be able to start for Paris tomorrow. Fred, I wish you could see this character. He wears a slouch hat, a black velvet jacket. Velvet, mind you, like a caricature of a Degas or a Cezanne. <laughs> Pretending to be an artist. He's nothing but a pretentious liar and a cheat. And you didn't tell him so. Well, how could I? The poor girl is enchanted with this faker. Well, let her keep her illusions. That's all she has left. And I'm not the one to break them. Um, what train shall we catch tomorrow? Oh, by the way, Elizabeth said to thank you, Larry. We've already taken up so much of your time. Freddie, if I hadn't come down to Le Havre to meet you both this whole episode with the poor little school teacher, how oh, it's so tragic. I wouldn't have known about that. Larry, have you thought maybe you should should do more than complain. You're right. You're right, Fred. Tomorrow morning, I'll go to where she's staying and make her accept a loan from me uh, just so she can do a tour. After all, we're related in a way. And Peg introduced us. Of all the times of my life to have overslept, this time was unforgivable. Not that our train for Paris was to leave till noon, but what were Carolyn Spencer's plans? As I dashed through the crooked streets to La Belle Normande, one sound echoed my worst fears. Looking for my cousin, are you? Yes. Good morning, George. Is Caroline up yet? Oh, yes. She's up all right. Nice little courtyard, this, don't you think? Has she had a breakfast? Oh, yes. We shared a few croissants and coffee. Is that right here? Oh, nice, mellow old place, don't you think? Uh, George, George, we can talk, talk about all that later, all right? Where is your cousin now? Oh, didn't I tell you? She went to the boat about seven this morning. I helped her with her suitcase, took Carolyn right up the gangplank. She's on board. You might be able to wave to her. If you go up the street, you'll see the ship pulling away. I turned away, conscious of the tears starting up in my eyes. That poor, poor woman. The end of her rainbow had been some 19 hours in Europe. Describing his own technique, Henry James tells us, make the reader's general vision of evil intense enough and his own imagination his own sympathy or horror will supply him with the particulars. Precisely our aims and ambitions here on Mystery Theater. Indeed, were he alive today, what fabulous spine-tingling dramas could Henry James have written for us? I shall return shortly with Act Three. we suffer at time present lessons with time passing. So it was with Larry Stanford. For a long time, he did not forgive himself for having literally missed the boat and allowing circumstances to take over Caroline Spencer's life. But months went by, then years. I'm not saying he forgave himself, but he did forget. And then... Suddenly it all came back to me. Five years after that dreadful episode at Le Havre, I found myself back home in America. It was spring. Again, I was a guest at one of Aunt Peg's tea parties with the same alderman and his wife, a selectman and a few teachers, but no Caroline. Oh, doesn't my nephew look well? After five years' absence from his homeland... One hears all sorts of things about Americans abroad. The weather is disagreeable, the food unpleasant. Uh, uh, uh. Not the food, Aunt Peg. It couldn't be better. Well, while you're in this house, Lawrence, 
You'll just have to be satisfied with molasses cookies, angel cake, and my own Boston tea. Oh, I'm not criticizing things at home. Far from it. I hate to hear Americans who come to Europe and run down their own country. I didn't think you remained long enough in one place to meet many Americans, Lawrence. Uh, which reminds me. Does that, uh, does that little Miss Spencer still teach school hereabouts? Caroline Spencer? Hmm. Indeed she does. You'll find her quite changed, poor dear. She hasn't really been very sprightly since her visitor arrived. What visitor? Why don't you run along and see for yourself? She's had a visitor for long? Oh, longer than she expected. No question about that. Uh, Frankly, Lawrence, I think it's an imposition. She's quite a changed person now. Lives most abominably and all to accommodate her visitor. Looks ten years older than she should. A great pity. Caroline Spencer did appear ten years older, and it had been only five. When I arrived the next day at about two, it was at a drab little house at the edge of town. Caroline looked at me as though she wished I hadn't come and then led me through a hallway up the back stairs to a tiny room which looked out on a small woodshed and two clucking hens. Isn't this a bright, cheery room? Ah, yes, yes, lovely. I didn't expect to see you ever again. Well, I waited for you over there to come back, but you never came. Waited? Where? At the old French port. La Havre. Remember? Yes. I remember that day. How have you been, Larry? You remembered my name. I never forgot it. Caroline, have I come here today at a bad time? Do I inconvenience you? Perhaps two in the afternoon is the wrong time. No, no, not you. No, no, no. Well, again, again you're in distress. What have I said? Oh. Please. Please, Caroline, take your hands away from your face. It's because... It's because you remind me... Remind you? Oh, you mean that miserable day in La Havre? Oh, don't say that, please. It wasn't miserable. It was wonderful. I, I can't tell you how it felt going back the next morning to the inn and finding that you had retreated and to see the boat sailing away with you on it. Oh, can we not talk about that? And... You've been here ever since? Yes, ever since. I hope at least your cousin repaid you that money. Oh, I don't care for it now. You don't care for your money? For going to Europe anymore. It's all over. Everything's different. I never think of it. (sighs) The scoundrel never repaid you. Please, please. Oh, pardon, ma chère. I didn't know you had company. The gentleman came in so quietly. We didn't wish to disturb you in the garden. I know how much you like your afternoon nap. I have only interrupted to speak of my café. Will you bring it to me, please, under the little quince tray? I'll bring you your coffee. Uh, C'est bien. And don't forget again, you know. Uh, Bonjour, monsieur. Well, who in the world is that? getting a little close in here. Do you mind if I open the window? I, I don't, usually, because of the hands. <laughs> Caroline, isn't this your own house? Oh, yes, I bought it. Well, then, without trying to be funny about those hens, why are you cooped up in this little room over the hen house? Oh. Surely, surely there must be other rooms in your own house. Oh, yes, there are. But she has them. You mean the person who just Ordered coffee? That is la comtesse, as they call her in France. My cousine. I told you about her that day, the letter she wrote me, remember? Oh, cousin George's wife. Yes, disowned by her own family for marrying George. Uh Uh-huh, and where is he? George is dead. Oh, I'm sorry. And what happened to your money? I don't know. And... Wasn't there supposed to be a baby? Oh, she never talks about it. I see. So on her husband's death, she came over here to live with you. Yes, she just arrived one day for a visit. 
How long ago? Two years and four months. She's been here ever since? Ever since. Will you excuse me? I'd better go and get the Countess's coffee. There's no one else to do it? No one but me. I do it every day at this time. Oh, you go out in the garden. Talk French to her, would you? Please, Larry. And I'll bring the coffee along. Well, can't she wait on herself? Well, uh, she isn't used to manual labor. <laughs> I see. And you are. Hand and foot, no doubt. Her family is of the oldest Provencal nobility. Oh, sure. I could see it written all over her. Now, please, Larry, don't spoil everything. Go outside. I'll be there in ten minutes. I wandered out into the garden, where, seated under a tree, was this woman posing as a countess, living off Carolyn Spencer. As I walked across the grass toward her, I knew in an instant all about her. A plump, dead white face, vulgar and common as any person from the streets of Paris. Monsieur? Monsieur? Oh, bonjour, madame. <laughs> bonjour. Please uh, be comfortable on the grass, monsieur. Unfortunately, there is only uh, one chair. Salamette a gal, madame. It makes no difference to me. Oh, I knew you could speak French. To think I would end in a foreign country here, an exile. My family drove me away. Oh, you get used to it, but some things, no. For example, my coffee. All I ask is a little cup after breakfast. I see. And when do you have breakfast? At noon, as I always did. And the coffee is the last straw. I ask so little. A cup of black coffee with a drop of cognac. My cousine is charmante, but uh, she cannot understand the habit of a lifetime. Every day I say to her, don't forget the drop of cognac. Well, let me go back into the house and see if I can rush things along. Caroline? Caroline, where are you? In the kitchen. I've forgotten where I left the tray. I'm so nervous these days. Oh, the coffee is boiling over on no, the stove. No, it has to boil like that to get black or she won't drink it. Caroline, don't you see what she's doing? You've got to stop letting people walk all over you. Oh, people only walk on me because I want them to. What? Uh, bring me that small cup. And, uh, oh, oh, that one's dirty. I'll get one from the shelf up here. Uh, Caroline, look out. The pan of coffee is spilling. <laughs> My goodness, it's all over you. Oh. Well, where's the butter? Butter? Yes. Do you, do you have any butter in the kitchen to put on your hand and wrist to stop the burns? I don't think I can go on much more. It's too much for me. My strength has all left me. I don't know what to do next with my life. Caroline. Caroline, what do you want to do? I don't care anymore. That's it. If, if only I could start my life over. Well, I'm afraid no one can do that. I think you're the only person I've ever known, Larry, who didn't cheat me somehow. Even Cousin George? Oh, I, I suspected he wasn't what he made himself out to be, but I thought it was wicked to be suspicious. And his wife? She doesn't seem to behave like someone of noble birth, does she? Perhaps I just don't know Europeans, but... Well, she's all I've got now. What else is there left for me? I've been cheated and made use of. My life is absolutely worthless. Is that what you tell your little students? Caroline, why must life be worthless? Why do you let people walk all over you? Are, are you afraid of life? Afraid? Why all this make-believe? Making yourself believe that by taking care of this vulgar, pretentious creature who happened to marry your cousin George, that this is Europe. That with her in the house, sipping your coffee, you're in a cafe at La Havre. It's no such thing. Now, why do you fool yourself like this, Caroline? Life hasn't cheated you. You've cheated yourself. Is 
that what I'm doing? You, of all people, an intelligent, sensitive, educated woman. Caroline, get on. Get on with your own life. Live it. Not vicariously. Experience it firsthand. Oh, I'm so ashamed, Larry. You, you should be. Uh, now, you must make that trip. And more than one. You owe it not only to yourself, but to all the little ones in your classes. Just think, think what you could tell them. What you've seen with your own eyes. How's your hand? I feel much better. Good. Then you cook up some more black coffee and I'll go out and tell the widow, George, it's on the way. Monsieur, whatever has happened to that wretched girl and my coffee? There was a slight accident in the kitchen. Miss Spencer burned her hand. Oh, no wonder. Clumsy little fool. Oh, ah, ma chère belle. My morning coffee. Uh, hold the train up to me, ma petite. I do hate reaching for things, you know. Ah, it smells delicious. Now, to taste. Um. No, 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 no. Uh, Mademoiselle Caroline, what would your cousin George say? You have again forgotten in my coffee a drop of cognac. I didn't forget, Bertha. I merely decided, since this was the very last cup I should ever again serve you, I brought it the way I prefer it. And Coyabs, what? You see, Bertha, I have several plans for myself, and they do not include you. Right now, Mr. Stamford and I are taking a ride into town, a pleasant airing. We are. Decidedly. And when I return, Bertha, it will be to pick up your luggage and yourself and take you to the train. But, ma chérie, where should I go? The train goes to Boston, and from there you may take the boat back to your beloved Paris. Au revoir. Goodbye. Was it common sense or the urging of a friend that caused the final turning of Caroline Spencer? The unfathomable and mysterious ways of man's behavior never cease to confound us. And as Byron himself said, never take a female's actions for granted. I shall rejoin you shortly. not read the Aspern papers, Daisy Miller, the Bostonians, and the hundreds of great short stories by Henry James? And who hasn't been horrified and hypnotized by the turn of the screw? In the countless volumes of this master writer, there is story upon story of man against evil, none the least of which is man himself. We hope the next time the name Henry James appears on our program listing that you will not fail to join us on Mystery Theater. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Larry Haynes, Ray Owens, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I... I am married? Yes. The legal documentation is already stored. But I don't know the girl. Why do you raise such an irrelevant point? It's just that the whole thing is such a surprise. Why? Certainly you knew that one day your marriage would be programmed. It's just that I thought... You thought... What is there to think about? Your home has already been selected and furnished. Furnished? In accordance with the registered and adjusted tastes and preferences of both of you. You will report there at once. Where? To North River. North River? But, But that's so far away. From what? Well, from my job. You have a new job. For the next ten years, you and your married companion shall devote all your efforts and energy to producing your young. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
This is the voice of the Rocky Mountain West. Radio 85, KOA Denver. This is Lorne Green. It is 1913, and Woodrow Wilson is president of the United States. But on the walls of this Montana schoolroom hang the portraits of two other presidents. George Washington and Abraham Lincoln stare down in a kind of benign severity upon the children working at their desks. It is nearly time for dismissal. Ruth Stoddard smooths back her hair in its tight bun at the nape of her neck. Uh, presents... Marshall. Possibly no period has inspired so many stories of high adventure than the fragment of history known as the Wild West, the era of the cowboy, and his endless war against the gunslinger, the sheep herder, and the Indian. Yet it was only a snippet of history, lasting less than a generation. By the beginning of the last decade of the 19th century, the Wild West was ancient history. Here's an unusual tale from that snippet which may strike you as a parallel with another ancient legend. Stay cool, Lucy. I'll handle it. But you can't. The killers, all of them. Boone, I'm calling you out. If you ain't got a gun of your own, you better borrow one. <laughs> mystery drama, On the Side of the Angels, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Earl Hammond and E.V. Juster. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The notoriety of the Wild West was at its height from 1870 to 1880, which is where our story begins, innocently enough. Somewhere in Wyoming territory, a solitary wagon drawn by one sturdy workhorse heads down a mountain trail towards a distant and sparse settlement. Behind the wagon, a cow pony hooked to the tailgate follows along. This is a special rig, a welcome sight to all in this wilderness land. The bandwagon, a traveling general store on wheels. It is driven by a ranch peddler, a tall, lanky man with a heavy, dark beard, straggled with gray, that grows high on his cheeks, till not much of his face can be seen below his worn old Stetson, but a pair of bright blue eyes. Get along, get along, get along, get along, get along. Now, I don't blame you for pricking up your ears, Baldy. Just singing a little old song to forget how hungry I am. Mm, I'm thirsty. Man, I am bone dry, and I reckon you and old Blue back there are too. So let's you and me pull off the trail here and head for that spread over there. And we can get that young man at the well to give us a drink at least. Hey there, youngin. What can I do for you, Sage Brusher? Well, uh, me and my two ponies here is dry as a gulch. I, I was wondering, uh, could we water down here? Sure. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Just help yourself up with the dipper there from the bucket I already drew. I'll draw a couple more and fill up the trough while you unhitch your ponies and bring them over. Well, I take that as right kindly of you, son. I'm not a boy. Oh? Well, what are you then? I'm a woman. My name's Lucy. Well... You sure could have fooled me and them Levi's and busted out hand-me-down boots with them worn-down heels. These are my work clothes. Oh. Oh, well, you own this spread all day by your lonesome? No. My daddy and my two brothers live here, too. Well, they don't appear to be about. They rode into town like they do most days. Hmm. Leaving a little slip like you to handle all the chores? I best get some water in the trough so the horses can drink. Yes, I reckon. Hey, come on, Baldy. Come on, Blue. Yep. Boy, huh? There you go. Oh, I don't guess that'll be enough. I- I'll get you another bucket. Uh, no, ho- hold on, ma'am. I'll carry the bucket for you. 
Oh, no, no, that's all right. Well, I ain't going to steal it. They don't look so scared. Why are you scared? Then what? Well, just surprised, I reckon. Oh, you ain't used to having a man doing for you, huh? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. Hey, come on now, give me the bucket. Now, right, your mom up at the house? My mom died five years back. When you was just about frying size, huh? Stop talking as if I wasn't grown up. I was going on 18 when she passed away. Well, you don't say. I do say. Here, here, let me do that. It's my job. Oh, no, 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 no. Especially not when you're doing me a kindness. Now, you hand me the dipper, though. I'll wet my own whistle before I let the horses finish up. Sure. Here. Thank you kindly. Mmm, oh, that surely does taste good. That's more. Oh, uh, now, I don't suppose you'd have something for me to eat up at the house, ma'am, and maybe some feed for the horses? Well, I'm afraid I... Well, no, 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 now, now, don't get me wrong. I'd be willing to pay, uh, only not hard cash money. But you could choose what you want in trade. Like what? Oh, like, uh, now I got pots and pans and knives and yellow soap and tallow candles, pens, needles, thread, buttons, fancy and plain, dress good, calico, homespun, cotton of all kinds. Well, you're a bandwagon. Yeah, that's right, ma'am. I'm a ranch peddler. I'm new to these parts. Name's Hank Boone. Pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. Boone. Uh, mostly folks just call me Hank. Could I, uh, could I see some of the dress goods? Hank? Why, sure thing, Lucy. Now, you just step around to the back of the wagon. There. Now, I brought a whole new batch up from Cheyenne on this trip. You know, the latest thing, just like they have back in the East. Here, let me show you. Now, there's plain cotton. And this here is fancy. Uh, there are prints and calico and stripes and squares. Oh, and... Ain't they pretty? Mm-hmm. Huh? What's the point tempting myself? They ain't for me. Well, you fill me and my horse's empty bellies for a couple of days, Lucy, and I'll cut you enough cloth for you to make a Sunday go to meet me clad in trade. Oh, I couldn't do that. Why not? I need to have my daddy and my brother say so. Wouldn't they consider it a fair trade? I don't reckon so. <laughs> you better ask them for yourself, Hank, because here comes my daddy and my brother Curly right now. I gotta make tracks so they won't see me talking to you. I don't want them angry with me. Well, why should they be angry? Well, I can't explain it right now. Oh. Well, howdy. Who in tarnation are you? Uh, I'm Hank Boone, the ranch peddler. What are your critters doing in my water trough? Well, drinking, of course. Water's scarce around these parts, mister. Who said they could freeload? Well, now I... It was my sister, wasn't it? I seen her run away from the back of your wagon when we rode up. Well, if you'd let me explain, I was just offering her to exchange some yard goods for the water and a square meal for me and my pony. We don't want no yard goods, Mr. Peddler. Well, uh, I'll make you a better barter. Yeah, what? Now, your ranch looks pretty run down to me. Corral gate falling off its hinges and barn roof needs mending. But look, the ranch house needs chinking and pointing. You feed me, and particularly my horse is good, three squares a day and bed us down, and I'll fix your roof and your cabin and your corral. Well, you'd, you'd have to sleep early than a horse, born. Well, I got my own crumb roll, and I'll doss down in the wagon. Okay, you got a deal. That's mighty generous of you, Mr. Uh... Stubbs. Jim Stubbs, and don't thank me yet. You're going to work for every bite you get. And don't you forget it. I'm certain sure I won't be let to. I don't like you, mister. Well, I reckon the feeling's mutual. All right, Curly, all right. And you, Mr. Kettlestick Boone, get on with your chores. Pronto, Senor El Presidente. Your wish is my command. Why, that ornery sidewinder. Let him go, Curly. Pop, if you gone plain local, why'd you want to hire him? First off, because he's right. A spread needs some work. Second, he's cheap. And third, you get a look at that wagon. Not real close. A lot of money tied up in that stock, son. You mean book 
could make ourselves quite a little profit on that layout. But it ain't ours. It will be, son. It will be. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Henny, my love. I want to talk to you about some of the invitations. It's a powerful long list. Well, with elections this close, we can't afford to disappoint anyone. Now, don't you think I know that? Already made plans to set up lanterns in the yard below the hay lift. This is going to be the biggest and best hoedown front sale ever had. I'll see to that. That's my little wife. I just hope I can get everything ready in time. You realize it's only one week from tomorrow night away? Pretty darn close. Powell. Yes, my love. Do I have to send an invite to Jim Stubbs and those two no-count sons of his? And now, Henny, Jim Stubbs and his boys are all fired up useful to me come vote roundup time. See, they're mighty good at persuading folks to fall to mine. And I need every vote I can get this election. Oh, very well. I just hope maybe they won't come. And they might not at that. They ain't much on fandangos and such. Mostly because they know we'll feel punch and not whiskey. In my books, they are animals. Oh, I sure wish I could include that poor little Lucy in the invite. It wouldn't do any good. They wouldn't let her come. What have they got against that poor girl? In fact, she's a woman. Stubbs haven't much use for women. Except the fancy kind. <laughs> They was that poor little thing like she was a jughead mule. They have her fetching, carrying, cooking, doing a man's work sun up till sundown. She might as well be a Cinderella. <laughs> Dang if you ain't just about hit the nail on the head. Only instead of the mother and the two ugly daughters, Lucy Stubbs has got Jim and his mean sons. Without any chance of a Prince Charming coming along. Uh, let alone a fairy godmother. Eh, shucks. Uh, what are we doing wondering over other people when we got enough problems of our own? What, what we can't help, we can't hassle over. Well, I'd still like to include her in the invite. Uh, you'd only cause her trouble, Henny. She's got enough of that already. Mm. and washing the dishes. I came down here to get your dirty ones. <laughs> well, you can have them, but they aren't dirty anymore. I washed them. Well, you didn't have to do that. No, ma'am, I didn't. Only, well, that's not the real reason you come down here now, is it? Now, listen, Hank, don't you get any ideas? <laughs> well, I got lots of them, Lucy, but none of them ought to worry you. Well, all right. I'll tell you why I come here. If first off you tell me why you stayed. Because I was hungry. Me and my partner. You and the horses got a belly full tonight. You could have took off as soon as it got dark. You don't need to work like a dog for them just for bed and board. You could ride on down into Frontville with your bandwagon and sell off a quarter of that stock you got in the wagon. Mm, yeah, I reckon I might have done. So? Why'd you stay? Well, ma'am, well, maybe on a hunch. See, I, I can see you've been getting a thick end of the stick for a long while now. Maybe I had a notion I might help you out some. I was afraid of that. That's why I took a chance in coming down here tonight. To tell you to pick up your heels and get, Hank, just as fast as you can. Well, why would I do that? Because if you don't... The only way you're going to be leaving this spread is feet first. Remember I mentioned that this story might remind you of an old legend? Well, we have some of the elements established already. But where in the rough and tumble of the old Wild West do you suppose a Prince Charming might come from, let alone a fairy godmother? I shall return shortly with Act Two.
quite a long while after the concerned girl had made her surprising statement, the tall, lanky ranch peddler regarded her solemnly, his piercing blue eyes never wavering. As he contemplated her, he reached into his shirt pocket to pull out a tobacco sack. His teeth against the grizzled beard were white and strong as he pulled the string with them to open the sack, his other hand creasing the cigarette paper deftly. Then he sprinkled some tobacco in it, licked the edge of the paper, and with the ease of long practice, rolled the cigarette. Now, who did you figure was going to fix it so I got laid out for the white linen, Lucy? Mm -hmm. Them. All three of them? My brother Buck's the worst of them all. He's quiet, but just plain ornery. Hmm, I see. Do you mind if I light up? No. Yes. Why don't you listen to me? Yeah, but I am. I'm just trying to understand how, how you can be so certain sure. I heard them. Most times they don't even know I'm around. But tonight was sort of different. Soon as Bucky come home, they sent me down to the well to get water. So? But he didn't need no water. They know I fill up the barrel every night before supper. They were just trying to get rid of me. So, as soon as I got outside, I snuck back in the shadow of the lean-to by the kitchen window. And I could hear what they were saying. And what were they saying, Lucy? Well, Daddy was doing the talking. He was telling Buck he only took you on so you'd get the layout back in shape. And then they dry gulch you, steal your wagon and your stock. Hmm. And just how were they going to send me up Salt River? Huh? Kill you? Or just shoot you? For no reason? Oh. They have a reason. What? They, they'd say they caught you messing around with me. And what would you say to that? I don't rightly know. <laughs> a woman's word don't carry much weight in the prairie dog courts men run around here. Mm, maybe so. Well, it looks like I'm forced to pull up stakes. Oh, yes, Hank. Please go. You don't have a chance with them. They told iron all the time in the years yet. But you, you don't even wear a gun. That's right. I don't. I'm a man of peace. I'm just a peddler. <laughs> and that's why you don't know about people like my brother. Well, like I said, I ain't so worried about me. I got time. You don't. Here. Better take these and get on up to the ranch house before one of those brothers takes a notion to wake himself up and wonder just where his little sister is. Mr. Mayor. Why, yes, Henny. What are you doing down here at the office? I just dropped off all the invites to the holdown at the post office, except in one. Eh? Yeah, what's that? I want little Lucy Stubbs to have one, even if she can't come. Only I want to make sure she gets it. Yeah, well, that might pose a problem. No, she never comes here to town to pick up any mail. That's right, Powell, honey. But ain't you planning to ride over to Grant's Junction on election business? I am. Well, then, you got to pass me enough by the Stubbs Ranch. I was thinking you could just stop off and make sure this gets into Lucy's hands herself. Howdy, stranger. Howdy. You working the stub spread? Well, I'm just helping out whilst I rest up my ponies. I'm a ranch peddler. Uh, there's my bandwagon. My name's Hank Boone. Well, pleased to meet you, Mr. Boone. I'm Powell Bloomer, mayor of Frontsville. I surely hope you're going to favor our town by passing through. <laughs> I'm certain the ladies could do a thriving business for you. Well, I intend to be there pretty soon. Glad to hear it. Any of uh, the stubs about? Well, no, I don't expect Jim or his boys back much for sundown. Uh, they went up to ride fence on the north pasture. That's so. Hmm. Uh, how about Miss Lucy? 
Yeah, well, she's right in fence, too, about a mile up there on the east. Hmm. Well, uh, I got a letter here I'd like you to get to her. You want I should ride up and take it to her? Well, I, I, I wouldn't want to put you out, Mr. Boone, but I'll tell you the truth. I'm kind of anxious it should get into her hands, and I... Well, I wouldn't want it. You, uh, wouldn't want her men folk to know about it for some reason? Well, I, I, I don't know how to explain. Mr. Mayor, you don't have to. I've met Mr. Stubbs and his boys. You can rest assured this will get into no hands but Miss Lucy's. Uh, somehow, I have no doubt. Here, Mr. Boone. Thank you. And uh, by the by, if you're going to pay us the courtesy of a visit and you should happen to be in town a week today, Saturday night, I'd like to issue an invite to a general hoedown and fandango Mrs. Bloomer and myself are holding. I take that mighty kindly, sir. If I can attend, I'd be proud to. <laughs> I could ask you the same question. What are you doing here? Oh, a couple of cars busted out through this hole in the fence. I'm taking down the last strand so I can drive them back into the pasture before the rest of them critters take a notion to, to bust out onto the range with them. Well, you get the rest of your wire down and I'll fetch in your mavericks for you. Yep. There you boy. Oh. Go, top strand. A snug home, and your whole fence is as good as new. Oh, I ought to thank you. But I wish you'd get on out of here. Well, now, if you're worried about your kin folks, them honorary brothers of yours and your pop took off to ride the west fence all the ways north, you know, clear to the end of the ranch. Well, they might take it to change their minds. I just don't want no trouble. Well, what trouble could there be? Like I told you, I am a peaceful man. You also said you was a ranch pet. And that ain't the whole truth either. Now, what does that mean? I watched the way you worked those strays when you rounded them up. <laughs> You're no peddler. Well, I never said I've been a peddler all my life. I've been a lot of things. And there's something else. What's that, Lucy? You ain't scared a bit of my brothers and my daddy. And you ought to be. Now, just who are you, Mr. Boone? <laughs> Come on, Lucy. Let's mount up and get to riding some fence whilst I tell you the story of my life. You've been talking for most an hour, and you still haven't told me one real thing about yourself. Well, Lucy, I, I told you I've been a cowpuncher. I've been boss. It was my whole life until I cut out and put all I saved into a bandwagon. Oh, I know you You talked a heap about what you was and what you are. But you ain't told me why. Why what? Why you ever gave up a life you know you loved. Well, maybe I just got tired of being lonesome. Maybe I took a hankering to settle. So? Why didn't you? Well, got to find a woman first. Oh, hey. Hey, there's a nice stand of shade trees. Now, why don't we cut over there, huh? Ponies need a rest, and I reckon we could use a little noon meal, huh? I didn't bring anything to eat with me. I did. I took the liberty and snuck in the kitchen. Now, I got bread and cheese and a slice of meat. And, well, you can give me 15 minutes to get a fire going, and we got coffee to go with it. Coffee, Lucy? Oh, no. I've had enough. <laughs> First food I've eaten, as long as I can remember. I didn't have nothing to do with preparing. Well, that was the object. Oh, what do you mean? Well, I'll give you a little rest for change. Having somebody do for you instead of you doing for them all the time. How do you stand it, Lucy? Why don't you cut and run? No cash money, for one thing. What would I do? Oh, I reckon there's only one thing a woman alone can do for a living out here in the frontier. I wouldn't cotton to that way of life. But you got no life here. That's for sure. I ain't set foot off this spread since my mom died. 
Don't even get to ride into town, even for mail, once in a while. Oh, land sakes, I plumb forgot. What? Well, the whole reason I rode out the line to find you. Yeah, I got this here for you. What is it? Oh, it's a letter. A fellow rode by and said he was uh, Mayor Bloomer out of Frontsville, and he wanted to make certain sure that this got into your hands and nobody else's. Oh, what's in it? Well, why don't you open it and find out? I will. Hey, 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 now, Lucy, I mean, how come it gets to you so? Oh, how could I explain? Well, I would listen. You wouldn't understand. Well, won't you try me? Well, I'd like to. Well, maybe you are the only one might understand. You see, this here is an invite. Well, is that something to cry about? Well, it is if you can't go. It's not just any old hoedown. This is the biggest event of the whole year. Well, why can't you go? Well, first off, because I wouldn't be allowed to. Anyways, because what would I wear? I don't even own a dress I could wear just to wash up the dishes. Well, that's no problem. What do you mean? Well, you know how to sew. Oh, I used to when Mom was still alive. I reckon you don't forget. Well, I got needles and thread and whatever fabric takes your fancy. I got no way of paying you. Now, did I ask you to? Oh, Hank, I couldn't. I shouldn't. And, well, even if I did, it it would just never pan out. You'll never know until you try. They'd never let me go. Well, will they be at the hold down? Well, they always get an invite, but they don't go. Oh, they just I'd rather go drinking and playing cards and hanging out with them fancy women down at the saloon. So how would they know if you win? Oh, it don't signify. I got no way of getting there. My coach and one are at your disposal, Cinderella. Huh? Well, isn't that just what you're like? And haven't you got a chance to escape just like she did? Oh, I want to go to the hoedown real bad. Just to wear a dress again and get off this old ranch. No use fooling myself. I ain't about to meet any Prince Charming like she did in the story. Like I say, you'll never know less than you try. Now, stranger things have happened. Maybe the strangest of all is figuring an old sourdough like you for my fairy godmother. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm too long in the tooth and the beard to be anything like that. <laughs> well, I, I'd still like to know who you are to do this for me. Well, let's say I'm a fellow who found the way to set himself free. Then maybe I'd like to help anyone else do the same thing. Now, you going to do it, Lucy? Yes. Lord, help me. I am. In spite of all, I just want this one fling. In spite of all what? I can just feel it in my bones, Hank. Nothing comes that easy to me. Oh, I just pray to heaven nobody gets hurt. Ain't got it coming to them. The story unwinds like a coiled lariat. All the parallels are there, and all the characters, except one. Prince Charming. Where can he possibly come from? Well, as Lucy said... Who could imagine that a grizzled old sourdough could play the role of the fairy godmother? If that could happen, perhaps anything is possible. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. The week before Frontsville's greatest shindig has fled rapidly for Lucy... She had picked a pure white cotton overprinted with a pattern of blue flowers. She has sewn it in secret in moments stolen from her daily chores. And it is finished none too soon because tonight is the night of the dance. Ain't you riding into town tonight, Daddy? That uh, depends on boys, Lucy. I thought maybe you might be going to Mayor and Mrs. Bloomer's big shindig. No, we wouldn't be going there. Tea and punch and lady fingers ain't just our style. We ride in and we go for man's enjoyment. 
Regular Saturday night poker game. Oh, Curly. Well, what's your hide hand have to see? Oh, he reckons about two, three more days he'll finish up. Yeah, steady. We got time to make our move, huh? Yeah. Where's Book? Saddling up. Ain't we riding into town? No reason now we shouldn't. I'll go get my cow out and my gun belt. What time will you all be home? What do you care? I'd just like to know. Well, then I guess uh, somewhere the other side of midnight. So they're finally gone. Yes. Oh, I thought they would never leave. So did I. Yeah, but they did. And it's getting sort of late. Now, ain't it time for you to get all dressed up for the ball, huh? I ain't going. Well, how come? It's too dangerous. I know it's going to mean trouble. Now, you mean to tell me you spent this whole week making that dress, planning, getting ready, and you're just going to plain throw it all over? I don't want to, Hank. You're even going to spoil the best surprise of all. What surprise? These. A pair of shoes. A pair of Sunday go to meet and dance and shoes. Just your size. Oh, Hank, they are beautiful. Only if they get worn and if they fit. Well, it it appears as if they are, huh? Well, why don't you go and find out? <sighs> Hank, I can't. It's too dangerous for you. What time are those three getting home? Not before midnight. Probably not till near sunup. But I couldn't take any chance. Till midnight, I, I'd ought to be safe. Okay, then I'll be your coachman. I'll drive you to the hoe down and fetch you home before midnight. And then I promise I'm going to take off for good before they try to dry gulch me. If that's a promise, then I'll take my chances and go to the bar. <laughs> Miss Lucy, are you ready? You can come on in, Hank. Oh, my, oh, my. You like? Oh, you are about the prettiest sight I ever did see. What did you do with your hair? I washed it and brushed it and put it up with hairpins you loaned me. Well, if you ain't a princess, I don't know what is. But only one thing is missing. What? This here. To put in your hair. Oh, Hank. A comb with real brilliance. Oh, where'd you ever find it? Well, I, I didn't. It was my mother's. Will you wear it tonight? Are you sure you want me to? Oh, yeah. Then I'd be proud to. Like that? That's just the way it should be. <laughs> now, come on. You don't want to be late for the party. Here you are, madame. I'm scared. I'm afraid to go in. Just swallow once and put your best foot forward. Here, now. Come on, let me help you down. You're just as light as air. Oh, you don't feel no heavier than a tumbleweed. And you are powerful beautiful. Am I, Hank? Well, appears that way to me. No, oh, I wish you was coming to the dance with me. What, an old rawhide like me? And I cramp your style. Now, you go find yourself a nice young buckaroo. But I can't find one I want. The mayor and, uh, oh, yeah, I guess that's his wife. They're waiting for you on the receiving line. You'll be back for me before midnight. Now, now don't you worry. And even if you're a little late, the old bandwagon won't turn into any pumpkin. Right, nice to see you, Mrs. Breed. Well, good evening, Mrs. Breed. I uh, hope you're going to allow me the honor of a dance later. Good evening. I don't believe I know you. I have my invite. Lucy Stubbs. 
Why, I'd have never recognized you in a million years. Why, child, you're lovely. Oh, I thank you kindly for saying so. Why, you can't see. It is. It's, it's Lucy Stubbs. Hiding all that beauty these last few years under a sweat-stained hat and some old wall Levi's. Why, could you believe it? Lucy, your family here? No, sir. Oh. Well, how'd you come? Um, a, a friend brought me in his wagon. Oh, that, uh, that ranch peddler who's staying out your way? Yes. Hmm. Yes. Well, why didn't he join us? He didn't have an invite. I reckon he's some shy about most folks. But he's like to be the best person in the whole world. I wish he was here. <laughs> I wouldn't feel so alone. Well, you ain't gonna be alone for long, child. You know, uh, once I take you into the dance, you're uh, going to have to fight them off. Having a good time, Lucy? Oh, the best, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, you found a young man? Oh, not quite yet. Oh. Well, looks like you have a new partner. I've never seen this young man before. Me neither. Bow to your partner, Lucy. Oh, shucks. Now, is it that easy to spot me, huh? Oh, you can shave off all your whiskers and come up with skin pink as a baby, but you can't change those blue eyes. Mm, skin pink as a baby, huh? And as tender, I can tell you. Took me best part of an hour to hack off all that stubble. Oh, it took me a whole week to turn the sow's ear into silk purse. Oh, ain't we a fair? Well, not quite. You're beautiful. <laughs> and what do you think you are? And so young. Can't we go somewhere right away and just be alone? Well, now, you don't have to twist my arm. Come on. <laughs> uh, what are you laughing at, Lucy? Us? <laughs> you, I reckon. Well, what's so funny? That my fairy godmother went and turned into my Prince Charming. It ain't quite the way the story went. Now, this is our story, and we make our own happy ending. Oh, Hank, I can't believe it's happening. You, me. Now, why'd you wait so long to tell me? <laughs> a week? Why didn't you say something sooner? Well, you know, I had to give you a chance to know. You know, the way you were situated... Any way you could fly the prison you were locked in might have looked good. Well, I couldn't let you take the route you'd cry over later. So you helped me make a dress, found out myself as a woman, and spread my wings. Princess, you were made for flying. Only right back into your arms. Oh, Hank. Oh, Lucy. Mm -hmm. So... It's just like the story. A happy ending. No, it ain't that easy, Hank. What about my family? Well, we just walk away from them or ride. You mean I can never go back home? What did you leave there that you have to take with you? Nothing, except... Now, it's coming on to midnight. Now, let's you and me get back to the party and make our farewells. <laughs> What is it, Henny? Look who just came in. It's the Stubbs boy. <sighs> yeah, so it is. Well, we did invite them, you know. I guess my will. Well, Lucy and that nice young man. Yes, and I, I don't see them. Well, I'll go greet Jim and his boys. You go see if you can find Lucy and tell her to keep out of sight. <laughs> Stubbs. I didn't think we were going to have the honor of your company. Well, me and the boys felt we ought to put in a token appearance. Well, you're most welcome. Can I get you some punch? I know. I reckon we'll just... Oh. What? Look. That's pretty good, all right, but what? You can't recognize your own daughter. That's Lucy. Bad. Damn, you're right. Who, who's that fancy fellow with her? Well, I wouldn't know him without the whiskers. Excepting for them boots with the fancy stitches he's wearing. 
That's the range peddler. Why, that order ain't no count going behind our back. Now, I hope there isn't going to be any trouble. No trouble, Mrs. Bloomer. I'm just going to call him out. And you just stay out of this, ma'am. This here is man's business. Hank Boone. Now, stay cool, Lucy. I'll handle it. But you can't. The killers, all of them. Boone, I'm calling you out. If you ain't got a gun of your own, you better borrow one. Uh, you don't want to call me out, Curly. I'm warning you. Don't you try to weasel. You're going to have a gun on your hip. I'll do better. You let me fetch my belt, and I'll have one on both. you do it, Curly? We could have took care of him back at the ranch. I never did like the guy. What's the difference, a ranch peddler? I got nothing to worry about. Just the same, we don't take no chances. Now, I got Buck covering for you to one side. The moment you draw, he'll squeeze off and drop him. Okay. I'll stand away for her. He's coming out from his wagon. Please don't go up against him, Hank. We've been spoiling for this since we first met. But he's a killer, Hank. Aren't you afraid? Yep. Then don't. I'm not afraid for me, Lucy. And it has to be if you and me are going to have any future. Peddler, I'm ready. Then draw down. No, 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 shoot. I ought to, Jim Stubbs. Your boys tried to sidewind me, and I had to kill them both. This ain't any prettier for me than it is for you. Can't you smile again, Hank? Well, give me time, Lucy. At the moment, I'm too ashamed of myself. What do you have to be ashamed of? Well, I... See, I grew up a cow hand. I was always quick with a gun. And I was only 20 when Pecus John come to our town. Now, he picked the quarrel. I didn't. It was just my gun was faster. And then from then on, I was a marked man. What do you mean? Well, every vaquero figured he could slip a gun out of the holster faster than I could wanted to go up against me. And I was marked for a killer. I didn't want it. Knowing as I did, sooner or later, someone would draw faster than me. So I, well, I took my savings and bought me a band wagon and I just hoped for some peace. Well, ain't you got that now? Yes, Lucy. I am daring to hope I have. But that ain't the best part. What is? It ain't going to be a long, lonely ride anymore. I got company to keep me warm. I got you. And in the old days, the wagon would have traveled off into the sunset while music played and two words would have been printed over the scene. The end. Which, of course, is true enough for the story. But for Hank and Lucy, the legend should have read, The Beginning. I'll be back shortly. The kind of raw justice that was meted out in the days of the Wild West is, of course, indefensible. No nation can live by anarchy. But sometimes, particularly when it's only a story, we can all silently applaud the side that we think is right even if the methods are against our natural impulses. For example, I would hope that in the story you have just heard, you would be on the side of the angels. Our cast included Earl Hammond, E.V. Juster, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. 
Until next time, pleasant dreams. The voice of the Rocky Mountain West. Radio 85, KOA Denver. Street Theater presents. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. And if you're wondering if that squeaking door doesn't drive me crazy, please don't be concerned. I've been living in this house of mystery for some years now, and I've grown quite accustomed to the sound. But perhaps the hero of our story would be interested in our door, or in any other device which might drive someone out of their mind. You see, that's the problem faced by Wallace Dodd. An amiable young man who has only one dislike in this world. The four-letter word called work. And unless Mr. Dodd does something very ingenious very soon, he might well be forced to join that grim, gray army of the employed. I'm telling you, Casey, if my Aunt Louise gets out of the funny farm, it's like the end. My ticket gets canceled. But, uh... What can you do about it, Wally? There's only one thing to do. I gotta send her back there. Our mystery drama, Two of a Kind, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Christopher Tabori. I shall return shortly. Let's face it, there are some people who are simply allergic to work. Wallace Dodd III is one of those people, and who are we to judge him? Who can say what any one of us might do if our sole surviving relative was a very rich aunt whose considerable fortune is doing her no good at all in the plush confines of the Maple Grove Sanitarium, where Louise Dodd has spent the last two years of her life? Happily for her, while she is away, her nephew is only too glad to see that her money is spent on only the finest things in life. Things which Wally and his bosom friend Casey enjoy with a youthful enthusiasm that would warm anyone's heart. Except, perhaps, an attorney's. Wally? Is that you? Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, Casey, wait till you see what I got. Hey, man, you're loaded. What'd you do, buy out the joint? Here, here, here. Uh, put some of those boxes down before you hurt yourself. Look at these loafers. That buckle is pure gold. You know what it's worth? And here, and this jacket. Look at the elbow patches. <laughs> you look like a country squire, Wally. Listen, uh, maybe I ought to do that. Buy some nice little place out in the country. I could take Lisa there or Karen, maybe. Uh -huh. Of course, I'll need a nice little car to get me out there. Uh, maybe like this one. Hey, what's this? It's a picture of my new car. Straight from the showroom. Wait a minute, you mean you bought one of these? Hey, Wally, this, this, this car goes for about uh, 30, 35,000. I figure if I spread the payments over 12 months, Hageman will never notice it. Oh, uh, listen, speaking of Hageman, the guy called before. He did? What for? Well, I don't know. He said he wanted to come over. When? Like now. He's on his way. What did you do that for, Casey? I don't feel like talking to a lawyer. Not this hour of the well, day. The man said he wanted to see you, said it was urgent. Oh, you know what he wants? Wants to chew me out about where the money's going. Oh, uh, there he is. If you don't mind, Wally, I'm going to uh, sneak out the back now, way. Now, wait a minute. I'll Casey. see you over at Lisa's place, okay? I'd better answer it. Hi, Mr. Hagerman. Nice to see you. You take a long time to answer your door, Wally. I'm sorry, Mr. Hagerman. I was just putting some of these things away. Hmm... You have quite a few things to put away, don't you? You've been shopping again. Uh, just for a few essentials. Mm. What is this thing? That? Oh, 
it, it, it's um, an electric wine corker. Mm. Now, what was it you wanted to see me about, Mr. Hagerman? Casey said it was urgent. Yes, yes, it's urgent. Is it all right if I sit down? Oh, sure. Make yourself at home. Mm. Can I get you something to drink? How about a nice glass of wine? It'll give me a chance to try out my new electric wine corker. Mm, no, thank you. I'd rather get right down to business. You see, I have some very good news for you. No kidding. And I was afraid you were going to chew me out for spending too much money. I doubt that I'll ever have to do that again. You'll be happy to hear that your Aunt Louise is leaving the Maple Grove Sanitarium. Would you say that again? Your aunt has made very good progress. Her physician, Dr. Winterhoff, has decided that she's well enough now to leave. To leave? You mean for good? Let us hope so. Yeah, but, but, but it was only three months ago she had Russian spies after her. Oh, she fully recognizes her delusion now, Wallace. Uh, but, but what about the Chinese with the time bombs? Your aunt understands she was suffering from hallucinations, and they are completely gone. She's ready to return to the normal world, ready to resume the responsibilities of her estate and her family. What family? She is only me. Exactly. Oh, good Lord. I knew you'd be pleased, Wallace. Yeah, yes, sure. Your aunt has always had wonderful plans for you. Yes. I remember those plans. She was going to send me out to the factory to learn the business from the ground up. A wonderful opportunity. She's going to put me back on an allowance, isn't she? The only way to learn how to handle money is to have a limited amount to handle. She's going to make me wait on her hand and foot just like she used to? Well, I'm sure she'll appreciate your devotion, Wallace. In fact, you can do something for her right now. You can find your Aunt Louise an apartment. An apartment? Just for her? Of course not. An apartment for both of you. This place will never do. I... Have here a list of her requirements. Now, please note them carefully. The apartment house must be situated between 63rd Street and 79th Street on the east side. It must be a high-rise luxury apartment centrally air-conditioned with two bedrooms and possibly a sitting room or study. It must be above the 10th floor. And as for the rental, she gives no limitations. It must be rented and completely furnished within a period of five weeks, which coincides with her discharge from Maple Grove. There. Is that clear? You mean I've got to find an apartment and furnish it within five weeks? That's correct. You'll have $25,000 to work with, and I suggest you hire a decorator. Judging from this place, I'm not sure your aunt would appreciate your taste. Well, that's all, Wallace. I, I trust you're as pleased as I am about this. Yeah. I was never happier in my life. Wally, you gotta be kidding me. You told me your aunt was socked away for good. That's what I thought. But I was wrong. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> I'm telling you, Casey, if my Aunt Louise gets out of the funny farm, it's like the end. My ticket gets canceled. But what can you do about it? There's only one thing to do. I gotta send her back there. But how? I don't know. Maybe I can convince her that Dr. Winteroff is wrong, that she's still got problems. Maybe I can hire some Russian spies to follow her. Huh? Or Armenian acrobats. That was one of her craziest delusions. The troop of Armenian acrobats were out to get her. I think that's why she always wanted to live on a high floor. Uh, uh, Wally, I, I don't get it. She used to think they'd stand on each other's shoulders and climb in her window. Ooh. Your aunt sounds like she's really weird. I liked her weird. Mm, I don't blame you. I knew her when she was plenty unweird. When she did nothing but talk about my education and my training. About how she was going to send me to a mattress factory with a broom for six months so I could learn the business right from the bottom. And I mean the bottom. Oh, man, that's awful, Wally. It'll mean the end of everything. 
Oh, come on. I got to get out of here. Where, where are you going? I've got to see a man about an apartment uh, on the east side between 63rd Street and 79th. <laughs> I've got just the thing for you, Mr. Dodd. Not a finer apartment in the building. Looks to me like there's plenty to choose from. Building looks half empty, Mrs. Griswold. We like to think of it as half full, Mr. Dodd. Uh, uh, when was this uh, place built, anyway? The Ritz Colonial was completed only six months ago. We've been renting for the past couple of months, and every single apartment will be snapped up. Even at these prices? Now, uh, you said you wanted a high floor, Mr. Dodd. Gotta be above ten. Well, then this is perfect. It's on floor 12A. 12A? Isn't there a 12? Why, yes. 12 is just below it. Uh, so it's really the 13th floor. No, we don't have a 13th floor. What's holding up the 14th floor? The 14th floor is directly over it. You mean uh, you call it 12A on account of some people are superstitious, right? Well, let's see the place. Just follow me, gentlemen. As you can see, the rooms are generously proportioned. This is the living room, of course. Notice that wonderful view of the river. Boy. Some layout, huh, Wally? There are two bedrooms off this way, and the kitchen is through here. Is there any kind of study or sitting room? There's a small room off the kitchen that can be either a maid's room or a study. Hey, Wally! Dig this view! Come out of here! Boy, that's a long way off this balcony. <laughs> Just don't look down. <laughs> I wish you were Aunt Louise, Casey. I'd give you a nice little shove. Hey, 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 stop horsing around. Would you gentlemen like to see the other rooms? No, it looks okay to me. The only thing is, I'm not sure my aunt isn't superstitious uh, about living on the 13th floor. Oh, if that's a problem, I have a simple solution. The apartment below us is identical to this one. Would you like to see that? Yeah, maybe I'd better. But if it's identical to this one, why bother? The view is different, dummy. Mm. We can take the stairs so we won't have to wait for the elevator. Right this way. Well, I can't see any difference in the view. I mean, what the heck, Wally? It's only one lousy floor. Yeah, you're right. You really can't see any difference. In fact, every single thing about the apartment is the same as the one upstairs. Like peas in a pod, huh? <laughs> and the same rental? Absolutely the same. But I thought you'd prefer the higher floor. Maybe I'd like both floors. I beg your pardon? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a kick, Casey, huh? To rent both apartments? You down here and me up there? I thought you said you and your aunt. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's right. It's it's for me and my aunt. Uh, Mr. Dodd, I I really should be back at my office. I have some prospects coming in at three. Yes, you go ahead, Mrs. Griswold. I haven't seen the rest of the place yet. Well, stop by my office when you're through, if you're interested. That is. Oh yes, yes. I'm definitely interested. Wally. What's with you, buddy? You got a funny look in your eye. I was just thinking, Casey. Thinking about these apartments. What about them? We really could have a ball if we rented both of them, couldn't we? I mean, furnish them exactly like... I mean, exactly. Like every stick of furniture, every rug, every lamp, every picture on the wall. Well, why would you want to do that? But just for kicks. Can you imagine if we got a couple of chicks up here and started switching apartments? <laughs> you mean we could, like, uh, run them up and down the elevator till they didn't know where they were at? Yes, that's the idea. <laughs> you could drive people crazy that way. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. You could drive somebody right out of their tree. Wally? Wally? Hmm? What are you staring at? What are you thinking about? There's something going on in that head of yours. Yes, Casey. There's something. What I was thinking is... Maybe we could drive somebody crazy with twin apartments. Mm, you're talking about your aunt, aren't you? I mean, they'd think they were crazy, wouldn't they? If they thought they were in one place, 
but they were really in another. Are you talking about your Aunt Louise? If we rented both apartments under different names so nobody knew about it, uh -huh. if we fixed them up exactly the same, I mean exactly... Yeah, but, but what for? I mean, why would that drive her crazy? I don't want to just drive her crazy. I want her driven right back to Maple Grove Sanitarium. But it'll cost a fortune to furnish both places. I'll spend my own money on it. It'll be worth it. And maybe I can get bargain rates if I buy two of a kind. Now, how will two identical apartments unhinge the sanity of his Aunt Louise? I'm sure it'll be ingenious. Because never underestimate the genius and energy of those who are determined to spend the rest of their lives unemployed. In fact... Not working may be the hardest job of all. But we'll find out what Wally has in mind when we return shortly with Act Two. Wallace Dodd, accompanied by his friend Casey, has spent the past five weeks riding escalators. From store to store, up and down, buying complete sets of living and bedroom furniture, hunting down identical rugs and tables, lamps, mirrors, prints, ashtrays, chairs, and dozens of other household items. And every single one of them, two of a kind. That's it. Uh, Move it another couple of inches to the left. Uh, no, 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 no. That's no good. There's supposed to be a chair over come there. Come on, Wally. Oh, look at the Polaroid dummy. There's a chair right where you moved the piano. Wally, this is driving me crazy. Forget about your aunt. That's almost finished. Just a few more things to do now. The place looks perfect to me. I swear. I, I, I can't tell one apartment from the other. If you took me up in the elevator blindfolded and let me off, I wouldn't know where I was. Well, that's the idea. Not to let Aunt Louise know where she is when she gets here. Hey, look, man, you still haven't told me how it's supposed to work. Okay, Casey. You've been patient long enough. Uh. Step one. They take the straight jacket off my Aunt Louise and deliver her here. You mean old man Hagerman delivers it? Right. She doesn't go anywhere without a lawyer. So there I am, down in the lobby of the building, waiting to greet them when they arrive. Got it. I'm smiling from ear to ear. I'm wearing my best suit and saying nice things. <laughs> telling my Aunt Louise how happy I am to see her. Yeah, yeah, I, don't uh, choke on your words. Yeah. <laughs> and then I tell her all about the terrific apartment I fixed up for us on floor 12A. I gotta remember that. 12A. Right, the apartment upstairs. I make sure they remember 12A. I tell them the story about it really being the 13th floor. Hey, uh, you think you should do that? I mean, your aunt may not like it. Uh, but she'll remember it, Casey. And so will Hagerman. And that's what they've got to remember. 12A. All right. Okay. Now, here's the crucial part. When we get into the elevator, I'm the one that has to press the button. On account of I don't push the button for 12A, I push it for 12. You... You push the wrong button? So we all get off on the 12th floor. No, 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 wait a minute. That's no good. Why not? Well, because it says 12 right where you get off the elevator. The big brass letters that says 12. <laughs> That's right. So what you do just before the elevator stops is put this on the wall. Uh, what's this? It's a big brass letter A. Can't you see? Mm hmm. It's got sticky stuff on the back. All you got to do is slap it next to the number 12, and the 12th floor becomes 12. 12A. <laughs> now you're beginning to get the idea. I am? Okay. So me and Aunt Louise and Hagerman get off the elevator, and I take them down the hall to our fancy new apartment. We walk in. Aunt Louise says, Why, Wallace, oh, this is lovely. This is oh, charming. This is simple. It's ideal. Yeah, okay, okay. So, well, what happens next? Well, we sit around and we talk about this and that. Hageman starts yawning and Aunt Louise says she's pretty tired herself. And Hageman finally goes home. And then the fun starts. The fun? Right. Because guess what happens to me? What? I turn into Jack the Ripper. Huh? As soon as Hageman is on his way to the elevator, I take this... Out of my jacket. <gasps> hey, Wally, that's a knife, man. It's a sharp knife. Very sharp. Sharp enough to rip open... Hey, 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 hey be careful. ...the oh. furniture. What? And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this knife and put it right on this sofa. No, 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 no. 
Not this sofa. The one upstairs. And I'm going to rip it all the way down. No, you are the one who sounds crazy. Oh, I'll be crazy, all right. Because after I rip up the sofa, I'll start ripping up the chairs and the curtains and slashing the paintings and kicking over vases and spilling the ashtrays. Hey, uh, Wally, are you sure you're all right? And when I the mean... place is a real mess, when I've ripped up everything in sight, I'll have to find something else to use my knife on, won't I? I'm not sure I like this idea. So I'm going to turn and look at Aunt Louise and say... Okay, Auntie, you're next. And you think that'll drive her back to the funny farm? <laughs> you don't think so? No, I think she'll just start screaming for the cops. You're the one who'll end up in a padded cell. Yes, but you better wait till you hear the rest of the scenario. First of all, the whole thing has only taken about a minute. Um, a minute and a half. Uh -huh. And what's Hageman doing in the meantime? Well, still waiting for the elevator, probably. I mean, that thing is pretty slow. Okay, okay. I don't start my Jack the Ripper routine until I hear the elevator door close. Why? Because I want to make sure that Hageman gets down to the lobby. And that's where you're going to be, Casey. Me? What am I supposed to do? You stop Hageman from leaving. I don't care how you do it, but you hold him there, you understand? Why? To give Aunt Louise time to get down to the lobby. Because that's what she's going to do. She's going to go screaming down the lobby to tell her lawyer that her nephew's just gone out of his mind. Yeah, that's what she'll do, all right. And then he'll call the police, and then what? You know, not so fast. Hageman won't call the cops. Not until he makes sure that it's true. Not until he knows for certain that it isn't another... Another delusion! Right! So he'll take Aunt Louise back in the elevator, and up they'll go. And where will they go, Casey? Huh? Use your head. Where will they go? Well, uh, uh, back to the apartment. Yeah. Which apartment? The one on... On 12A! That's right, Sonny! Oh. They go to 12A, because that's where the apartment is. And when they walk into 12A, what a nice surprise for Aunt Louise. Why don't they get here, Wally? Relax, they'll be here. Uh, oh. Hey, isn't that them now? Yes, yes. Yes, they are. Okay, Casey, beat it. Uh, but don't go too far. You've got to do your part, too. Don't worry, I'll stop the guy from leaving, even if I have to tackle him. Aunt Louise! Wally! Oh, Auntie, it's so terrific oh. to see you again. Wallace, my dear boy, how are you? Never better, now that you're back where you belong. Well, oh. just where do we belong? These suitcases are heavy. Oh, hi, Mr. Hagerman. Here, let me help you with those. Uh -huh. Did you do as I asked, Wally? Did you find us a nice high floor? Yes, Aunt Louise, and it's got a view of the river and everything. Uh, what floor are you on, Wallace? 12A. Now, let's go then. I don't like standing around lobbies. Just follow me. Oh, there is just one thing that worries me, Auntie. What's that, dear? I thought this building was perfect for both of us. But the only decent apartment they had available was on 12A. Well, what's wrong with that? Uh, here, this is the elevator. But you see, the truth is, 12A is really 13. It's the 13th floor, Aunt Louise, and they just tried to disguise it. Well, what's so darned important about that? Oh, I see. Poor Wallace is worried about me. He's worried that I might be superstitious, so... Well, I didn't want to do anything that might upset you, Auntie. Oh, excuse me. I'll just press the button... Well, you needn't have worried, my dear. I assure you, I'm neither superstitious nor nervous any longer. I promise you that Dr. Winterhoff says I'm completely, totally cured. And of course, that doesn't mean your aunt is in perfect health, Wallace. She's going to require plenty of peace and quiet for a while. I understand. Everything is going to be just lovely now, just as it used to be. Oh, I have wonderful plans for your future, Wallace. Here we are, 12A... Just like the sign says. Oh, come on, come on. Let's get into the place. I've got a busy day ahead, and your aunt should be resting in bed as soon as possible. Oh, stop fussing, Mortimer. It's right down here, Aunt Louise. Wait, I'll find my key. There. Shall we go inside? Yes, yes. Let's go in. 
Oh, Wallace, it's lovely. It's just simply... It's perfect. You really like it? I love it. It's so simple, so so light and airy. And look, Mortimer, a terrace. It goes all around the apartment. Both bedrooms have a view of the river. Oh, how delightful. Wallace, you've done a wonderful job. You're really a dear. Now, 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 let's sit down and talk, shall we? Sure, Auntie. I have something very serious to talk to you about, Wallace. Now... For some time, I've felt you've forgotten me completely. But now I realize I was wrong, completely wrong. You do? Yes, and do you know why? Because of this lovely apartment you found for me. Found and furnished for me, Wallace. And not just with that $25,000 I appropriated. Well, how did you know about that? We keep a very close watch of your finances, young man. Closer than you think. I knew you withdrew $10,000 of your own money to buy the furnishings, Wallace. You were a very naughty boy to do that. But a very sweet, very thoughtful boy. Gee, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're happy about it, Auntie. Yes, Wallace, I'm very happy. And that's why I've just come from Mr. Hagerman's office. We've done some wonderful things about your future there. My future? For one thing, I'm pleased to tell you that I'll be increasing your allowance. You are? Yes. And then we must talk about your career. It's time you had one. Yes. My career. Uh, Louise, I really have to go. I have a meeting in less than half an hour. Oh, of course, Mortimer. You run along. I'm in good hands now. Yes, I- I'll talk to you tomorrow, Louise. Make sure you get some rest now. I'll be fine. Just fine. Mm. Well, goodbye, then. Goodbye, Morris. Goodbye, Mr. Hagerman. Well, here we are. Yes, my dear boy. Here we are at last, reunited. Yes, reunited. Right back where we started from. Dear, why are you standing near the door? To hear the elevator, Auntie. Why? I just want to make sure that Mr. Hageman gets an elevator. That's the only thing wrong with this building. They tend to run a bit slow. Oh, it doesn't really matter. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, there. There it is. I just heard it. Good. Now come and sit beside me. No, Auntie, I'm afraid I can't. Not just now. Why not? Because of this. Wallace, what is that? It's a knife, Aunt Louise. A long, sharp knife. But what on earth? are you doing with a a knife in your pocket? There must be something I can do with it. Why don't I do this? Wallace! There. Doesn't that make the sofa look better? Oh! I never liked this pattern. Now it looks much better, don't you think, with the stuffing coming out? Wallace, are you mad? Let's see if the stuffing is the same in this chair. No, no, no. Wallace, you stop that. Now stop that at once. I hate this painting, don't you? I hate all paintings with deer in them. I hate deer. I think I'll go deer hunting. Wallace, for heaven's sake. Yes, and this will help, too. And this. Oh, no, 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 you've gone mad. Now, there's oh. nothing left to cut open, oh. Aunt Louise. There's nothing left in the room to cut. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. There's one thing. What? Don't come near me. Now, go away. It's your turn now, Aunt Louise. Uh, help! Help! Mortimer! Mortimer, wait! Wait, help me! <laughs> So long, Aunt Louise. (laughs) See you on 12A. Aunt Louise has had quite a welcome home party from her loving nephew, Wallace. But the party isn't over yet. Wally has another surprise in store for her. A surprise that he hopes will change the welcome party into a farewell party. Will Wally's clever scheme work as planned? 
Wally's as anxious as you are to find out. moment his Aunt Louise went screaming down the hall to the elevator, Wallace Dodd has been a busy young man. First, he picks up her purse and luggage, noting carefully where they had been positioned. Then he dashes into the hall and removes the brass letter A he had placed alongside the number 12 on the wall outside the elevator. Quickly, he ascends the fire stairway up to the 13th floor and quietly enters the apartment. It is so peaceful, so orderly, and oh, so quiet. He puts Aunt Louise's things in exactly the positions they had been in downstairs. Then he picks up a magazine, sits on the sofa, and waits. And what about Aunt Louise? Mortimer! Mortimer! But, help! But Louise, what's the matter? Oh, it's Wallace! Oh, I'm so glad you're still here. He's gone crazy. What? Oh, he's gone stark staring mad. Louise, what are you talking about? He, he's got a knife. He's ripped the furniture open. All of it. What? The sofa, the chairs. He slashed the paint. Louise, you can't mean this. I, I saw it with my own eyes. He broke all the vases. He, he's, he's gone completely crazy. Louise. And, and then he, he threatened to Louise. kill me. Please stop this. It, oh, it can't be true. I swear it, Mortimer. I swear it. He came at me with this knife. I ran out of the apartment. Well, we're going to go back to that apartment and see what this is all about. Come on. <laughs> Wallace? Wallace, where are you? Who is there? Be careful. He's dangerous, Mortimer. He's out of his mind. And Louise, is that you? Wallace, what the devil is going on here? Oh, oh dear God. Hi, Aunt Louise. You know, I was getting worried about you the way you ran out of oh. here. Did you forget to tell Mr. Hagerman something? Oh, it, 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 can't, it can't be true. It, it can't be. What, Auntie? This, this, this apartment... It's it's exactly the same. The same as what, Auntie? Uh, Wallace, what happened here? Your aunt says you went absolutely mad. Me? You 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 had a knife. A big long knife. You 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 ripped open this sofa and, and all the cushions and, and this chair. And and then you, you slashed this painting. How can you say that? You can oh. see that. Oh, gee, Mr. Hageman, oh. I really don't understand. Louise, uh, are you sure oh. you didn't just uh, go oh. to sleep and have a bad dream? No, no, no. I swear it's true. I saw it with my own eyes. He ripped apart all the furniture, and then he, he smashed this vase. This vase? Oh, Louise. I, I, I know he did it. I saw him do it. Oh, Auntie. Oh. Why would I do such a thing? You know how long it took me to find this furniture, to pick out that vase? Why would I want to do such a crazy thing? Oh, oh good Lord. Oh, Mortimer. Mortimer, you must believe me. He was going to kill me, too. He said he was. Louise, Louise, oh. calm yourself and sit down. Uh, no, 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 I don't want to sit down. It's all right, no, Auntie. No, There's no, nothing no. wrong with the sofa. No. You can see for yourself. Oh, yes, yes, yes. There's nothing wrong with it. The, the stuffing's all back in place now. You don't think I upholstered it in the last five oh. minutes, do you? <laughs> oh, 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 up upholstered it. Oh, that, that's very funny. Oh, Louise, oh. Louise, dear, dear, I, I told you that you needed some rest. Oh, oh, yes, 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 that, that's right. Yes, you, you, you told me that. Now, please, you go straight to the bedroom oh. and you go to bed. I'm, oh. I'm sure you'll feel much better oh. in a little while. Oh, yes. Yes, oh, oh, I, I, I really am tired, Mortimer. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely exhausted. Uh, Wally, uh, where's your aunt's bedroom? It's right this way, Mr. Hagerman. Uh, oh. Come, my dear. Oh, Mortimer. 
What's wrong with me? Don't worry. Everything is going to be all right. A good night's sleep and everything will be fine. Oh, what am I going to do? We'll um, talk about it tomorrow. But you and I will talk right now, Wallace. Yes, Mr. Hagerman. I'm afraid Dr. Winterhoff was too optimistic about the state of your aunt's health. I can see that. Mm. It was obviously too soon for her to leave Mabel Grove. Much too soon. Oh, I'm really sorry about that, Mr. Hagerman. I'll call Dr. Winterhoff when I get back to my office and tell him what's happened. You may want to come over and see her. Poor Aunt Louise. Uh, and then tomorrow... Well, tomorrow we'll have to make... Arrange, plus. Yes, sir. Of course, I understand perfectly. Mm, now I... I must go. Sure, Mr. Hagerman. Thanks very much for everything. Uh, Wallace, if your aunt has any other, um, serious delusions, be sure to call me. Oh, yes, sir, I'll do that. Goodbye, Wallace. Goodbye, Mr. Hagerman. <laughs> oh, Oh, boy, I did it. <laughs> I did it. I did it. I did it. <laughs> Hello. Wally, it's me. Hi, Casey. Where are you? I'm downstairs in the apartment. Hey, listen, how'd it go? <laughs> I tell you, it couldn't have gone better. It was great, man. It worked like a charm. Yeah? You should have seen her face when she walked into the apartment. And everything was just the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> I sure would have liked to see that. Yeah. Oh, and Hagerman. Oh, you should have seen his face. He knew she wasn't playing with a full deck the minute he walked in with her. <laughs> uh, how's the apartment down there? Oh, a wreck, man. You sure did a job on a place. Yeah. Don't worry about it. With all the money that's coming our way, once Auntie is back in storage... Hey, man, stop clicking the phone. I'm not clicking it. Oh, something clicked. Your, your phone isn't tapped, is it? Of course not. Who would tap my phone? Wait a minute. What is it? There's an extension phone in the bedroom. So what? My aunt is in there. What? Now she's in there lying down... Or she was supposed to be. Uh-oh. You better check, man. Yeah. I better. Oh. Aunt Louise? Wallace. I heard it. I heard it all. You were listening in? I, I, I heard the phone ring. I thought it might be Dr. Winterhoff. No, no, Auntie. It wasn't Dr. Winterhoff. But he'll be here soon. Don't worry. I heard what you said to that man. Something ab about an uh, apartment down there. What did you mean? Oh, you didn't hear right, Auntie. You know you're not seeing things right, so you're not hearing them right either. He said something about the apartment being a wreck. Wallace, what have you done? Nothing, nothing. It's some kind of trick. Now, isn't it? You took me to, to another apartment. That apartment downstairs. Come on, Auntie, that's crazy. Oh. You're crazy. You oh. know you are. Get, get away from me. Don't come into this room. You just imagined that oh. phone call, didn't you? Oh. Get away. Get out of here or I'll scream. Help. Help. Somebody. Get off that balcony, Auntie. Oh, We're 12 stories up. No, 13. Help. Nobody can hear you. Help. Help! He, he's going to kill I'm me! I'm not going to do anything Help. of the kind. Help. Now, look out. Stop leaning Help. over and look... Help. And the Come in, Morris. Yes, Mr. Hagerman. Oh, please, sit down. I know you're badly shaken... I never did like funerals. Mm, it's all terribly sad. But you mustn't blame yourself for what happened. I just can't help it. I never should have left Aunt Louise alone in that bedroom. No, oh, it's my fault as much as yours, Wallace. I should have realized the state of mind your aunt was in. Realizing that she wasn't cured, that she should have to return to Maple Grove Sanatorium. Oh, she must have been really depressed about that. Yes. Yes. And we should have realized what depression can do to people. But I 
I never thought she'd take her own life. No, neither did I. Well, you did everything you could for her, Wallace. I'm, I'm very proud of you. Thank you. And, um, I'm really sorry about the will. Pardon? Your aunt's will. I, um, yes, that, that's right. I was going to ask you about that. I, I guess I'd better get to the details. The details? Yes. Uh, how much um, is my aunt's estate worth? I ought to know that, shouldn't I? I mean, since it's mine. Yes, yes, I should have realized you'd have that misunderstanding. Misunderstanding? What do you mean? I'm afraid there's nothing which is yours. Nothing at all. What are you talking about? Well, you remember the day your aunt left Maple Grove? She went to my office first to draw up a new will, leaving everything to you. That's terrific. Yes, yes, she was very pleased about what you did, Wally. Spending her own money to furnish the apartment. Oh, her previous will, in case you didn't realize it, left everything to charity. Yeah, but, but, but why isn't the money mine? Well, the new will isn't valid, of course. The old one is still in effect. Not valid. But why? Because she obviously was not in her right mind. The hallucination she had that day. Well, no probate court would accept it. Therefore, the earlier will stands. And it leaves everything to her favorite cause. Her favorite cause? Yes. Mental health. <laughs> Wallace Dodd, not only has he lost his aunt's fortune, but he's stuck with two apartment leases. How would you like to pay two rents, two electric bills, two of everything? Now, that's what I call double-digit inflation. I'll have another word to say about that when I return shortly. bad that Wallace Dodd's get-rich-quick scheme turned out to be a get-poor-quick scheme instead. But as we all know, crime doesn't pay. It can entertain, however. And that's the purpose of the Radio Mystery Theater. Who knows what terrors and delights we'll have for you next time. The only way to find out is to use your ears. You've got two of a kind, haven't you? Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Russell Horton, and Martha Greenhouse. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Just, just one minute, Chloe. What's the composition of Jupiter's atmosphere? Do you remember? Of course. Hydrogen, helium, methane, ammonia, water... And so forth. Don't you see... See what? Almost the same components that were on Earth when life first emerged back there. You mean the thing that nearly jammed us could have taken off directly from the surface of Jupiter itself? Why not? That there might be some kind of life form on Jupiter? Exactly. But that's crazy. Nobody could breathe. Nothing could live in that kind of atmosphere. You couldn't. I couldn't. But isn't it conceivable that some other kind of being, a new and completely different form of life, could. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
mystery drama, A Private Demon, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Norman Rose. It is brought to you in part by Ace Books. Where there is charity and wisdom, there is neither fear nor ignorance. Where there is patience and humility, there is neither anger nor vexation. That's what Francis said about charity, wisdom, patience, and humility. But of course, he could practice them to the full. After all, he was a saint. We lesser mortals are not so happily situated. The things of this world, fame, success, the adulation of the crowd, too often, these are the guiding lights and the driving forces, even in the most remote and abstruse fields of endeavor. There's some of the roast left, Professor. Ah, that's good, Mrs. Lovekin. Although you really shouldn't have anything more this evening. That's true. Oh, and there's some beer in the refrigerator. Oh, thank you. But you shouldn't drink it. I understand. Oh, and uh, if you want to go out for a walk later tonight, uh, your heavy sweater is in the hall closet. But I shouldn't go out because I can catch my death of cold in the night air. Yeah, that's absolutely true. (laughs) Do you suppose you could end this seemingly limitless litany of illicit activities and tell me perhaps what I am permitted to do? Well, I would start working on my acceptance speech. Huh? Which acceptance speech is this? <laughs> the one you're going to make in Stockholm next month, when you accept the Nobel Prize. Oh, I wasn't aware that I'd received this. Oh, you will, you will, you will. You overestimate my importance. <laughs> well, I don't see how you can be overlooked. My field of activity is simply too, well, let's say, specialized. Too restricted to a single, rather shadowy, almost prehistoric people. I hear all the gossip on the campus. <laughs> I shouldn't be at all surprised. And I hear all those big-time professors say, Jeremiah Soames is the foremost pure historian in the world. <sighs> the Nobel Prize. And why not? Because it is a highly complex situation. And there are all sorts of political implications. Write the speech. It could be your year. This is Lofkin. Now, why aren't you on your way? I'm going, I'm going. Oh, would you look at this floor? Well, what's wrong with it? It needs a good scrubbing. Nonsense. It's absolutely spotless. Uh, I didn't get around to it Tuesday morning. Maybe I had just better take care of that before I go. You will miss the bus. Uh, that might be a good idea. You should stay another day or two with your sister-in-law. Uh, no, no, thank you. One night with my late brother's relic is more than sufficient. Good night, Mrs. Lufkin. Good night, Professor. Oh, <laughs> and don't get into any mischief while I'm gone. Mischief? Me? <laughs> I think I'll snack on some of that roast beef. Oh, Professor. Oh, is Mrs. Lufkin back already? Oh, I almost forgot. Yes? A gentleman called you, a Mr. David Porter. Hmm? He asked if you would be home tonight, and I said yes. He said he would stop by to see you sometime after eight. And I said it would be best for him to make an appointment. He he said it was a most vital matter and that it couldn't wait. And then he hung up. A Mr. David Porter? Do you know the gentleman, sir? I never heard of him. I I, I don't know how I came to forget that. I don't know either. Uh, Good night again, Mrs. Lufkin. Oh, but you look at you. What now? You wore that shirt again. I feel quite comfortable in it. But it has to be laundered. Now, please, don't wear it again tomorrow. Do put it aside tonight, and I'll do it as soon as I return. Yes. You promise? You have my solemn oath. And now for the third time, good night, Mrs. Lufkin. Good night. Professor Jeremiah Soames? Uh, yes. My name is David Porter. I must speak with you, sir. Uh, well, please come in. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have a chair. Uh, Mr. Porter? I'm an instructor in ancient history at Southern State. Ah. I'm writing my doctoral thesis on the people of Chator. Ah. I was inspired to do research in the field because of you, Professor Soames. Oh, well, thank you. You were the one who discovered the people of Chator. Yes, the people of Chator. I read your work in college. Your definitive work. It had more influence on me than anything I'd ever read before or since. It actually guided me toward my own field of endeavor. It has become my life, just the way it's become yours. Ah, yes. The people of Chator. A little-known, dimly-perceived tribe who appeared briefly at the very early, perhaps even 
the false dawn of history, and then disappeared, leaving behind a few artifacts from which you, sir, have so brilliantly constructed their daily lives. Uh, well... Uh... And you have those artifacts here, in this room. The flint knives, the axes, the drills, the bowls. M- may I? Oh, yes, of course. They, they were meant to be touched. Oh, and the little serpent carvings. Yes. Tato. Meaning... Serpent. Yeah, it would be serpent people. Yes, yes, Professor. You are the discoverer of the people of Chator. And you were the leading authority. Uh, I was the leading authority, Mr. Porter. There's talk of a Nobel Prize, isn't there? Uh. Mr. Porter, exactly what have you come here for? You were my idol. You inspired me. Because of you, I found my life's work. I couldn't wait to do my thesis. And so I went there, into the incredible desert wilderness that lies between Iran and Afghanistan. I went to the place where you had discovered the people of Chator. How long ago? How young I was. And these were the people who formed the link between the late Cro-Magnon and the earliest modern man. (laughs) Is this what you have come to tell me? I've come here, sir, to tell you. In sorrow. For you have been... You always shall be my idol. That you have been wrong about the people of Chator. I beg your pardon. The people of Chator are not the transition people. Mr. Porter, just what are you up to? Had you gone further into the country, had you dug deep... Now, see here. Yes, you found their early artifacts, but they went beyond those. They developed these. And what, may I ask, is that? A dagger. I see that it is a dagger, but... What does it have to do with... This is a Chator dagger. That's, that's impossible. Why? It, it's made of metal? Yes. A primitive bronze. Well, this discredits you immediately. The Chator were a late Stone Age people. You are convinced they emigrated south and west and were wiped out by the stronger tribes they encountered in Asia Minor. That isn't true. Sir, I see no need to prolong this pointless discussion. Read my note. I have neither the time nor the inclination to humor every charlatan who barges in here. I challenge you. I say they went north and east. They never died out. Their descendants still live in the remote fastness beyond Karakum. Oh, that, that, that's nonsense. Why are you afraid? Read these. You'll see. They show. They prove... I have found the Chator. They speak the language, the very language you put together. You claim the language and the people died and disappeared, but here, read this. Why are you afraid? Why should I be afraid? Then read. I I do not believe a word of this. You know it's true. Why have you shown me this? I want your blessing. My blessing? As of right now, you are the authority. I want you to sponsor me. Sponsor you? Why? I am carrying your work forward. You are denying everything I ever held to be true. But I'm building on your foundation. You'll discredit me. Your place is secure. But now you must yield to men who have gone beyond you. It happens to all great discoverers. Darwin, Freud, Einstein. Yes, but not yet. Not now. Not this year. Wait till I'm dead. Professor. This... This dagger destroys me. This bronze-bladed dagger destroys me. Why did you have to find it? Because it was there. Why did you have to bring it here and show it to me? Because I wanted you to be the first to know. The first to know that I'm disgraced? Professor, that isn't true. Oh, I could kill you. What are you saying? I could kill you with this dagger. I could kill you. <laughs> the work Professor. of a lifetime. <laughs> Professor, you've gone mad. <clears throat> you said I'm bleeding. Help me. Help. Help you. After what you tried to do to me, I'll help you. I'll help you. Professor Soames? Yes. Your office, uh, 
isn't easy to find. <laughs> Which is only fitting and proper. You see, my specialty concerns an obscure and out-of-the-way people, so I have been assigned an obscure and out-of-the-way office. I'm uh, Lieutenant Barnett of the uh, city police. Oh, if it has anything to do with tickets to the annual policeman's band... I'm afraid that's uh, not why I'm here. Huh. Well, I, I do have a class very soon. Is it important? Yes, sir. It's murder. Murder? Why, well, how may I be of assistance? Mr. David Porter was killed last night. David Porter? Did you know him? Uh, no. We understand that uh, he was supposed to have visited you at home last night. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. But, well, you see, that wasn't what you had asked me. You asked me if I knew him. No, the man was a complete stranger. But uh, you did see him last night. Oh, yes. When? Oh, it was just a bit after eight. May I ask the uh, purpose of his visit? Of course. You see, he was a teacher of history, and he wanted to consult with me on a uh, specialty of mine. That's right. Uh, you're the uh, Professor Soames everybody's talking about. <laughs> Everybody? Well, there was a piece in the papers about you being uh, up for a prize. No, that's the merest speculation. But uh, what a shot in the arm it would be for this uh, old town, huh? Well, anyhow, uh, you'd never seen this uh, David Porter before, huh? No. Do you mean that after he left my house last night... His uh, body was found in his car. It was uh, parked just off exit 18 on the interstate. What had happened to him? He was stabbed to death. Oh. Oh, no. We figure he stopped to pick up a hitchhiker. Whoever it was killed him. Oh, horrible. Everything he had on him was gone. His watch, his ring, his wallet. His wife says... His wife? Yeah, he was married. It's uh, kind of tough on her. She's going to have a baby. Oh. What time uh, would you say he left your house? Well, it was well after nine. Yeah, and by ten o'clock he was already dead. That's uh, that's when his body was discovered. Oh, I, I feel so badly, Lieutenant, so badly... I don't think that I can ever forgive myself. Why? What'd you do? Well, it's for what I didn't do. I don't understand, sir. Well, you see, he had come to me with a perfectly ridiculous hypothesis. And I, I'm afraid I dismissed him out of hand. I, well, it's unforgivable, but I, I'm... I'm afraid I laughed at him. Professor, if it was ridiculous like you say it was, what else could he have done? Well, I might have been kinder to him, Lieutenant... Just a little bit kinder. Oh, yes. Much kinder and certainly not nearly so sharp. Well, Professor Soames is one of the most intelligent criminals we've had around here in a long time. And considering that he had to play this one by ear, he's not doing it all badly so far. However, this is only the end of the first act. Got it. one of the most ancient of weapons, literally, our professor has committed one of the most ancient of crimes, murder, for some of the most ancient of reasons, A, jealousy, which is why Cain killed Abel, and B, for the protection of one's turf, which is why Romulus killed Remus. Things are not really too much different today, are they? Oh, Mrs. Lufkin, you're back home already, I see. Yes, one night and one morning with my sainted sister-in-law is punishment enough for the most hardened sinner. Oh, I see you ate all the roast beef. Guilty as charged. Mm. And you drank all the beer. But you were not here to preach temperance, Mrs. Lufkin. And you also disapproved of my housekeeping, Professor Soames. How can you say such a thing? It's obvious. You actually scrubbed the floor. Oh, who did? Well, you can see for yourself. Yeah, this part here, near the table. It wasn't nearly this clean when I left. And it's certainly much cleaner than, than this part on the other side of the room. Oh. You could have waited for me to come back. Oh, well, I see the brush marks. You know, you must have gotten down on your hands and knees. Oh, now really, Professor, what on earth ever made you do a thing like that, huh? I, uh, I had spilled something on the floor. What? Coffee. Coffee? Oh, 
That's impossible. <laughs> Why do you say it's impossible? Because you never drink coffee. You're not allowed to. Yes, I know. But, uh, well, you see, I had a guest. Oh, yes. Yes, this, um, David Porter. Mm -hmm. And he uh, had been driving a long way to get here, and he really wanted a cup of coffee. I suppose you used that as an excuse to have some yourself. Hmm? In bringing it to the table, I must have tripped. No, no, I didn't. I, I slipped. Yes, that's what I did. I, I pitched forward slightly, and I, well, I spilled the coffee. Quite a bit of it landed on poor Mr. Porter's jacket all over the front. Oh, my goodness. And a great deal of it just spilled down all over this part of the floor. Well, why didn't you just wipe it up and forget about it? You know I'd be back this morning. Well, I understand that coffee leaves a stain. And when you would see that, you'd know that I'd been indulging in forbidden fruit, as it were. <laughs> you know, there is no getting past you, Mrs. Luskin. You managed to find me out. I always do, Professor. <laughs> Yes, Mrs. Luskin. Uh, Professor, there, there is a detective downstairs to see you. Uh, his name is um, Lieutenant Barnett. Oh. I, I suppose it's about that terrible thing that happened to that uh, poor Mr. Porter the other night. Yes. To think I'd spoken to him on the phone just a few hours before he... Uh, what sort of person was he, Professor? No. Well, nice enough, young man. Ah, uh, it's a pity. I told the officer that you were very busy, but he insisted on seeing you. Oh, it's all right. I, I, I don't understand. What does he want to bother you for? Tell him that I'll be down directly, Mrs. Luskin. Yes, sir. Sorry to bother you again, sir. <laughs> you know that's odd. I've heard that so many times. I've read it in so many novels. The detective always says that. Well, you know what they say. Uh, life imitates art. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Now, how may I help you, Lieutenant? Well, the dead man's wife, the uh, the widow, Mrs. Porter. As you know, uh, well, she's been in a state of shock. Actually, I didn't know. But it's understandable. She said that her husband had come here to see you on some uh, scholarly matter. Yes, yes, that's right. I believe I told you that. When we found him in the car, everything of value had been uh, stripped from him. I remember that you had mentioned it. His wife said he had an attaché case. He used it to carry his papers. They were important to him, the papers. The attaché case was missing. Uh... Now, did he have it with him when he called on you? Hmm. Did he have... An attaché case. Hmm. I would assume he must have. After all, uh, you said he had come to you with a perfectly ridiculous hypothesis. I would assume it was in writing, and uh, you saw it or you read it, didn't you? Oh, yes. Those papers, were they uh, in the attaché yes, case? Yes, yes, right, of course, naturally. Okay, so we have established the fact that the attaché case was here in his house. Yes, yes, I remember it. Uh, could he have left it here? Oh, no. I I mean, why? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe he wanted to leave his material with you so that you could uh, consider it, no, you know? No, no, no. I told you that I had already dismissed it as ridiculous. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I is it possible he could have forgotten it? Well, how could he do that? Once again, I don't know. What I'm saying is, uh, perhaps, he was so upset that uh, he just... Oh, wait. Was he upset when he left? Was he upset? Uh, I guess it would have only been natural, huh? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. So he could have left without it. I haven't seen... No, no, no. no just wait a moment. Uh, Mrs. Lufkin, uh, perhaps my housekeeper. Oh, yes, Professor. Uh, Mrs. Lufkin, have you... Have you seen an attaché case around here that, that does not belong to me? It's a... Uh, uh, Lieutenant, I'm, I'm afraid I don't remember what it looked like. Well, according to Mrs. Porter, it's uh, very old and quite scuffed. Kind of uh, brownish in color. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Lufkin? No, sir. No, I haven't seen anything like it. It wasn't there in the car with his body. Well, the killer must have taken it with the other things. Well, from the looks of it and the uh, shape it was in, it wasn't worth stealing... And yet, Lieutenant, it's missing? Oh, yes, ma'am, yeah. The attaché case and uh, everything in it. Yes. Yes, I remember now. Yes, he did have it with him. He walked out of the door with it. Oh, then that takes care of that. Well, yeah. Why would a, a criminal want that attaché case? Or, or what would be in it? Well, who knows what passes through the criminal mind, huh, mm -hmm. ma'am? Yes. 
Oh, I wish that I could help you, Lieutenant. Well, I wish someone could help me, Professor, because, frankly, right now I'm stuck. It's the doorbell, Mrs. Lufkin. Can't you hear the bell? What is the matter with that woman? Is she deaf? All right out there. I'm coming. I'm coming. Uh, yes, ma'am. You you wish to see me? I, I'm Professor Jeremiah Soames. Please excuse me, Professor. I, I shouldn't have kept ringing your bell like that. Well, certainly not. I, I'm very sorry. I'm, I'm not at all myself. You see, my husband, he, he was murdered. Oh. His name is... was... David Porter... And, and I understand that you may have been the last person to have seen him alive. That is, of course, with the exception of the murderer. Ah, yes. uh, Mrs. Porter, won't you come in? I, I really don't know why I'm here. Now, uh, uh, won't you have a chair? Oh, thank you. Um, m- Mrs. Porter, what, what can I do for you? What can you do for me? Well, now that I think of it, nothing. There's nothing anyone can do for me now. Even if they catch the person who murdered my husband, it won't change anything. It won't bring him back. I'm very sorry, Mrs. Porter. I'm not really Mrs. Porter anymore, am I? Well, legally. Well, legally. I I, I mean, I'm talking about actually, physically, definitely. How can I be Mrs. Porter when there's no longer a, a Mr. Porter? Uh... You you had a talk with him the other night, didn't you? Yes. What did you think of him? I, I, I mean, as a scholar. Please, don't try to spare my feelings. Well, I, I listened to him. I examined his alleged findings. Alleged? Well, you see, I, I, I questioned their validity. Are you implying that the evidence, the artifacts he brought back from Asia are... Not genuine? Oh, no, no. I only questioned whether they were relevant. Did they belong to the people of Chater? Or whether the product of a, of a different people? Another people who appeared on the scene later on. And in your opinion, they were not appropriate? That is correct. But that was only your opinion. You know, ever since he read your earliest book about Chator, those people became his... Well, I I, I could say his reason for existence. I'm flattered. We went to the site of ancient Chator on our honeymoon. Can you imagine? We traveled north with the mosquitoes and the dust and the rocks and the biting winds. And every day he would see something else. He He would find something else. And we reached that place where, according to you... The people of Chator were supposed to have turned west and south. Yes. But he said, he said to me, look, what if they didn't? (laughs) That's ridiculous. They did. Well, I'm only telling you what he said to me. And so we kept going north. He was looking for the trail of the people of Chator. There is no such trail. Yes. Yes, that's what he was beginning to think after a while. And then... He found it. What did he find? The dagger. A Chator dagger made of bronze. There is no such dagger. But he showed it to you, didn't he? That's what he came here for. Uh, just a moment. He he showed me a dagger. With the serpent carved on the hill. Uh, he was deceived. Now, he knew that he had found the trail. That dagger pointed the way. And as we went north, we saw the carvings and the cave pictures, all with that that serpentine design. I tell you, he had deceived himself. He was in a daze. He, he was a man who received the shock of tremendous revelation. And he said to me, he said, Soames is wrong. He is wrong about the people of Chaita. Your husband simply did not know what he was talking he about. He said, I have it here. We can go home now and publish But first, I must show it all to Soane. Yes. Yes, he did. He showed it to me. Oh, believe me, Mrs. Porter, I I tried to be nice to him. I tried to let him down as gently as I could. Like a fool, he came here. 
in him, you saw the man who was about to take away from you everything that made your life worth living. It hit you. It struck you like a bolt of lightning. And in one sudden, uncontrolled spasm of fury, you killed him. Mrs. Porter, what are you saying? Professor Jeremiah Soames. I accuse you of murder. How could I have murdered him? You killed him with that dagger. The, the dagger that would have cut you down from your pedestal. What did you do with the dagger? Mrs. Porter. Mrs. Porter. How could you ever hope to prove such a monstrous accusation? <laughs> He doesn't have to prove it to our satisfaction. We know it already. But we don't count. First, she'll have to convince the police. And then, a jury. But of course, she would have no problem at all if she could manage to convince a certain person. And you know who that person is. That will be the business of Act Three. Sometimes we make what we like to call a logical assumption. We say a thing is so because it seems to make sense. But does it make sense because that's what we want? So many times we say we are seeking the answer to a question. But is that true? Don't we start out with the answer already in mind? And isn't our quest merely to find the evidence that proves it? You murdered my husband. This is poor. No! Don't touch me. Don't come near me. You do not know what you're saying. That isn't true. I know what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying. I'm saying something terrible. And, and I had to say it because this way I could believe that my husband was right and that you would murder him because of it. But, but the fact is... A gentle, elderly scholar like you can't be a murderer. Ah, oh, Mrs. Porter, please. And therefore, my husband was a man who believed in something that just wasn't so. And I've been fighting it because I don't want to accept it. I can't do it anymore. I had to explode at somebody. I'm sorry. I apologize. Now, I'd better go. Excuse Mrs. me. Mrs. Porter... Mrs. Lufkin. Mrs. Lufkin. I am here, Professor. You don't need to shout. Where were you? Uh, but I, I was downstairs in the basement. What were you doing in the basement? Well, I heard that poor woman. Oh, what she must be going through. Oh, it's dreadful. I, I'm sorry for her. Well, I'm sorry for her, too. Professor. What are you looking at me like that for? What... What am I supposed to do about it? Professor, I didn't say what anything. What can I do about it? I'm sorry. I said that I was sorry. I'd give anything for a thing like that not to have happened. Why did I have to answer the doorbell? I told you, Professor, I was in the basement. You are supposed to shield me from people who intrude on my time. I was doing the laundry. You see, that, that woman has upset me. I cannot concentrate on my work now. I'm sorry. If you have to bury yourself in the basement where you don't hear the doorbell, I would rather you sent the laundry out. Um, well, what did you do with your shirt, Professor? Oh, please, don't change the subject. Well, I asked you to leave it out for me. You couldn't possibly wear it another day. Well, I've never been so embarrassed. Where is the shirt you were wearing the other night? When I left for my sister-in-law's house, I, I can't find it anywhere. Where is it? Where is what? Your very good old cotton shirt. I would like to put it in the machine. It washes so beautifully. No, it doesn't. I beg your pardon. It doesn't wash at all. And that, that's why I had to get rid of it. You got rid of that beautiful, practically brand new shirt. Mm -hmm. I, I told you what had happened. Ah. I had made a pot of coffee, and when I brought it over to the table, I slipped and spilled it all over everything and everybody, including myself. Oh. I thought I would leave the shirt for you to wash, Mrs. Lufkin. You should have. And then, well, I remembered about the coffee stains. Once they set, you could never get them out. So I started to scrub at the stain, but obviously it was too late. It wouldn't come out. 
I see. <laughs> you know, actually, I scrubbed so hard. I must have weakened the uh, material, and I, well, I made rather a large hole. That's too bad. The shirt was obviously ruined, and so I simply threw it in the garbage, and it was picked up this morning. Oh, I, I'm sorry you did that, sir. I could have used it for cleaning rags. Ah, yes, I didn't think of that. But I suppose you had to do quite a bit of scrubbing, what with the floor and your shirt. Mm, it's just that everything was so unsightly. What are you sniffing at, Mrs. Lufkin? Did you, um, did you have a fire going last night? Hmm? Yes, sir. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I did. I was rather chilly. Last night mm. seemed rather warm and humid to me. Well, I'm probably coming down with something, and I thought that I might enjoy a fire. Yes, sir. I mean, it's my house. It's my fireplace. And if I if I want to enjoy a nice, cheery blaze, am I required to request anyone's permission? No, no, Professor. What What am I doing here? I, I must get back to my work. And, and you listen to me. If the doorbell rings, I am not at home. To anyone. Now, is that clear, Mrs. Lufkin? Of course, Professor. You haven't touched the veal, Professor. No. I'm not hungry, Mrs. Lufkin. You haven't been hungry for the past three days. Hmm? Are you trying to make something out of that? No, Professor. If a man doesn't feel like eating for a while, it doesn't have to signify anything. We all eat too much anyhow. A little judicious fasting now and then, we'd be the better for it. What do you say to that, Mrs. Lufkin? Well, all I want to say is that if you're going to let food go to waste, tell me in advance, and I'll prepare something cheaper. The hunters and gatherers of Chetor, you know what? They would grab a handful of wild wheat from the stock, and they would munch on it as they traveled. And that was dinner. That and the meat of an animal that they might have been lucky enough to encounter and kill. Yes. Fruits, nuts, berries. And I could serve you fruits and nuts and berries, Professor. But I'm not sure I can go hunting for meat. Mrs. Lufkin, I must ask you not to look at me like that. Well, I wish you would describe the look. And I will take pains not to assume it any longer. You are siding with her. Her? That woman. His wife, Mrs. Porter. You are taking her part. You, you, you think that I treated her badly, huh? No, I, I thought you had been placed in a very uncomfortable position. You thought that I had been cruel to her. But what was I to say? To do? Do you know, she had actually accused me of murdering her husband. Now, now that's ridiculous, isn't it? But tell me, don't you think that that's absolutely ridiculous? Yes, Professor, yes. It does sound ridiculous. Yes. Now, I'm... I'm going upstairs. I have work to catch up with. Oh, uh, uh, aren't you going to take your mail upstairs? Oh, there's a card from your friend in London, um, uh, Dr. Hodges. <laughs> and you read it, I suppose. Well, if he had wished for privacy, he would have written a letter. He says there are strong rumors that you are in the running for the prize this year. Hmm? I know. I know. And nothing had better happen to spoil my chances. Lieutenant Barnett. Yes, ma'am. Come in. Sit down. You, uh, look familiar. My name is Mrs. Muriel Lufkin. Oh, yes. Now I remember. You're, uh, Professor Soames' housekeeper. Mm. What can I do for you? I, 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 I'm afraid I, I don't know how to begin. Well, let's just start at the beginning and go on from there. Huh? Well, that, that wouldn't help much because... Even after I could get beyond the beginning, I, I wouldn't know where to go. Well, uh, let me put it this way. What is there that you know that could be of interest to the police? Well, right now, I, I don't know anything. But you're here. Yes, I am here. Uh, I, I would like to, to solicit some information from the police. Such as... Uh... Well, there is something I must know for my own sake. Yes? Lieutenant, when the body of David Porter was brought to, to... to wherever they bring bodies, I would imagine that there were some um, blood stains on his shirt. 
Well, obviously he was stabbed. Were, were there any were there any stains on his jacket? Blood stains? Coffee stains. Why do you ask? I must know. Mrs. Lufkin, uh, it's hardly the business of the police department to satisfy your curiosity. But it isn't idle or morbid curiosity, Lieutenant. Or perhaps if you could tell me why. I can't. Well, if I could tell you, would it help my investigation? Perhaps. I read detective stories, Lieutenant. I know how you people operate. You collaborate with all sorts of of questionable characters. Uh, Can't you trust a reputable citizen for a change? What can I expect in return? Perhaps nothing. And perhaps everything. Let me check with the lab. What are you doing here, Mrs. Lufkin? I'm cleaning your office, Professor. You never clean my office. I told you when I hired you that the rest of the house could be spotless. But I don't want anyone misplacing my books and my papers. Well, nevertheless, I have been cleaning your office. Secretly. Once a week, I come in here and I remove the top dust. What were you looking for? What would I be looking for? Did she ask you to find it? Did who ask me to find what? Mrs. Porter. The two of you, you stick together, huh? Now, don't lie to me. I know what you're looking for. It's in the closet. I didn't hear you. See? The dagger. Yes. The bronze dagger. How did you find out? Uh, you said you had spilled coffee on his coat. There weren't any coffee stains. Did that mean you were lying about the coffee? Yes. Then why did you scrub the floor and dispose of your shirt? What other stains could there have been? Blood. Oh, why did you have to find out? You wanted me to, Professor. What? How could you say that? I am not a detective, but I am a housekeeper. You did everything to arouse my suspicion. Now listen to me, Mrs. Lufkin. You have been with me for ten years. You're not going to tell the police. No, I won't. But you will. No, no, never. No, no, not this year. Not when I'm so close. You will have to. I don't have to do anything, Mrs. Lufkin. Now, don't force me to kill you. You wouldn't kill me. I can do it. I'm bigger than you. I'm stronger. Mm. I, I have the knife in my hand, and I am standing between you and the door. I know all that. And I still say you won't do it. Ah, poor David Porter. He caught you at a terrible moment, unaware, with your defenses down, when when your demon was in command. You listen to me, Mr. And I know that demon inside you, too. I know how, how you would rage silently against the obscurity and the neglect. How it ravaged you to see lesser men than you receive the honors. And then, at the last moment, along comes this, this youngster and, well... Well, you see, I, I don't know what happened to me. I don't know. I, I, yes, yes, I do, yes. For the first time, I... For the first time, I did not think of the work, only of the fame. Had you been in command, you would have welcomed that young man, proclaimed the value of his discovery, and you would have been hailed for it. Oh, what am I going to do now? Now? Well, you can either kill me or call the police. Yes. Well, I don't know the number. I'll get it for you. Dear Mrs. Lufkin, how am I going to get on without you? You might not go away for long, Professor. It was completely unpremeditated. And you weren't yourself. And now, (laughs) now, you had better give me that dagger. Yes, the bronze dagger of the people of Chetor with the serpentine insignia on the hilt. Only one time in over 19,000 years was it used to shed blood. And hopefully, the last. (laughs) 
think back to the first time the dagger was used. It was clenched in the fist of a man who can be fairly described as a primitive savage. Some 20,000 years later, it is once again clenched in the fist of a man. But this one is a highly educated product of a most advanced society. And yet, each was driven by the same passion and blinded by the same fury. In so many years, have we really changed so little? I shall return shortly. Mrs. Lufkin spoke of the demon inside Professor Soames. Yes, each of us has a demon. A demon that is like another self. Rudyard Kipling understood the situation very well. He wrote, When your demon is in charge, do not try to think consciously. Wait. Drift. Yes. One should neither fight one's demon nor obey it. Just wait till the storm dies down. Our cast included Norman Rose, Carol Titel, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. And before you venture to disagree, consider that despite a few perfectly normal intervals of doubt, she does enjoy a happy marriage. I'll be back shortly. I posed a little problem at the beginning of our story. How is the child molded? What makes him the man? Two youngsters. Why does one become a ruthless killer and the other a dedicated cop? Our modern wise men study, analyze, experiment, but their answers leave us no wiser. On the other hand, the ancient wise men dismissed the problem by saying that all of us are playthings of the whimsical gods. Why isn't that as good an answer as any? Our cast included Howard Dutsova, Terry Keene, Robert Dryden, Leon Janney, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. By the beginning of the 19th century, the finest vessels afloat were the great merchantmen of the East India Company. At 1,200 tons, they were the true queens of the sea. Yet a voyage from India around the Cape of Good Hope and on up by the west coast of Africa and of Europe was a long and hazardous undertaking at best. The gauntlet of pirates, freebooters, and the sometimes insurmountable weather had to be run. Disaster sat behind the voyager's shoulders all the way. What was that, Mr. Rowland? That last lightning bolt hit us from the mizzen to the stern, Captain Stokes. What's the news from below? We're settling on the port bow, sir. She'd be in twice as much water as the pumps can handle. Then get Lady Castleton topside. And stand by to abandon ship. Our mystery drama, Phantom World, written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin, and stars Marion Seldes and Lloyd Batista. I'll be back shortly with Act One. of our Lord, 1814, England and America were at last at peace after the senseless war of 1812. The HMS Arabella set sail from India for England. 
She was flying the flag of the East India Company. 1,100 tons burden, her clustering square-rigged sails hungry for a breath of air in the calm of the Indian Ocean. Of the complement aboard, we need consider only two people. The Lady Castleton, wife of the Governor General of India, headed home to rejoin her two young children. And a certain Captain Giles Maybury, sequestered in irons in the lazarette, on his way back to England to be tried for murder and high treason. Till a raging typhoon came whistling clockwise out of the south to change the established order of things. Yes, Captain Stokes? Your pardon, Lady Castleton, but I felt it no less than my duty to warn you. Is it a, a typhoon? I'm afraid it is. At best, we're in for a period of discomfort. I must ask you to keep to your cabin. How much danger is there? Well, I should hope little. The Arabella's a fine ship. And she's ridden out many a storm before this. Still, one must take precautions. Just tell me what I have to do. Well, above all, dear lady, don't be afraid. But if the unthinkable happens and we should have to abandon ship, I urge you to wear the simplest of gowns and not to saddle yourself or the lifeboat with too much baggage. The unlikely event takes place. I promise you I shall be of as little burden as possible. But in the meantime, can I be of any help? Only by staying in your quarters and by not despairing, my lady. With luck and God's help, we shall ride this one out like all the others. <laughs> What's to do, Boson? All hell, most like. Typhoon blew up from itself. How bad? No way of knowing till we ride it out. If we do, it's a bad one, no doubt of that. You think it'll thunder us? Well, they never have yet. But there's always a first time. Let's see those medicals. Well, what are you going to do? Set you free of the chains. Just on the off chance. Can't have you cooped up here like a rat in a trap. Well, I'm only being forwarded back to England to be hanged. I might as well drown and save the crown the expense and the bother. Well, that's as maybe. If I have to go see my maker, I don't intend to have you on me, conscious, sir. Seeing as how I don't hold what you've done was so reprehensible. <laughs> Flying in the face of established authority. Shooting a superior officer. I should have thought such conduct would have rocked you to your conservative soul, Boson Rowland. It just isn't the English way. But then, you're not exactly English, are you? I mean, you was born in the colonies. Yes, I was born in America. Brought up there till my father brought me home to England. I suppose that's my whole problem. I'm affected with the belief that a man ought to have the right to be free. Ah, oh, but not the heathen, Lieutenant. Oh, you mean the Hindu, the Sikh, the lowly Parsi? Why not, Mr. Rowland? Well, now, I mean, it just ain't the natural order of things, is it? Isn't that what got me into trouble? Because I refused to give the orders to a firing squad to cut down a sad little rabble of Indians who are only asking for their birthright. What's that? Sounds like the mainmast. And that wind is stronger than I've ever heard. We're in the middle of this one, and we've caught it proper. I'll get to my station. It's every man for himself now. What's the news from below decks, Mr. Rowland? It ain't good, Captain, sir. We're starting leaks all the way up to the freeboard. The pumps can't keep up with it. Have you any fear that we shall founder? Unless the storm abates, it's going to tear us apart, Captain. Were we hit? Yes, sir. Carried away a half our busy mast. Well, we'll still run before the wind. And with God's will, we'll run it out. I'm afraid not, Captain. That last lightning bolt split the rudder from wheel to key, sir. We have no control over the ship. No, sir. No. Get her ladyship topside and stand by to abandon ship. What's that? A boat around it, sir. That's the powder magazine. We're going down by the head. Get that long boat out! Aye, aye, sir. Stand by to abandon ship. Look lively, lads, and swing out the long boat. Is there any way I can be of assistance, Mr. Rowland? There is, Lieutenant. Go fetch Lady Castleton from the aft cabin. And don't stand on no ceremony. We're sinking fast. I'll bring her right up. Lady Castleton! Lady Castleton! Yes, what is it? Uh, don't ask questions. Come with me. Who are you? Oh, oh. Aren't you the renegade lieutenant who was in Ireland? Uh, none other. 
Well, what are you doing running free? Looking to save my life, ma'am, as you should be doing. Is the ship in danger? She's about to sink, my lady. I was sent to bring you above decks and into the lifeboat. Well, why didn't Captain Stokes come himself? The captain's busy enough trying to save his ship. Now, are you coming with me, or must I save your precious life in spite of you? I'm not accustomed to be spoken to in this way. Nor are you accustomed to facing death, I should imagine. But you are. Now, are you coming? I will come when the captain tells me to. Oh, you'll leave me no choice. And over my shoulder you go. Please down, sir. Let me... When I get you to the stern ways of the long your favor, madam, lie still. You're waiting not to drag up this matter without crashing about like a wounded cow. Cut it free, lads! Get it all overboard before the rain gets light. Are you? What have you got there? The Lady Castleton, Captain. Mr. Rowland asked me to fetch her. Leave of heaven, man, put her down. Aye, aye, sir. Who are you? Oh, the prisoner. Milady, are you all right? I will be once you keep this barbarian away from me. First, let me help you to the lifeboat. No, I have nothing with me. My jewels, my toilet case, and my clothes. No time for that, your ladyship. Let me help you over the rail. And you, prisoner, make yourself useful. Help those men cutting the debris clear. Well, I have no blade. I'm unarmed. Oh, then take my sword. And if that mess is not cleared... Oh, with... her, it's out of the shroud. Look out, lad. She's about to turn turtle. It's every man for himself. Hold on to my head, Lady Castle. Ah! What happened, Captain? She's in the water. But it doesn't matter. We're all going to be there. <laughs> Lady Castleton, are you all right? Yes, I'm still alive, if that's what you mean. Are you hurt? No, I don't think so. The ship capsized and then I... I don't remember going into the water. I only remember coming up and fighting for air and finding... this, whatever it is, I'm it's clinging to. It's crossbar from the foremast. Oh. oh. But the, all these rat lines are dragging it under. It won't support both of us unless I... Unless I cut this tangle away. Uh, what can you use to cut it? Well, I still have the captain's sword oh. he gave me. Do you know how to swim? Yes. Then let go, just for a moment, until I hack it free. That's it. Get out of there. There. M- Milady. Milady. Oh, it's, it's all right. I have you. Hold on to me. Oh. What's the matter? I said hold on. Ah. Oh, damn it. Here, just let me get an arm around you. Ah! That's it. That's it. I'll lash you to the spa. Lady Castleton! My lady! Oh, you can't hear me. But are you dead or, or still alive? Where am I? Somewhere. In the Indian Ocean. The ship. Oh. oh. What happened to the ship? She capsized. And sank? Like a stone. With, oh, with everyone? I mean, all who were aboard? As far as I know. Excepting us. And, and you are... Oh, yes, the prisoner. Oh, yes. The leper still remains the outcast. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean... It doesn't matter. What is is how we can save our lives. If they're worth saving. What chance do we have cast away in this empty ocean? Shh, listen. What is it? Gulls. Now, that means there's land near. What land? The Seashell Isles are somewhere in this vicinity. I never heard of them. Are they inhabited? Well, some of them. Look. What? That white line in the moonlight. That's surf. Oh, come on. Come on, kick. Head for it. Kick for your life. The lady. Yes? We made it. We're safe. Where? This island is deserted. Not a sign of... It seems we're not alone. After all, help! Est-ce que vous êtes vraiment vivant? Who, who are you? What? 
Je suis le roi, pauvre Pascal, the king of the island. <rire> a woman, half dead, half live, cast away on a desert island. The female, a gentlewoman, nurtured in luxury. The male, a convicted traitor, heading for a firing squad. Now to this ill-assorted duo add a third, a giant Frenchman, bearded, naked except for a kind of loincloth, and apparently stark staring mad. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Mercifully, Lady Castleton has fainted in shock at the sight of the bizarre creature towering over her. Giles Maybury is helpless to make a move, menacing as this giant with a mahogany skin appears to be. As for Pascal himself, suddenly he breaks off the demonic laughter and, in an astonishing reversal, begins to cry. Je vous en prie, madame, monsieur. Vous êtes ril? Vraiment? I, I cannot speak French. Ah, mille pardons. I try to speak with the English. Vous comprenez? Yes, yes, I understand. We are English. Ah, but you are also, what do I say, human beings. Pascal is not alone anymore. I weep because I am so happy. Well, since you're so friendly, can you help us? Oh, what must Pascal do? You have only asked. Will you assist me to carry Lady Castleton to somewhere she can dry out? Oui, but of course. I will do better. I will carry her myself. And we need water and some food. She is as light as a feather. It is Raymond that she is en Saint-Denis. Her husband is Lord Hugh Castleton, Governor General of the East India Company. Mm. And you, monsieur? Lieutenant Maybury. At least I was. Uh, can you rise? <laughs> yes. Ah, but can you walk? I'll manage to stagger along. I'll take us where I can drink and find some fresh water to revive her ladyship. So, that is better, eh? Oh, yes. Much better. Oh, the seigneurie. I think she's opening the eyes. Get me some more drinking water. Oui, mon Now, don't, don't try to speak, Lady oh. Castleton. Just lie back and rest. But what, where are we? Safe on dry land. On an island. Oh, yes, I remember. Oh, there was a huge wild oh, man. Don't, don't worry about him. I think he was as shocked to see us as we were him. I'm so thirsty. And we'll have you a nice, cool drink in a second. Uh, Pascal. I come. Voila. Uh, thanks. Here, your ladyship. Fresh water. Uh, uh, don't, don't drink too much at first. Just mm. take it in small sips. Oh. Oh, it's so good. More. No, no, that's More. enough for a moment. No, I'm, I'm still thirsty. Uh, Pascal. Oui, monsieur. From the looks of you, I take this island is uninhabited. Uh, oui, monsieur. This is why Pascal loses his head when he first sees you. I am so happy to see after three years again a human face. You've been here that long? Uh, oui, I mark with a small stone the days as they pass on a rock in my cave. Do you mean to say that uh, in three years no ship or boat, nobody has ever come to this island? Mm, that is what I say. But how have you stayed alive? What do you eat? Oh, there is plenty. Fruits, nuts, coconuts, maize, breadfruit. And there are the birds, the fishes, the giant turtles, but no beef. But how did you come to this island? Were you shipwrecked also? Uh, that is a long story. And there are things perhaps not for your ears. Yeah, we'll save it for another time. <laughs> it would seem it's a commodity we're going to have more of than we might care to. Oh, in the meantime, this talk has made me realize I'm famished. I'm ravenously hungry, too. Can you find us some food, Pascal? Well, it's as much as you want. Shall I bring it, or will you come to my cave and eat it? I think we'll go with you. I wouldn't want to lose sight of you until we get a few more things settled. Monsieur Pascal, I must compliment you on the meat. <laughs> I thought you said there was none on the island. That was a fish, Lady Castleton. Oh! Called a dugong. Actually, it isn't a fish, it's a mammal. Mm -hmm. Herbivorous, but seagoing. Pascal, 
Is there another cave available like this? Mm, for why? We must find suitable quarters for Lady Castleton. But there are other caves, we, oui, but it will take time to clean them. Uh, let's get one in shape for her ladyship for tonight. It's warm enough for me to bed down outside. No, you must be undercover. It is the rainy season. Tonight, the rains will come. You can share my cave if you want. Well, I may take you up on that if there isn't time to clean one up for myself. But I want to help. No, no, you're worn out. Better rest. Besides, isn't housework just a little below you? Oh, oh. who's that? Oh, it is only Pascal. Oh, oh I've, I've been asleep. <laughs> Good heavens, it's nearly sunset. Where is Lieutenant Mabry? After we prepare a cave for you, he stay to prepare one for himself. Pascal, he come back to cook the supper. I'm very grateful to you, Pascal. Oh, it is nothing. Oh, you saved our lives. I can never repay you for that, but oh, I'd like to show my gratitude some way. Oh, it is not necessary. Look, this pendant, it, it, it doesn't mean much here, I suppose, but it's very valuable. Will you take it as a thank you for everything? Oh, Belle, Signor. At least yeah. wear it as a medal, as a token of my thanks. Mm. I shall be proud to. There. Now tell me, how did you end up on this island? Well, I was marooned. Why? Well, if I told the Senori why, she might turn her back on me. Oh. Anyway, there is no time. I must start to prepare the meal. Your palace, Lady Castleton. All the comforts of home. I'll leave you the lamp. Your bed is made up. Palm fronds with a mattress of tree ferns. You should be reasonably comfortable. Well, have you quite dried out? Oh, yes, Lieutenant. How amazing it all is. What? Oh, that even in this wilderness such comforts can be had. A bed, a roof to shelter one. Even a lamp. How is that possible? <laughs> A conch shell filled with oil rendered from the digon. A wick woven from some trailing jungle vine. And how lit? With neither matches nor tinderbox? Uh, a twig from the fire. And the fire? Oh, you must ask Pascal that. Who is he, Lieutenant Mabry? What is he? Well, I wouldn't care to speculate. He says he was marooned. Yeah, for good reason, no doubt. Yet, he's kind. And he's saved our lives. Uh, Lieutenant? Yes? I haven't thanked you for saving my life. I haven't thanked fate either for saving mine. Oh, Pascal was right. The rains are coming. Oh, you will excuse me for not wanting ever to get wet again. I'm going to run for shelter. <laughs> oh, what was that? <laughs> Lady Castleton, what is it? <laughs> oh, watch your head, watch your head. The roof is low. Come in out of the rain. Here, here, here. Lie on the bed. Now, what is it? Oh, please hold me. Hold me. Just keep them away. Hush, oh, hush. You're in no danger now. Keep who away? Oh, it's awful. You made me sick to my stomach. Oh, those dreadful, musty, furry things touching me, beating my hair like... Uh, like ghostly hands from a grave. Bats? Is that what you're talking I don't about? Oh, yes. I, I, oh, I suppose so. Oh, I've never been so terrified. No, no, you can relax. They're not in this cave. The roof is too low. No, no, there. There, I'll leave you here to sleep. No, 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 please. Please don't leave me. I'm sorry. I... Oh, I'm afraid that was the last straw. I'd simply go to pieces completely if I were alone. Oh, very well. I, I won't be far away. I'll, I'll just move to the mouth of the cave. No, do you mind? Just, just hold me a little longer. I'm so afraid of the dark. There. It's all right. I, I won't go away. You try to sleep. Well, good morning. Mm, morning. I've been here all night. Yes. Yes, you slept like a baby. With you? I had a long sleep myself. But now we're awake here. Do you mind if I take my arm from under your head? It's still fast asleep. Oh, please do. Oh, oh I'm 
so ashamed of myself. Well, scarcely any need. We may have slept together, but virtually fully clothed. No, that's not what I meant. Oh, forgive me. Of course, Lady Castleton. You meant it was too far beneath your dignity to seek comfort and safety from a common. I meant no such thing. I, I, I was in a blue funk last night, really ready to fly apart at the seams. I'm nothing but grateful for your kindness and understanding. Oh, I'm touched, your ladyship. You can be as sarcastic as you want, but it's the truth. And that will be the end to the titles. My name is Valerie, or Val. The other belongs to a world I... We both have left behind. The matter of a name or a title is the smallest adjustment we'll have to face in the new one that lies ahead. Oh, you're right. You're right, it's not going to be easy for either of us. We might as well start as friends. My name is Giles. How do you do, Giles? Hello, Val. I brought you your favorite drink, Val. Some coconut juice with fruit juice. Thank you, Giles. Did you bring some to drink with me? Uh, yes, if we can take some time off. After two weeks of constant labor, I am ready to... My other world upbringing scarcely prepared me for this life. You've adapted to it beyond belief. Maybe it's because for the first time in my life I've been free. I, I don't understand. Oh, why should you? You weren't married at barely 17 to a sadistic bully who made the last seven years a nightmare. Except for the two children he forced me to bear for them. I have only love and gratitude. For the man who ripped them from me, the only feeling I can have now is how bitterly I despise him. Well, I have little cause to love Lord Castleton either. It was he who was sending you back to England? To your death? Yes. On the trumped-up charge that in trying to protect the right of some Indian natives, I committed murder. Did you? I killed a superior officer in a fair fight. To stop him from massacring a hundred innocent and blameless people whose only mistake was not to have been born British. I believe you, Charles. Do you believe me? Oh, yes. That's good. We live now in a very special world. Just man and woman. Well, more than that, two men and one woman. And I must choose. And I do. You. Oh, not because it is the better of two possibilities, but because in these long days that have begun to shape the pattern of what may be the rest of our lives... I know that no matter how many we numbered, the whole universe, I would still pick you as my man. For better or worse, until... Don't. Don't try to read the future. Let's be content with the present, day by day. And I want you that way, Val. Day by day. But for the rest of our lives. With this thought... I thee wed. With this thought, I marry you. <gasps> oh, heaven help us, Val. And all the future may have to bring. A strange and affecting wedding outside the bonds of church and against all dictates of their society. One which can only be binding as long as they are castaways. Will they really remain that for the rest of their lives? Or has fate still another trick to play? I shall return shortly with Act Three. Over a year has passed since the former Lady Castleton and Lieutenant Maybury were shipwrecked and cast away on this southern atoll in the Seychelles. The uneasy first six or eight months when Pascal was constantly tempted to challenge Giles' right to be Valerie's mate have now passed, with her growing and obvious pregnancy. The threat of the male's drive to dominate is stilled for the present, sublimated in the approaching miracle that a new human being is shortly to join them in this lonely paradise. Pascal! Pascal! I am here, Giles, in the thicket. This is where you sneak away to these days. What are you doing? I'm making a cradle for le petit enfant. His grand-père Pascal has to have a present for his arrival. 
So that's why I haven't been able to find my sword recently. Uh, I must have something to cut the wood from the banyan tree. <laughs> Don't worry. I keep it sharp. <laughs> why should I worry? Uh, we have no use on the island for it except something such as you're doing. Well, you never can tell it. Someone may break in on us one day. Well, after four years, can, can you really believe that? There. There is always the hope. Or the fear. Tell me, what would you do if a ship arrived, Pascal? And they came ashore? Mm, I do not know. You see the scars on my body? They kill hold me. Tied me to a rope, naked, and dragged me underneath the keel of the boat, from port to starboard, fighting for breath till my eyes start from my head and if my lungs burst for air. And all the time the barnacles on the ship's hull ripped and tore at me like a hundred knives. I was not supposed to live, but I did. And they threw what was left of me on the beach and sailed away. Who? The captain and the officers. But really, the whole French Navy. Why? Because I led a mutiny against them. And I made one fatal mistake. I did not succeed. And so if a ship should come, I would run and hide. Well, death waits immediately for both of us beyond that reef. Here on our island... Well, he'll be more patient and take us in our own good time. Yes, I too would run and hide. Then to the madam? Ah, oh, well, it's different for her. She has two children halfway across the world she mourns. But uh, she's in love with you and about to bear your child. <laughs> Let's think only on that, Pascal, and, and hope that no one has to make any decisions. Now oh, we're, we're dead to the rest of the world anyway. Since God has given us the gift of a new life, let us pray he will not take his gift away. Oh, how do you feel this morning, Val, darling? Me? I feel splendid, Charles. Why? Yeah, I worry about you having the baby here in this wilderness with no doctor, not even a midwife. Well, I'm not a helpless aristocrat anymore. Not after the last 16 months. Besides... Remember, it's not exactly new to me. I've given birth twice before. Uh, now I see the pain in your eyes as I saw it a minute ago. I can't forget them. Andrew and, and dear little Amantha. He'll be nearly six by now and she'll be just three. I can't help thinking of them more and more as my time gets closer. Oh, my poor darling. Now you must miss them. I only hope you don't regret ours. Never. Giles... Must you work today? Well, there's always work to be done. But nothing important. I want... To... I know this may sound like madness. When there are only three of us on the whole island. But I want to be alone with you. As if there were nobody else in the world. Where do you want to go? To Spyglass Hill. Where we can see all of our little domain. And count our blessings. Well, the wind's quite heavy. Here, we can shelter behind the rock. Help me sit down. <laughs> Hold my hands. <laughs> there. Oh, that's so clumsy. <laughs> uh, you are so beautiful. Oh, Charles. Val. Oh. Hold me close. And let me tell you things. <laughs> what things? I told you once, the day we accepted each other as man and wife... That this island had set me free. I still feel the same. Oh, I still long for my children and I miss them. But I could never go back to that life with him. He humiliated me. Abused me every day I was with him. And by now, he'll be back in England. But he would have done the same before my children. I couldn't bear that. And it, it would have broken their lives. Now, please, don't torture yourself. No, no, yourself. please, let me have my say. His mother will protect and care for them. They'll be better off. And besides, so very soon I shall have our child to take care of. Ah, oh, which shall it be, boy or girl? Doesn't matter. It shall only be the first of many, as many as you want. We need to people this island. Oh, that's for the long future. And we'll need some outside help. No, no, don't say that. I don't want to be found. Well, eventually we have to be. Why? When our son or daughter grows up... We can't lock them into our paradise. 
It would be hell for him or her once he grew up. Well, that's for the long future. You don't have to worry about that now, please. Well, I hope I can arrange for us to leave in our own good time. What do you mean? Pascal is making a present for the baby's birthday. He's using the captain's sword I brought ashore with us. Well, it, it answered a question that has disturbed me ever since you first told me you were with child. How to build a boat to sail away from the island. But where? Uh, north, I should judge. There are larger islands there, settled by the French, some held by the British. But not now. I don't want them to find us. I want to keep you alive. I want to keep my freedom and the greatest happiness I've ever known. If a ship should come, I want to hide. Obviously, so do I. What about Pascal? Well, he has every reason to do the same. He says he does. <sighs> but I suppose none of us will ever really know until the situation... Giles, Valerie! It's Pascal. Something's wrong. Oh, what is it, Pascal? Have you not seen? I was afraid. Perhaps you had not. Beyond the rock, to the northeast. But be careful not to show yourselves. There is a ship headed for the island. Oh, no. Oh, it's British. No. A man of war. Oh. Well, now we face reality. Do we go... Or do we try to stay? Pascal, where have you been? With a branch, I brush all our footprints from the beach. Are you sure that they didn't see you? No, the headland blocks their view. Have you cleaned out the caves? Yes, yes, just finishing. I've made two packs of our belongings. You and I will carry them. But where are we going to hide? Well, at the edge of the bush. We can watch them from there if they land. If they should search. We know the island better than they do. We can avoid them. Fresh fruit. Shh, shh. Hold up. Half a bow, lads. Wait for his lordship. What are you stopping for, Mr. Roland? Oh, no. Oh, no. It's not possible. Just waiting for orders, my lord. What is it, Val? That's my husband's voice. What's the hold up, Bosun? You want us to search the whole island? Yes. We know someone's here from that banyan tree that's been cut recently. Oh, mon dieu, the cradle I have betrayed us. Have a guard in Ebo Bay, Lord Castleton. Well, send back to the ship for as many as you need. I want this island gone over with a fine tooth comb. Oh, no, we're lost. Oh, not yet. <laughs> C'est tout ma fault. So it is up to Pascal to make amends. Adieu, mes enfants. No, Pascal. I'm no. lost anyway. No. But you can still be saved. Adieu. Oh, stop it. Shh, oh, no. it's too late. You look for me, eh? By the Lord, Harry. Cover him, men. Who are you? My name is Pascal. Why do you come to destroy my solitude? You say you are alone on this island? For oh, four years, monsieur. You are trespassing on my property. I am a man who enjoys my own company and no one else's. You are a liar. Come closer. As you wish. What's that around your neck? My, my, my neck? That pendant. It belonged to my wife, the Lady Castleton. She's here on this island, too. Where have you hidden her? Look out! Don't let him escape! Cut him down! <laughs> In, Mr. Rowland, and drag him back here. Yes, sir. Come along, lads. They kill him. I don't know. He made it to the underbrush. It doesn't matter. They know I'm here now. You will never rest till he finds me. I won't let them find you. The Val, you can't. Hush, darling. It's the only way. Goodbye, my love. You? Val! It's too late for us. Maybe it always was. You? Very. I found you. What's that devil's the idea of hiding from me? What's got into you? Valerie. Yes, you. I don't believe it. You're pregnant. Yes. By that scum who wears the pendant I gave you, I'll have him flogged to death and hung from the yard. Please, don't blame him. Who else shall I blame? Is there anyone else on this island? No. No one. I'll make him sorry for the day he ever laid eyes on you. But he's the least of it. What am I going to do about you? Take me back to England. And my children. In that condition? Oh, no. I won't permit you to make me a laughing stock. I can't even allow the sailors from the ship to see you. A story will get out and the Castleton name will be dragged in the mud. In my condition, it can't very well be kept a secret. What? Oh, slut. Oh. Turn around. Walk into the bushes. What are you going to do? The only thing that's left for me to do, cut 
cut your throat. And get off this accursed island before anyone else learns my shame. Now move, Castleton. Who's that? Lieutenant Giles Maybury. Maybury? The traitor who... So you're the one who's responsible for it all. Oh, Giles, why did you have... Hush, Val. This is the only way. Since his precious name means so much to him, I'll arrange he won't have to worry about it. What do you mean? You have a weapon, sir. So do I. Guard yourself. It'll be my pleasure to run you through. <coughs> First, catch your chicken and... Ah! Giles! Try for him, Valerie. Oh. It'll not save him. If I go, I'll take you with me. Ah! Ah! It, it can't end like, like this. Giles, run. Run, Giles, and hide before the sailors come back. Nowhere to run anymore. Oh, help me to the ground. Oh, my darling, you're hurt. <coughs> oh, oh, better this way. Your children need you. Without him, you have your chance for happiness. No, the only happiness I ever knew was with you. <coughs> oh, remember what we had. Take care of, of our child. Charles, Charles, don't die. Oh, it's the only way. I gave you freedom, so I die happy where we knew paradise. And thou beside me, singing in the wilderness, and wilderness where paradise be now. What happened here? What? What? Lady Castleton and Lieutenant Mabry. Uh, Boston Rowland, remember me? So... We all escaped alive from the Arabella. How about that? But what happened to you, your ladyship? What happened to Pascal? Ooh. Oh, oh, the Frenchman. Oh, the lads are bringing his body back. He was riddled with bullets. Then they're all dead. Except me. And I would be too if I didn't have two little ones who need me. And a third who'll need me most of all. At least I'll have him to remind me of all I leave behind. Come, Boson. Let's turn our backs on paradise and head for England. And home. The delight of two children to have their mother back with them again was enough to bring Lady Castleton out of her profound melancholia. And their unquestioning acceptance of the baby brother she brought home with her lifted her heart even further. There is this much happy ending to a very sad story. I'll be back shortly. It was Sidney Carlton who said in Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, It is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. In this tale, let that serve as a fitting epitaph for Lieutenant Giles Maybury and that gentle giant named Pascal. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Lloyd Batista, Robert Maxwell, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Our story is called Obsession. What is an obsession? It is a persistent and disturbing intrusion of or anxious and inescapable preoccupation with an idea. More simply, it is a siege. 
and the obsessed person is laid siege to by an unreasonable, absurd, obstinate, inescapable conviction. I couldn't believe it. I'd known the guy all my life. We grew up together, lived on the same street. Why, he he was best man at my wedding. I named my first son after him. Now here he was, standing in front of me and asking me to... I simply couldn't believe it. Our mystery drama, Obsession, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Robert Dryden and Mandel Kramer. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There is an older definition of obsession regarded as obsolete, but one I suspect showing signs of coming back into fashion. This is it. An act of the devil or a spirit besetting a person or impelling a person to action from without. Take the ancient definition or the modern one. The tale we're about to tell you deals with the phenomenon of obsession. My knees were shaking. My mouth was parched. My palms were damp with sweat. I was standing in front of a door marked Chief of Police. And the man on the other side of that door was my childhood friend, Dave Chase. I hadn't seen him for quite a few years. Ten, maybe. But before that, we'd known each other well. Very well. We'd been best friends as kids and... When he got married, I stood up for him. He had a son named Emmett after me. Certainly that ought to count for something. Still, my hand was shaking when I knocked on the door. Yeah, come on in. You wanted to see me? The desk sergeant didn't give me your name. I didn't tell him. He just said a friend. You don't recognize me, do you, Dave? You look familiar, but... Emmett O'Hara? Emmett? You're Emmett O'Hara? For Pete's sake, Emmett! Oh, Em, I am sorry, of course, of course. Now that... Emmett, it is wonderful to see you. Well, come on, can sit down. Sit down. I, you know, I'm really sorry. It's been a long oh, time. No excuse. I mean, I should have... Sit down. Yeah. Sit down. And now, tell me, wh- what are you doing in Cornford? Are you living here or what? Just the last few months. Well, why didn't you look me up before? My gosh, we were kids together, you and me. Mm-hmm. Come on, sit down, will you? Yeah, that's better. Now, let's see. The last time I saw you, uh, when was it? Well, it's got to be ten years. Twelve, maybe. I, I was on the force in L.A. You were a crime reporter. And a darn good one, too. Are you still working for that paper? Uh, no, no, I quit that. Too much wear and tear. <laughs> I know. So, what are you doing these days to make a living? Ever hear of, uh, Paul Pickens? Uh, the name is familiar. Thayer Loomis, Edward Price, Natalie Bannon. <laughs> what have they got to do with you? They're me. I'm them. You're Natalie... What's her name? No, so Mary McFarland. They're pseudonyms. You see, I write novels. Mystery novels. Murder mysteries. Under different names. Well, I'll be... You know, Muriel reads those things. They're paperbacks mostly, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Well, Muriel buys them. You remember Muriel, don't you? You know, her father was medical examiner in L.A. I stood up for you at your wedding at City Hall. Of course you did. Of course. How could I forget? I mean, it's been a long time. I mean, you know, we're both getting on in years. I'm 61. I guess you must be about the same. 62. And you're a writer now. How about that? Mm, It's a living. I manage two, three books a year. Boy, you must be good at it. Very good. Too good. Oh. Come on, there's no such thing as too good. Oh, yes, there is. Uh, To come to the point of why I'm here, Dave, I want you to lock me up. You want me to what? I don't think I quite caught that. I want you to lock me up. Lock you up? 
in here, in the cell. You can do it, Dave. You're the chief of police. That's why I came here, to ask you this favor. Just shove me in a cell and keep me there. Well, Emmett, why would I do that? Why would you want me to? Because if you don't, I'm going to do something terrible. Well, like what? I mean, what would you do? Murder? Theft? I don't know, something. Beat up somebody and take everything he's got. Beat up who? Take what? I don't know. Anybody, anything. I... I'm going to do it if somebody doesn't stop me. You're the only one who can, Dave. And you've got to do it. Now, just hold on, Emma. Now, just take it easy. Somebody's okay? got to do now, it. Now, you just simmer down and tell me where you got this nutty idea. It's not a nutty idea. It's going to happen. I know it. All right. All right. Now, now, now tell me, when, when did you get this, this, this idea? When did it dawn on you that you were going to do something terrible, like, like murder or assault or burglary or whatever? It's been growing on me for quite a while now. I think it must have started way back when I was crime reporter for the paper. I was a good crime reporter. You know that, Dave. One of the best. When I got to thinking how... how dumb all those criminals were. How they didn't really have to get caught if they'd just been more careful. If they'd planned it just a little better. Used their heads. Thought it out. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure, I know what you mean. So about ten years ago, I quit being a reporter and started writing these detective novels. I must have written, oh, I don't know, dozens of them. Of course, when you write these whodunits, the bad guy always has to get caught, always. You understand? Sure. Figures. So I had to have him do something stupid, overlook something, leave a clue, say some dumb thing, anything. Or the police had to be so all-fired intelligent, which they are not, uh, Dave, I'm sorry, but we we know, you know they're not, not really. We try. Well, after a while, the whole thing struck me as just plain silly. I knew, I knew for a certainty that if I put my mind to it, I could commit a crime, a major crime, and never get caught. I just knew it. Mm -hmm. Did you ever do anything about it? No, of course not. I'm not a criminal, Dave. I don't want to hurt anybody. I'm a very... a very moral person. I know you are. But I'm not going to go on being one if you don't help me. I'm going to commit a terrible crime if you don't lock me up. I am. I can't do that. But you've got to. I'm telling you the truth, Dave. If you don't... Now, just take it easy, will you? Will you just take it easy? You know, Em, whenever there's a crime committed, all sorts of people come running to the police trying to confess, saying they did it, you know, that they're the criminal. This is different. I mean, we can spot those people a mile off. It's some kind of a need to punish themselves. At least that's what the psychiatrists tell us. Not for anything they've done, just for something they wanted to do. This is different. Personally, I think they're looking to get their pictures in the paper. You know, they feel so insignificant that they'll do anything just to get noticed. Get somebody to pay attention. At least that, that's, that's my opinion. This is different. But you're not insignificant, Emmett. You're a successful writer. You're known. You ever get married, Em? No, I was afraid to. Oh? Well, maybe you should have. You got a girl? I've had lots of girls. No, I don't mean lots of girls. I mean, anybody can have lots of girls. I mean, a girl. Have you got a girl here in Cornford? Yeah. Rosalie. Oh, pretty name, Rosalie. She's housekeeper for some rich people out on the river road. You like her? And I like her. She like you? Seems like she does. Well, look. My suggestion to you is you go and see Rosalie. Or, or call her up and ask her out for dinner. Or, or take her to a movie. There's a good one playing at the Bijou. Or, anyway, Muriel says it's good. I wouldn't know. You take Rosalie to the Bijou and call me tomorrow, Emmett, and we'll talk some more. Okay? You're not going to lock me up? I can't, Emmett. I got no reason to lock you up. You haven't done anything. You can't just walk in here and say, put me in a cell. The law doesn't work that way. 
You could do it if you wanted to. No, I couldn't. Jail isn't a motel, Em. You can't just check in and out whenever you've a mind to. Mm, yeah, I... I suppose you're right. I know I'm right. I know the law, Em. I know what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do. Now, you run along and call Rosalie. Got it? Right. Got it. And uh, call me tomorrow, huh? Or stop by here? Okay? Right. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for nothing. What on earth had made me think my old pal would believe me? Not only did he not believe me, he thought I was an idiot. A total idiot. Soft in the head. Somebody to be humored and nursed along till he comes to his senses. He didn't know that this was serious. Dead serious, you might say. Because I couldn't think of anything else to do, I did the first thing that came into my mind. Will you care for another drink, Mr. O'Hara? Oh, no, thanks. I tell you what I would like, though. Yes, anything for a good customer. I'd like to buy a quart of gin to take back to my hotel. You want me to sell you a bottle of gin over the bar? Yes, please. Oh, I can't do that. Twenty bucks? It's against the law, Mr. O'Hara. Thirty? Look, you can drink all you want here. But we're not allowed to sell booze to take out. You have to go to the liquor store. Yes, but they're all closed. Now, look, you know me. I'm a regular customer. I've never asked you for a favor before. Just this one time, I... Look, I need it. I really do. Believe me, I, I do. Well, if you really need it, so... All right, here you go. You won't regret this. Slip it under your coat if anybody saw me doing this. You got a phone I can use? Yeah, on the wall, by the door. If it's a local call, you don't have to pay for it. That's a local... Rosalie, th this is Emmett. I just wanted to tell you I can't make it tonight. I got something I have to do. Oh, gee, Emmett, I'm sorry. I, I was hoping I'll call you tomorrow. Or the next day. Or the day after. Hey, Mr. O'Hara, you didn't settle up. Mr. O'Hara? Hey! Uh, that, that, that's him. Grab that guy. He broke my oh, window. I can't do it. I can't Get a cop. Somebody get a cop. Of course, I just stood there. I felt calm and peaceful. Everything was all right. I had done something wrong, and they were going to put me in jail. I think I was smiling when the cop came and took me away. we're beginning to comprehend something of the strange nature of an obsession. Not only can the victim find himself beset by the notion of something he has done in the past, he can be equally beset by the idea of something he is bound to do in the future. Either way, an obsession is a torment, and there is no relief and no escape. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. heard me describe an obsession as a siege. That definition is taken from Webster's International Dictionary and to me seems appropriate for the person obsessed is indeed a person besieged, set upon, bombarded, attacked, and rendered helpless through no fault of his own. He is, in every truth, under siege. I couldn't believe it. I've known Emmett O'Hara all my life. Granted, I hadn't seen him for the last 10, 12 years, but we were kids together. Then he shows up out of the blue and says, put him in jail because he might commit a crime. Now, I tried to reason with him. I tried to calm him down, and I thought I had. I thought he was going to call some woman named Rosalie and take her to a movie. Two hours later, they tell me he's been brought in on a charge of disorderly conduct. A crazy loon had thrown a bottle of gin through a window. 
Emmett O'Hara? Our Emmett? Our Emmett. I tell you, Muriel, when he walked into my office, at first I didn't know him. He's changed that much? Well, it's not so much that he's changed exactly. I mean, you know, he's still got all his hair. He's a little heavier, maybe. No, it, it, it was the way he looked. You know, his expression. I, I can't describe it. Well, try. I was always very fond of Emmett. So were you. Well, it was his eyes, mostly, I think. They're kind of wild, staring. And, and his smile... When he managed to smile, which which wasn't too often. Emmett always had a lovely smile. Well, he hasn't anymore. It's, 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 I don't know, it's kind of twisted. It's m- more of a grimace than a smile. Well, what's happened to him to make him look like that? Nothing's happened, not really. I mean, he's, he's been very successful. He's had all those murder mystery books. You know, the, the kind you read. Mm. No, it, it's this notion he's got into his head that he's going to commit a crime. Oh, Emmett wouldn't hurt a fly. Yeah, I know that. And you know that. Even Emmett knows that. I mean, he said so himself. He's a very moral person. Well, then why in the world... Muriel, it's an obsession. He's convinced, he's absolutely positive that he would do something awful if I didn't lock him up. Of course, I couldn't do that. And I told him so. I said, I can't lock up a guy who hasn't done anything. Well, certainly he could understand that. Well, I had to do a little talking, but I think he finally got it through his head. I told him to go and call up this girl he knows, uh, Rosalie, something or other, and take her to dinner or a movie, and then come back and see me the next day. And he said, okay, he would. And I thought, that's that. But did he call this girl, this Rosalie? Well, I don't know. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Next thing I knew, must have been, oh, a couple of hours after he left my office, one of the men on the beat brings him in for disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace and damage to property. It seems he threw a bottle of gin through the window of a bar he'd been drinking in. Well, he was drunk. He must have been. Well, the cop that picked him up said he might have had a couple, but he wasn't drunk. And he was just standing there with a little smile on his face. Very nice, very pleasant. He didn't deny anything. He said, yes, he'd thrown the bottle. He'd broken the window. Of course. Of course. What, of course? Well, you had to lock him up, didn't you? Well, certainly. The man who owns the bar pressed charges. The judge gave him ten days. Then he got what he wanted. He got himself locked up. Yeah. Know what I'm going to do, Muriel? Tell me. I'm going to ask the judge to cut down his time. Will he do that? Well, if I explain to him that, that Emma's just going through a, a bad time right now, you know, that he has this obsession about himself. That he just threw the gin bottle to get himself arrested in jail. Tell him we've known Emmett for years and years. What kind of a man he is. I'll do it. I'll go down to the courtroom right now and do it. And listen, Dave, if the judge says okay and you get Emmett out, tell him we both love him and we're dying to see him. And you tell him that I want him here for dinner and talk over old times and all of that. You you know what to say. Sure. And tell him if he wants to, to bring his girl along with him for dinner. This uh, Rosalie person. Well, everything went fine with the judge. He and I are old friends anyway, and he's easy for me to talk to. I explained about Emmett being a bachelor at 62, kind of lost in the world, and worked hard writing those mystery novels. Well, that helped a lot, as it turned out. It seems the judge had read every last one of them and knew all the names that Emmett wrote under. He was really very impressed. Hey, Emmett, it's me, Dave. Oh. Oh, hello, Dave. Hi. Well, you're free. Free? Yeah, you're free to leave. I talked to the judge. Leave here? That's right. But I don't want to leave here. All right, Emmett, look. You've committed your crime, even if it's only a misdemeanor, and you got yourself locked up. You've had your fun. So now... Let's get you the heck out of here, huh? Yeah, but I don't want to get out of here. You want me to let you sit in this cell for the whole ten days? I don't ever want to get out. I want to stay. Well, you can't. I mean, look, once you get this... this notion out of your head, you'll go back to living a normal life and everything will be okay. Now, come on. Yeah, but it's not a notion. I know, I know. It, it, it's an obsession. I talked to the police psychiatrist about it, and he says you can be treated for it. I can? Certainly. Listen, Emmett, people get obsessions all the time. You know, that the world's going to blow up, that the Martians are coming. Some of them even get the obsession they're they're God. 
I mean, yours is just a, a tiny obsession. You're just neurotic. Now, you can get some therapy and be your old self again. Now, how about it? How about coming along with me, hmm? Now? Right now. Oh, I, I, I don't know. Now, listen to me. Muriel sent you her love and said to bring you home for dinner. Really? Yes. I mean, she's dying to see you and to talk over old times, you know, all like that. Oh, that'd be nice. Matter of fact, she said bring your girl along with you if you feel like it. Rosalie? Yeah. How about it? I don't know if Rosalie would fit in. Well, okay, then it'll be just you and me and Muriel. Okay? Okay. 6.30 be all right for you? 6.30? What am I supposed to do between now and 6.30? Oh, I don't know. You know, you could take a walk or... You know, do some writing, maybe. Hey, did I tell you the judge has read all your books and he thinks they're great? What, did he really say that? He really did. Now, look, here, I'm, I'm jotting down the address of our house. All right, now you stick that in your pocket, oh. okay? Okay. I'd hang around with you till dinner time, but the Cornford Savings and Loan got held up this morning. We got a lead on the perpetrators, and I have to follow up on that. You'll be all right, won't you? Maybe I'll go down to the library and find something to read. Good idea. Fine idea. Just don't go breaking any more windows, huh? Oh, no, I won't. I won't. Okay, so let's go. It'll be nice to see Muriel again. I always liked Muriel. Always. I liked her a lot. I have to say, I didn't think too much about Emmett for the rest of the day. I had to go back to my office and turn my attention to the problem of catching up with the bums who'd robbed the Cornford Savings and Loan. I was surprised when I looked at my watch and saw that it was already 6.30. So I shut up shop and hurried home fast as I could, wondering if Emmett really did show up. I'm home. About time. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. It couldn't be helped. I'm putting dinner on the table. Emmett here? Mm Mm-hmm. In the living room. I mixed a drink for him since you weren't here to do the honors. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Well, hi, Emmett. Hello, Dave. Hi. Make it to the library okay? Oh, yeah. Read one of my own books. Learn anything? Uh, I wrote it so long ago I forgot how it came out. (laughs) Of course, the criminal got caught. Sure, due to the innate sagacity of the police. Hey, Muriel, is it time for me to have a drink? Yeah, I'd make it a fast one. How about you? A small glass of sherry. Okay. Well, how do you think Muriel looks after all these years? Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Hardly changed at all. Yeah, you put on a little weight, but, you know, four kids, you know. You've got grandchildren? Mm, six. Six? Boy, that must be wonderful. Yeah, it is kind of wonderful. Of course, we hardly ever see any of them. You know, they're scattered all over the country. You see them at Christmas, probably. Yeah, some of them. And once in a while, all of them. Oh, that must be sensational. Well, it is, kind of. Gives you a sense of, oh, continuity or whatever. Emmett, uh, your namesake, he's got two boys and a girl. You don't say. Mm -hmm. And one of his boys is named Emmett. Boy, is that so? That's right. Tell me, are you sorry you never got married, Emmett? Right now, I am. All right. Where is my small glass of sherry? Right here, honey. (laughs) Ready and waiting. Thank you. Well, here's to all us good old friends. Here's to us. To us. Hmm. Uh, Emmett was just asking about our grandchildren. Muriel knows all their names and how old they are. I kind of get them all mixed up. Well, uh, there's Emmett David Jr. He's 19. And then there's Melinda Muriel. She is 17. And... Hey, excuse me a minute, will you? Oh, sure, Emmett. Anything wrong? No, 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 no. I'll be back in a minute. You need anything? I have to take a pill. A tranquilizer. They're in my overcoat pocket. The doctor recommended them. I keep forgetting. Think he's all right? He's just very nervous, that's all. He'll be all right. He looks all right. You think so? Yes, I think so. Anyway, I think I think so. I'm glad we got him here for dinner. You were the attraction. Me? Sure. As soon as I said you wanted to see him, he came right along. He likes you a lot, Mira. He always has. He said so. Oh, you want to get the phone? Sure. Yeah, I'll chase him. Yeah. Are you sure? 
Yeah. Well, good work. All right, I'll be right down. Hold everything till I get there. You going out? I got to get back to headquarters. They've collared the guys who held up Cornford Savings and Loan. But uh, what about Emmett? Well, what about him? You're going to leave me here alone with him? Honey, it'll be all right. Emmett's okay. You don't have to be scared of him or anything. He's not going to do anything to you. Matter of fact, he's not going to do anything to anybody. It's all in his head. Come on, give us a kiss. I'll be back as soon as I can. I really believed what I said, too. Every last word of it. Emmett O'Hara was our friend. Old Em wouldn't hurt a fly. No, of course old Em wouldn't hurt a fly. Not the old Em that Dave and Muriel knew back in Los Angeles. Not good old Em. Not that good old Em. But this is a new Em. The new M obsessed with the idea that he can commit a perfect crime. Not old M at all. And perhaps not good at all. I'll be back shortly with our final act. Chase has left his wife, Muriel, alone in the house with their friend for 40 years, Emmett O'Hara. Emmett O'Hara, as we have learned, is convinced that he can commit a crime without being apprehended. But more than that, he is certain that he will do so unless he is restrained. So I sat down to dinner with Emmett. Never have I talked so much so fast about anything, everything... Emmett threw in a word or two now and then, but mostly he simply listened with his eyes fastened on my face. Not really looking at me, I felt, but looking through me or beyond me. His look was intent and at the same time vacant, if such a thing is possible. Finally, dinner was over, and I was faced with the prospect of an evening alone with this man I'd known so long, so well... And now, hardly knew it all. You know what I think I will do, Em? I think I'll go get my knitting. Oh? Well, sure, if you want to. Uh, The fire's all laid in the fireplace, so if you want to set a match to it... Yeah, I could do that. I'll just go fetch my knitting. It's in the bedroom. Go ahead. I'll be right back. Take your time, Muriel. I'm finishing up an asking for my newest grandchild. I'd like to have it ready for Christmas. Sure. Emmett, look, if you don't want to hang around here... No, 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 it's nice here. But if you've got any place else you want to go... I've got no place to go. Oh, well, Dave said something about you having a girl here in Cornford. Rosalie, wasn't that her name? Oh, yeah, Rosalie. Well, if you want to go see her or call her up, ask her to come over, anything at all, you go ahead, hmm? Oh, thanks, Muriel. Maybe I'll do that later. I rushed into the bedroom and shut the door behind me. My heart was pounding. How silly I'm being, I thought. Emmett wouldn't hurt me. Emmett wouldn't hurt a fly. Then I saw his overcoat where he'd flung it on the bed when he first arrived. And on the bed were half a dozen little plastic bottles. They must have rolled out of his pocket. I recognized most of them right away. Red devils, yellow perils, and some tiny white ones. But there was one I'd never seen before or heard of. Was this the tranquilizer Emmett was taking that gave him that strange glazed look? On an impulse, I scribbled down the name of the pharmacy, the prescription number, the doctor's registration number. And then I saw the name of the patient. Not Emmett O'Hara at all. It was Rosalie Cash. I just got everything back into the overcoat pocket when there was a soft knock at the door. Oh, uh, yes, is that you, Emmett? 
Okay to come in? Yes, sure. Sure, come on in. Find your knitting? Oh, uh, no. I can't imagine where I put it. Oh, uh, want me to help you look? Oh, no, no, no. You don't have to do that. It'll turn up somewhere. Muriel, I, I was thinking about what you said. Maybe I should call Rosalie. Maybe she's expecting me to. Why don't you do that? Or maybe I'll go over there and see her. Uh-huh. Where does she live, Emmett? Oh, oh, uh, out on River Road somewhere. Uh, I know the house when I get there. She's housekeeper for these very rich people. Well, if you think she expects you... I didn't say she expects me. Oh, whatever. You want me to help you on with your coat? Oh, thanks, Muriel. Uh, thanks very much. There you are. You want me to call you a cab? No, no. I'll pick one up down at the corner. Uh, Muriel... Yes, Emmett? You know, there are different kinds of people. I mean, different people have different obsessions. Did you know that? It's true. Some people have this obsessive thought that the world is going to go up in flames. <laughs> they could be right. <laughs> yes, they could, the way things are going. And then there are people who think they're God. Of course, they are wrong. Because nobody's God. Except God, of course. That's right, Emmett. But those people are crazy. Psychotic is what they call it. But then there are other people who are not crazy. They're not psychotic. They're just uh, disturbed. You know what I mean? Neurotic is what they call them. Well, I'm one of those. I'm neurotic. It's because I'm so depressed. I see. Well, thanks for dinner, Muriel. It was very good. You're a wonderful cook. Dave's a lucky man. Well, Emmett, it was wonderful to see you, and we'll see you again, I hope. You call up any time. I will, Muriel. I'll do that. No, don't, don't bother to come to the door. I can find my way out. You just look for your knitting, and I... I'll call you one of these days. I heard the outside door slam. Then I looked at the piece of paper that was still crumpled in my hand. With its numbers, the name of the pharmacy, and the name Rosalie Cash. I don't know just what I had in mind, but I called a taxi. Just closing up, lady. Um, my husband is David Chase. He's the chief of police. Oh. Uh, well, what can I do for you, Mrs. Chase? Uh, your pharmacy filled this prescription, I believe. Mm -hmm. I wrote all this down from the label on the bottle. Right. There's the prescription number and everything. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's possible. Uh, what, what do you want to know about it? First of all, I'd like to know what the prescription is for. I've seen the pills, but they weren't like any I've seen before. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, Mrs. If Chase. necessary, I will get my husband on the phone. Now, I don't want to buy anything. I just want to know what kind of pills they are. Oh, yes, ma'am. Then I would like to know who this Rosalie Cash is. That, uh, that's the prescription that oh. was made out for. Yes, ma'am. And where she lives. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hey. <laughs> this is a very strong drug. I mean, we, we don't get many prescriptions for these. Here, l l let me look it up in the desk reference. Uh... I, I hope whoever's taking these knows how to... I mean, if she doesn't... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Here we are. Uh-huh. Well, it, it's an antidepressant. It's not to be taken with amphetamines or diet pills or with caffeine or alcohol. Here. Um, extreme caution is advised. <laughs> well, I should hope so. All right, now, uh, will you give me the address of this Rosalie Cash? I know she lives someplace on River Road. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll give it to you. Oh, I do hope... Oh, my goodness. Oh, here. Here it is. Yeah. Uh, number 13 River Road. Well, that should be about 12 miles out in the direction... Well, never mind. Of... I'll find it. A dozen thoughts chased themselves crazily through my head as the taxi drove me toward 13 River Road. Emmett would kill Rosalie Cash. Emmett would rob the house where Rosalie Cash worked. Emmett would bludgeon 
Rosalie Cash into unconsciousness and then set fire to the house. Emmett would... Emmett would... How could I know what Emmett O'Hara would or would not do? The taxi pulled up at the house and I started to pay him off. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Taxi? Taxi, wait. Uh, wait, will you wait there a minute? Hey... Hey, uh, are you through with this cab? Who are you? Oh, what do you care? Uh, hey, driver. Are you Rosalie Cash? Wait, would you get out of my way, lady? Do you know Look, Emmett I, O'Hara? I, I never heard of him. Would you just get out of my way, please? I need this cab. He came to see you tonight. I know he did. Look, are you going to let me have this cab? No, I am not. Listen, Rosalie, my husband is chief of police in this town, Dave Chase. Maybe you've heard of him. Uh, I, I didn't do anything. Well, we were just having... Driver, a... here's your money. We won't be needing you. No, please, please. Now, Rosalie, I know... Emmett O'Hara came to see you tonight. He was at my house. He said he was coming here to see oh, you. I didn't ask him to. But he did, didn't he? Well, he, he showed up here. Uh, as a matter of fact, he called first to see if the people I work for were going to be in or out. Oh, Lord, which was it? Out. They went out. So he came over and he... Uh, he brought a bottle of champagne with him. Yeah, I don't even like champagne, and he knows I don't like it. So I should have known right away from the start. Known what? Well, that, you know, that he was up to something. Like what? Well, like something. Well, I, I got out some champagne glasses, and we went and we sat down in the drawing room. I mean, a, as long as people were out, it seemed all right. I mean, we, we've done that before. See, I, I always clean up afterwards, and, you know, we, start, we started to drink the champagne. Only I didn't like mine. I mean... I mean, I really didn't like it, you know, more than usual. It tasted funny, you know, like bitter, like awful. So, when he wasn't looking, I, I poured it in the potted palm, but he just kept on pouring it in, and he, and he kept on saying, come on, drink up, and I, I couldn't drink it. I mean, I just couldn't, you know, it tasted so peculiar. So, after a while... But by that time, he wasn't noticing anything, so I, I, I switched glasses. And, and he tossed off the one that was supposed to be mine, and then, and then he... God, it was terrible. I mean, it was just terrible. I couldn't bear to look at him. He turned, he turned white as a sheet, and he grabbed his head, and then he, he just fell over. He just fell over. I didn't know what to do. I, I, I just wanted to get out, to, to get away, you know? And where is he now? I don't know. Uh, I guess he's still on the floor. I mean, right inside. But that's where I left him. Is he dead? I don't know. He, he could be. I, I didn't wait to find out. Come on. We're going inside. Emmett wasn't dead, thank the good Lord. But he was unconscious, and I could hardly find his pulse. I called the ambulance. They got there in jig time and took him to the hospital. I left him there and went home and waited to tell Dave the whole terrible story. It was several days before we were allowed to see our old friend Emmett at the hospital. That's a pretty darn fool thing to do, Em. I told you. I told you. You could have killed that girl, Emmett. I told you. What were you going to do after you killed her? I don't know. Maybe steal some jewelry. Mm, I don't know. What kind of a dumb doctor gave you that prescription? One I always go to. Well, how come Rosalie Cash's name was on the prescription? I told him I needed it for a friend. For a friend, hmm? Yeah. A friend who was really depressed. In a deep depression, I told him. That's what I told the pharmacist, too. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. No need to cry about it. I told you to lock me up. I begged you to, Dave. You don't have to beg anymore. I warned you. I, I said I'd commit a terrible crime. You did. What? You committed a crime. Well, I... I I was going to... No, but... not going to. You did. Didn't you know that attempting suicide is a crime in this state, Em? But I didn't attempt suicide. No? Well, we'll take you to court and see what the judge says. 
Do you think he might? Yes. I think he might. Then we'll have to lock you up for a while. Will that make you happy, Emmett? Kind of. Yes. Happy. Kind of. That's what I thought. Come on, Dave. Let's go home. Dave and I sat up late talking about our old friend, Emmett O'Hara. We got to wondering if, after he got out of jail, he would be free of the obsession he'd had that he would commit a perfect crime. He'd committed a crime, all right. But it was far from perfect. I do not know if the obsessed person is freed from his obsessive idea once it has been executed. I do know that when the obsessed one is a strictly moral person, yet convinced that he is dangerous to others, there is every likelihood he will prove dangerous to himself. I'll be back shortly. Hostility and violence reside in each and every one of us. Most of us control it or conceal it, sometimes so cleverly and so completely that we ourselves do not suspect that it is there. But it is there, and it can turn and destroy us. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Robert Dryden, Terry Keene, and Carol Titel. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. preview of our next tale. I just wish you could have liked Dolores better. She brought you a plant. That brownish, hairy, scraggly thing. Oh, Mom, she's really a sweet girl. I, I wish you'd give Dolores a chance. A chance? I never want to see her again. Mom got her wish. She never did. The next morning, when I brought up her breakfast tray, the first thing I noticed was the plant in full bloom, heavy with blood-red blossoms. The next thing was Mom, whiter than any ghost, with a dry, drained whiteness that made her seem to be made of powder, as if when you touched her, she would turn to that. I didn't even have to put down the tray to know she was dead. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. This is your White Sox station, Sports Radio 78, WBBM Chicago. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... E.G. Marshall. The term self-made man has in recent years assumed heroic proportions. He or she who make something of themselves, supposedly out of nothing, are the folk heroes of the present. To have made the climb from nowhere to somewhere is regarded as the epitome of accomplishment. The only flaw in the formula is what did he make of himself and how. Generally, what they had to do to get there is far from a noble picture. 
And this portrait of Theodore Sampson is no exception. Lots of actresses in this town make a very good living without having a husband who runs the studio. I want to build something on my own. Ted has always made me feel I was just a trilby. You mean that trilby? <laughs> yes, Demorius. The girl who could only sing while Svengali conducted. I'm going to prove I'm a star without a Svengali. Or die trying. <laughs> mystery drama, That Magic Touch, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis. It stars Marion Seldes and Michael Tolan. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Interesting story, this. It has money, it has murder, proven jealousy, unproven crime... And against that background, there are honest, simple people trying to live the right way, although they have taken the wrong turnings. Let's hear first from Ronald Sampson, an adopted son of a famous Hollywood couple. I'd like to begin this from the beginning, although I, Ronald Sampson, was not there at the start. But my adopted mother and father were. Very much so. It was one of those Hollywood weddings of the 60s. Mother, a beautiful actress, a star at 18, and dad, not much older, a whiz kid producer who had just been given control of a studio and was twice over a millionaire. Teddy, am I all in one piece? I think so, Emily. <laughs> that was something, getting through that crowd at the church. I know you wanted us to go off to Mexico and tie the knot there without all the hoopla. Yes, that's what I wanted. Well, it's all over now. We really had to do it this way. I know. Another public appearance to promote another picture. It just happened that way. Triangle for Two is being released. You're the star, and our getting married is a great tie-in. Oh, I accept all that. I really do. It's part of the picture business. It's what you wanted. And I love you. It's only I would have liked it better if we'd gone home to Beaver Falls and had the wedding in our little wooden church and... And afterwards, just gone to Mom's for the reception with just a few friends. You'll never again have just a few friends. There are millions of people who think they're your friend. And they love you, too. Yes, and one of them pinched Mother's veil. We'll get another. Oh, it's not the same. Don't you understand? Well, anyway, it's stupid to argue about. I love you, and I adore you, and I've got five whole days before I've got to get back to the studio. And who knows? Maybe a year from now, I may stop working. Why would you want to do that? Well, I don't know. Maybe I'll be raising a family. Uh, nurse, will you show it Mrs. Sampson, please? Oh, come in, Anna Lee. Here, you sit yourself behind my desk. It's the only comfortable chair in my office. Oh, what about you, Eli? Oh, I'll just walk around. It's easier for me when I have a problem to deal with. Especially when the patient is also a personal friend. And I'm your problem, Eli? Okay, let's have it. What did the test say? Ah, uh, bad luck. How bad? Probably you can never have a child of your own. Never? Well, you know, Annalie, that doesn't have to be the end of the world. But Ted might think so. He'll be so disappointed. <laughs> I suppose it's wrong for me to say this to you, but I'd never have taken Ted for a family man. He's so wound up in the picture business. Well, so am I, Eli. I love my career. It's getting better with every picture, but... But never to have a baby of your very own. For a woman, of course, it's different. I recognize that. Even a woman who's on her way to becoming a superstar. Oh, sometimes I wish I'd stayed in Beaver Falls with my mother and father and my sister. And I'd never won that beauty contest at 15. Uh, you're not the only one who's wished you could have stayed the girl next door. And how does the script go then, Eli? Would I have married and had lots of children? What would have happened to me? Mm, who knows? Maybe you would have become a doctor's wife. But no children. Oh, I'm not unhappy, Eli. I love Ted. I love my work. 
I'm proud of Ted. Since he's gone independent, they're calling him another Thorberg. He demands the best. He wants his own way, and he usually gets it. Except this one time. Annalee, maybe you should... Maybe you should think about adopting a child. Adopting? I might be able to help you there. You could. I'll talk to Ted about it tonight. Oh, I'm glad. You'd make a wonderful mother. It's sort of ironical, isn't it, Eli? Everyone's starting to say that Ted Sampson's got that magic touch. But it only seems to work for pictures. <laughs> same year, I was adopted. They named me Ronald. I don't know if I was more sickly than most children, but Dr. Eli Sean seemed to spend a great deal of time at our house. And my adopted father spent a great deal of time at work. Bertie, take a memo to hell, Lask. I don't like the candlelight effect on the dungeon scenes of Vampire. They're not scary enough. Got that? Uh, next. Memo to Pat Wiley. Mr. Sampson's office. Can I speak to him, Bertie? It's Annalee. Oh, uh, Mr. Sampson, it's your wife on the tie line. Uh, yes, Annalee, what is it? Ronald is sick, Ted. What? I said your child is sick. Well, I heard what you said, Annalee. What's it got to do with me? Call our pediatrician. I have. He's here now. Well, then what do you want from me? I can't do anything about it. Honey, I'm in the middle of five productions, and you call me like this? I told you, if that pediatrician doesn't give you a satisfactory answer, call for Eli. He's on the studio payroll anyway. Oh, oh, say, Anna Lee, I think that new book of the year selection, Elizabeth Barrett, would make a doozy of a part for you. It's on the night table, my side. I want you to read it and let me know when I get home so I can put it in the works on Monday. I got better, but the marriage of my adopted parents got worse. Those years when I was a teenager were something I don't want to remember. And when I was 18... Mother had a nervous breakdown, which is when Dr. Eli Sean began to treat me as an adult. Ronald, now that your mother is back from the sanitarium, I want to have a little talk with you. Right now, Dr. Sean? Father's coming home soon. Don't you want to talk to him? No, I don't. You're 18, Ronald, and I'm charging you as of now to make sure your mother gets better. But what do I do? Well, first of all... Do you have any idea what may have caused her breakdown? You mean mother not being able to continue shooting the picture? Mm, I mean more than that. I'm going to take you into my confidence. I have known your mother even before you were adopted, Ronald. But when she was your age, 18, and then when Ted bought up her contract and brought her to his studio... She always says nice things about you, Dr. Sean. Well, we're old friends. Ronald, today your mother is one of the top movie stars in the world. Now, that means total dedication, work, concentration, and the absence of any strains at home. You're saying keep my father away from my mother. I can see you know the score. No, I don't think you can do that. But in the few hours they do have together, evenings or Sundays... You manage to always try and be on hand. Would that help? I think so. Definitely. Just your presence will make it easier, finally. I don't think he'd do anything overt to hurt her while you're there. Hurt her? I don't understand. Well, there are ways. Insidious, cruel. Hello, Eli. You and Anna Lee got here ahead of me. I had the limousine all set to take me to the sanitarium to bring her home, but Marcy Dallas is giving us problems on location. Hello, Ronald. Hello, Dad. How's the uh, patient, Eli? How is Anna Lee? Resting. You haven't said anything to her about Marcy Dallas taking over her part in Steeplechase? Uh, no, I haven't. They're afraid to, actually. You think it might make her worse? It's possible. Eli, I know my wife. She's enough of a pro not to let one picture getting away make any difference to her. She's still one of the top ten box office draws. Eli, you're an old friend. You've kept the studio healthy, but you're still only an M.D. I make the decisions here. And if I decide to tell Anna Lee it's no more pictures for a while, I will. Uh, 
Good morning, Mother. I thought I'd bring you your first breakfast home from the hospital in bed on a tray. I brought mine, too, so we can eat together. Oh, Ronald, what a darling idea. I, I don't think I'm much up to eating, but you go ahead and have yours. P put it on the table at the foot of the bed. I, um, didn't have a very restful night last night. I know. I heard. You're a young man of 18 now. I guess these things can't be hidden from you anymore. I wanted to come in and stop it. But I was too chicken. Oh, that shouting last night. He was brutal. That's the only word I know to describe how he ordered me around. My career is over, according to him. I'm unreliable. That's why I've got to get on my feet and out of here. It wasn't until last night that I realized what... Who drove me over the edge, and now I know... Oh, no, Mother. The only way for me to survive is to leave your father... You said that to him last night. Oh, yes, I said, I'm leaving you, Teddy. We need a rest from one another. What did he say? Well, didn't you hear? I thought his shouting could be heard on Beverly Drive. He told me where I could go, and he was through with the marriage. What about your work, your career? Oh, well, lots of actresses in this town make a very good living without having a husband who runs the studio. I only feel on solid ground in one piece if I'm away from him. Then I can build something on my own. On your own? Ronald, your adopted father has always tried to make me feel like a trilby. You mean that trilby? Yes. The girl who could only sing while Svengali conducted. I'm going to do my darndest to prove I can act without a Svengali. Or die trying. <laughs> Most of us are familiar with the double duty performed by a grain of sand. On the one hand, one grain can so irritate an oyster as to produce a matchless pearl. On the other, one single grain can destroy sizable machinery. So it is in human relations. It takes only the slightest irritant to grow and grow and irreparably damage a marriage. I shall return shortly with Act Two. As I listen to Annalie trying to extricate herself from what she feels is the bondage of her husband, I am reminded of Queen Catherine centuries ago kneeling before Henry VIII, saying, I have been to you a true and humble wife, at all times to your will conformable, but your heart is crammed with arrogance, spleen, and pride. The difference in centuries is that a modern woman does not kneel or beg for what is rightfully hers. Mother and I moved to San Francisco, into a narrow little Victorian house three stories high. We lived on the top floor at the head of narrow stairs. Only Dr. Eli Sean knew where we lived, not even her agent. She was first going to get well, then think about a career. But escape from Theodore Sampson wasn't that easy. Hello, lady. Where are you, top floor? I'm coming up. It's your father. How did he find us? Annalee, I know you'll live up there. Is Ronald with you? Annalee, are, are you in there? i better open it before he breaks it down. Hello, Father. Well, what's going on here? What, what are you two doing Ted, here? Ted, calm down. I told you I was leaving. Now, do you think I'd accept that? You'll have to. I've been giving out all kinds of stories to the press. You went to visit your folks in Beaver Falls. You didn't go to visit your folks. You're, you're in New York seeing a specialist, seeing some plays. Who knows what I've been telling them. Have you thought of the truth? What? Tell the world you walked down on me for no good reason? I've got an obligation to the stockholders. A dumb statement like that and, and boom, down goes our stock. What do you want us to do, Father? And you, Ronald. Oh, I'm surprised that you... You might have had the decency to tell me where you were. I was protecting Mother. From what? I'm not an ogre, no matter what your mother says. I was darn worried about you. Yes, both of you. I'd, uh... I'd like to persuade you to come home. Why? I think it's best for you. And you, too? Well, of course it's best for me, too. I'm not denying that. Darling, remember... Remember that book I wanted you to read? We bought it. 
And I got Trevor Maine working on it now. It's a beautiful script. From her illness to her book of sonnets to Wimpole Street, London, to Robert Browning, I, I can't begin to tell you. It, it's fascinating. It's great period, great costumes. And that's why I want you to come home and get, get well fast. Is that all you want to tell me? What else? What, what do you want me to say? Ten years ago, you wouldn't have had to ask me that question. I think you'd better go now, Ted. What are you talking about? What do you, what do you mean about ten years ago? Well, then you might have said come home because you loved me. You know I love you. Hey, what, what gives here? You get away from that door, Ronald. I'll leave when I'm good and ready. I came to talk to your mother and I'll go when I'm finished. You can talk, but I'm not listening. Hey, you come back here, Annalee. You're not turning your back on me. Come back into this room. Let go of me, Teddy. You can't force me to be with you if I don't want to. Let go of my mother. You get out of the way. Oh, oh. Annalee, let go of those banisters. Let go. Stop pushing me. You're oh. pushing me off this landing, oh. Teddy. Stop. My mother fell down an entire length of stairs. By some miracle, her neck was not broken, and she lived. But for her, it was the most catastrophic accident that could befall anyone whose face is their fortune. On the day they were to remove the bandages, father suddenly showed up. He sat in a room next to hers, waiting. Terrible. Terrible. She should never have rented that rickety old house in Frisco. Those old rotten banisters giving way like that. A terrible accident. Is that what you think? Believe me, I would no more harm one hair of your mother's head than shoot myself. Why'd you come to San Francisco that day? Why? Because I wanted you back. Both of you. Why? Because the newspapers were getting nosy? Do you think I want to be sitting here in this hospital while they unwrap her face? Do you think I want to see that? Why not? She has to see it. She has to live with it. Oh, why can't you leave us alone? Look, I, uh... I can't stay anymore. I wanted to see your mother to give her this envelope. She wants a divorce, she can have it. She wants security, and this letter, it's all spelled out. The house, the lodge at Big Bear, anything else she wants, just name it. You give her this letter... And I just hope and pray someday you'll both understand that every bruise and cut on Anna Lee has hurt me the same way. Oh, just you, Ronald, I thought. Hello, Dr. Sean. I thought Theodore was here, too. My father had to go. How's mother? She's... She's in pretty good shape, considering everything. Oh, but it's a crime, such a crime. Is there anything left of... Her face as it was? No, not much. That fall, it was... They're planning on pretty extensive facial reconstruction. Oh. If it works. Can I... Can I go in now and talk to her? Yes, she was asking where you were. Yes, yes, go on in. Oh, Mother, shh, shh, it's all over. I'm going to be as good as new. It could have been so much worse. Dr. Sean told me they're going to, uh... To, to reconstruct my face. I know. I'm not so sure I want to be reconstructed. Have you heard from your father? He was here a long time. We were waiting together to see you. Only then he had to leave... He gave me a letter for you. He did. Why don't you read it to me? Can it wait? It's all about you having the house in Beverly Glen and the place up at Big Bear. And it's okay for a divorce if you want it. You know, that kind of stuff. Mother. You know something? Something I never felt until now. I wish I was your real son and not just adopted. Oh, that doesn't make any difference. Do you think if you'd been our real son, we could have loved you any more, that we'd feel closer to you? Maybe you wouldn't, but I would. You see, somewhere back inside me, I know it's all his fault, you being here. 
I don't have any good thoughts about my father, the great Theodore Samson, who adopted me when I was a child. That kid grew up, Mother, and he hates that man so much for what he did. I hate him. I could kill him. You don't mean that. I do. That's the terrible part. I could kill him. Maybe, maybe if he was my real father, I couldn't feel that way. Can you imagine, Eli, how I felt when Ronald said that to me? Oh, poor kid. You can't really blame him. When you don't understand, it wasn't Ted's fault. I slept and fell down those stairs. So long as you believe that. What are you saying? Annalie, I can't lie to you. I know that Theodore was responsible. I don't care what you say. All that nonsense about the banisters giving way. I can't forgive him either, Emily. Please believe me, Eli. It was an accident. Ted would not have had this happen to me for anything in the world. (laughs) I remember once years ago you're saying you wondered what would happen to your life if you'd never entered that beauty contest and become a star. Did I say that? You wanted to know how would your life have turned out. And I said to you, if it were up to me, you might have become a doctor's wife. I've always known how you felt about me, Eli. And you were always where I needed you. When Ronald was sick, you even helped us with the adoption. I'll always be here, Emily. Good morning, Mr. Sampson. Morning, Bertie. How did the preview go at Pasadena last night? Well, the only bad rap we had on the preview cards was about Marcy. It just makes me weep when I think how magnificent Anna Lee would have been in that part. Oh, I, I got the call from her attorney. The divorce decree went through. Uh, they're sending you a copy. <sighs> ho, ho, ho. I'm sorry, Mr. Sampson. This is that time of year we used to either see her family in Beaver Falls or the three of us who go up to Big Bear and pray for snow. I'm going to miss that place, Bertie. Well, why don't you go on up? Oh, yeah, sure. And hang the divorce decree right next to my Christmas stocking. No, no, I mean it, Mr. Sampson. Do you think my wife, my ex-wife, could be persuaded? Well, why don't you ask her? What have you got to lose? Maybe you could put out a feeler. Maybe call the boy. Get his reaction. Will do. Christmas spirit. Goodwill to all men. (laughs) That's got to include divorced men, too. Don't turn away from me like that. I know what you're saying to yourself. She's useless. Crippled. She's ruined our marriage. I wish I could forget her. Well, I can still be useful. I can still inspire youngsters where I teach to be honorable and speak the truth. And I'll go on fighting for them until the day I can't open my eyes. Cut! Print that! About to take! Wrap it up! Oh, Annalie, that was tremendous. When you're playing these character ladies, you are great. A more powerful actress than you ever were. Well, coming from you, that's the nicest Christmas present I could have been given. Why not, Mother? Just for Christmas, let's ask Father to join us up at Big Bear. You know what they say. Goodwill to all men. Mm, It's peace on earth to men of goodwill, not the other way around. So what you're really saying is no. I haven't made up my mind yet. How did you hear your father might like to spend a few days up at Big Bear? Bertie called me. Ah, oh, Bertie. <laughs> He's the one who said goodwill to all men, isn't he? I guess he did, but he <laughs> meant it. He always means it. He's taken a lot from Ted, but he's loyal in spite of it all. Why is that? The year we adopted you, darling, Ted went on a hunting trip and Bertie was his guide. And accidentally, Ted shot Bertie. It it was a dumb thing. But Bertie's foot never got better. That's why he limps. Oh, it was all hushed up. And then when Ted formed his own company, he made Bertie his executive assistant. What about Dad, Mother? Can he come? I'd rather not. Not this Christmas, anyway. I'm trying to make my life again without him, don't you see? Oh, Mother, please. 
I thought you wanted to kill him. It's Christmas. Give him a break. Okay. Call Bertie or call your father directly. Tell him to meet us up at the lodge. <laughs> we might even have snow. And I'll do the cooking for you two guys, just the way I used to every other year. Now I know what Dr. Sean meant about you. Oh, Eli talks entirely too much. What was it this time? Your mother's very beautiful, he said. No accident can rob her of that. Eli's an old sweetheart. He's always had a soft spot for me, as I have had for him. I guess because we both came from small towns. You go along now, son. Call whoever you have to call. Make all the arrangements. You bet. I'll do it right now. I just... I hope having him up at the lodge... I just... I hope I'm not making a mistake, that's all. Strange about second thoughts. Are they indeed an omen to be heeded? Or are they fears to be disregarded? Forebodings, forewarnings, premonitions, presentiments. How do we get them? And what if we are warned too late? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. It's a few days before Christmas. A top movie executive, his divorced wife, once the reigning beauty of the screen, and their adopted 18-year-old son are to spend the holidays together in the California mountains. It's the time of year for celebration. Also the time Ted Sampson has his annual medical checkup. Eli, no, no. How is it possible when you check me over every year? It is possible, Theodore. Well, how, how can it happen? How did it begin? These things develop within the human system for no discernible reason. Medicine is still in the dark as to the causes of carcinomas. I can't believe it. Okay, what can be done? How soon can I start radiation therapy? Theodore, it's beyond that. But we can start you on chemotherapy. And we should immediately. Why not radiation? It's effective when the area is localized. Yours is spread quite widely. Oh, my Lord. Oh. This is the toughest thing I've ever come up against. It is for everyone. But I know you. You're a fighter. You've never liked me, have you, Eli? I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. As a doctor, I'll do everything I can for you. You know that. Eli? Yes? Why does it always happen to the good guys? Goodbye. <sighs> Not always to the good guys. The nice part about Big Bear is that it resembles the state of Maine. Pine trees, blue lakes, wild birds and animals. Mother and I got there with supplies on the 22nd. The next day, father arrived... And suddenly it felt like the old Christmases together, before the divorce. Except that he was a heck of a lot nicer to Mother than I ever remembered him. Annalee, your culinary hand has never lost its touch. That was one great spread. I can't eat another thing. I know, until breakfast time. <laughs> Everybody, look outside. It's starting to snow. Oh, it's beautiful. Ronald, what's that? Where? There's a man standing out there. See him? Let me look. Yeah, you're right, Annalee. I'm going to open the door and ask him what he's up to. Hey, you. What are you doing out there? This is all private property around here. Hey. hey what do you know? He's gone. Can't understand it. Is he lost? Why didn't he show his face? He had a scarf wrapped around it. I know he saw me before he took off. Teddy. What? Look out this window. There, standing next to that big pine tree. I, I think it's the same man. He, he's holding a gun. Let me open this window. Hey, you! Didn't you hear me? This is private property. What do you want? Get everybody! Everybody down on the floor! The man's crazy. He's shooting every glass pane out of the window. He's not there anymore. He's gone. Did you get a good look at him, Ron? He was so bundled up, I... I couldn't see. Did anybody? You, Annalee? I just noticed one thing. When he ran off, he had a limp. Sean speaking. Dr. 
Dr. Eli? Yes, who's this? I've been trying to get you for hours. This is Ronald Sampson. Uh, what's the problem? Dr. Sean, do you think you can get up here to the lodge at Big Bear? I've been trying you all night. Father's up here and... What? Theodore's with you and Anna Lee? We invited him for Christmas and New Year's. Oh, I wish I'd known. I don't like the idea of your mother and you alone with that man. Doctor, the reason I'm calling is... There's been some mysterious shooting last night. Like someone's using the lodge, uh, or us, for target practice. Well, did you call the police? I did, but there's no answer. I'll get up there as soon as I can. Mother doesn't feel safe. She asked me to call you. She says you're the, you're the only one she can trust. It'll take me about two hours, but I'll be there. Bertie, I'm up at the lodge, but uh, can you give me figures on how we did last week? Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm writing it down. Eli. Hey, Come right in, stranger. Uh, yeah. Donald, tell me you're on your way. Yeah. Ted, look who's here, Eli. Oh, uh, Bertie, hold those figures, will you? I'll call you back. Uh, hello, Theodore. Glad to see you, Eli. In fact, I was thinking of calling you. I'm sure you haven't had lunch. I'll make you a sandwich and coffee. How are the roads coming up? Oh, not too bad. Uh, but uh, looks like the start of a young blizzard. Well, where's Ronald? He went out to check the roads. He also went out to see if he could find some footprints. I had a nasty experience last night. I'll tell you about it. What'll it be, Eli? Chicken salad or roast beef? Well, roast beef on rice. You've got it. Gotcha. And a cup of black coffee coming up. Eli, will you take my pulse? My heart feels like it's racing. What is it, Theodore? Last night I had these terrible pains in my stomach. Oh, well, could be the old ulcer acting up again. It couldn't be the, uh, the other thing already, could it? What you told me in the office? Anything's possible, Theodore. It could also be psychosomatic. My emotions don't control my body. I think there was something in what I ate last night. Uh, I don't get the drift. I think I was... I was poisoned. I'm, I'm sure of it. I get these waves of nausea all last night, and now it's starting all over again. Well, I'll tell you what. You go into the bedroom and lie down. I'll be in in a few minutes and take your temperature, and we'll see. Okay, I will. Here's your lunch, Eli. Simple, but from the heart. What's wrong with Ted? He looks so pale. Oh, this sandwich looks great. Thanks, Anna Lee. Oh, I, I told him to go in and lie down. Could be anything. I just can't thank you enough for breaking into your Christmas holidays to come up here, Eli. I was suddenly very frightened. My dear girl, I'd rather spend Christmas under the same roof with you than anywhere else. Spoken like a true mooching bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> I hear from Jock O'Malley. The rushes are simply tremendous in that picture he's shooting. Mm, Jock likes character women. Well, he says you've made a lead out of the part. Anna Lee, to think how you've made a career out of... The... Out of the face I've got now? I've come to terms with not being a raving beauty anymore. Well, you are to me. You're still blaming Ted, aren't you? Let's not talk about him. Don't you think he's been punished enough? Do I? Somebody up there may not think so. I didn't see Dr. Sean arrive at the lodge. Mostly because the snow was coming down in a curtain around me. I was glad I'd worn snowshoes. And I was starting back when... Hey! Hey, up there! Can I give you a hand? Uh... Hey, what you doing out here, young fella? See, you're caught in a snowdrift. Can I give you a hand? You put her in first, and I'll try to rock her free. That should do it. You got chains? Uh, what I need is cleats. No, no, I've had it. I'm leaving the car here. Uh, you live far? No, no. I'll show you the way. What's your name, young fella? Ronald Sampson. Oh, you're the Sampson boy, sure. I'm Dave Perkins. I'm the coroner and the sheriff and the whole blame shooting match. Let's go. Okay, kid. Mush. Hey, you want me to carry that bag of yours, Mr. Perkins? My snowshoes give me better balance. No, no, I never let it out of my hands. It's a coroner's kit. A portable laboratory. What were you doing out here? Uh, somebody reported a man taking pot shots with a rifle. I was looking for him. night at the lodge, I got a good fire going and Mother made us a family favorite, campfire stew. 
The main ingredients being hamburger, onions, and vegetable soup. All of us, except Dad, dug in for seconds and thirds. He didn't eat much, said he wasn't feeling well, and went back to bed. Afterwards, we all sat around the fire. You're sure there's nothing very wrong with Ted, Eli? No, it's hard to tell. Could have eaten something that disagrees with him. For now, he should stay off his feet and eat lightly. Help! Huh? Help me! Eli! Come here, quick! Eli, you took so long in there. What's the matter with Ted? Will he be all right? He was right, and I was wrong. I think he has swallowed poison. Poison? I'm reasonably sure about it. I've induced disgorgement and hope he'll rid himself entirely of the substance. Uh, may I use your telephone, ma'am? Of course. The one on that table is the closest. Uh, see if I can raise someone at headquarters and get an ambulance out here. Eli, I don't understand. It couldn't be something wrong with the food. We all ate the same thing. I'll be watching him closely the next 24 hours, checking his temperature, monitor his pulse. Oh, uh, Mr. Perkins, did you get through to headquarters? No, well, I couldn't. Telephone's dead. Good morning, everyone. Just gaze outside that window. We're in the middle of a sea of snow. Morning. Boy, am I hungry. Coffee's on. I'll have eggs and toast ready in a few minutes. How's Ted today, Eli? Uh, seems to be improving. Pulse okay. Temperature just a degree above normal. I'm hoping whatever it was is passed out of his system. I've just made tea and toast for him. That wouldn't hurt Ted, would it? Uh, I'd say it's all right. But I see Dave Perkins shaking his head. What is it, Dave? Uh, Ma'am, if you'll excuse me, could I uh, take a look at that tea and toast? Do you think I put poison in it? I'm not saying, ma'am, but if you don't mind, I'll take out my little portable lab and we'll have a look-see. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Eli. Oh, you know, we have to take precautions. Mr. Perkins is right. Some of the foodstuffs could have been adulterated before you bought them. Well, I'll take my chances, Mother. You put the eggs and toast on the table and watch me make them disappear. <laughs> I feel exactly as you do, Ronald. But your father's reacting degeneratively to some substance, and we want to find out what. <laughs> was a nightmare. Dr. Sean brought the tea and toast into Father's room, came back, and we all sat down to breakfast. A minute later, there was a noise like someone had fallen out of bed. By the time the doctor rushed in there, it was all over. The next day, the snowplow came through, and we all had to follow Dave Perkins to police headquarters. All that day, we waited, and the next. Then Bertie limped in. Bertie! What are you doing here? Well, the police asked me to join you. Uh, sorry about Ted, Annabelle. Is that so? He was poisoned? Oh, hi, Ronald. Uh, where, where is that coroner who's been doing all the investigating? That's him. Just walked in the door. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have asked everyone who was under suspicion in the death of Theodore Sampson to be here. Well... All under suspicion? Well, now, that's hardly possible, Dave. Are you certain Mr. Sampson did not die of natural causes? We have identified a poison, and also how it was administered. You mind if I snap these handcuffs on you, Doctor? Huh? You're arresting Eli? Oh, why? What for? For the death of Theodore Sampson. You see, on each occasion Dr. Sean took Mr. Sampson's temperature... The tip of the thermometer he used had been immersed in a toxic substance. The evidence showed up in my tests. Now, if you would care to make a full confession, Doctor, let me first acquaint you with your rights under the law. And may I acquaint you, Mr. Perkins, with the fact that Theodore Sampson was suffering from a terminal carcinoma. I'm sorry, Anna Lee, that you had to learn it this way. I didn't know. I, I would advise you, Mr. Perkins, before presenting your case to the local district attorney, to have a more exhausting autopsy performed to discover the actual and true cause of death. Are you denying your actions, Dr. Sean? I'm saying nothing at this time. I do not wish to deny my intense hatred of Mr. Sampson, 
who's always ridden roughshod over anyone who would challenge his authority, yes, even his wife. This was a beautiful lady once. The man did not deserve to live. But I suggest to you, what and who was the instrument of his death will take more than a country coroner with a black bag laboratory to determine. I wish you luck, Mr. Perkins. Oh, Eli. Eli, my poor Eli. My lovely Annabelle. Can you ever find it in your heart to forgive me? When a man takes the law into his own hands, he had better be certain the law is on his side. For should any murder go unpunished, something is taken away from the security of every man's life. I shall rejoin you shortly. The mystery theater often delves into what motivates man to crime, and more than often comes up against a wall of the unexplainable when passions are involved. Hate can be a cause of murder, but on the other hand, so can love. What does this tell us? Only that the mind of man is as mysterious today as it ever was. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Michael Tolan, Christopher Tabori, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Were you afraid to know who it is doing this crazy thing? Well, maybe. I know I was. I mean, I was afraid of of confronting him with what he was doing. Or what she was doing. You thought it would be me. Well, didn't you think it might be me? Well, yes. Or worse. <laughs> what could be worse? A ghost. Bernice. Yes. <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. Yes, I know. Uh, but... Why don't you go and ask some of us some flour? Yeah, well, we'll do what you said. We'll spread it all over the mantelpiece. All right. Ghosts don't leave any fingerprints, do they? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight, partly cloudy with a low in the low to middle 60s. Friday, a partly sunny, windy, and very warm day with a high in Chicago in the upper 80s or the low 90s. At Midway Airport, it's 63 degrees. At the lakefront, 61. At O'Hare Field, 58. The humidity is 53%. The wind southeast, 6 miles per hour. Hi, I'm from the CCC. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. All the world loves a love story. Adventure is absorbing, mystery is marvelous, and suspense is superb. But of all the categories, give me first the tale of the old house, the creaking stairs, the wind that moans about the eaves like a human voice, and the jagged flashes of lightning that tantalizingly reveal only the suggestion of the shapeless white figure gliding through the driving rain. The ghost story. Such a one as I bring you now. I want my baby. It's her. The woman in the mirror. Help me. Help. We shouldn't have locked her away, Christopher. She's trying to tell us something. Mr.
mystery drama, Legacy of Guilt, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Roberta Maxwell. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The house is some 40 miles outside New York, perched on a bluff over the Hudson. An easy hour's commute. It is a perfect example of American Victorian, with fancy gingerbread moldings surrounded by a wide porch, the steep roof crowned by a useless tower room. It is rambling without being large, and stands in considerable disrepair. A situation that Tom and Angie Barr, two young New York actors who have just become parents as well as new householders, intend to repair. Tom, what are you doing? Oh, I uh, overcut one of the shelves a smidge, so I'm backing it off with a wood rasp. I don't mean that. It's after dinner, and this is supposed to be your day of rest. Angie, Sunday's the only night off I get from the play. Exactly. So you ought to spend it with me to say nothing of your son. Honey, I spent all day with you and the baby. That was a hardship? Oh, come on. You know it wasn't. Hey, what's the matter with you? Something wrong with uh, his nibs? No, he's fine. Sleeping like a... Uh, uh baby. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Oh, darling. <sighs> Angie. <sighs> Tom, darling, I don't care what you do with your spare time. You just have so little of it. But I do want you to relax. Mm, look at who's talking. You can't kid me anymore since I had the baby. It took Christopher to teach me how to slow down. This time off from the soap opera has been invaluable to me. Mm, this building and remodeling is good for me. It's uh, sort of therapy. It looks like hard, tiring work to me. But it isn't. It's a joy. It's a real challenge. Like uh, these shelves I'm building into these two alcoves. They're going to be wonderful. We've got crates of books, and the shelves balance the ones around the fireplace on the opposite wall. Now, that's just the point. Why does the wall stick out in the middle here a couple of feet? I thought we knew all about that. It's because the big kitchen fireplace backs up on this... And the stick-out part here is the chimney and the flue. That's what I thought at first. But look, what if it was a double flue? And behind this is a second living room fireplace. So? What if it is? Angie, can't you see? If the living room here had opposing fireplaces, how, how it'd make the room uh, stunning instead of just plain marvelous. <laughs> I see what you mean. Hmm. But wouldn't it be a terrible amount of work? <laughs> I'm not suggesting we start tonight. Good, because I want you to come up to the attic with me. I've been finding all sorts of interesting stuff up there. Oh, mm, like what? Something that would please me and make me happy if it could be salvaged. An old mirror and vanity. I thought they might be just right in the bedroom. Mm, if there's anything connected with the bedroom I haven't provided so far, by all means. <laughs> you <let's>, uh, idiot. <laughs> come on, darling. <laughs> let's have a look at your vanity in the attic. I suppose what I found is ours. Didn't the house come as is? As mm, far as I know. Well, it isn't all that great. I'll show you. There's a light somewhere. It's overhead, right in the middle. Half a sec. Uh, there. Oh, oh gesundheit. <laughs> Boy, there's enough dust. I don't think anyone's been up here except me in the last 50 years. Mm, more like the last century. There's a sort of a little lost alcove over here between the eaves and the chimney wall. The stuff's in here. Mm. Uh, shall I drag it out? Would you mind? Oh. Uh, uh, here's your vanity thing. Ooh, heavier than it looks. Uh, 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 Gesundheit! Uh, turn about is fair play. Still, maybe uh, some tortured spirit from the past is trying to tell us something. What? <laughs> Amidst the dust of ages, from out the grave I cry... Open not the pages, let sleeping vanities lie. What's 
that from? <laughs> Made it up myself. <laughs> okay, I lugged out your dressing hmm? table. Does it still grab you? You know what it is? That's mahogany inlaid with rosewood. And look at that marvelous three-quarter length oval mirror. Uh, what about the rest of the junk in here? I don't think it's anything we'd want. Except maybe the trunk. Hmm? What's in there? I don't know. I didn't know if I should open it. Or could. Oh, let's have a look. <gasps> oh, my. What is it? Faded old baby clothes. Oh, aren't they sweet? All handmade. <gasps> and? Well, they've never been used. Any of them. At least, I'm pretty sure not. <laughs> Anything we can use for Christopher? No. They're practically disintegrating. They must be a hundred years old. Anyway, I, I don't want Christopher in any hand-me-downs. Oh, honey, I was only kidding. Oh, look at this. What? An old photograph. Isn't she beautiful? Let me see. Yeah, she is. <laughs> You know why? What do you mean? She looks a lot like you. You see it? She does. Sort of. Only I'm not that pretty. Oh, don't you ever believe it. She looks awful sad, though. Her eyes are kind of... haunted. Mm hmm Gives you a shivery feeling. I wonder what got her so uptight. Maybe these clothes were for her baby... And she lost it or something. So, uh... What do I do about this dressing table? Oh, just leave it till we know if it's ours to use. Yeah, check into it first thing tomorrow morning. What a racket! It's a wonder I ever got the little king off for his nap. <laughs> I'm sorry, Angie. I just wanted to get this last shelf up before I get back to my uh, other profession. <laughs> I came down to remind you it's time to get showered, shaved, fed, and off for the theater. Okay. Uh, just one last thing before I go. What? Uh, stand back. I can't resist this. <laughs> Are you crazy? What are you doing? Just uh, proving I'm right. Ah, there, you see, there is a fireplace behind here. Okay, you convinced me. But did you have to make all this mess? I just had to convince myself. Leaving me to clean up. Well, I'll do it. You haven't time. Oh, darling, I'm sorry. Don't be. I'd work my fingers to the bone for this house. I love it. Are you sure? You know, it's going to be a tough commute once you're back on the TV series again. You working days, me nights at the theater... We'll be lucky to meet each other coming and going. It won't always be like that. And it's worth it. This is all I ever wanted. Oh, by the way, who was on the phone? Huh? Oh, 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 uh, that was uh, Marge from Copley Realty. She got in touch with Mr. Kiever. Who? McChesney Kiever, the old boy who owned this house before we bought it. Says he doesn't know anything about the things we found in the attic, and we're welcome to him. That's wonderful. Mm. Now, you want to uh, lug your famous vanity down to the bedroom before I go clean up? Doesn't it look magnificent? There's no question. It's a handsome piece of furniture in its way. I know it's old-fashioned and Victorian, Tom. But that's its charm. It fits the room. It just sits there by the wall as though it belonged there. If you like it, I like it. And I really do, anyway. It's uh, an unexpected bonanza. Hey, I can't hang around here admiring it. I'm going to miss half hour tonight. Go on and have your shower. What are you going to do? Oh, just take a sponge and clean up the mirror a bit. Why don't you do it tomorrow instead? You look tired. Oh, I have it away. Don't know what it is. Although your son and heir did keep me up quite a bit last night. Well, maybe he's uh, having a tooth. Four and a half weeks? Idiot. <laughs> Go shave. Okay, okay. Hmm. Okay, old mirror. Let's see what a little elbow grease and 
soap can do. <laughs> Come on. You've got to do better than that. It's like looking at someone underwater. Come clean. That's better. That. Oh, no. That's not me. That's... Uh, who are you? Who do you want? Who? Tom! Tom! Angie, what is it? What's wrong? Look. Where? In the mirror. What? Can't you see? Oh, yes, a, a reflection. It's, it's not very good, sort of wavy, but... Well, well, who is it? Who is it? Well, you, darling, of course. Well, no, no, it's not me. Can't you see? It's her. Her? Who, who's her? The girl. The girl in the old faded photograph. The one in the trunk. What's the matter with you? Can't you recognize her? Angie, Angie, here, here. Now, come away from that for a minute. No, I can't. Don't you see? She's trying to say something to me. Lie down for a while. Here, let me hold you. Don't make me leave here. She's counting on me. Just rest for a moment. You've got nothing to worry about. All right. If you'll... Just... Just do one thing. What? Look in the mirror again. What? Well, sure. If it'll make you feel better. What do you see? Well, nothing but my own reflection, half shaved, with uh, soap sticking to my face. I don't believe you. Let me look. All right. What do you see? Mm. Angie, what do you see? Nothing. What? But my own reflection. But a moment ago, I... Oh, Tom, what's the matter with me? Am I going out of my mind? What is the answer to Angie's question? The only thing one can see in a mirror is a reflection. But supposing, just supposing... You looked in a mirror and found a totally different person staring back at you. Someone who must have been dead long ago. Would your reaction have been so different from Angie Barr's? I shall return shortly with Act Two. WBBM Chicago. quiet bedroom, Tom sits holding Angie's hand. She lies in the bed, immobile, perhaps asleep. Tom's eyes are gloomy and brooding, his gaze fixed on the mirror on the vanity, his brow crinkled with concern. Now Angie opens her eyes. Tom? Yes, Angie? Forgive me. I don't know what got into me. Neither do I. That's what worries me. It is crazy, isn't it? I guess it was the trunk full of the baby clothes. Stored away and never used. That kind of hit me. I mean, supposing anything had happened to Christopher, I'd... I'd have had the same collection in my... Oh, Angie, stop it. Don't think that way. Thank the Lord we don't have to... But I do understand the way that poor girl must have felt. Honey, we don't even know if it was her baby. Or even if she had one in the first place. <laughs> hey, look at the time. I've got to get you some dinner and get you on the train for New York. Uh, no, I'm not going to the theater tonight. <sighs> what do you mean you're not going? You've got to. It's in your contract. Well, the standby can go on. I'm calling in sick. I can't leave you alone up here, Angie. you not... Not after what happened. I'll be all right. Honest, Tom. 
Look, I- I'll prove it. I'm looking in the mirror, and what do I see? Me. That's all. And I look like something the cat dragged in. Mm, one good reason I'm not leaving you. You can't be alone. I'm not alone. I've got Christopher. Well, suppose you had another wing ding who'll take care of him. All right. I'll get someone over here to be with me. Marge or someone. But I can't let you miss a performance because of me. Please, Tom. I'd never forgive myself. Okay. Just so long as there's someone here with you. Oh, isn't he a killer? Hey there, Tiger. Say hello to your Andy Marge. What does this kid weigh? Eight pounds, twelve and three-quarter ounces. Oh, you better call the Giants. They could draft him for defensive tackle. <laughs> He's not going to be a football player. <gasps> Come on, Marge. Give him to me. <laughs> it's his bedtime. Yeah. Oh, this man is raring to go. He's not going to sleep. He will once we leave. <laughs> I uh, want to take a gander at this famous mirror and the vanity. I um, think maybe I don't want to be around it anymore tonight. Oh, okay. Skip it. But, uh, you know, as the realtor who sold you this house, I feel responsible. Well, just because I had a sudden attack of the crazies? I don't know what got into me. Oh, neither do I. Oh, that is a beauty. Any idea of what this thing's worth? I didn't think about that. I just had an urge to bring it down here into the bedroom. Mm. Of course, the mirror's pretty well shot, but you can have that replaced. (laughs) I don't wonder you saw visions in it. It's like looking down a well. It's not that bad. Just a couple of spots where the backing is worn off. Oh, and the ripple effect. Phew. I know I'm no beauty, but I get a load of that rattled old bag that's staring back at me. Let's see what it does for you. Go on, go ahead. Sit down. I'm, uh, not so anxious to look in it. You might as well. Get used to the fact that it makes everybody look like someone else, more or less. Oh, that that is a pretty one. My face I'm known. looking at. Just as good as you What's she trying to say to me? And that it wouldn't Why does she reach out her arm? A- Angie? Angie, what happened to you? Where'd you go? Uh nothing. I uh I'm right here. You you saw her again. Saw who? The woman in the mirror. Yes, Marge. I... I saw her. Now, listen to me. You just thought you saw her. You couldn't have. I was right here, looking into the mirror, and I didn't see anything but you. Just the same. She was there. But she couldn't be. I didn't see her. You say Tom didn't. But I saw her. If she is a real person... I never said she was real. You mean she... She's a ghost? Oh, come off it, Angie. There's no such thing. If there isn't, it means I'm hallucinating. Either there's a ghost that lives in that mirror and is trying to tell me something, or... I'm just plain crazy. Oh, of course you aren't. But maybe... Well, you know, having the kid moving, worried about your career, you just got uh, nervous. I wish there was some way I could help, but you got to see your doctor for this, Angie. I have an appointment with him tomorrow. Good. I I wish there was something I could do. You can help me, March. How? You sold us this house. Well, if I'd had any idea I'm not blaming you. I just want to... Do you think you could arrange for me to meet the old gentleman who owned it? Oh, honey, I never even met him myself. It was all done through lawyers. Can I meet the lawyer so I can get around to seeing him? Well... What do you want to see him for? I want to ask him about this vanity and the mirror and the trunk with some baby clothes and who it is in the picture I have. Angie, you didn't have to wait up for... Oh, I'm sorry, Marge. I uh, saw the light here in the living room. I thought it was Angie. Oh, she just went upstairs a minute. Your son and heir was kicking up a storm. Well, I didn't mean for you to stay so late with Angie. Oh, I would not have left that beautiful wife of yours for anything till you got home. Why? Did, uh, did something happen? Oh, it sure did. She thought she saw something in that mirror again. 
How do you know? Well, I was in the room as she was putting Chris down for the night, and like a fool, I wanted to have a close look at the piece of furniture. I said something about the mirror being so decrepit. Anyone would look a fright in it. But you know me, that wasn't enough hangnail psychology. I calmed her into sitting down and looking at herself in it, just to show it was a plain, ordinary mirror. And before you knew it, she was off on some kind of a trip. You said she saw something in it? Yeah, the, the same woman. Uh, Tom, you've got to make sure that that girl of yours gets to the doctor. Uh, she has an appointment with him in the morning, huh? I was going to babysit while she went. No, look, I'll be glad to babysit for you, Tom. You just make sure she tells the doctor about this fantasy of hers or whatever it is. And this reflection in the mirror or this woman who seems to appear isn't anyone you know. No, doctor. Well, that is, in a way... I mean, she looks like me, sort of. And also like the picture of the woman Angie found in an old trunk in the attic. Uh, the one with all the unused baby clothes. Yes. What do you think it could be, Doctor? Well, instead of that, let me tell you what I think it isn't. What's that? You're a relatively new patient for me, Mrs. Barr, but all the records I've received on you from Dr. Frazier, they indicate that you're a healthy, well-balanced young woman. But you are an actress. And you have just had a baby. I don't see what that's got to do with it. I think I do. This mysterious visitor has appeared twice. Once right after you'd found the old trunk full of baby clothes and the picture of a woman who, I must say, does look remarkably like you. Very beautiful woman, I might add. Mm, has to be if she looks like Angie. I agree. Now, Mrs. Barr. You say yourself that you immediately leaped to the conclusion that the woman in the picture was a mother who'd lost her baby. Doesn't it seem logical? It could also be logical that this was a woman who couldn't have the baby she wanted, or who had lost her husband before she could, or who lost her life before she could give birth, or... Well, there are many possibilities. The only important thing is that, as an actress... You were sensitive enough to fantasize immediately. You dreamed you saw her. You said you were tired and sleepy at the time. I wasn't tired when I saw her the second time. But you just put your baby to sleep. And unconsciously, this woman was again strongly in the back of your mind. Well, I'm not going to speculate anymore. All I can tell you is that, in my opinion, you're in the pink of good health. And I'd make one simple recommendation. What's that, Doctor? Get rid of the old vanity, Mr. Barr. And with that, I'm sure you'll get rid of your wife's hallucinations also. Hello? It's uh, Tom, Angie. You all right? Tom, where are you? Aren't you at the theater? Yeah, yeah, it's intermission. Uh, I was worrying about you, so I just thought I'd call. Uh, what are you doing? I just finished feeding the baby, and I was putting him to bed. Uh, everything okay? Uh, I mean... Tom, we took the vanity back up to the attic, even though I felt kind of silly about it. So what could be wrong? Well, I don't know. I'm perfectly all right. I hope. Just wish I'd gotten a nurse for the baby so there'd be someone with you. Cheer up. She comes next Monday. I promise you, I'll make out till then. Yeah, well, oh, hang, they're calling places. Uh, Angie, uh, don't stay up for me. <sighs> I won't. As soon as I get Chris off, I'm going to bed myself. And stop worrying about me. I'll try. Angie? Yes? I love you. And I love you. Oh, oh mother's little darling. Were you jealous because I said I loved another man? Hmm? You know Mommy loves you just as much. She knows just how wonderful you are and how much you mean to her. Don't cry, honey. Mommy has you safe in her arms. <gasps> What's that? Well, it sounded as though someone cried out. No! No one will harm 
from you. It's coming from the attic. It's her. The one in the mirror. We'll help her, won't we? My big, big man. We shouldn't have locked her away. We shouldn't. She's trying to tell us something. I can't. I can't turn away. She's asking for help. I've got to try. Where's the light? Here in the mirror. Her back is turned. She's searching. Searching for... Wait. She turned around. Oh, no! No! You can't have him! You can't have my baby! Whatever she has seen in the mirror, Angie, clutching her child to her with one hand, has lunged forward and spun the glass towards the wall so violently that the mirror shatters into a thousand shimmering pieces. Like a wild animal, Angie rushes headlong down the stairs from the attic to lock herself and her baby in her bedroom. I shall return shortly with Act Three. in the train, Tom Barr has had this twisting of unease below his stomach. Most of us have felt this premonition at one time or another about someone we love, this kinetic feeling that can only be explained by ESP, or simple hunch. From the train, he has hurried to his car, driven to the house recklessly, calmed at the last moment by its quiet exterior as he turns into the drive, with only one light shining from the bedroom. Reassured, he parks the car and walks upstairs to the bedroom door. Oh, Tom, I'm so glad to see you home, darling. Oh, it's all right, Angie. Hey, you're trembling all over. What is it? Oh, it's my fault. What? What is? It happened... It happened just after you called me. I just... I just hung up when... Okay. Okay, darling. Oh, Tom, I'm so sorry. I didn't want this to happen. What the hell? After I hung up, I went to talk to Christopher a moment. And suddenly I heard someone. Kind of far off, calling for help. I picked up the baby and went to the attic door to listen. Because it didn't seem like it was coming from outside. When I opened the attic door, it was louder. Are you crazy? You, you thought someone was inside the house and you... Who did you think it was? I didn't have to think. I knew it was her. Oh, no. I wasn't afraid then. I was only sorry for her. I mean, her voice was so sad and desperate. So I... I went up to the attic. For heaven's sake, why? I don't know, darling. I can't explain it. I could hear the voice, and it was echoey and, and strange. And sometimes I felt as if it was even coming from inside me. But I had to go. I had to respond to her call for help. You must have been out of your mind carrying the baby. I couldn't leave him alone. And I never thought. I... I never dreamed what could happen. Even after I... I saw her, I... You saw her? Where? In the mirror. When I turned on the attic light. It was... It was like looking through a window into someone else's house. Only it wasn't. It was this house, our bedroom, as though I was the one in the mirror and looking through from where the vanity was. Darling Angie, don't try to go through she it now. Was, she was coming through the door, just as you did now, and as if she had been searching the house. She was crying crying out for someone to help her find her child. I wanted to help. 
Only suddenly... Suddenly what? She saw me with the baby in my arms. And she rushed towards me, getting bigger and bigger, till I knew she was going to burst right through the frame. And I thought, she's going to take my baby. And I took the mirror, and I turned it swivel to make the glass face the wall, and I I guess there wasn't room, so it... It smashed, and the mirror flew everywhere. Hush, hush, Angie. It's all right. I'm here now. What are we going to do? Well, well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. One thing for sure. We are going to get out of this house. I don't think I'll ever feel safe again, Tom. Unless whoever she is finds her lost baby. <laughs> What are you doing? Oh, indulging in some emotional therapy, I guess. Anyway, since we'll have to sell a house, I've got to fix up this wall I broke through to the fireplace. I don't want to move, Tom. This is our house. Why should we be chased out of it? Well, I should think you could answer that easier than me, Angie. I can't help what I saw last night. What I heard. I didn't say you could. I'm not going to be driven out of my house. I won't let it happen. This is a problem that's got to be solved right here. Oh, uh, by the way, Marge called. What does she want? Oh, something about McChesney Kiever. You know, the old boy who owned the house before we bought it. She said he was anxious to talk to us. Well, to you. Did you, uh, ask her to contact him? Yes, I did. Why? Because he's my only hope to establish that there really is a ghost in this house. And perhaps give us a clue how she can be exorcised. Angie, Tom, uh, this is Mr. Kiever. How kind of you to come. Mr. Kiever? Under the circumstances, there was little else I could do. Look, uh, why don't I leave you three together, huh? And go up and spend some time with Christopher. Would you, Marge? You're a lifesaver. <laughs> don't ask to see my badge. I failed Girl Scouts. Won't you sit down, Mr. Kiever? No, I think perhaps I'd rather stand... Ah, see, you're breaking through that wall there. Yeah, yeah, I um, thought there had to be a fireplace behind there. Oh, no, please don't apologize. Any apologies in this room must come from me. You're perfectly right, of course, there is a fireplace. But you haven't opened it all the way yet. Well, matter of fact, having a... Satisfied myself, my guess was right. I've been considering closing it up again. Ah, I see. Well, we shall leave that decision until I finish my confession. Confession? Whether the facts are proven true or not. For what Mrs. James has told me, since the discovery of the old vanity, you've been plagued by a series of inexplicable events. I'm ashamed to say I realize that. I have visited upon you a legacy of guilt. I do wish you would sit down, Mr. Kiever. In due time, my dear. I'll try to make this as brief as possible. It's painful to me. My father was H. Haverford Kiever, a moving spirit in these parts. I was born, I always thought... In this house in 1895, I'm 84. Can I get you something to drink, sir? Um, some tea, some water? No, 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 let me finish. Uh, my, my father was something of a um, philanderer. <laughs> Dear me, that, that sounds impossibly old-fashioned. But all those years ago, it was neither simple nor funny. Fortunately, he was rich. So, having got a certain young woman in trouble, when it became no longer possible to conceal her problem, he arranged to have her, what shall I say, um, domiciled nearby in his summer house. This house. 
that was the lovely young woman in the picture I found? By no means. That picture was of the woman I grew up believing was my mother. But she wasn't? Uh, Bear with me. Alexandra, for that was my father's wife's name, was pregnant at the same time as my father's mistress. But when the moment came for both of them to deliver, the mistress delivered first, the wife second, with only one difference. The first baby was alive and healthy. The second lost not only its own life, but the mother's as well. I don't understand which was which. That was the legacy of guilt. You see, I grew up believing that my mother died in childbirth and that the woman my father married after a decent interval was my foster mother. But she was actually your real mother? Yes. But how? What happened to the baby who was stillborn? I have only my father's word for that. I've never wanted to test if it really was the truth. It didn't seem to matter anymore. What do you mean, your father's word? After his death, when the estate was finally settled, I was handed a letter that my father had left for me. I destroyed it after I read it, but I remember very clearly how it began. My dear and only son... I have lived with a lie all my life. And even now, confession comes hard to me. I bear a terrible guilt that I was responsible for destroying your relationship with your mother. There is no way I can make amends. This is only a selfish attempt to clear my own soul. I don't understand. I grew up believing that I had been responsible for my mother's death. And I resented my father's wife for pretending to be my mother, not knowing that she really was. Do you understand now? You were substituted for the child that died. Correct. But what happened to the dead baby? It was too late for it to become a matter of record. It had to be disposed of. How? I must admit that after reading my father's letter, I put it out of my mind. You see, it didn't matter anymore. I wasn't even sure if I believed any of it. Of course, there was always an easy way to prove it. But somehow it didn't seem worth the effort. What was it, sir? Life is so frequently more bizarre and unreal than any story. You see... There's a problem in opposing fireplaces. If one flue draws better than the other, a room can quickly be filled by smoke. At the time I was born, my father was in the process of walling up one of the fireplaces in this room. There was a small and tiny corpse to be disposed of. Where better than a hearth that was about to cease to exist also. Oh, murder. No, 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 no. Not that. I I just meant that... Now that it's all out in the open, why don't we make sure? Uh, no, uh, let me... It won't take a moment to knock out the rest of the bricks. So that's why she haunts this house. She's looking for her lost baby. I can't answer that, my dear. But it seemed to me imperative that you know the whole story. I would never have sold you the house if I'd known it was haunted. Then you believe with me it is? Yesterday I would have scoffed at that. Today I... Oh, 
my lord. What is it? Look for yourselves. Huh? A skeleton. It's so tiny. But big enough to bring the truth to light at last. <laughs> Okay. I have it. Put it down. All right. Now you drop your end first. That, that's it. There. There. Back where it belongs. Oh, I don't know how you talk me into these things. <laughs> Why would you want the vanity back down here? I just said it. Because it's where it belongs. Without a mirror? We'll replace that. Oh, that poor old man. Huh? Mr. Kiever. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget his face when he went to touch that little skeleton. And it just powdered to dust. Hmm. It was almost as if his whole life ended in that moment. Hey, Angie, what are you doing? Looking in the one piece of the old mirror that's left. You know what it really shows? What? Me. Happy, fulfilled with my own baby to hold in my arms any time I reach for him. Just as that poor ghost I saw, or dreamed I saw, has hers to comfort her in eternity. We can forget the past. All we have to look forward to is what life is all about. The future. So the ghost is laid to rest. A tiny ghost, never even born, but one who has perhaps found immortality in the arms of a mother who gave her own life to bear him. The past is buried. The legacy of guilt wiped out. And Tom and Angie Barr can once again look ahead to their marriage promise with as much hope as anyone else can to live happily ever afterwards. Maybe we're all too emotional when... We didn't have any flashes of lightning or driving rain, but it was a ghost story all the same. A true ghost story. Because if you don't believe in spirits and beasties and all those other things that are accused of haunting our waking dreams, how do you account for what Angie saw in that fateful mirror? One parting thought. How safe will you feel the next time you look in yours? Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Russell Horton, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. She thinks that you are her son. And if she thought otherwise, there is no telling how she would react. You will come home with me now, and we will all have dinner. And tonight, when Dorothy has gone to bed and is asleep... You and I will discuss a few matters. Such as? Such as what you have done with my real son, Robert. Is that a simple request, Professor Melville, or an order? Perhaps this will persuade you. The... Mr. Melville, put that revolver back in your pocket. You can't kill me. A bullet has no effect on this body whatsoever. You cannot threaten me with death. I do not die. I'll return with you to your house, and as you say, later tonight, we shall have a little talk. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall with another tale of the macabre. The word has chilling connotations, but that's our stock in trade. Ours is a shadowy, uncharted world of spirits, dreams, and psychic experiences. 
however forbidding this particular story may strike you, it is based on fact. The phenomenon about to be unfolded occurred in a city in the Midwest. Captain Burgess, chief of detectives, has a puzzled expression on his face. The uh, murdered woman didn't mention his name or describe him, Mrs. Hoy? No, Captain. I I remember nothing. My husband should not have mentioned it. You will think us foolish. Dr. Hoy? The Chinese are psychic, Captain. What I told you is true. I listened as Charlene Ali spoke through the lips of my sleeping wife, Chang Chin. Charlene will lead us to her murderer. Our mystery story, The Voice from the Grave, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Earl Hammond. I'll be back shortly with Act One. As you have already inferred, the subject of our story is a psychic phenomenon. Although most of us probably admit the possibility of such an experience, I don't suppose that many of us know anyone to whom it has occurred. Medicine accepts the psychic without understanding him thoroughly. One definition is a person, and I quote, apparently sensitive to non-physical forces. Captain Burgess is in his office at police headquarters. And that's the whole story, Ralph? That's it, Captain. We questioned everybody cross-examine them over and over until the hospital super, Mr. Gilman, said we were interfering with the staff and get out or he'd telephone the commissioner. Ah, give it up, Norm. It's just another unsolved killing. We got more important things to worry about. Charlena Lee was murdered. <sighs> What's with you in this Charlena Lee? <sighs> the, uh, the brutality of it, left under a mattress with a knife in her stomach and set on fire, was senseless and vicious. Why are you in this business, Ralph? Hmm? Huh? You're a cop because deep inside your cynical exterior, you want the city to be safe for the decent citizens. Oh, and someone goes crazy, it's our job to arrest him before he does more damage. Now, somebody brutally murdered that Chinese woman, and I intend to get that someone and send him to the chair. We've worked our tails off, Norm. Nothing, as you said. No motive we can find. She, she didn't earn much money as a lab technician. No sex life. And she lived simple. No real friends, except for Mrs. Hoy, the wife of this Dr. Too Noy, heart specialist. Mrs. Hoy worked with Charlena. They're Chinese, too. They haven't a clue to why Charlena was murdered. But there is a clue someplace. Now, it's just a matter of digging it out. Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Yes, yes, put him on. Yes, this is Captain Burgess. My, my father. Well, is he alive? Yes, yes, I, I'll, I'll leave now. Thank you, Dr. Hoy. An accident? No, 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 a heart attack. Uh, my dad, uh, that was Dr. Hoy. He, he was very reassuring. Oh, I'm sorry, no. Yeah, yeah. well, I'll uh, be at Oakdale General. Captain Burgess, uh, please sit down. Oh, yes, uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you for telephoning me personally. You are welcome. You have seen your father? <laughs> yes, yes. He, he even winked at me from under the oxygen tent. Uh, uh, how is he really, Dr. Hoy? Well, it's too early to tell. He appears to be strong. I have every hope he will recover. It is a matter of rest. Your mother has requested special nurses for the next few days. Oh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, please uh, do everything you can for him. Uh, how long will he be hospitalized, Doctor? Oh, three, perhaps only two weeks. Then he must rest at home. Oh, well, I'll, I'll drop in to see him once a day. Now, that will be a tonic for him. <laughs> yes. Uh, Doctor... While I'm here, I uh, want to apologize for the investigation, which is, well, 
disrupted the hospital staff. The uh, superintendent... Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Dr. Gilman's been very upset. The police have persistently questioned every one of us. Technicians, nurses, my wife, me, the interns, everyone. It has been distracting. Well, so is murder. Yes. Poor Charlene Lee. Uh, have you made any progress, Captain? Well, we're still searching for a clue, and we will find it. And by a clue, you mean a fingerprint or an alibi that can be broken? Or someone who can place a murderer close to his victim? Uh, no, no, no. Those are, uh, those are routine. In the case of Charlene and Lee, none of them apply. There were no fingerprints, uh, the alibi seemed to be legitimate, and no one saw anybody near the victim's residence. It's, it's close by, as you know. So you conclude that one of Miss Lee's co-workers committed the murder? Oh, no, no, no. It's not a conclusion, but a working basis in the investigation. Now, what stumps us is the motive. Unless it was a senseless murder by someone deranged, there was a motive, and we have to find it. You still have no idea what it might be? No. Uh, you've thought about the murder, of course, Dr. Hoy. What is your opinion? I hesitate to offer it. Our conversation is confidential, Doctor. Oh, I realize that. I have hesitated to come forth because I don't want what I would say to prejudice you against someone who might be innocent. You do have a suspect? No. Hmm. But I do have some information for you. Well, why have you withheld it until now? Because we do not want to appear foolish. We? Uh, my wife, Chan Ching, and I... What I am about to tell you is true. The Chinese are a psychic people, Captain. Ah, uh, yes, so I believe. Americans are inclined to doubt it. Still, it is true. The murdered woman, Sharena Lee, has spoken through the lips of my wife when she was sound asleep. It, uh, it wasn't Mrs. Hoy talking in her sleep. No, sir. The voice I heard come from my wife, but it was the voice of Miss Lee. Oh, that's fantastic. Not fantastic, because it was real. I heard her. Uh, I realize that it is hard to believe. What did you hear, Doctor? I wrote down the essence of it... I uh, have a copy of it in my drawer. Here it is. Read it aloud. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, I, Dr. Toon Hoy, heard the following from the lips of my wife, Chang Ching. Not in her voice, but in the voice of Charlena Lee, who was murdered. The voice said, What are you doing? You're choking me. Please, I can't breathe. My ring... My gold pin, no. Sing gave them. The television said, are you insane? Let me go, let me... And that's it, Dr. Hoy? The words were spoken in horror and anguish. The woman was fighting for her life. Oh, that's, it's incredible. It was awful. It terrified me. I shook my wife awake. She was annoyed. She did not remember a single word she had spoken in Charlena's voice. You can understand why I have withheld this from you. I am a doctor, a man of science. <sighs> it is the weirdest thing that I've ever heard. I, it's not just thought transference. Miss Lee is dead and buried. I have mentioned this now because in the last few days, my wife has received two threatening phone calls. Then someone has seen this piece of paper, Doctor. Who has access to this office? Oh, everyone, Captain. My cardiology team, uh, nurses, maintenance personnel, visitors. I have no idea of who might have opened my desk drawer and seen this transcript. Miss Lee was robbed of a ring and a gold pin, so robbery was the motive. A ring and a gold pin, a television set... 
That was still in her living room. Hmm? Singh. Who was Singh? Have you any idea? No, sir. Has this been helpful? Well, I, I, I don't know. I appreciate you telling me, Dr. Hoy, but what you said and what I've read just deepens the mystery. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll sort this out, Doctor. What you heard helps in one way. The man who murdered Miss Lee knows that she has spoken through your wife. That's why Mrs. Hoy has been threatened. Now, what if Mrs. Hoy has another uh, psychic experience? Yes, and mentions the murderer's name. I'll assign a bodyguard to your wife. Oh, she will find that most disagreeable. Well, she won't even know she's being protected. Well, thank you, Doctor. This has been very helpful. I hope so. Now, it's a lead. It's not evidence, but it is a lead. It sure would be crazy to catch a killer with a voice from the grave. <laughs> believe it, Norm? Oh, I don't disbelieve it. Why would Dr. Hoy make it up, huh? Well, Mrs. Hoy's got a real imagination. She was this Miss Lee's friend. The, the, the murder weighs on her. She imagined stuff, but she spoke in Miss Lee's voice. Okay, if you say so. Just don't mention it to the DA. <laughs> you get the big haul. Oh, oh. uh, no, no, there is nothing to mention. There is no evidence. It's only a lead. Lead? What lead? Well, we start with the fences in town. Oh, uh, no. By the time we've checked every one of them, I'll be ready for retirement. Anyway, how do we know the ring and the pin were sold? We don't. Maybe the killer kept them. But we we got to start somewhere. And another thing, what happened to Miss Lee's things? Uh, her personal things? There are none. Oh, and a worn suitcase, dresses, hospital uniforms, a few books, most of them about stargazing, life after death, that kind of stuff. Where are they? Well, gosh, I don't know. Find out and bring everything to my office. What for? A clue. I want to know about that ring and that pin and a guy named Singh. There's a hundred things in the city. Well, that should keep you busy. <laughs> Give me a description of the ring and the pin. I'll have an exact one for you after I speak with Mrs. Hoy. I'm going up there at six. In the meantime, find Miss Lee's belongings. Go through them. All right, all right. What am I looking for? Well, if you're lucky, reference to this guy, Singh. I thought she didn't have any men friends. That's what I've been told. Do I have to believe it? Oh. Captain Burgess and my wife, Chung Ching. Oh, I'm uh, pleased to meet you, Mrs. Hoy. Uh, you interest yourself in Charlene Ali? Uh, yes, yes, and you have been helpful because of what she said through you. It does not amuse you, Captain. Oh, no, no, I take it seriously. It's the only lead we have. I do not recall anything that she said through me. My husband... Ah, uh, I wrote down what she said... After you telephone, I wrote down again about the jewelry. My wife remembers it. The description is there. Oh, thank you. Thank you. They were her only treasures. Those two pieces. A sapphire set in a silver band. Ah, uh, on which, uh, which finger did she wear it, Mrs. Hoy? The, the fourth finger on the left hand. Uh, and the pin? Gold. In the form of the leaf of a clover. It was delicately made. A lovely pin. Very expensive. Uh, uh, we understand that she uh, had no men friends. None that we knew of. But who was Singh? The ring on her wedding finger. Singh? Did she ever mention him once? No, not to me. Charlina was secretive. Is it important? Yes. Yes, it could be. If we had his full name. A disappointed lover? It's possible. Or a man she loved. Did he buy the ring and the pin? Hmm? If I had his full name, we could trace him. And then there's the uh, mention of the television set. Now, what could that mean? Charlena, I had trouble with that set. Someone was always repairing it. Any idea who he was, Mrs. Hoy? It could have been one of several men who worked for the hospital. 
I will try to find out for you, Captain. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I think we're getting somewhere. Oh, uh, one other favor, Doctor. Yes. Is it possible that Mrs. Hoy might have another psychic experience? I cannot tell. Why do you ask? Because if she does, I want to be notified. I'd like to be here when Charlena again speaks through her. You may shake your head. I did when I first heard the story. When you're asked to believe in a literal voice from the grave, the voice of a corpse that spoke through a sleeping, living person... But however strange it may seem, it happened. That opens up speculation about a number of subjects. Life after death, spirits that may wander the earth, the riddle of the universe. I'll have more when I return shortly with Act Two. Without exception, the exception being those who believe that everything is finite. We wonder what happens after death occurs. Religion, in its many aspects, holds forth the promise of life after death, presupposing that the soul is immortal. Some believe that a person's soul or spirit wanders the earth until, for some reason, it finds peace. Until then, Can it manifest itself? Can a dead person speak to the living? In Dr. Hoy's office at the hospital. Good morning, Dwight. Morning. Is it okay work on that, Doctor? Eh? The intercom. Well, they told me... Oh, right, yes. The buzzer doesn't work. Huh? Oh, I guess I can fix that. I'll hurry. Well, there's no need to hurry. I'm free until ten. I'll get out of your way. Okay. Okay. Won't take me long. Uh, heard anything about Miss Lee? Hmm? Nothing here, Doctor. Cops have turned everyone inside out. They got any leads? No, but they haven't given up. Have any of the nurses an idea of who might have murdered her? How would I know? Will you date? <laughs> Some of them, Dwight. <laughs> hey, we got other things to talk about. Uh, she's quickly forgotten, except by one or two friends. Yeah, and she was a loner. Did you ever date her? Hmm? No, no. The cops asked me. Uh, guess it hit Mrs. Hoy pretty hard, huh? Right? Hmm? Yes. She still dreams about it. Uh, uh, so I heard. There you go. You're all fixed, Doctor. You heard about my wife's dreams? Good. Try it. Come on, put your secretary. Oh, yes, all right. See if she buzzes back. Ah, good. <laughs> Thank you, Dwight. That was quick now. Oh, that's okay. Um, may I request a favor? I'd pay you for it, of course. Sure. Can you repair... Oh, well, of course you can. A television set? One of ours at home. Mm, yeah, I guess so, but... Uh, well, Noto's better than I am. You know, Johnny Noto? Another guy in maintenance. You know him? He's very, very good. Ah, yes. Maybe I'll speak to him. Well, I can do the work, but you see, Johnny's the expert. He takes care of all the screens here. I'm I'm not bad. I'm just slower. Oh, then why don't you help me out? Well, okay. Some evening. I'm off at five. Fine. I'll let you know when it's convenient. Uh, Will that be all right? Sure. Oh, by the way, Dwight... Uh, just curiosity, who told you about the dreams? And your wife? About Charlena? Oh, and Johnny. He uh, had it from a floor nurse, and she had it from your secretary. At least, that's what he told me. Why? Well, not important. Just odd. Maybe Mrs. Hoy did talk about her dream. Why not? Cafeteria, maybe. <laughs> oh, women talk. But Mrs. Hoy doesn't know the details of the dream. Only I do, Dwight. Yeah? Well, how come I heard it from Johnny? I'll speak to my secretary. Oh, yeah, that's that's where it started. I mean, that's what Johnny said. Did 
Johnny know that Miss Lee spoke through my wife? Charlene is dead. Are you kidding me, Doc? I'm serious. It worries me. Mrs. Hoy could be in danger. No. Who believes Charlene had talked to Mrs. Hoy? Nobody, I suppose. Well, you let me know about the TV set. Nice to talk to you, Doc. Uh, Miss Michaels, please telephone Captain Burgess in the detective bureau. And then I have a question to ask you. men at Oakdale General. They're electricians. So? They know how to repair TV sets. You're reaching. Noto was on the night shift. Five until twelve. Taylor was off at five and went home. Can they account for where they were between 5.30 and 7 when the fire was discovered? Uh, sure. Noto punched in at five. Taylor went home. Witnesses? Sure. Security saw Noto at six, repairing a lamp connection in the lobby. Taylor's wife swears he was home by six. Oh, well, I didn't think he was married. Isn't he on the, uh, on the town? Well, um, it's an arrangement. He's a macho guy. He <laughs> well, thinks he is. Where does he live? Foster Avenue, by the lake. Drive to work? No, he takes a bus. Mm hmm. And Miss Lee? She had a car. She left alone? Was anyone in the car with her? Is there a parking lot at Thunder? Sure. Well, did anyone question him? Uh, I'll find out. Uh, do that. Anything on the fences? No, nothing. Uh, what about Miss Lee's personal effects? Uh, red tape. I'll get them released by tomorrow. Anything else? No, no, not offhand. We need a break, Ralph. Those alibis aren't watertight. Look, why don't we pick up those two guys and go at them? Too soon. Ah, uh, excuse me. Captain Burgess. Dr. Hoy, Captain. I have some information for you. Go ahead. My secretary denies gossiping about Mrs. Hoy's visitation from Charlene Ali. I showed her my uh, handwritten transcript. She had never seen it before. You a believer? Absolutely. Then I chatted with all the floor superintendents. One of them admitted that she had heard about my wife's strange experience from an orderly who can't remember who he heard it from. Someone in the cafeteria, he thinks, but he can't pin it down. So somebody did open your desk drawer. That is my opinion. I agree. Uh, doctor... Will you be at home tonight? Yes. May I pay you a visit? Certainly. I want to talk over some uh, speculations. That is progress, Captain Burgess. Yes, of a sort. We're no longer groping around. Now we're trying to find flaws and some alibis. And I'm sorry Mrs. Hoy is retired, but uh, it is late. It's my fault. How could she help you, Captain? There are four pieces to the puzzle. The ring, the pin, the TV set, and Sing. I'd hoped that Mrs. Hoy might remember something about Sing. Now, is that a man's name, first, last? Either. Well, you've helped us a great deal already. Let me go! Captain! <laughs> what are you doing? Keep your hands My wife, off me. speaking in her sleep... Come, Captain. Another psychic visitation? Oh. But she's in pain. This is her bedroom. I opened the door after she fell asleep. Go away from me, please. Charlena's voice. Oh. That is the voice of Charlena Lee. Oh. Good Lord. You're choking me. My pin. My gold pin. Let go of me. Give that back. That pin. Sing. Give it. To me, ring my ah, engagement ring. Sing, help me. Tian Ching is killing me. Sing, Yuan, engagement. 
Mentoring. Good. Pain. Don't breathe. Choking. Avenge me. Television. Sit. Kim to Repair. Avenge me. Chung. Ching. We have witnessed her murder. He strangled her. And then he stabbed her. But we still don't know who he was. Oh, Chang Ching. Chang Ching? Yes. Wife, Charlena again has spoken through your lips. Who? Captain Burgess? You, I, uh, I mean, Miss Lee mentioned Sing Yuan. Do you know him? I do not understand. She does not remember what her lips told us. But I have a name to work on. Sing Yuan. We'll find him somehow. Uh, may I see you alone, Dr. Hoy? Oh, of course, yes. Good night, my dear. Uh, good night, Mrs. Hoy. Good night. What is it, Captain? When is Dwight Taylor coming to repair your television set? Any evening at my convenience. Don't ask him over until you hear from me. Yes, Captain. Won't you confide in me? With luck, I may have found the sapphire ring and the gold pin. That would be extraordinary. Well, it's a hunch, but it may pay off. A hunch? About what? Is Taylor a ladies' man? So I have heard. Well, does he uh, pay for his favors? Ah, I begin to see what you mean. That guy in the hospital parking lot is pretty sure that Miss Lee left the hospital with Taylor the night she was murdered. Good work. And uh, a policewoman posing as a saleswoman for a kid's encyclopedia visited everybody in Miss Lee's immediate neighborhood. She got one housewife talking, one who lives in the same building as Miss Lee, and she remembers smelling smoke and then going to her front window. Well, go on, go on. She saw a man leaving the building carrying a small bag, a, a toolkit probably. It was dark, so she can't be sure of identifying him. But a guy did leave the building shortly after the woman smelled smoke. About what time? Around 6.15. And what time did Taylor get home? His girlfriend's is around 6. Well, uh, how do you feel about breaking and entering? Hmm? Not without a search warrant, no. I want somebody to go through Taylor's place when no one's there. Now, somebody to comb the place. That jewelry hasn't been turned over to a fence. It could have been given away, Norm. It's more likely that he kept it and gave it to the chick he's living with. Well, she wouldn't take a chance wearing it. Well, that's why it might be tucked away someplace in their rooms. So... Assign a man to search the place when no one is there. It's illegal. Whatever came out, I'll take full responsibility. Well, I want the neighborhood jewelers covered. Find the jeweler who sold those items. Why are you so hipped on the jewelry? If they're worth a lot of dough, sure. I can understand that, but the chances are slim. Miss Lee was poor. This Sing Yuan, or however you say it, you think he was loaded? You've read the reports from all the investigators, hmm? Tell me about Dwight Taylor. Well, macho, high opinion of himself. This common law wife's quite a dish. Still, he moves around with other girls, nurses mostly. Uh, for your information, Sergeant, Taylor gave gifts of jewelry to the young women he went after. Well... Yeah, I still don't get it. The facts are right under your nose. Now, where would Taylor get jewelry to dangle in front of a chick he had his eye on, huh? He stole it. He's a jewel thief, and Charlene Lee had a couple of valuable trinkets that he wanted. Yeah, so? So he went home with her to repair a television set. That's how he got in. And then murdered her. Well, how can we prove it? I don't know. But I'm sure gonna try. The solution to any tough problem is patience and thoroughness. 
Charlena Lee's voice from the grave has supplied several tantalizing clues to her murder. What you must bear in mind is that the story unfolding is based on fact. The police have often turned to psychics for help, and it has paid off. It is possible that Miss Lee's revelations through Mrs. Hoy will corner a killer. I'll be back shortly with our final act. WBBM Chicago. Over 150 years ago, Daniel Webster argued that every unpunished murder takes away something from the security of every man's life. I think you'll agree that's the truth. It is to a good cop such as Captain Burgess. In his experience, a long one, this is the first time he's been helped by the voice of a dead woman. At 8.30 the next morning, Captain Burgess is walking down the corridor of the hospital. Ah, good morning, Dr. Hoy. Ah, you're up early. Uh, come into my office. I'll call for another cup of coffee. Oh, my secretary seems to be late. Oh, thank you. Um, please sit down. You have seen your father? Yes, yes, he's doing fine. We had a good talk. His progress is very good, very, very good. <laughs> uh, did Dwight Taylor agree to repair your TV? Whenever I set the day. He's free after five. What have you in mind, Captain? A surprise. If you invite him over at 7, I'll uh, show up a few minutes later. He's your suspect? Yes. Right now, our evidence is circumstantial. I want to panic him into a confession, or at least try to. I appreciate your cooperation. Why have you settled on Taylor? Well, for a number of reasons, none of which I feel free to discuss at this time. So just please be patient. You'll hear all about it. Now, I hope to appear at your home shortly after Taylor, but that depends on a step we're taking sometime this morning. It, uh, it has to do with evidence. I hope to have it before noon. Now, uh, if I don't appear, just be casual with him and have, have Mrs. Hoy stay in her bedroom. Well, that sounds ominous. It should. If Taylor's the murderer, and I think he is, remember what he did to Miss Lee... So be careful. Don't make him suspicious. Is it the jewelry? Yes. As oh, he's generous with it. Women find it hard to resist. Ah, uh, he steals it and and gives it as gifts. Hmm. Stealing is one matter, Captain. But would he murder for a ring and a gold pin? He knew their value. We found the jeweler who sold the sapphire engagement ring and the pin to Sun Yuan. Now, that was a year ago, and their value has increased. When they were bought, the ring cost Sing $2,500, and the pin, which he bought later, cost a 1000 Well, do you have them? No. And if you find them, as you say, the evidence is circumstantial. Well, so is the gossip about Mrs. Hoy's dream. You know, that originated with someone, Doctor. That's true. Not you? Not Mrs. Hoy, not your secretary. Who, then? Someone anxious to know if he was suspected. Someone who walked into your office to, uh, snoop around. Some man for maintenance, Noto or Taylor. And Noto seems to be clean. And there's more. But I'll save it. Expect me after seven, Doctor. <laughs> Promotion. Oh? I'm a genius. Uh, yeah. Well, go prove it. How about this? Hey! Who found it? Is that the gold clover leaf pin or is it the gold clover leaf pin? Who broke into Taylor's joint? Sergeant Winkleman. Give him a medal. Well, I won't forget it. Uh, no, come on, tell me about it. Well, he waited until Taylor went to work. Then he rang the bell and was told to come up. He was dressed in work clothes and carried some plumbing tools. What excuse did he give to the woman? He said, the landlord, it's a four-flat building. He asked him to check on a leak coming through the floor of the first floor west. She didn't know what to make of it, and he got in. And? Winkleman knows plumbing. 
He tightened up a few connections, and she asked him to change a washer in the bathroom. He agreed. She got friendly, invited him to have a drink. He went along. Where did he find the pin? On her bureau in her bedroom. He went through it to get to the bathroom. He just put it in his pocket and brought it to me. The woman telephoned the police at the 42nd precinct to report the theft. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> and uh, what about the sapphire ring? He didn't see it. Oh. Now, you got the gold pin. That should do the trick. It directly connects him with the murder, Norm. And you have the other evidence. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, look, I better act on what we've got before Taylor gets wise. Now, I have a date with Dr. Hoy. Taylor will be at Hoy's home to fix a TV. I stroll in, and then the fun will begin. Now, you better come along to cover me. I won't be armed. I want him alive. Ah, good evening, Dwight. Oh, hey, Doctor. Come in. Thank you. Thank you for stopping by. Under the circumstances... Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what happened. Yes, your wife told me. Oh, uh, she and my wife. And can you imagine opening the door to a stranger... Some guy who says he's a plumber who needed a plumber. Landlord didn't say nothing about no plumber, so this guy wanders in, and, and when he wanders out, all the jewelry is gone. Ah, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, he scooped up everything off the bureau. From the bedroom? Yeah. Oh. Smart, huh? She had him fix a faucet in the bathroom sink. Now, you, you don't let a stranger into your house, right? It's not smart, no. Well, uh, she is not smart, uh, that's the set, Dwight. If you're too upset... No, no, no. This will take my mind off it. Hey, you alone? Yes, I am. Mrs. Hoy went to a movie. Uh, she had any more dreams? It wasn't a dream, Dwight. She talked out loud. Oh? Yeah, I had a cousin who did that when he was a kid. Walked in his sleep, too. Pretty scary. Miss Lee's voice came from my wife... When she was asleep, Miss Lee described how she was murdered. Oh, yeah? Well, who done her in? She didn't say. Oh. Well, I better get to work. Ah, excuse me. Ah, good evening, Mr. Burgess. Come in. Oh, thank you. See, you're busy. Perhaps I should uh, come back. No, no, no. It's uh, only Mr. Taylor. He's on the hospital staff. He was very kindly agreed to check out the television set. Now, uh, we can go to another room. Oh, uh, did you say that uh, this is Mr. Taylor? Uh, why, yes. Hey, who are you? Uh, Burgess. I'm in the insurance business. Uh, t- were you the man who was robbed this afternoon? Well, how did you know that? I heard it on the radio. Uh, there was a description of what was stolen. Among the pieces was a uh, gold cloverleaf pin. Where'd you get that information? I suppose from Mrs. Taylor. There ain't no Miss Taylor. Hmm. You heard all this on the radio? That's right. And the woman who was robbed said that the gold pin belonged to uh, Miss uh, Charlena Lee. Hey, what are you trying to pull? Who are you? Is this the gold pin, Mr. Taylor? Give me that. Not so fast, Taylor. I'll kill you. I don't think so. You murdered Charlene Lee. Prove it. Explain how you got the pin. She gave it to me. You're a liar, Taylor. The parking attendant saw you leave with Miss Lee. And after you murdered her and set fire to the mattress, the next door neighbor saw you leave the building at 6 o'clock. You picked up a newspaper shortly after that. You told the police that you arrived home at 5.30. Now, can you explain all of that? Get out of my way! You can't prove a damn thing! Captain! Let him go. Sergeant Lucas will take care of him. Taylor's our killer, Doctor. The defense attorney makes you look silly, Norm. He keeps hammering away at that voice from the grave. I hope this case isn't laughed out of court. It won't be. Charlene Lee was murdered. Now, the evidence against Taylor is circumstantial, but it's strong. Maybe if Mrs. Hoy got on the stand and told... No. 
I understand the DA's problem. He's got to stick to facts, and we have quite a few. He's afraid to introduce the testimony uh, about the voice from the grave, and I, I don't blame him. You didn't believe it either, Ralph. Well, I do now. You heard it yourself. <laughs> oh, I sure did. A telephone to see if the jury's gone out and home, will you? No. No, no, no. That's self-torture. Now, you go home and get a good sleep. <clears throat> How about you? I have a visit to pay. The Hoys? Yeah. Just imagine how they feel. If they're victimized by ridicule, I will speak out. It is considerate of you to stop in, Captain Burgess. We have followed the trial in the newspapers. You have not appeared. Oh, you do understand why. Yes. Charlena Lee's voice gives you clues that lead to Taylor's arrest, but you cannot introduce her testimony as evidence. It would be laughed at. I want you to know something, Doctor, and you too, Mrs. Hoy. Yes? The defense has made the three of us look ridiculous to the public. Now, if there are any repercussions from it, if your positions are threatened in any way, I will testify to the truth about Miss Lee. Thank you, Captain. I thank you, too. I heard Miss Lee's voice. At least, it was not Mrs. Hoy's normal voice. I will swear to what I heard. Now, the point is this. Without that information, however slim that Miss Lee supplied, I never would have zeroed in on Taylor. Ah, excuse me. He is? This is Dr. Hoy. Hi, Dr. Sergeant. Good news. Dwight Taylor was found guilty and sentenced to ten years in prison. <sighs> he should have been sentenced to life. Was it not possible that he might have been acquitted? Uh, yes, I I suppose so. Then let us be grateful that he was not. We have been vindicated. Those who have laughed at us have been put down. Charlene Lee has been avenged. We thank you, Captain. The moral of this grim story is the importance of keeping an open mind, even when the subject seems as fanciful as psychic retrogression. A voice from the grave? Nonsense. But... A murderer got ten years because of it. Life imprisonment was deserved, but some criminals do get away with murder. I will return shortly. The story of the voice from the grave, although changed in part was based on an actual police case in which a murderer was tracked down because a dead woman spoke through the lips of a sleeping friend. I know it's hard to believe. I myself find it hard to believe. But Dwight Taylor was caught and sent to prison because a captain of detectives had an open mind. Our cast included Earl Hammond, Court Benson, and Carol Tytell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I was told about an hour ago, in no uncertain terms, that if we didn't get rid of him, they would. Fine, let them. No, let me finish. They would do it in a way that we wouldn't like. I find it difficult to believe that I'm actually plotting to kill my husband. Don't do that. Just stick to the facts. Wait. He said we were going on vacation next week. Which means that silly, boring cabin up in the mountains. Hey, that is just great. That's a marvelous place for an accident. You know that? Hey, he is going to fall off Cherokee Cliff. 3,000 feet straight down to the solid rocks below. 
Well, how can we get him to do that? Well, I can get a pretty good powder, you know, that you slip into his coffee. It'll knock him out completely. And then it's just a question of carrying him to the edge. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Yes, Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. We usually reproach people for talking about themselves, but why should we? And why shouldn't they? Isn't this the subject they know best and love best and that inspires them the most? And many people who don't like the self they have talk about the self they would like to be. Sometimes they talk too much and to the wrong audience, which is why we have so many murder stories. I must get in to see her. But what can I do about it? There's a law. What does the law mean to a man in your position? I have to obey the law the same as everyone. I don't care. Do something. Anything. Blackmail them. Celeste. Buy the place. Or commit murder. Our mystery drama, In the Name of Love was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Terry Keene and Norman Rose. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You are not required to answer this question, but... Have you ever unburdened yourself to a complete stranger? A chance met seatmate, perhaps, on a plane or a train? Told someone you've never seen before and will never see again intimate personal details that you've kept secret from even your closest friends? As I said, you are not required to answer. A huge supersonic jet is being wafted through space between Paris and New York. Aboard up forward in the luxurious first-class lounge sits a well-groomed, attractive woman. Next to her, a well-groomed, attractive man. The two, who just happen to be sitting near each other, are whiling away the journey with polite, meaningless small talk. I, uh, suppose we take it for granted by now. Take what for granted? Oh, this, what we're doing. How we can travel across the Atlantic in practically the twinkling of an eye. Mm, I don't know. I made better time last trip. No, did you? Yes. I have a luncheon date. I'm going to be late. That's too bad. Mm, No great tragedy. Missing a meal now and then is hardly the worst thing for one's diet. I suppose so. Actually, it's a blessing. A what? Oh... That isn't important. No, no, I I heard what you said. It just sounded rather peculiar. I beg your pardon. Oh, please forgive me. It's just that sometimes someone says something and it strikes a chord. In this case, a discord. Well, what did I say? Uh, Well, it doesn't matter. But I really should explain, I suppose. Explain what? Well, I just wasn't prepared to hear anyone say that missing a meal could be a blessing. Uh, to imply that, that food could be something that's inconvenient or uh, troublesome. Not where there are people who are dying of starvation. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have said that. It seems to have offended you. Offended? Well, perhaps that wasn't the correct word. I was in Europe just now to take part in a conference on... Well, I suppose I might just as well call it by its right name. Starvation. Uh, I'm upsetting you. Well, now that you've participated, have you solved the problem? Well, I don't think we'll ever solve the problem. Not in the foreseeable future, at any rate. Are you a professional in the field? A fundraiser or a functionary of one kind or another? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just a volunteer businessman. I feel that people should devote a portion of their time and effort and money to just helping out. Very commendable. Um, 
It's been very nice talking to you, but now if you'll excuse me. <laughs> I'm sure that really isn't true. I'm sure it hasn't been nice talking to me. And I'm sorry. You must let me explain. What is there to explain? I don't want you to go away thinking that I'm a fanatic of some sort. I had a very shocking and moving experience. What I'm trying to say is that in the ordinary way, I don't make people uncomfortable. Well, that's certainly in your favor. This conference I attended, you know, it, it opened up a world I never knew existed. I may have been aware, I suppose we all are, but... I mean, to be confronted with it was just too much. Oh, well, I hope you'll feel better soon. Well, I don't know if I'll ever really feel better again. Uh, as I said, it's been nice talking to you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, no. Just a moment. I resent your attitude. What? I'm sorry, I didn't... I didn't you mean... spoke to me as if I were Marie Antoinette. Qu'il mange de la brioche. Let him eat cake. I am very aware of the cruelties and the suffering of the world. Oh, look, I had no intention... Oh, of... yes, you did. So eager to flaunt your newfound social conscience. Your heart aches so much for children. Uh, do you have any of your own? Well, I, I never married. I was always too busy. Mm, making money, no doubt. Yes, I confess. You don't have to confess anything to me. You see, I at least have a child. And I adopted her when she was six years old. Today, she's a lovely young lady of 20. You're very fortunate. I envy you. <laughs> a daughter. Oh, do you have a picture? A picture? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, of course. May I see it? Why? Be because if, if she's yours, she must be beautiful. <laughs> well, how can I resist that? Wait. Oh, yes. Beautiful. You know, somehow she looks familiar. Familiar? Could I have seen her somewhere? <laughs> Most kids today look very much alike, the way they wear their hair and dress. Yeah, that's true. What's your name? Maureen. Oh, yes. Beautiful girl. Lovely name. Yes. And it's not just on the outside. She's really a most unusual girl. Ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts to prepare for our landing in New York City. Oh, that's the voice that literally brings me back to Earth. <laughs> Once I get started on my daughter. Yeah, I understand. Well, what a fortunate woman you are. Well, Goodbye. And it really has been nice talking to you. Celeste. Yes, come on in. Just get back? Hmm, plane landed less than an hour ago. All right, what's it all about? Is it going to be a long story? It's going to be a good story. Well, it had better be to drag me back from Europe just when I decided to take another week off. Have you ever heard of quantum industries? Who hasn't? We have a shot at them. Oh, which division? The whole works. I thought Naylor and Evans had a lock on them. Al Drake managed to open the door. The entire advertising responsibility for quantum? How many millions of dollars are we talking about? It scares me. How far is Al gone? He's at the U point. The me point? Mm -hmm. It's time for your thing. You have to go in for the kill. Well, what's the program? Now, let me pull together Al's notes. Won't take me a minute. Well, it'll take at least five. I have to make an important call. Yes, ma'am. And I am not to be interrupted. Don't tell me you finally met somebody over in Europe. No, I didn't meet anybody. Well, that's too bad. It isn't too bad. It's too late. You're still a delectable woman. Close the door on your way out? Sure. <sighs> Darling! Yes, it's Mother! I know, finally. I just got back. Yo, know, it was interesting, I suppose, but it was lonesome without you. 
I would have stayed longer, but good old Joe Daly set up a flare. Uh, no, I haven't met any interesting men. Have you? <laughs> well, let's talk about it at dinner. Hmm? Oh, no, no, no. I won't let you break a date just so you can eat dinner with your old mom. No, darling. It's a bad habit. Don't get into it. If you end up an old maid 20 years from now, I don't want you to say it was all my fault. Because you will, you know. God? No, don't cut the evening short either. I'll be up when you get home. See you later, Maureen, darling. <laughs> brief you on quantum. Fine. Who makes the decision? Roger Carlson. Roger Carlson. Mm -hmm. Roger Carlson is quantum industries. He takes pains to keep out of the limelight. He only services when there's a major decision to be made. Mm -hmm. What's known about the man? Does he collect stamps, butterflies, women? I have to have something to go on. You'll have to go up against him cold. No, Joseph. Carlson has already set up the meeting, which is why we sent you the SOS to come home. When? Tomorrow morning, for breakfast. What? That's Mr. Carlson. They say he's a morning person. <sighs> Where? His suite at the Ritz Plaza. <laughs> Was Celeste Manning. <laughs> and you're the all-powerful Roger Carlson. <laughs> we meet again. Well, had we known, we could have held the meeting on the plane. No, no. I enjoyed the conversation. We did have so much more than any possible discussion of business. Well, then, shall we now get down to business? Oh, no, no. Not until after breakfast. Oh, uh, may I present Joe Daly, who will be able to supply us with any document that may be required? How do you do, sir? Hello, Joe. Well, why don't we sit down? Uh, dare I say that it's a small world? Uh, the chief executive officer of Quantum Industries may say anything he likes. Now, Mrs. Manning. Miss Manning. Uh, Miss Manning, uh, please do not be impressed with me. Or uh, how can I help it? Well, you certainly weren't on the plane the other day. Oh, had I but known. Yes, had you but known, we might have developed a most artificial relationship. And this way? Well, at least we have an idea of each other's true character. Well, that must have been some plain ride. Yes. And how is the lovely Marine? M Marine? Yes. Oh, yes, she's fine. <laughs> is that all you can say, a noncommittal fine, after the way you raved about her? <laughs> well, she's, she's fine. I tell you, Joe, you don't want to let this one get started on the subject of Marine. But I guess you, you know that already. Uh, have you met young Al Drake at our company? Oh, uh, yes. And I was impressed enough to take your outfit seriously. Well, uh, you'll discover that we're completely equipped to handle everything. Yes, I've already ascertained all that. But this is business and we're still at breakfast. And I make it a rule never to combine the two. And I'd rather discuss Marine. What a lovely and unusual young lady she is. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Later. Well, why can't it wait? Oh, oh, I see. All right, hold on. Well, you see, I no sooner tell you that I have a rule and I'm forced to break it. Will you excuse me for just a few minutes? I have to take this inside. Celeste. Celeste, what did you tell this guy? What did you tell him? What did she tell him? We were listening very closely. Did she seem to say anything that appeared to be out of line? Obviously she must have. Else why would right-hand man Joe Daly be so upset? The second act, the act of illumination, shall soon be here. When lonely strangers meet... Who can tell which one is indiscreet? Obviously, the poet doesn't know. Do we? Perhaps this is why we seek to exchange confidences with strangers, so that we may commit indiscretions with impunity. Has our Miss Celeste Manning been indiscreet lately? Obviously. Celeste! What did you tell Roger Carlson on that airplane? 
Nothing. But, uh, who is this Maureen? Joe, just forget it. Well, if you say so. But it seems I'm supposed to know about her. I said to forget it. Now, let me worry about it. Okay. I just wish I knew what's going on. What's all this about a Maureen? I believe we have the top people in every category. Research, creative, administration, marketing. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't have to push so hard. You've got the account. Oh, thank you. We've been watching you over the past two years. We've seen how you work. Oh, there'll be considerable negotiating and all that sort of thing to go through, but you and I have people who handle those details. Yes. Leaving us free for grand strategy. I wonder how to go about setting up mine. Your strategy? Yes. Well, what's your problem? Um, in a word, you. Me? When I saw you on the plane, I said to myself, this is a woman I will simply have to get to know. Oh? I want you to know this. It has nothing to do with the account. Well, that is reassuring. Hmm. You see, I... I missed so much in life. It's my own fault, of course. Of course. I think what iced it for me was when you spoke of your daughter. Here was an opportunity at, at one stroke to make up for everything. A wife, family... And all this time, I thought what I had to offer was the most efficient and effective advertising agency in the world. I can imagine how this sounds. I wonder. But I, I've always been like this. I say things that may sound way out to others, but, but if I feel them, why not say them? Why not indeed? I wonder if I might take you and Maureen to dinner one night. Uh, well... Maureen is going away. She intends to stay with a friend for a while on the West Coast. Oh. Well, could we make it some evening before she leaves? We could try. Are you having a problem, Mr. Carlson? Is it that obvious? Yes. I know you asked me to lunch for a purpose. Well, quite frankly, I'm in love with your boss. Well, that's obvious. That's a relief. Now we can get to it. You know, I cannot get to first base. You're not the only one. What am I doing wrong? Nothing. It's just that she was always too busy for romance. Now she thinks she's too old. But it isn't true. Well, that's what she thinks, so for her it's true. There must have been romance in her life at least once. Why do you say that? Well, she has a daughter. Who has a daughter? Who are we talking about? Celeste. Celeste doesn't have a daughter. She doesn't have a daughter named Maureen. Oh. Uh, Maureen. Now, just a minute, Joe. What is going on here? Does Celeste have or does Celeste not have a daughter? Well, she... Joe, there is no percentage in lying to me. Does she? Hello, darling. It's Mother. I just wanted to find out if you arrived safely. Oh, wonderful. Oh, I know. I miss you, too. But, Ted, what about him? Oh, well, if he misses you all that much, he can always fly out there. I mean, that's how you'll know it's love. How else do you know? <laughs> well, for one thing, if it's really love, you never have to ask. Oh, there's somebody at the door, darling. Call me later tonight after you get settled in. We'll talk then. Bye now. Just a minute, please. Miss Manning? Oh. Uh, Celeste, uh, I, uh, I had to see you. Uh, Celeste, Mr. Carson. Uh, all right, come in. I, uh, I have to talk to you. I discuss business during office hours. Well, I haven't come here to discuss business. Well, what else is there to discuss? You know how I feel about you. I'm sorry, Mr. Carson. I'm sorry, too. I have never been in love. And when I did fall for the first time, it had to be with a woman like you. I didn't ask you to fall in love with me. You are a clever woman. The way you worked me over on that airplane. 
On the airplane? When you found out how I felt about children, you played your trump. You told me about your daughter. Your daughter, I might add, who does not exist. What are you saying about Maureen? I am saying you do not have a daughter named Maureen, nor a daughter named anything else. You knew who I was all along. Maureen was just a ploy to capture my attention, to uh, enlist my sympathy. Get out of here. Well, it doesn't matter. Did you hear what I said? You do not have a daughter, but it doesn't matter. I don't care. How dare you? Shall I tell you who Maureen is? You leave and you take your account with you. Maureen is a fantasy. That's a lie. Is it? Maureen exists. Oh, of course she exists. She's flesh and blood. Yes, but not yours. Oh, I put it together. It occurred to me that, uh, that picture... Why did it look so familiar? Where had I seen that breathtakingly beautiful face before? Of course. She's Marine Lovell, the movie star. You don't know what you're talking about. You said you had adopted her when she was six. Well, that's when you would have first noticed her. That is when she made her first picture. Please, don't say another word. You adopted her in your mind, in your fantasy. There's a whole life you share with this girl in your mind. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Yes. What's the difference? There's the truth is important. To whom? And for what? Does the truth let you sleep better at night? Does it make you happier? Celeste, I am only trying... Who is asking you? Who needs you? Who sent for you? But let's be realistic. You can be as realistic as you please. As far as I'm concerned, she is my daughter... And you won't take her away from me. Don't you understand that you're living in a fantasy world? I live in two separate and distinct worlds. Which one is the fantasy? The cutthroat, the dog-eat-dog jungle that you and I prowl every day, taking what we choose by force and cunning. That world drains you, exhausts you. There's no peace, no rest. You live moment by moment with a constantly improvised strategy. Where is the time for love in such a world? Did you find the time for it? Oh. No, I didn't either. But I had to have some kind of reality. And so to get it, I had to retreat into a world of make-belief. Yes. I wanted... A little girl to adore and to raise. But I wasn't willing. I couldn't pay the price. The real price. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. And there she was. On the screen. This lovable little blue-eyed girl with the long blonde hair. Why couldn't she be my daughter? In the most private place in my heart... Why couldn't we talk and be like mother and child? And we were. And this little exercise of the imagination, this has been enough for you? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Why did you have to destroy it? Well, how did I destroy it? You invaded a private place, a hidden place. A quiet retreat of dreams and illusions. I only wanted to show you. Why did you bring in the sunlight? The harsh, blinding, burning sunlight. Celeste, I want to help you. Help me. I want so little. Why did you have to kill it? <laughs> Looking at it from your hard-headed point of view, perhaps it was a sad and pathetic thing, but it was my own. Listen, I want to help you now. I came here because I thought that I should... Well, I thought that I should be the one to tell you. Tell me what? Besides you, I'm the only one who knows about her. And the only one who understands. What is it you think you should tell me? Celeste. She's gone. Who's gone? Maureen. Gone where? Haven't you read the papers? to the news. She... She simply disappeared. What does that mean? Here. I, uh... I picked this up at the newsstand. 
film star vanishes. Foul play suspected in the sudden disappearance of Maureen Lovell. Maureen? Oh, no. Oh, no. Not my little girl. Not my baby. Celeste, she is not your little girl, and she is not your baby either. Don't you dare say that! Celeste, she is a dream. (laughs) All of them are dreams. Maureen Lovell, a dream sweetheart for adolescent boys, an aspiration for teenage girls, a companion, a daughter for aging, frustrated women. I am not an aging, frustrated woman. Well, please do not behave like one. I will behave any way I please. Who are you to order me around? I'm only saying what's right. All my life, men have been telling me what's right, and I've been proving them wrong. Do you know who I am? Faith Celeste Manning. That's how I was baptized. But I dropped the faith because I learned the hard way not to have faith in anyone or anything. All by myself, I built an empire. I don't need counseling or advice from you or anybody. All right. What do you want me to do? I want you to get out of here. Very well. No. Wait. Don't go. Help me. Help you? Help me. (laughs) Do you know what it cost me to say that? Oh, oh, how hard it was for me to say that. It's been 30 years since I asked anybody for help. It just doesn't come easily. But for my little girl, I will ask anyone for anything. Celeste, I want to help you. But I cannot help you preserve this illusion. Help me find her. Someone has to find her. I know how hard it is to wake up from a dream. To me, it is not a dream. To me, it's the truth. To me, she actually is my daughter. My real daughter. And so our mystery deepens. The word real implies flesh and blood, no? Is there that kind of connection between Celeste and Maureen Lovell? Once again, we must define a word which simply defies definition. Real. But that's the task of Act Three. said, and quite possibly agreed, that life is real, and life is earnest. But like most taken-for-granted statements, this one is usually more honored in the breach. Most of us live in two worlds, don't we? The one we want, and the one we must put up with. Which one is more real? About which one are we more earnest? You say that Marine Lovell is your real daughter. Yes. Did you give birth to her? No. Or did you adopt her legally? No. Well, then how can she be your real daughter? What is this, an inquisition? I'm only trying to establish... She a... is my real daughter because she's real to me. Now, is that good enough for you? Oh, Celeste, in the world of business where you made your mark, is that kind of thinking good enough for you? I want my daughter back. All right. Now, what do you want me to do about it? Nothing. I'll find her myself. And what is it that you want to see me about, Mr. Uh, Jenkins, is it? Uh, Yes, Mrs. Manning. Uh, Mr. Carlson told me to report to you. Obviously. If you hadn't used Mr. Carlson's name, you'd never have gotten in here. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm having a bad time. I understand. How could you possibly understand? Well, I'm used to it. By the nature of my profession, I usually get to see people who are having a bad time of one kind or another. I'm a private detective. Oh. Mr. Carlson asked me to look into the disappearance of Miss Maureen Lovell. 
Have you found any clues? I'm sorry. No. Then nobody knows where she is or if she's been kidnapped. At this point, I would rule out kidnapping. Why? We would have had a ransom demand. But she is gone. Why? How? With Maureen Lovell, anything is possible. I don't know what that means. I suppose you could say that the private life of Maureen Lovell was one of the best kept secrets in the business. Yes. Everyone's little blue-eyed, blonde-haired sweetheart. The cheerful, wholesome, all-American, next-door beauty. Would you please get to the point? None of it was true. All of it was a public relations smokescreen. And Miss Manning, I don't know how they could have kept the lid on it. Well, I do. If you spend enough money, you can buy any image you like. And they did. How bad is it? Everything. You name it, she's done it. Of course, now the drugs are the worst. If you want my opinion, they spirited her away someplace. I guess it was getting out of control. I see. Is that all you have to say to me? At this time, yes. Then thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Good day. Good day, Miss Fang. Hello? Yeah. Maureen? Maureen? Where are you? Maureen? They told me everything. All about you. Everything. How could you do this to me? Ma Maureen, tell me where you are. No. No. Don't hang up. Maureen, I forgive you. Don't hang up. Don't. Maureen? Why did you do it? It's only right that you know the truth about your alleged daughter. And now that I know it? Well, it should help you dispel this fantasy. That's what you thought. Celeste, she's just a little tramp. Yes, that's true. So should that be the end of it? Why? Well, I should think it would be obvious. Yes, I suppose you would. Well, you see, this is how and where we find out what love really is. I don't understand. Uh, of course not. How could you? When you found out about this, what you called this uh, fantasy, you thought I was mad. Oh, no. no not exactly. I just... I just thought that you were somewhat off base in a certain area, but that's all. I created a full flesh and blood reality for myself. Even if it was all inside of me. I took her through the cute little tomboy period, through the awkward stage. Oh, we had long, serious, confidential talks about boys and sex and life. And I watched her blossom into a radiant beauty. I enjoyed the best of her. Oh, Celeste. But you can't be selective. Not if you really love. Now I have to live with the worst of her. Do you... Do you want this to drive you mad? No. It's going to help keep me sane. She needs me. What do you mean she needs she you? She needs a mother. Right now, more than anything or anyone else, she needs a mother. I'm going to go to her. But how can you hope to find her? They're obviously maintaining a fantastic secrecy. Do you know how many millions are at stake here? Your Mr. Jenkins can find her. Or I can hire my own Mr. Jenkins. <laughs> Hello? Mr. Jenkins. Yes? I found the place. It's located high up in the mountains north and west of Hollywood. It's called The Retreat. The Retreat. Oh, thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Thank you. You wish to see me? If you're the director of this place. I am Dr. Cullen. 
How may I help you? I wish to see a patient. Oh, we don't have patients. We have guests. Uh, well, whatever you call them. In any event, we do not permit visitors. You don't? That is why they are here. To separate themselves completely from an intolerable environment. I demand to see Maureen Lovell. I am sorry. We have no guest by that name. Now, see here, doctor. Miss Manning, your reputation has preceded you. I know who you are and how important you think you are. If you insist on a scene, I shall be forced to have you removed from the premises. What do you want me to do? Something. It's a legitimate institution. She's been signed in legally. Why won't they permit visitors? Oh, they have a right to make their own rules. But they can't help her. They have access to the finest medical talent. Only her mother can help oh, her. Oh, Celeste. I know what's wrong with her. Oh, sure you do. I mean it. I am asking you to help me get in to see her. And I am telling you that my hands are tied. Well, untie them. What are you? Some ineffectual little clerk somewhere? You're Roger Carlson. You can do anything. Celeste. Don't give me that modest, barefoot country boy look. You get what you want. Nothing ever stops yes, you. But in this case, in I... In this case, what? There's a weak link in the chain around that place. For instance, you could make sure they'd have trouble getting their license renewed. Or buy the place. Fire everybody in it. Have somebody killed. I don't care. This way, Miss Manning. Thank you, Doctor. I must be frank. I have been compelled to do this against my best medical judgment. Yes, Doctor. I don't think you can do the patient any good. Have you been able to do her any good? She refuses to speak. She has shut out the world. It is all part of a reaction to a severe overdose of drugs. May I see her, Doctor? If you insist. You may go inside. Maureen. Maureen. You have a visitor. Maureen. Please leave us, Doctor. Very well. Darling, she's gone, and we're alone. I'm here, finally, Maureen, dearest. Who are you? It's me, Mother, Mommy. Mommy? Mm-hmm. I don't have a mother. I don't. Anymore? Oh, yes, you do. They tried to keep me away from you, but I'm here. Why? I'm here to help you. Help me? Darling, I heard you call to me. You said, help me. No. No, you can't help me. Nobody can help me. You let me try. Because nobody loves me for myself. I do. Nobody wants me for myself. Darling, I want you. Oh, yes. Now you want me. You come to see me now. Where were you? Maureen. Listen to me. Oh, I'm so tired. Everything hurts. I'm so lonely and frightened. You don't know what it is. I do. I do. Please go away. Just let me disappear. That's all I want. Please. No, I won't go away. Please. Please, Mommy, please. Never, darling. I'm going to help you. I'm scared. You don't have to be scared. Ever again. Mommy is here with you. And you'll come home with Mommy. Mommy? I'll always be with you. Nothing bad will ever happen again. <laughs> Mr. Carlson and I have come by to pick up Miss Lovell. Oh, did you want to take her out for a drive? No, I thought we'd take her home for a while. Miss Manning, you deserve a medical degree of some kind. Mr. Carlson, 
this charming and extremely able lady worked a most miraculous cure. She saw Miss Lowell yesterday. I don't know what she said or did, but do you know what happened? What happened? Last night, Maureen sent for me. She was still weak, but better. Whatever was raging through her was gone. She said, Doctor, I've quit fighting it. I want my mother. I'm going home to mother for a while. Oh, Roger, I told you she wants to come home. Oh, that is wonderful. Yes, dear. She is going home today. I telephoned her mother last night. What? Well, her mother? But I... Her mother in Carbondale, Pennsylvania. Mrs. Lover flew out this morning. She should be here any minute. Her... Her mother. Her mother. All she really needed was her mother. How did you know that, Miss Manning? Oh, here comes Maureen now, all dressed and ready to go. Maureen, my dear, may I see you for a moment? She may not remember you, Miss Manning. I think she believes she had a dream, and everything suddenly became clear to her. Yes, Dr. Cullen? I would like you to meet Miss Manning. How do you do, Miss Manning? And... Mr. Carlson. How do you do, sir? Maureen. Oh, you look troubled, Miss Manning. Oh, but you shouldn't be. This is a very good place. They really do the job for you here. Oh, that's the taxi. And Mother's here. Mother, I'm coming. I'm coming. Miss Manning, are you all right? Uh, Miss Manning has had a hectic day. I think we'll just sit down for a moment in the lounge, may we? Of course. Celeste? Well, Celeste, are you ready for the real thing? It, uh, it would be too hard. The make believes even harder. How about the real thing? It's too late. Too late for make believe also? All the years were wasted. No. No, they weren't. You were a mother. What a foolish dream. But you made it real at the end. For the most important few hours of her life, you actually were her mother. Was I? Was I really? You saw the proof of it. She was saved by the way only a mother could save her. A lot of love is needed in this world. Hmm. Celeste? Yes? Love, real love, starts with two people. And it radiates from there all over the whole world. What do you say, Celeste? The question is, can a billionaire industrialist find happiness with a millionaire advertising executive? It's a question that boggles the mind. But somehow, I believe it's in line with the old saying by Mr. Virgil. Love conquers all, so therefore, let us all surrender to love. What is the moral of our story? Any love, even if it exists in the imagination, is better than no love at all. I shall return shortly. commit in the name of love? Well, may the philosopher ask. For everything is done for a love of one sort or another. Love is the most prevalent and pervasive of all the emotions. Love can be good and love can be bad. But whichever way it goes, we live with it. Don't the vows read, do you take each other for better or worse? Our cast included Terry Keene, Norman Rose, Robert Dryden, and E.V. Juster. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Uh, Mademoiselle, I am most happy to make your acquaintance. Thank you, Lieutenant. I am aware of your father. He lived here for several years, and 
if I recall, married a lovely English woman, yes? That's right. My mother died a few years ago. Ah, and the professor? In good health. He's the head of the anthropology department in Ithaca. Splendid. And the missing girl, Antoinette Duchamp. Well, she lives with us. She came here on a holiday. Any clues, Lieutenant? I have one, but do not excite yourself. We have made a thorough check of all automobile accidents between here and La Chapelle. Uh, there is one that may provide the clue we seek. She, she was in an accident? Uh, the car was in an accident. Heavy rain, a rock slide. What about my cousin? And there was no trace of her. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. This message was brought to you by the Unitarian Universalist Church in your community. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We live in an age of scientific wonders. The far-out science fiction of yesterday has become today's reality. And yet, despite these giant strides unlocking the secrets of nature, mankind suffers from confusion and fear. Fear partially engendered by these very scientific advances that are first hailed as triumphs. Why? Perhaps because the science of technology lacks soul. You can't help Amelia. Don't you understand? She's beyond help. If she is, it's your doing, Professor. You and your computers, your laboratories have done this to her. You're too emotional, Gerald. Why can't you look upon this as a noble and successful experiment? Never. I look upon it as a monstrous denial of the human spirit and the destruction of love. mystery drama, Life Blood, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars John Beale and Marion Seldes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The Bible has it that the Lord created Eve from one of Adam's ribs. Pygmalion fell in love with the statue of Aphrodite and brought her to life as Galatea by his earnest prayers to the gods. I'm sure every man has dreamed of his idea of the perfect woman. Our story today is the tale of a man who made that dream come true. Gerald, you surprise me. You can't be serious when you say you're nervous about seeing Uncle. He may think I'm too old for you. By the way, Amelia... Just how old are you? Now that is a question no gentleman asks a lady. You should know that. Anyway, isn't Uncle waiting for you? Yes. And I want you to wait here in the den for me. I'll be right back. I'll wait for you, darling. Ah, nice to see you, Gerald. Now sit down and make yourself comfortable. Well, I'm glad my niece has come to visit with me. I see a lot more of you since she's here. Well, that's exactly what I've come to talk with you about, Arthur. Your niece. Oh? Something important? Very. I've asked Amelia to marry me, and she said she would. Oh, no. I I've never lied to you, Arthur, and there's certainly no reason for you to... Don't be a fool, Gerald. But I didn't mean that Amelia had turned you down. Of course she accepted you. Uh, I don't understand. Uh, I know, and I'm reluctantly forced to explain. When you hear why, you won't want to marry Amelia. Impossible. There's nothing you can say about Amelia that would make me love her any less. She's the perfect woman. She's not a woman. What did you say? I said Amelia 
is not a woman. She's a robot. My creation. You can't be serious. If I had a niece, Gerald, I'd be the happiest man in the world if you and she wanted to get married. You have everything to make a great husband. You're good-looking, successful, intelligent, and you've got integrity. Oh, thank you, but we're off the point. Are you trying to tell me that Amelia is a, a mindless, soulless replica of a woman? And I didn't know it? Exactly. When was the last time you saw a doctor? I see you all the time. I mean professionally. <laughs> you think I've gone over the edge, huh? All right. It must be a big shock to you, and you, you deserve some proof. Ask Amelia to come in. I don't think that's a good idea. Well, you've inferred that I've lost my mind now. Now I want to prove to you that I'm perfectly sane. Ask her in. Now. All right. All right. Whatever you say, Arthur. Amelia, would you come in for a minute? Certainly, Gerald. Have you spoken to Uncle Arthur? He has. Come here, Amelia. And listen to me carefully. I always do, Uncle. You taught me that. Of course. Who are your parents? Parents? Yes, your mother and father. Oh, my father was your brother, and he and mother are dead. Good. Excellent. But who made you, shaped you, taught you, told you what to do and say and how to behave? You, Uncle. And are you grateful? I owe everything to you. My very existence. I understand Gerald has proposed marriage to you. Yes, Uncle. Whom would you rather kiss now? Me or Gerald? It really doesn't matter to me. Amelia, kiss me then. Of course. Well, Gerald, do you still think I'm out of my mind? I, I don't know what to think. If, if you've really accomplished this, this miracle, how did you do it? What, what is she made of? <laughs> Sugar and spice and everything nice. If what you're telling me is true, this is a scientific miracle. If if this is really an automaton, your your creature made up of of what in heaven's name? Of the results of years of experimentation with computers, sound waves, unheard of advances in physics and chemistry. In short, ten years of my life. Of course you realize what this means. When you show Amelia to the world and explain your accomplishment, you'll be the most I famous... I have other plans for Amelia. Haven't I, my dear? So you've told me, Uncle. I don't understand. I intend for her to meet Wilkerson. Wilkerson? What's he got to do with this? What do you think will happen when that Romeo, that woman chaser, sets eyes on this beauty? Tell me that, Gerald. Don't tell me you're still harboring a grudge against Wilkerson for something that happened ten years ago. Something... Is that how you describe my public humiliation? My being forced to resign as head of the DNA experimentation project? Of being laughed at because of a stupid mistake that wasn't mine? Oh, it's been long forgotten, Arthur. Not by me. Tell me, Amelia, what do you think of Harry Wilkerson? I think he's a most attractive man. Very masculine and brilliant. Oh, I've been a fool. You couldn't help yourself. No man will be able to resist Amelia. No, no, I mean about swallowing this fairy tale about a robot. You, you've hypnotized her, that's all. You found a great subject for hypnosis uh, and... Amelia, my child, come here and bring me a pin. What are you going to do? Prove to you that Amelia's exactly what I said, an unfeeling robot. Oh, thank you, my dear. Now watch as I take this pin... Now be and... careful. Plunge it deeply and directly into this lovely arm. So. No! Did that hurt, Amelia? Of course not. Well, Gerald? <sighs> she still could be hypnotized. Then she'd feel no pain. Correct. But if she's human, where's the blood? You all right, Gerald? Would you like some brandy? No. Nothing, thank you. But I would feel better if you sent Amelia out of the room. Of course. Amelia? Certainly, Uncle. I'll be in my room if you want me. A computer. I've 
fell in love with a computer. Oh, come on, Gerald. I assure you, she's far more sophisticated and intricate than any computer. The most advanced computer is childish in concept compared to Amelia. Now you understand why I said no to a marriage between the two of you. Mm, I suppose I should thank you. But I resent the fact that you never told me. It was an experiment. I'm no guinea pig. Of course not. I never thought of you that way. But I, I did want a test. And now that you've seen how successful it was, you can help me by introducing Amelia to Harry Wilkerson. I've got to talk you out of it. Not a chance. Wilkerson's got it coming. For what? Because he failed to stand up and take the blame for a costly mistake on a project that was headed by you? It shows a lack of integrity, but it doesn't deserve the kind of punishment you have in mind. Then you admit it'll work. That Wilkinson will fall head over heels in love with Amelia. No, you're out of touch, Arthur. Wilkinson's already fallen. He's out of his mind about Nita Raven. The ballet dancer? Right. They're practically engaged. So you see that... I'll stack Amelia up against any woman in the world. I tell you, it won't work. You're so blinded by your need for revenge... You can't see it's you I'm protecting. That's interesting. Now, justify that. Lord knows what you've created, Arthur. I'm still in shock. But you think you've made the perfect woman. A creature of real flesh and blood. When, as you so graphically demonstrated, Amelia has no blood. And what do you think will happen when that fact is inevitably discovered? At the time, I thought I'd won the argument with my friend, Dr. Arthur Moore. But I underestimated the depth of the passion that drove this brilliant scientist. I'd also underestimated his genius. I'll admit I saw much less of Arthur than before. Because I never again could feel at ease with the woman. The thing called Amelia. But a month or so after our conversation, he called and asked me over. I appreciate your coming in such short notice, Gerald, but I promise to make it interesting. You remember Amelia, of course. Oh, of course. How are you, Amelia? Flourishing, thank you, Gerald. It's so nice to see you again. Arthur, I can know we... you don't feel entirely at ease with Amelia, but I assure you her presence is necessary. Come here, my dear. Yes, Uncle. You remember, Gerald, you made a very cogent point the last time we discussed the makeup of our charming Amelia. I believe it had to do with blood. And now, I'm taking this needle... I really object to these demonstrations. They, they leave me feeling decidedly... Well, physician, uh, you're uncommonly queasy. I assure you, it won't hurt Amelia in the slightest. Now, I take the needle, soak, and behold, bright ruby red blood. See how naturally it flows? Good Lord, Arthur. What have you done? He eliminated the last obstacle standing between Amelia and her introduction to Wilkerson. Go put a bandage on that, my dear. Gerald and I have to talk. I will, Uncle. Is that real blood? Certainly. Would you care to take a sample for testing? No, I'll take your word for it. How in heaven's name did you do it? I'll make a bargain with you. You promised to introduce Amelia to Wilkerson... And I'll tell you how it works. I, I've told you, Arthur. I don't want any part of this. Wilkerson's engaged. It's definite. He gave Nita a ring, and the date for their wedding will be announced any day now. What's an engagement or even a marriage to a man like Wilkerson? The minute he sees Amelia, he's Suppose going to... Suppose I tell him the truth. I'm going to ask you not to. What I revealed to you was given in confidence and to save you from humiliation. You at least owe me the favor of keeping quiet. But if this... This deception would... You would... owe Wilkerson nothing. And if he's really sincerely in love with this Nita Raven, he won't do anything about Amelia. But if he does, doesn't he deserve to be taught a lesson? Well... I want your solemn promise that you'll keep this a secret between us. Well? All right. I promise. easy to look back on things you've done and say you shouldn't have done them. But at the time, it didn't seem that too much harm could come from this mad scheme. I also thought that Arthur would have some difficulty in arranging a meeting between Amelia and Wilkerson. I found out quickly I was wrong. We live in a university town. 
The university has a large and extensive library. But there's also a smaller private library reserved for the use of a small group of scientists. It was there that Wilkerson first saw Amelia. Now, tell me what a beautiful young lady like you wants with that complex scientific treatise you have there. You must have brains equal to your beauty. Thank you for the compliment. But I'm taking this book for my uncle, Professor Moore. Professor Moore? My old boss. Really? Oh, yes. We worked together on a project some ten years ago. Uh, Let me introduce myself. I'm Harry Wilkerson. And I'm Amelia Burke. You left something out. I don't think so. An adjective? You should say the beautiful... No, 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 no. The ravishing Amelia Burke. I'm afraid you're an incorrigible flatterer, Mr... Uh, Professor Wilkerson. Ah, Harry. And I'm Amelia. Amelia? I need your help. I beg your pardon? I desperately need help. I absolutely must have some refreshment and some female companionship. Or... Or I shall open my mouth and scream and be barred from this library forever. Oh, we certainly can't let that happen. Can we, Harry? Men have died and worms have eaten them. But not for love, said William Shakespeare. And he was the greatest. However, there have been a number of very fine writers who've written stories about gallant men who have died for love of a woman but none that I know of who have perished for a robot. At least not yet. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Femme fatale abound in history and literature. They all have one thing in common. They possess a strange appeal which leads men to follow their siren song down the path to destruction. They also share another characteristic. They are human. Unlike Amelia Burke, who is a robot created for the express purpose of ensnaring one man. And she seems to be succeeding. Who is Amelia? What is she? I'm a woman, Harry. Really a very... Simple, predictable woman. Oh, let me contradict you. As a man who's not inexperienced when it comes to women, allow me to say that you're completely unpredictable and almost unknowable. If you're trying to confuse me, you're succeeding. All I know about you is that you're the most beautiful and charming woman I've ever met. Thank you. But who are you really? Who are your parents? Why did you suddenly appear on the scene to live with your uncle who never mentioned you all these years? I thought women were the curious sex. (laughs) Oh, you're unbelievable. We've been seeing each other for two weeks and you've never asked whether I was married or even engaged. Not a single question why we always meet in these little out-of-the-way places. The important thing to me is that we're together. I couldn't have said that better myself. But don't you sometimes long for a a little more privacy? That might be nice. I figured you might feel that way, so I spoke with a good friend of mine, a fellow who can keep his mouth shut, and uh, I've arranged for us to have the use of his apartment this Friday afternoon. He's going out of town for the weekend. How does that sound to you? Like everything else you say, Harry. Very nice. Amelia, my darling, you're wonderful. Just magnificent. Thank you, Uncle. Now, I think we ought to recheck your programming for the big date you have coming up on Friday. Who the devil is that? Just sit there, Amelia. I'll get rid of whoever it is. Gerald, it's a pleasure to see you, but you've really come at a time when... I'm sorry if I've interrupted anything. It's important that we talk. Important to whom? To you. This thing with Wilkerson has gone far enough, Arthur. As a matter of fact, it's gone too far. Well, that all depends on the point of view. Now, I'm not here to argue. I'm here to tell you, Arthur, that you must stop it now. Well, we don't like that very much, do we, Amelia? No, Uncle. Unless you stop. I intend to tell Wilkerson the truth. Calm down a minute, will you? I don't want to hear any of your pseudo-rational... Gerald, if Amelia were a real, as you put it once, flesh-and-blood woman, would you interfere? Come on. 
answer, would you? I refuse to answer any hypothetical question. Then I'll answer for you. You wouldn't. And why wouldn't you? I think I've already told because you. Because it wouldn't be any of your business. But just because Amelia is something out of the ordinary, you consider it your duty to warn Wilkinson, or better, to make him aware of what Amelia is. I intend to tell him, if that's what you mean. Believe me, Arthur, I'll do it. I believe you. Even though you're breaking a solemn promise. But have you ever thought of what Wilkerson will think of you when you come to him with this preposterous, incredible story? Uh, I'll make him believe me. You know better. And what's more, I'll see to it that Wilkerson will think you're jealous that you want Amelia for yourself. When I left, I knew that it was a stalemate. Arthur was right. Wilkerson would never believe me. But I was determined to do something. The problem was, what? When I was racking my brains for a solution, Amelia was pushing ahead as programmed. Amelia, why did you call and have me meet you here? Isn't this a good place? Out of the way and discreet? No, that's not what I meant. We had an appointment. Sit down, Harry. I think we have a lot to talk about. Whatever you have to say could be said better at the apartment. I'm sure you think so, Harry. You've changed. What is it? Has something happened? How is your fiancé? Her name is Nita Raven, if I am not mistaken. Oh. Well, I knew it had to happen sometime. It was too good to lie. Now you understand why I didn't come to the apartment and why I won't go to the apartment. I didn't know you were engaged. I am. And her name is Nita Raven, but uh, that doesn't mean I'm not interested in other women. Particularly someone as fascinating as you. Does Nita know about me? Of course not. But it's all right for me to know about Nita? I didn't tell you about her. Why not? Because you're too important to me. I was afraid that what's happening right now would have happened much sooner. Nothing's happening. Yes, that's what I mean. Oh, Amelia, we're two adults. You like me. Now, don't, 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 don't try to deny it. I see it in your eyes, the way you talk to me. And I am crazy about you. Now, let's forget about everything else and get over to Bob's apartment. You make it sound so simple. That's because it is. You belong to someone else. No one belongs to anyone else. Have you ever discussed that with Nita? Certainly. She knows that when we get married, we both don't stop living. She knows I'm not going to stop admiring beautiful women simply because I'm married. You may admire me to your heart's content. And you can do that here just as well as in your friend's apartment. Hello? May I speak with Amelia, please? Who's calling? Harry Wilkerson. Oh, Harry... I'm sorry, but uh, Amelia Professor doesn't want Moore, to... Uh... please forgive me. We've had our problems in the past, but I'm going to ask you for a favor. Uh, please, get her to come to the phone. Harry, I really don't want to interfere with my niece's life. And I also don't have that much influence. Well, what harm can there be? I just want to speak with her. All right, Harry. I don't promise anything, but I'll see what I can do. Call back in ten minutes. When he calls, Amelia, agree to meet him, and we'll proceed as planned. Amelia, I hope you notice where we're meeting. Very nice. A pleasant change. You haven't thanked me for coming. (laughs) Oh, you're something else. You really are. You refuse even to speak to me for three weeks... And then I finally get your uncle to bring you to the phone. Well, look. I've broken my engagement to Nita. Poor Harry. I don't want your sympathy. I want your love. My love has to be earned. And don't you think I've earned it? These past three weeks, I did everything I could to put you out of my mind, and look what happened. I don't know. Oh, I'd be driving to my laboratory. I'd see a blonde head in a taxi cab with another car, and... Well, I I couldn't wait to pass the car to make sure that it wasn't you. 
Do you know how many times I've run across the street because I thought I caught sight of you on the other side? You sound angry. Well, I am. That's never happened to me before. Not even with Nita? Let's forget about Nita, shall we? How did she take the news when you told her the engagement was off? I did not come here to talk about Nita. I'm here to tell you that we're having dinner every night this week and that we're spending the weekend at Lake Ferris. We're invited by some friends of mine who are anxious to meet you. I have plans for the weekend. Cancel them. I'm afraid I can't. Oh, really? I can break an engagement, but you can't even change an appointment? You seem to be under the impression that I asked you to break your engagement. Look, I think it's time we leveled with each other. You never asked me to break my engagement, but you made it perfectly clear that the only way we could have any relationship was if I gave up Nita. I was honest with you about my feelings. You can't fool me about yours. I know you're attracted to me. You going to deny that? No. I am attracted. All right, now we're making progress. I've broken a commitment, and I expect you to break... Why do you make this sound like a business deal? I thought you were more romantic. Well, I'm upset. I've never felt this way about any woman in my life, and at the... Well, at the same time, there's... Well, there's something about you that bothers me. I think you made a mistake. What? You've changed. When we first met, you were relaxed and happy. You made it clear you liked me. And you hoped I would like you. I did. Well, now you're a different man. Uptight, grim, distracted. I think you feel guilty about breaking your engagement. And if you do, there's no future for us. Oh, now, wh- Thank wait... Thank you for the lunch. Think about what I said, Harry. And then, call me. I promise I'll answer the phone. so hung up on romance, you don't dance very close. I'm sorry. Dancing isn't my strong point. I only know how to waltz and foxtrot. <laughs> I would have thought that you'd been the queen of disco in college. Would you have liked me better? Oh, it's impossible for me to love you any more than I do now. Shall we go back to the table? Oh, as you like. The Ferris's were disappointed they didn't meet you the other weekend. Tell them I'm flattered. I have a surprise for you. I love surprises. What is it? Here. Open this box. Oh, it looks like a ring, is it? Open the box. Well, do you like it? It's very nice. Very nice? That's an engagement ring. I'm asking you to marry me. I realize... And so all you have to say, I realize. I'll bet I'd get more reaction from a robot. Don't you ever say a thing like that? Never. It's disgusting. Well, 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 a reaction at last. You... You are exquisite. Promise me you'll never use that word again. What's wrong with exquisite? There's nothing to joke about. You know the word I mean. (laughs) I can think of a lot of words some ladies might object to, but... Harry! All right, all right. It will never pass my lips again. Now slip on the ring and we'll seal our engagement with a kiss. Harry, I know you're going to think this is silly, but... This isn't the ring I wanted. Darling, if you knew how long I searched for... It's beautiful, but call me sentimental. The ring I want is the one you gave Nita. Oh, come on, Amelia. Nita's out of my life. I'm not going to ask for the ring back. If she had any pride, she'd give it back. Well, forget it. I'll get you any ring you want except that. That's the only way I'll really feel sure of your love. I want the ring that Nita has. Otherwise, we're not engaged. A famous poet commenting on the human race wrote, The female of this species is deadlier than the male. I don't think anyone can question that some form of robot is a definite part of man's future. But are we going to have to apply the same yardstick to the automatons? We should have the answer when I return with the final act of lifeblood shortly. 
you ever wished your bank would pay you interest on your checking account? Wouldn't it only seem fair? We at Otero Savings think so. That's why we're offering the check-in account. It's better than checking because you get five and a quarter percent interest. At Otero, you get the best of both. The interest-earning capability of a savings account with the complete flexibility of a checking account. The Otero Check-In Account. From Otero Savings. Member FSLIC. You missed Jimmy's birthday party. I was with a client, and I stopped And Jimmy's and... your child. I was only going to have one drink. I didn't mean I to I know. You one. never mean to, but I've had it. Mary. You quit drinking or I'm leaving. Now, Mary, please. Jim, Sound please. familiar? That was a scene from my life. My wife thought I had a drinking problem. I didn't, but I was scared. I wasn't in control, and I didn't want to lose my family. We went to the recovery center. We worked together and solved our problems. Life can be good again. Call the Recovery Center, 825-4951. The Recovery Center. Perfection is the goal of many driven people. The fact is that absolute perfection is unattainable. It should be, because if you stop to consider... Life with a perfect man or woman would be rather formidable. Harry Wilkerson doesn't think so. He's fallen in love with a perfect woman, Amelia Burke. He's unaware that Amelia is a robot, the creation of a genius who holds a long-standing grudge against him and who's determined to use Amelia to extract a terrible revenge. I thank you for the invitation, Gerald, but I never dine out. I thought you might make an exception, Professor. The dinner is an occasion for me to congratulate you upon the success of your stratagem to even the score with Wilkerson. I think your congratulations are a trifle premature. Really? Wilkerson's broken off his engagement to Nita. He's a man driven almost to the point of distraction. He's on such a short fuse that his colleagues object to working with him. What more do you want? I want him to have the final gift. The thing he wants more than anything in the world. I want to see him married to Amelia. But he hasn't seen or spoken with Amelia in a month. And she's seeing other men. Well, you seem well informed. Have you talked with Wilkerson? Yes, but not about Amelia. She's a subject he refuses to discuss. I've tried. I don't understand this sudden revival of interest in Amelia on your part. Arthur, you produced a robot so perfect that she can pass as a woman. Now, that's, that's a scientific miracle. I'm your best friend. Yet I haven't the slightest idea of how you did it. In my position, wouldn't you be curious? Well, this is my life work. You're a physician, and quite frankly, the process is so complicated, it would take weeks for me to explain the various intricate and even dangerous steps I used to create the finished product. Well, couldn't you simplify parts of it for me? I'm not asking you to divulge the secret of how you simulated the marvelous skin... Or how you solved the problem of the blood that seems to course through her veins. But her responses are what fascinate me. How do you program her so that her answers to questions follow a logical train of thought? Well, I'll give you a hint, Gerald. Stimuli. Everything in nature responds to certain stimuli. And they, in turn, trigger other responses. Uh, that's logical, but... Vague. And that's the way I intend for it to remain. I'm opposed to the deception you're practicing. It isn't only Wilkerson who has fallen under the spell of this... this mindless robot. But now she's deceiving others. Now that oh, is what I... fools, all of them. And that's exactly the point I'm going to prove. That's how I'll get my satisfaction. <laughs> Arthur was right. After long hours considering how I could expose Amelia as a robot, I hit upon the idea that the weakness was Amelia herself. Because of my own experience with her, I had some understanding of how she'd been programmed. I felt that perhaps I could disturb her pattern enough to expose her. But I had to get her alone. Now, Arthur rarely went out. He monitored her phone calls. But I knew he would attend an important lecture on DNA and cloning the following night. So I called and got her permission to visit. It's so nice to see you again, Gerald. Have you missed me? How could I not miss such an interesting person as you, Amelia? You're much more interesting than I. Did your uncle tell you to say that? 
My uncle? Amelia, I know who you are. Or rather, what you are. Of course you do. Your uncle Arthur's dearest friend. How do you know that? The way I know everything else. I just know it. (sighs) Well, what do you and your uncle talk about? Can't we talk about us? We can. But I'd rather have you tell me what you and your uncle talk about. We... We don't talk about much. Are you fond of your uncle? I love him. I owe him everything. What do you do when you're alone with him? Mostly we listen to records. What kind of records? All kinds. Music, talk. Oh, lots of talking records. That's how I learned to dance. Talk or music? Both. That's how you learn everything, then. Through records? I beg your pardon? Don't you think it might be nice if I made some records and we listened to them? I'd enjoy that. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, Harry, what a delightful surprise. Of course I mean it. I mean everything I say to you. That's ridiculous. We're not playing a game. There's no winning or losing. Of course I missed you. Yes. Yes. I'll be there. Was that... Harry Wilkerson? Yes, and he has wonderful news. I'm sorry, Gerald, but I must leave now. I'm going to meet Harry. You can stay and wait for Uncle if you like. I'm sure you understand. Amelia, let me pinch you. (laughs) Why? To make sure that dreams come true. Come in, come in. What a lovely apartment. I told you you'd like it. Oh, why the devil did it take you so long to get here? Think of what we've been missing. Think of the happiness we've lost that can't ever be. Don't you have something to show me? All right. Hold out your hand. There. That's what you wanted. Oh, yes. You know what's amazing? That even fits. Amelia, with this ring, I thee wed. Oh, Amelia, I need you so desperately. When are we going to get married? Whenever you like, my darling. Well, isn't the lady supposed to set the date? Oh, I suppose so. I'll have to speak to my uncle. I wonder how he'll feel about your marrying me. He wants what I want and what's best for me. Oh, if you knew how I missed not seeing you this past month... I thought the loneliness would gradually disappear, but it only got worse. And as the days went by, I, I I missed you more and more. My poor darling, you could have saved yourself all that misery if you'd just gotten the ring for me right off. That was the most difficult and painful thing I've ever been faced with. Did Nita try to... Oh, I mean, I love you. I, I, I've proven that. I, I'm warning you, the subject of the ring is taboo. We'll never mention it again. Okay. If you want. After all, a wife must please her husband. Arthur, I'm here to check on a rumor that I hope is false. Well, if it's about Amelia and Harry Wilkerson getting married, it's true. Uh, have you any idea what a hell's brew you're compounding? Harry Wilkerson is no robot. Whatever you may think of him, he's a human being with feelings and sensibilities. You're becoming hysterical. Wilkerson's forthcoming marriage to Amelia is none of your business. That you persist in making it so leads me to conclude that you're not entirely over your early infatuation with Amelia. Oh, you really believe that, don't you? Of course. And as Amelia's creator, I can understand it. She was designed to be irresistible and also controllable only by me. She was created to please men. And she has. Arthur, I implore you, as a friend, as someone who has your best interest at heart, give up this insanity. I know you're sincere, Gerald, but nothing you say or do will make me change my plan. And what happens when inevitably, at some time in the future, Wilkerson discovers the truth about Amelia? Now, that's an interesting speculation. I'm looking forward to that day. What do you suppose he'll do? I have no idea. But what will you gain? If you told Wilkerson the truth now, 
Wouldn't that be humiliation enough for him? And satisfaction enough for you to know that you have so completely fooled a scientist like Wilkerson that... Save your breath, Gerald. Nothing you say will stop me from walking down that church aisle tomorrow to give the bride away. Well, you've caught me at a terrible time. Didn't you know that I'm getting married in an hour? Not if I can help it. <laughs> what the devil is it? Harry, your marriage to Amelia will be a disaster. It's simply a plot on the part of Arthur Moore to make a fool of you. Have you lost your mind? Amelia is a mannequin, an automaton, a robot, programmed by Moore. Jerome, I can see you believe that. I'm sorry for you. I don't know what's caused this apparition, but I... I'll just... prove it to you. Look, I'm meeting my best man in 45 minutes. I'm already if late. you're a I... scientist, you'll at least let me prove the truth of what I'm saying. Well, how do you propose to do that? And just meet me at the church in half an hour. But don't let Arthur Moore or Amelia know that you've arrived. I conceived a wild plan, but it was the only thing I could dream up. I raced to the church, praying that Moore's eagerness would have him bring Amelia early. When I saw I was right, I stopped in the minister's study briefly, and then entered the room where they were. Gerald, what a surprise. Come to say a last fond farewell to the beautiful bride? Something like that. And also to ask no, you... No, 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 no more pleading with me to... Oh, excuse me, I see that I'm wanted in the minister's study. I'll be right back, my dear. And don't be too nice to our dear friend, Gerald. Amelia, come with me. Where? To meet someone you know and like. Quickly now. Harry, my darling. Don't you know it's bad luck for the groom to see the bride before the wedding? That's an outdated superstition, Amelia. All right, Gerald, get on with it. I'm warning you, I've come prepared. Get on with what? Amelia, do you like me? Of course, Gerald. Very much. You are one of the most fascinating men I've ever met. All right, what is this rigmarole? Quiet. Amelia, will you kiss me? Of course. Now, wait. Shut up. I'm giving a scientist's proof. Kiss me, Amelia. Amelia, you're truly a lovely, bewitching creature. Will you marry me? Why, of course I... Oh, oh, no, wait, wait. No, Uncle Arthur told me not to be too nice to you. Uncle... Uncle Arthur told... I mean, you... What about me? How can you think of anyone else when... I, I want you to marry me, Amelia, to be my wife. You want to, don't you? Of course, dear Gerald. I've always liked you. You know that. Shut up, you stupid mindless... There's no sense in shouting at her, Harry. She's only a robot. Only... I told you I came prepared. And now I'm going to prove it. What's going on here? Wilkerson, what, what have you lost your mind? Put that knife down. Not until I've destroyed your monstrous creation. Now watch while I rip her insides out. Stop him! Gerald! Somebody! There! Right where your heart is supposed to be and there! Uh, and there! Uh, stop there. it! Stop there. it, Harry! And now he's laughing at Amelia! Look! Don't you see? The professor is bleeding also. Gerald, I, maybe you were right. Harry, get an ambulance here immediately. Move, man! Too, too, too late, Gerald. The knife has gone too deep. Too much loss of blood. Don't talk, Arthur. It doesn't matter now. You see, I was telling the truth when I said I gave ten years of my life to me. I did give her life, Gerald. My own life's blood. The story never made the newspapers. When the coroner told the district attorney that Amelia was indeed a robot, the state felt there was no way they could prosecute Wilkerson for murder or even manslaughter. Until now, I've kept quiet. But I never stopped wanting to tell the story to the world. And 
quite a story it is. Harry Wilkerson resigned and left town quietly. You may take the story as a fairy tale, a horror story, or as a warning. The choice is yours. Oh, and uh, there is another aspect to this story that should be considered. I'll be right back to explore it with you. that the district attorney felt the state couldn't prosecute Harry Wilkerson for the murder of a robot. But if it was indeed Wilkerson's knife that was responsible for the lifeblood seeping from Professor Arthur Moore, could that perhaps be construed as murder? Or at least manslaughter? For you lawyers in the audience, a pretty little legal problem. One for which I should be grateful for your guidance. Our cast included John Beale, Marion Seldes, Ralph Bell, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. So this is your room, Rodney. It's very nice. Oh, but it's my so hot and stuffy. Oh, dear me, let's open a window. It, it's midsummer, and you have all the windows closed. There, that's better. Now, let's see your butterflies. Well, aren't you going to show me your collection? Rodney, why are you staring like that? Rodney, don't come any closer to me. I don't like it. Rodney, what's the matter with you? This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant Five years we ate from the same dish, slept in the same bed, shared the same room. She never had a single thought that didn't echo in my own head. And then one morning we awoke from a dreamless sleep and discovered that we were strangers. This from an English novel. It is called The Lover I Never Knew. How well do you know your lover? I'm sorry, Mrs. Granby. What are you telling me, Lieutenant? You have to face it. You're saying my husband robbed a bank? He is a member of a gang that robs banks regularly. I know that's a lie. How do you know? I've been married to that man almost 50 years. He can't keep a secret from me. <laughs> I don't know, ma'am. Looks like he kept a pretty big one. <laughs> drama, The Sweet Smell of Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Bryna Rayburn. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It isn't because she's 70. Oh, no. Ella, or Mom, as she's called by everybody, is still as spry as she ever was. It's just that she's thinking about something. What? Well, she doesn't really know. It's just that things have been different somehow between her and her husband, Tom, who everyone calls Pop. Different in what way? Well, she doesn't know that either. But it doesn't matter right now. She's going out in the boat with Pop, the old reliable Becky Ann, a 28-foot cabin cruiser that may be showing its age 
But he's still the soundest little vessel in the harbor. Hey, Skipper. It's crew coming aboard. Oh, what'd you bring for? Oh, why don't you wait and be surprised? Well, it smells good. Uh, Hop down, or do you need a helping hand? No. <laughs> still as spry as you was when you were 18. All right, cast off. Aye, aye, Skipper. And we're away. <laughs> running, Skipper. Blues? Well, that'll be supper. Hey, come forward. Hmm? I want to show you something. Oh, well, what is it? Take a look. Why, it's, it's a brand new ship to shore telephone. Give that lady a cigar. <laughs> I'm not surprised I'd smoke it, too. Where'd you get it? What kind of question is that? I bought it, naturally. Uh, I've seen that model in the store, in Braxy's. It costs $2,400. Well, I've done a little better than that. I hope you're feeling chilly. You know that cashmere coat you always wanted? Look at here. All right, Thomas Taylor Granby, all right. Now, you just tell me, where did all this money come from? Uh, where? Now, you just give me the answer. All right. You're entitled to an answer. Now, quit stalling, Thomas. I won it. You mean you were gambling? Well, in a way, I guess that's right. I won it in a lottery. When? Last week. You never told me. That's right, I didn't. And why not? Well, I was afraid you'd want to do something foolish with the money. Something foolish? Huh. Yeah, like putting it in the bank, I suppose. Well, yeah, something like that. Uh, how much did you win? Quite a bit, you might say. How much is uh, quite a bit? Now, there's no use pumping me, Ella. I'm not going to tell you. What are you saying? I decided if I told you, I'd, well, I'd destroy your peace of mind. You lay awake nights just worrying about it. But you've got to tell me. You can have everything your heart desires, but that's as far as it goes. This is going to be my secret. Now, we never had any secrets from each other. I figure it's about time we started. Now, Thomas, I'm not about to accept this from you. Oh, what you want to do, some silly arguing or some serious fishing? Hello? Uh, Mama? Well, finally. Why'd you let me ruin supper? You could have called sooner. Yes, but this is the first chance I got. A yeah, likely story, but we won't press it. Now, where you been? Oh, never mind. You won't tell the truth anyhow. When are you coming home? Or can't you tell me that neither? Matter of fact, I really can't tell you when I'm coming home. I, I don't know that myself. Thomas, have you been drinking? Oh, I'm stone cold sober. Well, where are you? I'm in jail, Mama. You... You're where? Oh, never mind. I heard you. I'll be right there. Yes, ma'am? Want some help? No. I was told to look for Lieutenant Sims. That's me. Uh, you Mrs. Granby? Yes, sir. Hmm. Well, why don't we just sit down for a minute here? Oh, where's my husband? He's being held. And what does that mean? M Mrs. Granby, what do you know about all this? About all what? Well, your husband will be arraigned before a judge. He can be represented by counsel. He should be. The judge will probably set bail. But what did he do? Well, he's in it up to his neck. You still haven't told me. He's been caught with the money. What money? The stolen money. What stolen money? He won it in the lottery. Oh. <laughs> Is that what he told you? Yes. He, he said he won it in the lottery. He won $30,000 in a lottery. $30,000? Mm -hmm. Which lottery was that? Well, I, I don't know. He, he didn't tell me. Well, he didn't tell me either. So I checked around the various lotteries. Nobody paid off a winner named Thomas Granby. Well, he, he may have used an assumed name. Good thinking. But all the $30,000 winners are already accounted for. I say all. I can assure you there weren't that many. Well, he, he's never lied to me in all these years we've been married. Really? How do you know? Well, I... I never lied to him. I just know, that's all. Well, you must admit there's a first time for everything. Well, can I see him? Sure. And you'd better tell him to start talking. And make some sense. I know a 
what you're going to say. But I don't know what you're going to say. I lied to you about the lottery. All right. The fact is, I found the money. Well, that doesn't sound much better. But it's true. $30,000. Please, Mama, I'm telling you the truth. I found it. Yes? I found it in a bag. A bag? Yeah, one of those big shopping bags. You know the kind you get at Millsaps? Yeah, but where did you find it? I found it on the dock. All this money in this big paper bag on the dock? Yeah, I came across this bag, and I couldn't imagine what was in it. Maybe garbage. And I looked inside, and it was just packed with these $10 bills. I didn't think there were so many $10 bills in the whole world. Well, didn't you bother to find out who the owner might be? Well, it was nighttime. There wasn't a soul on the dock. And besides, what was it doing there, anyhow? And so? I figured it was stolen money. Oh, Thomas. Since they were tens, they probably wouldn't have been marked. They only do that with very big bills, you know. No, I don't know. Have you become an expert on crime? Please, Mama. It was wrong. All wrong. It, it's just that... I, I don't know. I worked hard. I thought we'd have enough to retire on comfortably. But things get tighter every year. Well, that doesn't give us the right to steal other people's money. No. It doesn't give us the right. I know that. I don't know what got into me. I, I, I shouldn't have done it. But I did. Well, where's the rest of the money? I turned it all over to the police when they arrested me. I didn't try to hide anything. They didn't believe a word I'm saying. Well... Do you believe me? Sure. I mean it. I, I mean it, too. I have an idea they're going to set a very high bail. They want to hold me here. Well, we'll get a lawyer. That's going to cost money. Don't worry, Skipper. We may have to sell the boat. No. No, we'll do something. We'll think of something. Okay, Granby. You want to talk about it? I told you the truth, Lieutenant. Sure, sure. Why don't you believe me? Uh, let me tell you a little story. Last month, the Third Merchants Bank of Westfield was held up. There was a quarter of a million dollar payroll ready to go to the steel mill. The bandits got away with it. Are you accusing me? There were four men who did the actual stick-up. The fifth man was in the car. That one was you. It was not. The 30,000. That was your piece. <laughs> You're quite a guy with the wheel, aren't you? Yeah, but Lieutenant, I what never did. What did you do before you retired? And you were a chauffeur, weren't you? You've been driving cars professionally all your life. Well, that's true, but I... And all the money had been registered. Your pals knew about it. So far, yours is the only dough that's come to the surface. Lieutenant, I know it looks bad, but I'm innocent. Mm-hmm. Then how do you account for the money? I told you. I found it. Yeah. Well, at least get yourself a better story. Lieutenant Sims. Mm hmm. Oh, uh, you're uh, you're what's his name's wife? Yeah, uh, his name is Thomas Taylor Granby. Mm hmm. So, what can I do for you? I owe you some money. Really? How do you figure you owe me money? Well, it's been established that the money my husband found was stolen. The money he found. I believe he found it, but that doesn't change the basic character of the money itself. I returned my cashmere coat. And the new ship to shore telephone to the stores. Since I know now what kind of money bought them, I was able to get the refunds in full. Now, here you are. $2,840. Oh. Now, take it. It's yours. Mrs. Granby, <laughs> you're quite a lady. Now, tell me, Lieutenant, the truth. Do you believe my husband is guilty? Mrs. Granby, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but... The answer is yes. I see. Mrs. Granby? <laughs> Mrs. Granby, you all right? Well, are, are you feeling all right? Well, do, do you mind if I just, just sit down oh, sure, for here, a minute? Oh, sure, here. You're right here. Just right in this chair. That's it. Oh, there you are. 
Take it easy now. Yes. Here, let, let me get you a drink from the water cooler. Uh, no, I, I don't want to put you to any trouble. What kind of trouble? It's just right over here. There you are now. You take some of this. Oh, yes. Yes. Maybe, maybe thank you. a cup of coffee instead, huh? You know, we always have some going around here. No, 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 thank you. All right. You okay now? Yes, I, I, I think so. Hey, look, I'm sorry. It's my fault. Your fault? Well, I shouldn't have come out with it, you know, bang, just like that. When you asked me if I thought he was guilty. Oh, you were only telling the truth, weren't you? Well, after all, I had no right to say it. A person is innocent until he's proven guilty by a court of law. I guess sometimes we... Well, we sort of forget that. Yes, but you... You believe he's guilty. Now, look, I've... I've got opinions. Yes. And they're based on experience. But that... It, it doesn't mean I have to be right all the time. But are you usually right? <clears throat> you know, it's a hot day out there. See, maybe I could fix it up to give you a ride home. Home? No, I, I, I don't want to go home. Oh? Okay, whatever you say. I... I'm afraid to go home. Afraid? Of what? Of myself. Why would you be afraid of yourself? Well, I... I'm afraid of what I'm starting to think. Very much afraid. Oh, uh... Why? Well, suddenly he has $30,000. 30000 stolen dollars. And he... He lied to me when I asked him the first time. And now he... He says he found... Found it. Well, maybe he did. You don't believe that, Lieutenant. Well, looking at it straight, facing up to the facts, Mrs. Granby, do you believe it? Now, I told you. I'm afraid of what I'm starting to think. Maybe I don't know him as well as I thought. Maybe no human being can ever really know another one, no matter how close you are. Is there always a part of you that is held back, that's closed off? Is he lying to me? Is he? Who knows at this point? Certainly it's a far-fetched story, Pop tells us. But the world, the real world, is crammed full of far-fetched, unlikely stories. Pity the poor writer of fiction. How he labors to create a fairy tale in a world of fantasy. When all the time, in the real world, all around him, happening every day are true stories that are absolutely beyond belief. I'll be back shortly with Act. been the devout belief of the poets and the dreamers that the longer lovers live together, the more they understand each other. And yet, experience has taught us that many times to grow closer together is also to grow further apart. I was talking to the lieutenant, Pop. Yeah? Well, he says... I know what he says. He wants me to confess. Confess to what? Confess to driving the getaway car and the bank robbery. Well, how can I confess to that? I didn't, I didn't do it. Yeah. That don't sound like a vote of confidence. Well, why'd you say you won the money in a lottery? Can't a fellow lie to his wife about... about some money once in a while? Oh, not this kind of money. Okay. So I lost my head. It was money. Real money. For the first time in my life. I was tempted, and I gave in. Tell me, did you drive the getaway car? How can you ask that? Well, you miss being active. You drove for Mr. Sloan, was always up and around and on the go. And now you're retired. Oh, sure, there's the boat, but I can tell. 
You've been restless. I wasn't restless. I was just worried about money. You don't believe me. I'll stand by you. It's not the same thing. All right. I believe you. I wish you could say that a little more enthusiastically. I, I wish I could, too. It's the lieutenant. Huh? Hey, can I, can I come on board? Oh, are you wearing sneakers? No. Uh, I'll take your shoes off. Okay. Uh, hey. Nice little boat. Uh, after me, it's his pride and joy. Or maybe I come after it. I wonder if he'll ever see her again. Well, it depends. On what? On whether or not someone can convince him to see a reason. That's someone I can bet. Is me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it has to be you. I couldn't. Oh, what do you want him to do? Confess? That's the least of it. See, it doesn't really matter if he confesses or not. We've got him with the money and no way to explain it. So he can sit in jail for the rest of his life. But what do you want him to do? Talk. Tell us who his buddies were. Oh. That's how most crimes are solved. You get one of the perpetrators, then you deal with him, and he gives you the evidence you need to bag the rest. Usually a fellow like that can make a very good deal for himself. How good? Well, if there isn't any murder involved, and in this case there isn't, such a fellow can practically walk away from it. You you mean he can go free? Mm Mm-hmm. That or a very short sentence. And it usually gets suspended. Now, if your husband gave us the other people... He could be back on this boat before you know it. What Confederates? We've been married for 48 years. It's been smooth sailing, hasn't it? You always felt you could trust me, didn't you? Well? Yes. You know why? Because it was easy. Nothing ever came up. Now, for the first time, I find myself in trouble, and where are you? Where are you when I need you? I said I'd stand by you. And I said it isn't enough. What do you want me to say? I want you to say you believe I'm innocent. And if you can't say that, I don't want you to say anything at all to me ever again. Thomas! I don't care how bad it looks, how open and shut the cops may think it is. I'm innocent. And you either believe me or you don't. Oh, Thomas. Thomas. Oh, come on now. Don't get weepy on me. Oh, I... I'm so sorry. It's just I was so scared. That we got it straightened out finally? Oh, yes, Thomas. Me help rob a bank? How could you now, believe... Thomas, please. We shouldn't talk about it anymore. We have more important things to do. We have to get you out of here. Yeah. Next time you come to visit, bring me a pie and hide a saw blade in it. Oh, Thomas. Make it a blueberry pie. Now, how did the money in that bag ever get on the dock? How do I know? Oh, we have to find out. (laughs) How can we find out? I'm going to find out. How? I wish you wouldn't ask me that, sir. Just yet. How did the money get on the dock, Mrs. Lieutenant? Granby, I don't... I know what you're going to say. It didn't get on the dock. Oh, please, just, just go along with what me. What is the point in speculating? In your experience, has money ever been left anywhere before? Well, yes, it happens. You know, kidnappings, ransom money... But there's no case of that current that I know of. And what else? Oh, pay off. What kind? Any kind. Political, maybe. But why on the dock? L- like I said, this is all speculation. Now, tell me if this makes sense. Drugs. Well, why not? But, but how do you tie that into a bank robbery? Well, it, it could be that a man involved in the bank robbery wanted to invest the proceeds in drugs. So he, he agreed to leave the money in a bag at the particular dock in payment. But 
something went wrong. Yeah? Now, the people who were supposed to pick it up never came. Or maybe it was left at the wrong dock. How could it be left at the wrong dock? Well, criminals never make mistakes. They're all such intellectual giants. Uh, no, of course not. Well, that could mean Thomas is telling the truth when he says he found it. Yeah, if you want to draw a very long bow. Or... Well, why is it long? Now, I've been thinking. You say you've got him signed, sealed, and delivered for a trial. Yes, I'm afraid the evidence is against him. Now, all you've got is the bag of money. It isn't beyond belief that he could have found it. Well, it would have been better for him if he turned it in. Remember, he was caught when he spent some. Yeah, sure, but you can't throw the book at him for that. And the jury would understand. Besides, he has a clean record. He's never been in trouble. Well, for your sake, I hope you're right. Well, are there any clues? Clues? What kind of clues could there possibly be? Well, there's the shopping bag Thomas says he found the money in. Did he turn it over to you? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it was a shopping bag. Well, did you examine the bag? We had no reason to examine the bag. But, but if you believe Thomas, would you have a reason to examine the bag? Could, could I see that bag? Of course. Oh, please, Lieutenant. Millsaps. That's right. That's what Thomas told me. Now, why would this person put the money in a shopping bag from Millsaps? Why? Well, because it was handy. Is it handy? Would it be handy to you? Does your wife shop in Millsaps? Oh, not all the money I make. Well, who does shop in Millsaps? People like the Sloans. Thomas and I were in service. I was housekeeper and he was chauffeur. Do you know the kind of people who shopped in Millsaps? Millionaires. Or people who were trying to make an impression. Well, anybody can get a shopping bag from anywhere. Well, this is the bag. Do you notice anything about it? Just a bag. Smell it. What? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, it does have a nice smell to it. Mm -hmm. Perfume. Do you notice anything distinctive about it? Nah. All perfume smells alike to me. Yeah, but they're not alike. And even though it's faint, you you smell it again. It's very, um... Uh... Fresh. Uh, uh, fresh, mm. yeah. It smells like uh, flowers. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean fresh flowers, not phony ones. Yeah, well, it should. You couldn't buy a more expensive perfume. Mrs. Sloan used it. That's how I know it. For crying out loud. You mean this could be Mrs. Sloan's shopping bag? No. Both Sloans are dead. Wonderful people. That's why Thomas and I retired early. Well, then why does this bag smell from that perfume? Why? Evidently, somebody bought some. Sure. But wouldn't it be wrapped up? And, and how would that odor last so long anyhow? Because I think it was improperly wrapped. And for some reason, the bottle may have been cracked. I think if you look closely, this might be a stain. Yeah? Now, whatever the reason, we still have the fragrance. Yeah, but where does this get you? Perhaps we could find out who bought the perfume. Yeah. And what would that prove? Well, it would prove who owned the shopping bag. Oh, please, Lieutenant, you must admit there could be something to it. The name of the perfume is Fleur de Nuit. Look, it doesn't add up to anything. Maybe. It all depends on who is doing the figuring. Mrs. Timmons, I am uh, Madame Lafarge. Oh, yes. Uh, I have just come from France. I am associated with the company that manufactures Fleur de Nuit. Oh, oh, of course. Uh, well, I am traveling to visit all of the places that have been making such good sales for our perfume. And your store, Millsaps, it leads the rest. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> we do do a very good job with it. Uh, we are the most exclusive perfume. Oh, no question about it. And I should like personally to write a letter of appreciation to each and every one of our customers. Well, I think that's a marvelous idea. Uh, so, uh, do you have for me a listing of those who have purchased a fleur de nuit from this establishment? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Oh, good. I can have it sent to your hotel, madam. Uh, oh, where are you staying? Oh, it is not a large list, no? 
It would have, oh, 15, 20 names, I suppose. Oh, well, then, perhaps, since I am here now, I could wait, if it is no trouble. Oh, it's no trouble at all. Oh, uh, there's a young lady who had a problem, I remember. Oh, a problem? Oh, yes, you see, she'd been shopping in the store. She bought a bottle of perfume, and she claimed that when she arrived home, we had sold her her broken bottle. Oh! We made oh. good naturally, but you might drop her a special note. Oh, I shall, I shall. Oh, she raised quite a fuss, <laughs> stormed into my office. She isn't our typical Millsaps customer. Oh. A rather brassy, if I do say so, vulgar young woman. But what can you do? It isn't the old days when you could simply refuse to sell that sort. Today there are laws. Uh, a pity. Anyone with money is as good as anyone else. I remember her name. Maudie Drake. Here, I'll write it down for oh. you. <laughs> A.T. Balboa. Oh, my, how that place has come down to you. Mordy Drake. Yes. Mm. I suppose a letter from you would help matters considerably. Oh, but yes. After all, anyone who can spend $200 for a bottle of perfume is entitled to a letter, whether they deserve it or not. <laughs> Here we see Mom in action as, of all things, a detective. Of course, she doesn't have a license, which could get her into trouble with the law. And she doesn't have experience, which could get her into trouble with the underworld. It is this type of double jeopardy that we shall follow in Act Three shortly. yourself has become almost mandatory these days if one is to survive the financial crunch. We have more and more people learning how to cope with their autos, appliances, plumbing, and electricity. However, it's one thing to be a do-it-yourself house painter. It's quite another to be a do-it-yourself detective. Yeah? I am uh, Madame Lafarge. So? I am a directoire in the Fleur de Nuit perfumes. Oh, sure. Well, come on in. Oh, thank you. No, I, I am told you had the most unfortunate experience. Oh, yeah. Well, the store made it good. Oh, I am so happy. I mean, I had to straighten out that dame. The one in the store. Oh, then there are no more complaints. No. Everything's A-OK. -okay. Oh, may I ask, if why do you purchase Fleur de Nuit because it is the most expensive perfume you can buy. Oh. You see, madame, I learned a lesson. Mm -hmm. You want a man to have respect for you? He's got to treat you to the best. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I live in this apartment. You couldn't pay more for one like it. My clothes, everything. And that is why you buy things in Millsaps. Because it is the most expensive store in town. Oh, Good. It is a philosophy of life that has its points. Thank you very much. And I hope you will continue to enjoy Fleur de Nuit. Until they come up with one that's more expensive. <laughs> it's about time you got here, Harry. What's the matter? Well, I don't know. A dame. An old dame came by the apartment. So? Well, she gave me a song and dance about working for the Fleur de Nuit Perfume Company. Why should it be a song and a dance? You throw away enough of my good doll on that slop. Well, she had a French accent. Why not? She works for a French perfume company, doesn't she? It was a phony French accent. What do you know about it? I used to be in show business. <laughs> you call what you did show business? 
I guess so. You sure showed plenty. Now, look, one thing I got is an ear. This was an old dame from the Midwest that was putting on a French accent. So, I followed her when she left. What do you mean? Well, she got into a bus, I got into a cab. Where'd she go? Down to the fisherman's dock. Yeah? Then she got on a boat. It was called the Becky Ann. And then what'd she do? Nothing. She just sat there. I don't know what you're trying to make of it. We better find out who she is. And uh, Lieutenant Sims? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Uh, come here, come here. Sit down. Oh, thank you. Now, tell me, who's Morty Drake? What do you know about Morty Drake? Oh, nothing. Do you know anything about her? Why? Oh, that, that shopping bag? Yeah. Now, I traced it to a Miss Morty Drake, 80 Balboa. What do you mean you traced it? How, how did you trace it? Well, I, I went to Millsaps. Yes? And they told me that the shopping bag must have been used by a Miss Morty Drake. Well, no, I, I deduced that. You did? Well, how? Well, they told me she had bought a bottle of Fleur de Nuit uh, perfume that turned out to have been broken. They told you that? Yeah. And the lady who was the manager told it to me. Yeah? Mm. What what made her tell you that? I mean, how did the subject happen to come up? Well, you see, I told her that I was a representative of the perfume company. I wanted to write a letter of appreciation to all of our customers. Now, one thing just led to another. You're saying that you went in there under false pretenses? Now, if I'd have gone there under true pretenses, she wouldn't have talked to me at all. Well, what you did was illegal. You impersonated... I didn't some... impersonate a police officer. Now, look, you, you just can't do this. Well, you're not doing anything. At least I located the bag for you. All right, all right. I just hope you didn't do anything else. Well, I... I went to see Miss Morty Drake. You what? Miss Morty Drake. At 80 Balboa. This girl, this Morty Drake, runs around with some very tough people. Well, I assumed as much. Well, you just can't do things like that. Why not? Because uh, you're not a police officer. Suppose she saw through you. For what reason? Look, these are tough, smart people. They suspect anything, everybody. How good was your French accent? Oh, well, it was good enough to fool Mrs. Timmons at Millsaps. Yeah? Mm. Well, I can only hope it fooled Miss Morty Drake. Where you been, Morty? Checking out the old dame. She's not French. Okay, she doesn't have to be. It's part of her act for a job. Look at all these guys that work in French restaurants. See how they put it on. Her name is Mrs. Ella Gramby. Yeah? You never heard it before? Gramby. Gramby. Why is it familiar? Her husband picked up your doll that night on the dock. Wait a minute. Yeah, wait a minute. You left it there for Leo to pay for all that grass. But stupid Leo goes to the wrong pier. So that's who she is, huh? What's she poking around for? She's telling the cops her husband found the dough. She's trying to prove he's telling the truth. How'd she ever find you? The bag. The one you left the dough in. It's just a shopping bag. How could she trace it? It's not just a shopping bag. It's from Millsaps. Why did you have to use that? It was the only one in the house. And why did you have to insist we should buy that marijuana with the dough? Because the dough is hot. What else could we do with it? Whose idea was to stick up at that bank in the first place? You should have known they'd have the money registered. Who said not to worry about it? There were ways to wash it clean, huh? Ah, ah, what's the use of all this talk? The old lady's got us over a bell. Oh, let's get out of town. No, not yet. Ask yourself, why is the dame poking around? I don't know. Think. It's because the cops are cold on this. It's her idea. Why should the cops bother? They got this chump, her husband. He can take the fall for the stick-up. They're happy. No, she's freelancing. On her own. Terry, what do we do if the cops begin to believe her? What can happen? Well, the cops will know I bought perfume in Mill Saps. Yeah, then what? Well, that'd mean I had a shopping bag like the one the money was found in. Yeah, so? Well, you and me, were tied to it. Listen to the DA, will you? <sighs> this is a trial now. 
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, money from the bank stick-up was found in a shopping bag from Millsaps. Oh, Harry. It is a known fact that Morty Drake buys his stuff there. Ergo, and to wit, demonstrandum, this proves that Morty Drake and her paramour, one Harry Watts, are guilty of the crime. <laughs> now, what jury would believe that, huh? We gotta get rid of her. Uh-uh. All we have to do is sit tight. Harry, all I know is this old dame was smart enough to find me. Therefore, she's got to be smart enough to convince the cops sooner or later. Isn't it a gorgeous day, Morty? Yeah. day like this seems wrong to kill somebody. Harry, this is something that's got to be done. All right. All right. Well, she don't know you, so you go ahead in. Yeah. Hey, lady. Yes? Is this uh, boat going anyplace? You want to hire it? How about a little spin around the bay? Cost you $15. Why not? Well, come aboard then. Uh, you want to take those heavy shoes off, huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Ready to go? Just hold it a second. What are you waiting for? We're waiting for me. Oh. How do you do, Madame Lafarge? Just keep the engine going, please, and head out. What do you want? The way it is, your husband's got to be guilty of the bank holdup, and we can't have you freelancing around till the cops finally get wise. What makes you think they're not wise now? You wouldn't be running around playing amateur Sherlock. Oh, no. You're in it all by yourself. So, you folks robbed that bank, huh? A little bit of help from a few friends. I guess you wanted to use some of the money to buy drugs. And, uh, you got your signals mixed. Am I right? You're really a very intelligent lady. I'm sorry we have to make this trip. Oh, what's going to happen to me? Looks a little rough. You could fall overboard. Uh, Everyone knows I can swim. Well, we could arrange something to take care of that. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. Now, let's see. Uh, You confessed to robbing the bank, huh? You threatened to kill me and throw me overboard. Like I say, I'm sorry. I don't go around looking for this kind of thing. So, now... Everything you said is part of the record. What record? Well, all boats keep records of everything that happens. Or they should. It's called a a ship's log. Now, mine is being kept by a crew member who's just below. He's moonlighting. His real job is with the city police. His name is Lieutenant Sims. Well, hello there. Is everybody having a nice trip? I thought I knew everything about you. But look, all this time you were an actress. You're also a detective. And you kept it all hidden. (laughs) That's right. I guess it's just as well that uh, we don't know everything about each other. Is there something I don't know about you? All these years, I wanted to be a crook. (laughs) Is that true? Mm. Real smooth gentleman type of crook, you know. Well, you sure kept it hidden. (laughs) Well, it's one of those things you toy with. Mm. But that night when I saw the money, and I thought it could be all mine, well, there was my life's ambition. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? I'm lucky. What kind of crook could be successful... He's married to a detective like you. Not only are there things we don't know about each other, there is also so much we don't know about ourselves. What is it that we really want to accomplish? Who is it that we really want to be? Not publicly, but somewhere deep in the recesses of our very private psyche. 
I shall return to develop this further shortly. Hello, this is James... Perfumes of Araby shall not sweeten his hand, said Shakespeare. And so, perfume once again figures in a story. Had the lady not had expensive tastes, she would have been free today. And there is a justice in this, because perfume, which is meant to hide and disguise, was used this time to expose and reveal. Our cast included Bryna Rayburn, Robert Dryden, Joe Silver, and E.V. Juster. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, all right, Frank. Uh, what is it that uh, plagues you? Those bells there, uh, hanging over the west window. Mm, yes, yes, I was admiring them. Beautiful, beautiful ancient art. I am always waiting for one of them to ring. By yourself? Without anyone touching it or even being near it. They have rung by themselves? One of them has. Now, I know it sounds impossible, absurd, but I find I wake up at night trembling, and then I can't get back to sleep. I, I lie awake for hours waiting. Here, when I'm at work at this desk as I'm sitting now, I am, I am filled with fear. Even as I talk to you, I'm waiting for that sound. No one hits it. It doesn't even move. A tone just comes out of it. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Thanks for joining us for the WAKR Radio Mystery Theater. We hope you've enjoyed tonight's mystery and that you'll join us again tonight at 1115 for the WAKR Radio Mystery Theater. Tell your friends about the best in radio drama exclusively at Akron Canton on 1590 WAKR. Your Mystery Theater presents... was it that said, a wise woman never yields by appointment. It should always be an unexpected happiness. That may very well be the ideal situation. However, we have those neglected ladies who keep waiting and waiting. And some of them have waited for so long that they cannot really be blamed if they take steps to arrange for the unexpected. What do you want? I want to gamble on you. I want to bet you really would like to get out. Get out? You're not in as deep as you think. We can say you cooperated with these people because we wanted to expose them. We? We. You need me. Look at me. Am I so hard to take? Oh, no. I'll save you, darling, from your worst enemy. Yourself. <laughs> The Old Maid Murders was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tammy Grimes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Here's a bit of philosophy that is 2,300 years old. A woman's time of opportunity is short. And if she doesn't seize it, no one wants to marry her. And so she sits and waits and watches for omens. Laura McRae has been confidential secretary to that renowned political scientist and advisor to presidents, Professor Morgan Lowcroft. 
for the past 12 years. And during all that time, she has been sitting and watching and waiting for omens that might suggest she could become something more. Unfortunately, there haven't been any. Come in, please. Well, Mr. McCray, come in. Have a seat. It's nine o'clock. You're right on time. Uh, did you have a good night's rest? No, Dr. Waller. I did not. Oh. Well, I may have to prescribe a sedative. I don't want to start that sort of thing. Well, we may need it for your treatment. I'm very tired, Dr. Waller. Do you mind if I go back to my room? Oh, no, by all means. Get some rest. You'll feel better. No, I won't feel better. Not till I find someone who believes me. Well, give me a chance to trust me. Why should I trust you? What have you got to lose? What have I got to gain? I've already lost everything. I'll never get another job. Uh, tell me what happened. I don't know what happened. Hmm. Now, how did it begin? When did it begin? I don't remember. You don't want to remember? Let me alone. You won't believe me. Tell me the truth, and I'll believe you. The truth. How did it begin? How did it begin? When did it begin? It never began. It always was. I loved him. Even before I met him. Does that make me sound crazy? No. It was always Dr. Lowcroft and Miss McCray. He was very good to me. But I didn't want that. I wanted him. There were women from time to time. He was a flirtatious man. But I didn't mind. They didn't mean anything. I had the best part of him. The part that negotiated with presidents and prime ministers. I was with him when he was truly alive. It's just... Yes. It's just that I wanted more. Oh, well, not much. Just a little bit more. I understand. No, you don't. And that morning you walked into the office, the way he always did, with that quick little smile on his face, and I said, good morning, Dr. Lowcroft. And you know, he would never say good morning to me. He would just wink his eye and say, Let's get to work, Miss McRae. Now come inside with this morning's tale of woe. Number one, you have to call the president. Yes, and who else? I should think you'd want to return the president's call immediately. Why? Because you always do. <laughs> you see how we become slaves of habit. Uh, read on, Miss McRae. Would you be willing to give the commencement address at Western University? No. And Miss Mallet's call? Ah, yes. Who is... Miss Marris. You've never heard of the beautiful, desirable Madeline Marris? Oh. I saw her latest film. Well, I believe you're blushing, Miss McRae. True, it was quite frank and even critical in certain places, but all in all a work of art, which is how one must look at these things, no? I suppose so. I ask myself, what would it be like to spend an evening with a woman of so much vitality? I phoned her and left word. I'm surprised she returned my call. It would be a surprise if she didn't return your call. Now, Miss McRae, I need your advice. I called Madeline Maris on the spur of the moment. But as you well know, I am not a spur of the moment person. Now, well, I, I need your guidance. After all, you're an expert on love. Mm -hmm. As a female, the fact is that love is for women. What did Lord Byron say? Man's love is of man's life, a thing apart. But is a woman's whole existence. Lord Byron never outgrew his juvenile fantasy. But he was right. Now, should I back away from Miss Madeline Maris? You're asking me for advice? Of course. You're the one person in the world I can trust completely. Dr. Lowcroft, I would rather you didn't involve me in these, in these affairs of yours. Mr. Cray, you know how we do things around here. Prepare me a position paper. Well? <sighs> yes, sir. Since Miss Maris's appeal could only be considered physical, there are those who would say you are exploiting her purely for pleasure. Uh, yes. It might prove difficult to shed Miss Maris should you tire of her charms. Why? She's America's sex goddess, and so people would assume that she was too much for you. Or perhaps you were not enough for her. You could become an object of ridicule. 
very incisively put, Miss McRae. Now you know why I've kept you all these years. <laughs> Dr. Lowcroft's office. One moment, please. It's Miss Madeline Manners. Are you here? Oh, well, so much for all our honest resolve and intelligent design. Hello there. Yes, himself. Uh, what did I have in mind? For dinner this evening. What? Huh? Oh, some quiet spot where we would not be besieged by the media. Oh, your place is fine. Seven is excellent, of course. Till then. Uh, make a note, Miss McRae. I need a bottle of Chateau Lafitte off shield. Uh, no, I better wait to see if she has the palate for it. For a first date, a very good domestic wine is in order. Dr. Lowcroft, are you really going to have a date with Madeline Maris tonight? Yes, my dear, and wish me luck. Dr. Lowcroft, look, don't I... look so troubled. I know how to be very discreet. It isn't that, it's... It's what? Uh, yes? I... I better answer the phone. Dr. Lowcroft's office. One moment. To Mr. Jeremy Wilmot. Are you in? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Jeremy, how are you? Yes, I just finished reading it. Mm-hmm. No, you're on to something. Oh, only a few suggestions. Uh, I made them on the margins. I'll send it down with my secretary. She'll guard it with her life. Uh, what's the best hotel on the beach? Uh, good. She'll be there this evening. Right. Goodbye, Jeremy. Now, how would you like a little vacation? Uh, in Florida. Where is that envelope? Uh, it's in my attaché case. Now, yeah, here it is. A vacation? In here, a manuscript by Jeremy Wilmot. The historic roots of the economies of emerging nations. It sounds grim, but it's great. Dr. Lowcroft. Now, you check into the Beach Royale for a few days and let yourself go. But I have so many things to do. You need a vacation. You're tense. You're nervous. Irritable, out of sorts. Oh. Whatever's gotten into you, a few days off will sweeten you again. But I can't spare the time. You know how we do things around here, Miss McRae. Now, I'll drive you to the airport myself. I knew, Dr. Waller, I was on a flight to Miami. You didn't think it unusual? He was always sending me off somewhere on an hour's notice. I was lucky it was Miami, Florida. Could have been Karachi, India. And, uh, and then what happened? You know what happened. I told this over and over. What happened, Miss McCray? The thing. The thing at the baggage claim. The manuscript envelope. It was in my suitcase. It was too big to fit into my carry-on bag. It was in my suitcase. And my suitcase wasn't there when I arrived in Miami. What did you do? I waited. I waited and waited. Then I went to see the person in charge. Uh, do you recall what you said to that person? I was very upset. I said, look here, my suitcase is missing. You've got to find my suitcase. And he said... Uh, Ma'am, we are doing our best. There's an important manuscript in that suitcase. Do you understand? Uh, you, you, you come in on flight seven from Washington, huh? I don't like to do this. I hate to try to impress you, but I'm working for Dr. Morgan Lowcroft. Well, well, I am doing the best I can. Now, if it's not good enough, maybe Dr. Morgan Lowcroft can come down here and look for a suitcase himself. Huh? But it'll be my fault if it's gone. Things like this simply cannot happen to me. Well, yeah, they can happen to anybody. Hey, Theodore, you put down that comic book and check to see is everything out on flight seven, huh? Yeah, I got a lady here, so you just keep on looking. Does this mean you haven't found my suitcase? Well, I'm going to turn the place inside out and upside down, okay? But everything was in that suitcase. Man, what's the problem? We don't find it. You get a whole brand new outfit on the house. But the manuscript. So it's a manuscript. There's got to be a duplicate copy, huh? <laughs> Why does it have to be the end of the world? I don't know what's the matter with me, son. I'm sorry. Well, you just write down where you're staying, huh? And I guarantee in one hour, one way or the other, you're going to hear from me. Well, how do you do? Oh, it's you. From the airline. Yes, ma'am. I thought I'd better bring it over myself. That can't be my suitcase. <laughs> it looks a lot worse than it is. It's destroyed. Well, we are sorry, ma'am. You get a new one. But how do you get so mangled? Well, we got this mechanical lefter, and sometimes... Well, anyhow, your clothes seem to be okay now. But anything you want to replace, well, we... The envelope. It's ripped. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't think there's more than maybe a couple of pages that might be read. Let me look. The first two, three, four, five, six pages have been torn. It don't look too bad. The whole thing appears to be so crumpled. I'll have to type a fresh copy. Uh, look, uh, do you want us to handle that for you? No, thank you. You've done enough. Well, now, you let us know if we can help out. I will. Goodbye. Yeah, you will have a nice vacation. <sighs> front desk. This is Miss McCray in 912. I would like a typewriter, paper, and some carbons, please. Oh, uh, no, I know it's difficult at this time of day. No, tomorrow morning will not do. I am working for Dr. Morgan Lowcroft. Yes. Uh, within 30 minutes? Thank you. If we are to consider... The specifics of the distribution of American military forces throughout the world. We may design the proper countermeasures to halt the insidious spread of American imperialism. What? Yes, Miss McRae. Miss McRae? There it was, Dr. Waller. I couldn't believe it. I read the entire manuscript and... Uh, uh, please, uh, calm yourself, Mr. Cray. Calm myself. I'm telling you about a plot to reveal the entire system of our defense. And you tell me to be calm. You must. It is important. I'm telling you that a man who operates on the highest levels of our government, who knows every single secret, is a foreign agent, and you want me to be calm? Miss Cray. I'm telling you... This man is a traitor and a spy. And you want me to keep calm. I don't know. I don't know if I would want her to be calm. After all, she's making quite a lethal charge. But then perhaps Dr. Waller knows something that's hidden from the rest of us at this point. Anyhow, we shall see who is going to keep calm in Act Two. But short of that, we can really use all the help we can get. It's all very well to advise people to be self-reliant, but then it all depends on the kind of self one has to begin with, right? I'm asking you to be calm, Miss McRae, so that you may give me a full description of the event. Dr. Waller, you already have that description. Now, let me see if I can understand what you're saying. What is there to understand? Uh, please, please, Miss McRae. Where is the difficulty? Morgan Lowcroft said to me, take this envelope which contains a manuscript by a Mr. Jeremy Wilmot and deliver it to him in Florida. Accidentally, I happened to see the contents of the envelope. It's a document written by Dr. Lowcroft himself, filled with the most vital military and economic secrets. Well, what did you do then? No, please. Don't pass this on as if it's merely a weather report. Do you realize the implications of what I've just told you? Yes. Do you believe what I just told you? I accept what you just told me. I'm sick and tired of being patronized by people like you. I'm going back to my room. You will go back to your room and do what? I am the last person in the world you can talk to. After me, who is it? <sighs> now, you claim it was a document filled with military secrets. It was. Your next move? I didn't know what to do. I sat there. Trying to think. I suddenly felt all alone in the world. I had to be in touch with someone. With something. Without knowing why, I turned on the television set. There was a marvelous burst of music and color. And her face. Madeline Morris's face was on the screen. I was so angry, I lost all control of myself. Somehow, I blamed her for what he had done. You blamed her? Why? I don't know why. It's just that I felt she was part of something that was corrupting him. I wanted to smash the TV screen, but I was afraid it would explode or something, so I turned it off. Yes. And then the phone rang. 
I let it ring. And then I thought I'd better answer. Hello. Again, this is Laura McRae. Yes. I'm Jeremy Wilmer. Oh. I do hope you've had a pleasant trip. Uh, hello. Yes. May I come up for a minute, Chris? Um. Uh, perhaps if you are busy, we could have some dinner. Oh. Uh, or a drink. At any rate, I, I cannot wait to see my manuscript and Morgan's suggestions. Why don't I just pick it up? No. I'll, I'll meet you downstairs. In the lobby. Well, did you meet him in the lobby? Dr. Waller, I wanted to get away from there. I wanted to run with that envelope. I wasn't going to give it to him. I wanted to get back to the airport. But how? And then I realized he didn't know me. He'd never seen me. So I took the elevator downstairs. I didn't meet him. But the trouble was, he met me just as I was about to go out the door. Oh, Miss McRae. Miss McRae, here I am. Uh, uh, Miss McRae, I'm Jeremy Wilmer. Uh, you see, I recognize the manuscript and uh, your cat in. Well, uh, here I am. Yes. So, uh, thank you very much for taking this trouble. Uh, uh, may I have it? What? Well, uh, no. No? Miss McRae, what, what did you just say? I said no. Well, I'm afraid I don't understand. You were sent here specifically to deliver this manuscript. Or to deliver it to me. You can't have it. Mr. Gray, is something the matter with you? I said you can't have it. Now, I must insist. Take your hands off me. Don't you dare touch me. Do you mean that uh, we're going to have a scene about this? You take your hands off me. Please, if something's the matter, let me help you. Get away from me. Hey, hey, what's going on? This man is attempting to uh, to attack me. Hey, hey, hold it, boy. Now, look, all I'm trying to do... Help me, somebody, please. Help me. <laughs> Did you receive help, Miss McRae? Oh, yes, Doctor. In a moment, he was surrounded by an angry crowd. In a confusion, I slipped out the door and into a taxi. Soon I was at the airport and on a plane back to Washington. I was so frightened. I could hardly breathe. Frightened? Of what? Well, by now they knew. They? The ring of spies and secret agents of which Morgan Lowcraft was a part. Would they be waiting for me at the airport in Washington? I somehow made it to cab stand. I went directly to Morgan Lowcroft's apartment. He wasn't home. I decided to wait in the study. Oh, how did you get into the apartment? I have a key. It was midnight. And then one a.m. And two. And finally, just a few minutes before three, I heard the door. Mr. Cray, what are you doing here? I see you didn't spend the night with Miss Vance. What are you doing here? I read the manuscript. You did? Obviously, Jeremy Wilmot didn't have a chance to get in touch with you. He's probably been booked for disorderly conduct. Jeremy Wilmot booked for disorderly conduct? Jeremy? Obviously, you didn't hear me. I said I read the manuscript. I heard you. What are you going to do about it? Well, it depends. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to save you. How? First, tell me why you did it. Well, I, I don't think I really know. Yes, you do. Every boy dreams of becoming president. Most of them get over it. Some of us don't. But you have almost as much real power as the president. Now, that's the trouble. Almost. It would be better if I had no power at all. It's the near miss that can cause the fatal wound. But you never tried to become president. You never tried to run for any office. I could never win. They see me as too much the uh, egghead, too much the professor. Are you trying to tell me that you became a traitor because you hoped if a foreign power could take over the country, you would be installed as a leader or dictator or whatever? <laughs> Mr. McGregor, you have this remarkable talent for oversimplification. But stripped down, you have just illuminated the essential kernel of truth. Do you want me to save you? Save me? Miss McRae, do you know the people you're dealing with? You could be dead by tomorrow. So could you. That manuscript is in a safe place. It'll be made public if anything ever happens to me. What are you proposing? I'm gambling on you. On my ability to read the real, the true Morgan Lowcroft. I believe you're in over your head. In your heart, you want to get out of this. But you think you're in too deep. But you're not. No. It was a foolish notion. You gave into it. 
And before you knew it, you lost control. But we can regain it. We can say you cooperated with these people so you could reveal and expose them. We? Yes, we. You need me. Look at me. Am, am I so hard to look at? No. I'll save you, Morgan. Darling. I'll save you from your worst enemy. Yourself. Uh, you, you'd better answer that. Hello? Oh, yes. Yes, Miss Maris. He did arrive home safely. No, no, there's no point in calling him in the morning. He'll be busy for a long time to come. Good night. Hold on, Miss McRae. My name is Laura. Call me Laura, darling. As you know, Miss McRae, both Dr. Wilmot and Dr. Lowcraft tell completely different stories. They're lying. Now, Dr. Jeremy Wilmot is a professor of economics in a leading Florida university. He is known to have uh, no subversive connections. I know his version, and Morgan Lowcraft's version by heart. Uh, Dr. Lowcraft denies ever having written such a document. Naturally. What else could he do? But uh, uh, let us continue with your story. You confronted him early that morning when you returned from Florida. Yes. And then... I insisted we move immediately to expose the spy ring to the authorities. But he said we would have to proceed cautiously. Well, well, what made you decide, finally, that he could no longer be trusted? It was Madeline Maris. Oh? He had promised me that that he would no longer see her or have anything to do with her. And uh, he broke that promise? Yes. He had been meeting her in secret. But you know Washington and the colonists. You can't hold them off for too long. One morning I was reading the paper and in one of the columns it said, In out-of-the-way places, two familiar faces, beauty and the brain, Morgan and Maddie. It could have been gossip. I checked it with the reporter. It was all over town. Everyone knew it but me. So I confronted him with it. I said to him, You lied to me. And you know what he did? He... He just laughed. <laughs> Oh, my poor Miss McCray. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> our agreement was that you were to drop Madeline Maris. Now, let me tell you about our agreement. When you behaved so inexplicably, I didn't know what to make of it. You had created a wild story about me being a foreign agent. I have the evidence. Now, let me finish, please, Mr. Gray. I looked at you as you talked to me. I could see how distressed you were. Of course. It wasn't an easy moment for me. So I decided to play along. Play along? This is no game. I was hoping perhaps you might come to your senses. But, Miss McRae, I am not helping you by perpetuating this farce. We'll see who thinks it's a farce when that document is made public. I wouldn't advise you to do that. Are you threatening me? I'm counseling you. Yes, uh, you need good counsel. Sensible, practical guidance. Don't try that tactic with me. I know how you operate. The wise, calm, patient, all-knowing expert... Along about this time, you should be lighting your pipe. You should be quoting from Aristotle. Miss McRae, it's difficult to live here at the summit, to be a part of the frenzy. Yes, that's what it is. And to realize how fragile, how thin the line between war and peace is. How easily the world can simply cease to exist even five minutes from now. You have betrayed your country. It's more than most people can stand. And so many of us give way. You know, bend, crack break. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's like it's like combat fatigue. Now, let me help you. I'm not the one who needs help. Take a leave of absence with full pay, of course. You're not going to get rid of me, Dr. Lowcroft. Rest. Relax. And then when you're better, come back. Your job will be waiting. How could I ever get along without you? Is that your attitude? I have to go to the FBI. As I said, I would not advise you to do that. What are you going to do about it? Do you propose to have me killed? Killed? Oh, no. No, of course not. But, dear Laura McRae, if you persist in this foolishness, it will be something much worse. Than death? 
What can such a prospect be, especially to a lady like Laura McRae? Each of them talks to the other like a person who holds a winning hand. But who has the aces and who has the deuces? The showdown is scheduled for Act 3. talk about the basic stuff of life. Life and fiction. Reality and illusion. What is real and what do we imagine? Laura McRae says she read a document which proves Morgan Rowcroft is a traitor. He claims there's no such document at all. Now what can you believe? Which of them is telling the truth? But uh, then again, what is truth? Morgan... Why are we fighting with each other? Why do you want to destroy me? I want to save you. From what? From the corruption you're drowning in. Miss McRae, things cannot possibly continue in this manner. That's right. I have a duty to perform. And greater than any feeling I may hold for you. Yes. There are so many who worship at your shrine, Morgan. And I was the most devout of them all. I was even willing to accept the fact that you could betray your country. Why not? How could treason be bad if Morgan Lowcroft is a traitor? But we're finished. Finished, Morgan. I'm going to the police and to the media. Don't. I'm sorry. The magic is gone. At one time, I'd have done anything under the sun for your sake, but no more. Not for my sake, but for yours. Goodbye, Morgan. You can't stop me. That's what I thought. But he did stop me. It seems I forgot something. You know what I forgot, Doctor? Tell me. I forgot that he was the establishment. And you simply do not buck the establishment. I went to a top officer in intelligence. Someone I knew. You develop contacts. You know who to see to get things done. He listened to me very intently. And when I finished, he looked at me... And he said... Thank you, Miss McRae. We'll take this under advisement. Colonel, what are you saying? I'm saying we'll investigate. No, Colonel, that's not what you're saying at all. Miss McRae... Let me tell you what you're saying with your eyes, your manner, and that tone of your voice. You're saying I'll humor this kook and get rid of her as gracefully as I can. No, Miss McRae... I know the drill. I had to get rid of kooks myself. You're seeing me because you want to be covered. But that's as far as it goes. He's talked to you already, hasn't he? Miss McRae, we have run a check on Dr. Lowcroft that is so exhaustive he couldn't swat a fly without our knowing it. You mean you're just going to sit there? I have to. Because if I tried to follow up on what you told me, I couldn't get anywhere either. But this man is a foreign agent. It's obvious. Go home. This document. You read it. Yes, but how can you prove he wrote it? What should I have done? Why did you confront him? Why didn't you come to me first? I could have investigated quietly. Oh. This way you alerted him. You can accept the fact that I could be right and yet disregard me completely. Yes. How can you sit there and say that so calmly? It's hard to explain this, but you know something? Even if you're right, it's not the end of the world. Ourselves, our adversaries, what secrets do we really have from each other? I can't accept that. I believe it matters. What's your complaint, Miss McRae? You say the media's sitting on a story. My paper published it. My stations carried it. But look at how you slandered it. Miss Laura McRae claims. Miss McRae alleges. Well, that's what they are. Claims. Allegations. I stated basic facts. If I told the story as you told it to me, I could be sued for libel. This sub-headline spinster says Dr. Lowcroft admitted his guilt. What about it? You have to label me as a spinster. How does the dictionary define spinster? An unmarried woman. Does that describe you? If I were an unmarried man, would the headlines describe me as a bachelor? Spinster. There's something, something ungainly, something erotic. What right does a woman have not to be married? 
There must be something wrong with her. You came to us with a story. Because of your position, we printed it. We have now discharged our duty. It's up to the authorities to take it further. I showed you that document. Well, he denies that he ever gave it to you. And here we go, round and round again. I have a responsibility. Yes, and I know to whom. Yourself. You're scared, Mr. Jones. Of what? You're afraid to be frozen out. You won't get any more inside information, any off-the-record briefings. You're not going to rock the boat. You're not going to make a powerful enemy. Just between you and me, Miss McRae, what's the real story? I told you the real story. No, 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 you didn't. I've been around this town too long not to recognize a vendetta when I see one. What did he do to you? Are you trying to say there's something personal in this? There has to be. I only... Is that what you think? A woman of your inside experience and understanding? How could you miscalculate so badly? Hey, yes, Miss McRae. How could you? I thought... No, it doesn't matter anymore. But it does. Nobody cares about me. I care about you. As a patient. As a person. How can you care about me as a person? I'm a spinster. There's something so pathetic. No. Ludicrous. About that word. I find you attractive. Perhaps you do. There's a tone in your voice. I recognize it. Oh. You're quite a woman for recognizing tones and voices. It's a talent you develop. You have a seductive tone. Why, well, uh, I wasn't aware of it. Why did you say you find me attractive? Well, you have a, uh, a quality of the inner strength, of integrity. At my age, a man finds that more uh, appealing than the superficiality. Uh, uh, let's continue. You actually find me attractive? What, uh, <clears throat> uh, what did you do after you saw the publisher? You do find me attractive. Yes, Miss McRae. Say Miss McRae again. Why? McRae. And then it's hard, crisp. But it sounds so lovely when you say it. Uh, uh, tell me what you did. Yes, I'll tell you. I'll tell you anything. I found out Morgan Lowcroft was right. He didn't have to kill me. I was already dead. As Morgan Lowcroft's secretary, all doors were open to me. As that kooky spinster, Laura McRae, everyone was out when I found. And then, you know what I did? Then go ahead. Tell me. Yes, I'll tell you. I was so frustrated. Angry. I stood outside the office building. And I actually harangued the people passing by. I'm Laura McRae. I was Morgan Lowcroft's secretary for 12 years till he fired me. The man is a spy and a traitor. And nobody wants to do anything about it. Keep away from me, officer. You can't silence me. Nobody can silence me. Pray. You must call me Laura, Doctor. Laura, mm -hmm. you know that that kind of conduct would be considered unbalanced. Yes, but it doesn't matter now. What was wrong with me all those years? Why did I have eyes only for him? Why was I blind to other men? There were men who must have thought I was attractive. There must have been men who looked at me the way you're looking at me now. Well, I'm not aware that I'm looking at you in any specific sort of way. You are. You are. Why did you kill him? Why? For my country. Your country? Yes. I killed him because somebody had to stop him. I went to the apartment. I confronted him. I said, you can't be allowed to get away with this. And once again, he laughed. You should have heard that laugh. <laughs> oh, my poor Laura. Haven't they locked you up yet? Don't talk that way to me. You're insane, dear girl. Insane. I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry. I just asked you to leave. I want to save you. Who's that? Can't you guess? I'm surprised she doesn't have her own key. She does, but she keeps losing it. You don't want to be saved. That's right. Goodbye, Miss Lickie. But I'm going to save you. Whether you like it or not. Now, look, this has gone on long enough. If I can't save you in one way, I'll save you in another. This is how I'll save you. Oh, you're, you're crazy. Put that down. I'll save you. Ah. Ow. 
What did you do? What did you do? I saved you. Keep ringing. Keep ringing. It'll never answer you. And how did you kill him? I killed him with this. This? He had one in his chest. Just like this. Long, sharp, pointed. I remember some years ago he had lost his letter opener and I bought him a new one for Christmas. That one. Where did you get yours? I, uh, I don't remember. I've told you everything. I've told you all my secrets. You know why? Because I'm in love with you. You mustn't say that. I don't care. I need somebody. I must have somebody. Tell me the truth. What truth? Was there actually an incriminating document in that envelope, or did you create that situation yourself? Why would I create it? How could I create it? Because of Madeline Maddox. She wasn't his first affair. But for the first time, you felt vulnerable. Madeline Maddox touched off the explosion. In 12 years, you couldn't get Morgan Lowcraft to look at you. Now, you would force him to. That is not so, Doctor. The mishap of the baggage was the uh, spark for the explosion. I had deliberately typed a brand new manuscript. You could do it. You had access to enough secrets. I didn't do it. I don't care what you say. I know I didn't do it. Well, you, uh, you could have done it without knowing it. Now, now listen to me. Yes. I'll listen. Sometimes, when we want something to happen, we want it so badly, we will it so strongly. Yes. When your voice is soft and sweet like it is now, I'll listen to anything. Everything. Well, what you did creating that document. It's been blocked out of your mind. But you have to go back to it. You have got to face it. Whatever you say, we'll face it together, won't we? I'll help you. It is my job. Not only because it's your job. Say it's more than that. Well, of course it's more than that. I'll keep nothing from you. I'll bear my heart. Expose my soul. Uh, Miss McCray, there is something we must do now. Oh, excuse me. Dr. Waller. Oh, yes. Yes. No, no, not too late. Yes, I'd like that. Uh, tell the children we can go. Right. You know I do. See you soon. Bye. Who is that? Uh, that was my wife. You didn't tell me you were married? Why didn't you tell me you were married? It has no relation to your therapy. You seduced me. I what? You gave me that loving look. That special tone of voice. You didn't mean either of them. You only wanted to trick me into trusting you. And I did. I told you everything. Miss McCray. What happened to Laura? She's been betrayed again. You'll never do that to anyone else. Miss McCray, put that down. Never. You know by now... That letter opener can be a lethal weapon, so put it down. You betrayed me. I told you the truth, and you betrayed me. You're all against me. Miss McCray. That's right. Back to Miss McCray. The neurotic, frustrated spinster. Laura. It's too late for Laura. But no one will ever betray her again. No, you... No! Don't! No! Oh! Oh! No! No! doesn't look as if anyone will ever get the chance either. Our heroine has been put away for quite a long time. It proves, as the poet says, that love suppressed breeds a viper's nest. And was she telling the truth? Was he a spy or was it all a lie? I shall return shortly. On CBS Daytime Television, yours is the best seat in the house for first-run drama weekdays. On Search for Tomorrow, watch stories of real people facing real problems. Then on The Young and the Restless, thrill to the romance and passion of warm young love. Search for Tomorrow and silky, steamy The Young and the Restless. <laughs> 
Television's hottest summer shows weekdays. Check your local listing for time. Hi, this is Michael Landon. Are you the Michael Landon who talks about Kodak paper on TV? Yeah, that's me. I just love your commercials and your paper. Oh, thanks, but it's Kodak paper. Do you get your pictures printed on Kodak paper, too? Well, absolutely. I always look for you when I get them developed. Uh, you mean you look for the Kodak paper sign with my face on it? Yeah, because I always get Kodak paper where I see you. Yes. Um, right. Well, nice talking to you. Yeah, what a handsome sign. <laughs> look for the Kodak paper sign when you get your pictures developed. We all know the story of the Emperor's new clothes, how everyone fawned over him and flattered him on the magnificence of his imaginary wardrobe. That is, everyone except for one little boy who piped up, but the Emperor is naked. It's too bad the story ends there. It would be most instructive to learn what happened to that clear-eyed little boy. Did everyone appreciate his sincerity and candor? How, if at all, was he rewarded? What sort of future did he have, if any? Was our story a variation on this ancient theme? Well, you know how it is with a good story. It's anything you want it to be. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Norman Rose, Court Benson, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. After all, he isn't it a close friend or anything like that? Uh, no, but I mean, you know, if I'd been in my office, or even at home where I was supposed to be, maybe he wouldn't have done it. Oh, nonsense. I mean, I was here with you. Where you were or weren't has nothing to do with what happened. It was my fault. Will you stop taking credit for something you couldn't help? You're just being arrogant. Arrogant? Me? It's... It's Louise. Louise? What about Louise? First Benita Barlow, now this Stephen Bennett. Both dead. But Louise didn't know either one of them. That doesn't mean a thing. Not when you have the... the capacity for evil. The evil eye. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I have always been struck by the similarity of animate and inanimate objects. A case in point, fatigue. In metals, for instance, a constant repetition of stress cycles produces fatigue, often leading to fractures. And so airplane spars, steel cables, locomotive axles, even bridges become unsafe. Stress can also make the human mind unsafe. Today, we place our radio microscope against a human subject and examine closely the strange emotional turmoil that leads to... Oh, but let me say no more. The story will tell itself. Lavinia, has something happened to Peter's mind? I'm not sure I like the influence of those people, Mr. and Mrs. Diedrich. He's very happy with them, George. Sees them every day. But that strange look in his eyes. Have you noticed it? It's not right. There's something unhealthy about the whole thing. Our mystery drama, Maud Evelyn, adapted from a story by Henry James, was dramatized especially for the Mystery Theater by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Paul Hecht. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Peter 
Harkness was in trouble and didn't know how to cope with it. You see, Peter had inherited money, not a lot, but enough to keep him from striking out on his own, making something of himself. He had the charm, the wit, the education, suitable for a well-brought-up young man, but gumption? No. For the tenth time in ten weeks, Peter had proposed marriage to Lavinia Dane, and for the tenth time, Lavinia had said... No, Peter. No, no, no. I heard the first no. When I marry, it's going to be someone I can look up to, who has a, a, a purpose in life and work to do. I've tried all kinds of jobs. I know that. When you decide on one certain ambition, and you concentrate on that and nothing else, then come and ask me to marry you. Is that your last word? For now, yes. Then I'll tell you mine, Lavinia. But not for now. For always. I swear to you, if I don't marry you, I will never marry anyone else. Cheers, George. Cheers. Well, say goodbye to me, George. I'm leaving London. Wish me luck. Wish me well. Peter, is this why you asked me out for a drink? To talk nonsense? Only the day before yesterday, you asked me to wish you luck. You were going to marry my sister. Yes, well, I've asked Lavinia ten times in ten weeks. And she always says no. Well, so you ask her eleven times. I thought you were crazy about her. I'm going away, and that's that. I've got myself a job with a travel agency that handles private tours of the continent. I'm due to leave for Switzerland and Rome on Saturday with a middle-aged couple. Very ordinary, very nice. I've met them, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Diedrich. Uh, so you're running away. Oh, no, no, not at all. Lavinia wants somebody with a purpose and a future. Besides, if I'm out of London and she can't see me, perhaps absence will make the heart grow fonder. You, Peter Harkness, five years at Eton and four at Oxford... A travel agent? <laughs> Not even that. A nursemaid for the middle age to wish to be led by the hand from the Jungfrau to the Colosseum. <laughs> well, at least you're laughing about it. And everything's a joke to me. Except Lavinia. And then, Lavinia, he said to me, everything's a joke to me except Lavinia. Now, what's wrong between you two? Well, there was never very much right with us, that's all. He was pretty wild-eyed when we left the pub. You don't think that he might do... Oh, something desperate because I won't marry him? No, I'm afraid not. You see, that's the real trouble. Peter's not given to desperation. And he's too influenced by the easy way and the kind word. And that's not the kind of man I'd like to have for a husband. <laughs> You look fabulous. Have you gained weight? When you phoned and said, I'm ill, I, I didn't know who you were. Well, what's it been, eight weeks? Yes, after Switzerland, we did Rome, then Naples, Florence. I had quite a time dragging them away from Venice. Oh, spare me. Oh, look, I can't stand these darn birds. Pigeons scare me. Do we have to meet in front of Peter Pan's statue here in the garden? But I like to feed them. Oh, Peter, this is a hangout for children. Well, at any rate... Tell me about your trip as travel nursemaid. Oh, they're wonderful people, the Diedrichs. You haven't any idea how well they treated me. Like a son. The people like that, well, you don't meet every day. They they were devoted to you. Yes, and, and elsewhere. Well, I'd like to meet them. Will you introduce Lavinia to them? Oh, no. Why not? You like them. You and Lavinia are engaged, aren't you still? I'll never marry anyone else. That's a foolish, negative thing to say. If you're serious about working at this travel business, I'm sure she'll think twice about saying no again. You think if I asked her now, she'd say yes? Yes, I do. She should have said it before. Before what? I'd rather not say. Before you met these Diedrichs? The people like that... Well, they made a profound impression on me. I'll say that. Have you seen them since you returned to London? Oh, yes. Yes, I have. And what are they? Well off? Or is he retired? What are they like? They live 
for Maud Evelyn. Maud Evelyn? Well, who is she? Their daughter. Unfortunately, they've lost her. What do you mean? I mean, a great many people would take it that way, but they don't. They won't. Other people would have given her up. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. Perhaps even tried to forget her. But the Diedrichs can't. Oh, they... Well, do they keep in touch with her? Communicate? All the while. Why? Isn't she with them? She is. Now? Since when? Last year. Then why do you say they've lost her? Well, I'm the one who calls it that, but I don't see her. They don't want you to see her, is that it? How can I? I think, George... I think I've told you all I'd like to for now. Would you mind very much if I concentrated on feeding the pigeons? Uh, Lavinia, I don't know what to make of Peter. I had the most peculiar conversation with him right by the statue of Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens. I mean, have you seen him since he's back from his conducted tour? Oh, yes. Didn't you find him strange? I mean, has something happened to his mind? These people, these... Diedrich... He's very happy with them. You can tell it by just looking at him. He's over at the house in Westbourne Terrace every day. It's not right. There's something... Uh, I don't know. Unhealthy about the whole thing. Would you promise me... In case he should want to introduce you to them... Promise me to refuse to go. Oh, wouldn't you go to meet them either, George? No, never. But why? Aren't you curious? Well, I can't explain it. If I believed in Satanism, I might say theirs is an evil influence. George, did he tell you about this Maud Evelyn? He was very evasive about it. And mysterious, I thought. I said there was a daughter, but there seems to be something the matter with her. Do you know what it is? The matter with her is simply that she's dead. What? When did she die? Oh, years and years ago. She was 14, I think, a little girl. Isn't that the impression he gave you? Well, he had this peculiar look. He, he said that she was always with them. But do you understand what he meant? But the Diedrichs live for her memory. She's with them in the sense that they think of nothing else. But what could be his interest in a little child? It appears that she's a lovely little thing. Peter? <laughs> Our Peter is interested in a little girl in a pinafore. Oh, I think she was older when she died. Perhaps oh, 16 or 17. Every time he tells me, he had the year or so. Do you know what he told me? That the Diedrichs are in touch with this deceased child. They, they communicate with her. Oh, but they do, in a way... They go in for mediums and spiritualists, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, Peter, does he go with them to these seances? Oh, no. Uh, ask him to show you the girl's photograph. He carries it with him. He goes around showing pictures of a young girl he never knew. Oh, I had a feeling I was right. He, he's possessed in some way. George, what if I am also possessed? Or at least affected? By a photograph of a child. Not the beauty of the face. I don't mean that. Well, Lavinia, obsession is obsession. It's dangerous. No, I, I don't mean it in an ugly way. But the whole thing, you see, the, the attitude of the parents, the, the way they've made the girl's memory almost a religion. I think that's what Peter came to tell me yesterday. Not to ask you to marry him again? No. Believe it or not, George... I think Peter has found something as important to him as I was. Peter, I wish you would come inside with me. Mrs. Jex has made me feel so very close to your dear Maud Evelyn. Mrs. Diedrich, I feel very close to her without having to... 
Well, it's 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 hard for me to say. Well, do you have some superstitious feelings about a psychic? Oh, no, no, not at all. But you don't believe in them bringing word from the other side? Mr. Diedrich wasn't able to accompany me today, so I've asked you to come with me. Now, will you? They'll open the door in a minute. Um... I'm Mrs. Diedrich. I have an appointment with Mrs. Jex. May we come in? Oh, do it for me, Peter. Maud Evelyn's mother. There's nothing to be afraid of. You'll see. In this house, there is no death. Life continues always. Thank you. Thank you. You needn't show me the way. I've been here many times before. Come, follow me, Peter. Oh. There is where she is. That's Mrs. Jex. She's sitting behind that long table, leaning back in her chair. Is she alive? Very much so. She's waiting for us. She's in a trance. Here. You take that chair, and I'll sit in this one. Now... The first thing we do is to light these three candles on the table. I I have a match. Go ahead. Light all three. That's right. Mrs. Jex. This is me, Mrs. Diedrich. I brought with me today... Uh, my husband could not be here. So I've asked this wonderful young man you've heard us speak to you about. He's the one who cares so much for Maud Evelyn. He's sitting beside me now. It would appear that Peter Harkness is falling under some spell which is obliterating all but fantasies from his mind. Would that he could but remember those words of Edgar Allan Poe. All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Had anyone said to Peter Harkness six months ago... One day, you will be stepping into the parlor of a psychic to please the mother of a little girl you have never met who died when she was in her early teens. He might have said, But why? I want to marry Lavinia Dane. What should I do at a seance? Let us listen. Perhaps we may understand what Peter Harkness cannot. Mrs. Jix, I am Mrs. Diedrich. I brought with me a young friend who also wishes to communicate with Maud Evelyn. Let the quietness and twilight fall around you, Mrs. Diedrich. Do you have any word from my daughter today? She has much to say to you and to the young man. Mrs. Diedrich... Is this medium a woman? She sounds like a man. It is her guide talking through her. Her guide? Sir Walter Scott. He communicates from the other side. I think disturbances of the soul. Oh, no, no, not at all. I I was just explaining. Please, go on, go on. This unfamiliar spirit seated beside you, Mrs. Diedrich. I read his aura, the physical, the mental, and spiritual aura. I think they all go to make up an entity whose name is Peter Hartman. That's fantastic. I've never told Mrs. Jax a word, not a word. She didn't even know you were coming. I assure you this Peter Harkness is a true friend. A like spirit and can be trusted completely. Uh, Sir Walter, do you have any message for me from Maud Evelyn? Has she been taking care of herself, not getting into any drafts? Maud Evelyn is very happy. She asked me to say to you, she will have something of importance to reveal when you come. 
for your next city. Something of importance. Oh, couldn't you ask her to give me a clue now? Please. It has to do with Peter Harkness. I knew it. I felt it all along. For weeks now, I've been sensing her presence very strongly. I have only this request from your daughter, Mrs. Dietrich. And that is to be sure to bring Peter with you at the next sitting. Oh, yes, I will come. I'll be here. Tell her that. That is good. We shall try for the transmutation of your mind, Peter, to contact the invisible world around you. Lavinia, I've so much to tell you, I hardly know where to begin. I seem to be going in all directions at once. That's why you always come here, isn't it? Uh, to Kensington Gardens. Right here, in front of the statue of Peter Pan. I've never thought why. It seemed a natural thing to do, to meet you here. It always has been. Some people might say you're identifying with Peter Pan, the boy who didn't wish to grow up. What are you talking about? Oh, never mind. Another time I'll go into it. I'm glad to see you, Peter. You look well and prosperous. <laughs> and a little fat. You must be eating well. Well, they've adopted me. The Diedrichs. Mrs. Diedrich is an excellent cook. Mm, it shows. They are the simplest, kindest, yet most original and unusual people. Well, if they've taken a liking to you, that speaks well for them. Do you have friends in common? Or whom do they know here? No one but me. They keep to themselves, but... Well, they are extraordinary people. They have certain beliefs which may seem strange to others. Such as what, Peter? We sensible people are not supposed to believe in the existence of what we cannot explain. Yes, am I right? I suppose so. In fact, before I went to Switzerland and Italy with the Diedrichs, I, I couldn't abide anything I could not understand. I, I disliked the mysterious... You see, what I'm getting at, Lavinia, is that in the past few weeks, Mrs. Diedrich has been taking me to her spiritualist, a Mrs. Jex. Oh, I thought you didn't believe in that sort of thing. I didn't. But this lady spiritualist is, is, is incredible. Her guide, who speaks through her from the other world, is... Sir Walter Scott. He is Sir Walter Scott, the Scottish author? Oh, no. Yes, and, and, and he carries messages to us from Maud Evelyn. So, well, the three of us have become quite close. Do you, do you understand? Uh, frankly, not a word, but I'll certainly listen to you. M Mrs. Diedrich and myself uh, and Maud Evelyn, well, we share at least an hour, sometimes more each day. Each day? Oh, you spend quite a lot of time with this spiritualist. Yes, a lot, but not enough. I'm training myself to become a better instrument, and then I won't need any guides or, or mediums. Maud Evelyn will come to me herself, directly. I have such very strong feelings for her. For a child who died many years ago? She's not a child. Believe me, Lavinia... Maud Evelyn is no child. George, do you know what Peter has now made himself believe? About the deceased daughter of the Diedrichs. He thinks he knew her when she was alive. But that's not possible. You know that. Uh, and he speaks of her as if she wasn't a child, but that she was quite grown up. Well, I don't know when imagination leaves off and madness begins. Well, he, he tells me stories, happenings they shared, conversations he had with this girl, what she used to say, what they did together, places they went. She's more real to him than reality itself. His mind is, is full of Maud Evelyn. Lavinia, do you think Peter has gone mad? No, I don't. I can't. It's all too beautiful. Lavinia, don't tell me you're becoming infected with this preposterous theory. It is a theory, George, but not really so preposterous. How can you talk like that? 
And she has caught this contagion from the Diedrichs. I hope you're not going to catch it from him. I don't know if I should tell you this, George. Peter said to me yesterday he was in love with Maud Evelyn. Lavinia, do you honestly feel that he is entirely sane? When he tells it, and, and you see his eyes so filled with love, it, well, it, it takes your breath away. It's that beautiful. It's pathetic. A young man of 25 talking about his love for a 15-year-old who's dead, who he's never met. All of a sudden, she's not 15. She's 16, 17. How can he be rational? How can her parents be? But don't you see, if Maud Evelyn was older when she died, then her mother and father have more of her to remember. So they fabricated that as well. No, they believe it. As I would if I had to. You see, this way, the girl had more of a lifetime. Oh, yes, I know, they invented it. A, a whole experience for her to, to talk about and share. Maud Evelyn growing up, being older, meeting Peter, their friendship. Now for Peter to be enmeshed in all this because he's weak or poetic or whatever, well, that scares me. Well, they need Peter. And they want him for their daughter. I wanted you and Peter to be married once. Lord, how long ago that seems. I wanted that, Lavinia. Now this nightmare. And you're encouraging him in it. I told him I believed him. In, in all the years I've known Peter, even in those days when he was proposing marriage, even then, I have never seen his whole being light up with such devotion as it does when he speaks of her. Oh, it's all very well for you to talk of being sane and sensible and rational. But to see such happiness in someone in, in, in this very ordinary and gray world. Well, I, I, I'm glad to be a part of it. I don't deny it. I am glad, George. <laughs> will get accustomed to the dark. I really appreciate your coming with me at, at the last minute like this. Oh, no, not at all. Lucky I ran into you in Westbourne Tariff. Well, how often do you and Mrs. Diedrich visit this swami? Oh, she's no swami. Her name is Mrs. Jex. She's a medium of the first order. Oh, Mrs. Diedrich will be very disappointed. She hates to miss a single sitting, but well, Mr. Diedrich is really quite ill and she couldn't leave him. And, I'm glad I didn't have to come alone, really. Well, this is the first time I've been to a psychic. Does your Mrs. Jex do table wrappings or tea leaf readings or what? George, don't be such a cynic. She's a medium. Through her, we get news from the other side, brought to us by Sir Walter Scott. Oh, come now, Peter. You're having me on. Shh, shh. Now, we must remain quiet. I like these three candles. And the seance will begin. Mrs. Jex, would you ask Sir Walter to come to us, please? Mrs. Diedrich could not accompany me, so I have asked an old friend to share with me this journey into the infinite. Do I say anything, Peter? No, no. I am ready for the transmutation of the mind to contact the invisible world around me. Peter Harkness, you are standing at a golden gate that will open your mind to a larger, greater field of consciousness. Yes. Yes, I am. That woman's not saying those words, Peter. Her lips aren't even moving. It's a trick. Shh, George, please. Limits there are none. As you climb the hilltop, when you reach the summit of your hill, you will find your dreams guarding the topmost peak. Oh, yes. Yes, Sir Walter. I shall. I shall. That's not Sir Walter Scott. George, please, I beg of you. The sun will set. The quietness and twilight will fall around you in your own 
your beloved Maud Evelyn will speak. It's a fake, Peter. Look at this wire in my hand. I pulled it out. There's someone in another room speaking into a microphone. It's a farce. <laughs> Thank you not to walk along with me, George. I have nothing to say to you. Oh, Peter, are you angry with me because I unmasked the terrible fraud? You had no business interrupting the seance. You were a guest in that house. You saw the wire in my hand and the voice suddenly stopped. Now, what do you think that was? Well, yes, of course, the guy had stopped with your behavior. Look, it's too ridiculous, Peter. Now, 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 which way are you going? That's not the street to your house. To Westbourne Terrace. That's where I'm living now. With the Diedrichs. That's right. With them. What will I say about your shameful behavior? Supposing Mrs. Jex calls her or, or, or writes her a note. She won't say anything. She'll be afraid to. It would ruin her business. London is full of charlatans who prey on people's loneliness. Oh, that this should happen today of all days. I, oh, I feel ill. Oh, Peter, calm down. It's not the end of the world. I wish it were. What did you mean? Today of all days. Today is the anniversary of my blessed engagement. Oh, I hadn't realized. You mean to my sister, Lavinia? What are you talking about? I mean my true engagement to Maud Evelyn. We talked about stress, emotional fatigue, which can cause a breakdown in the human psyche as surely as if it were a rubber band stretched beyond its tolerance. That's one possible explanation. Yet, who is to say that an imaginary world is not a greater refuge than the world we know? Henry James has created three people. Peter and Mr. and Mrs. Diedrich, for whom fantasy is the only reality. I shall return shortly with Act Three. It's a treacherous high wire act, balancing on that fine thread that joins the finite to the infinite. And George is at the perilous midway point in his attempt to rescue Peter from falling to where no net can catch him. Did you say, Peter, that today is the anniversary of your engagement to Maud Evelyn? That's what I said, George. It was inevitable. From the very first moment when I met Mr. and Mrs. Diedrich, when, when I sat with them to plan their trip, they recognized me as, as the right person. You were the right person? Yes, to become their son-in-law. They wanted her so much to have experienced, well, everything. Did, did I ever show you her picture? She has a child's face. So Maud Evelyn became engaged to you. Why don't you come with me now, George, to Westbourne Terrace? No, no, I'd be intruding. Yes, there's a whole suite they prepared for our marriage, and they've kept it just the way it was then. All, all our wedding presents are there. I'd, I'd love you to see them. But what would Mr. and Mrs. Diedrich say? We have two rooms full of wonderful furniture and bric-a-brac. You know how important those things can be. I had quite a hand in selecting them. I can remember every single thing dearest Maud Evelyn said about how I arranged everything. No one else could possibly have made our little house so beautiful. She said that. Well, Peter, not today. Forgive me. I, I'll come some other time. I thought you said George would be meeting us here, Peter. We've been sitting here for ten minutes. Do you think you'll come? Oh, Peter, will you forget those pigeons for a moment? Look how smooth the bronze rabbits are worn at the bottom of the statue. All the children love Peter Pan so much they climb all over him. Lavinia. You don't have to say it, Peter. You know? I can see you're wearing a black armband. You don't have to tell me anymore. I understand. Hello, Lavinia, Peter. 
Oh, there was such a traffic jam at uh, Marble Arch, I thought my cab would never get through. Well, I- I've only been here a few minutes, George. It's been too long since the three of us were together. I... I'm afraid I have something infinitely sad to tell you both. I see that. I hope you've lost no one that I know, Peter. He has lost a wife. Your wife? I didn't know you had a wife. The more we live in the past, the more times we find in it. I live in the past, too, Peter. But I hope, sister dear, not with the result of making such extraordinary discoveries. You see, her parents wanted it for her, wanted it so much. So, well, it worked out. We married. Maud Evelyn did have all her young happiness. You married? The marriage did take place. Ah, so now you're a widower. And the black armband is a sign. I shall wear it always. But when she died, I mean, uh, wasn't that years ago? I mean, Peter, isn't it a little late to have started to wear black? I had to wait until all the facts of my marriage gave me the right. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must go. They're waiting for me. They become quite anxious if they don't know where I am. It's almost beyond me, all this. I thought he was never going to marry anyone else but you, Lavinia. He won't. Not ever. He'll still be faithful. To you? To Maud Evelyn. Oh, it's a sickness. If it is... It's a beautiful one. I wish I could make you understand. A man cannot go on from day to day with one foot in this world and one foot in another. It can't be stopped. That's the way he is. Yes, it can. I want to remove Peter from this whole environment. Westbourne Terrace, the Diedrichs. Take him somewhere to give him time to think things over. To realize what a wasteland he's making of his life. Take him by force. If need be, yes. Now, you remember Dr. Medwin? Frank Medwin, who was at Oxford with Peter and me? Now, I'm going to put this whole strange case before him and ask him to help. George, you're making a mistake. Peter will never be parted from his dream world. I can't begin to tell you how delighted I am you both have come to visit me here in Westbourne Terrace. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Diedrich occupy the entire top floor. Uh, They're out at the moment, so we'll have the whole place to ourselves. And, well, I can show you the wedding suite as we've kept it all these years. All these years. Uh, How long have you known the Diedrichs? Uh, Since last spring, no? George, don't keep pinning him down. Uh, You go ahead and, and show us everything, Peter. We want to share it with you. Wait till you see. Oh, it's a treasure house. I furnished a lot of it myself. I felt nothing was too good for her. Uh, it's these two rooms, the uh, the wedding suite. Uh, there they are. Oh, Peter, it's lovely, charming, tasteful and elegant. A French provincial sitting room and bedroom. Ah, yes, you've hit it on the head, George. That's uh, Louis the Sixteenth chaise longue and a little 18th century fruitwood secretary for her to write her letters on. Oh, I can't take my eyes off the armoire, Peter. Certainly 17th century. I found it in the flea market. Peter, you've done an excellent job of decorating. It was for her. It was for us. Oh, I like that old cotton paneling on the walls. Recognize the tree of life design? We used to stand under it, Maud Evelyn and I, before we were married and imagine each branch would be another child. And that coffee service on the small table near the bed. Yes, completely on pier. George, George, why are you moving behind me like that? Don't don't keep getting behind me, George. Why, there's so much to see. Do you, do you like this Victorian love seat? I come down here by myself every day and sit there alone and think of her. Oh, and there's my pride and joy. Our bed with lace canopy. It's never been slept in. George! George, what are you doing? Will you let go of my arm? You're twisting it. George, do be careful. I can't Ow. bear this. Ow. Lavinia, open the bottle quick George. and put some chloroform on the handkerchief. George, Lavinia, please. Look, look, I'm, I'm asking 
asking you nicely. Why am I on this train with with you? No luggage. Where are we going? All right. Do you remember Frank Merrin? Yes, yes, of course he. He, he was at school with us, wasn't he? he? Became a doctor. Frank has a rest home in Scotland, and he thought it might be advisable for you to go there for a short period of time. Oh, oh, he did, did he? Well, what did you tell him? That, that I was mad? I, I mean, what right have you to pass judgment on someone and then, and then practically kidnap them in the bargain? The right of an old friend who couldn't stand by and do nothing and see you waste your life in an, in an imaginary world run by the Diedrichs. Well, now, wait a minute. They are not running my life. They opened up doors through which I might never have walked if I hadn't met them. <laughs> of course, you wouldn't understand that. Lavinia and I are very concerned about you. Now, you just relax. We'll have a good time up at Frank's place. I understand it's beautiful. I have no intention of leaving the Diedrichs. They need me. Every day. And the moment this train stops, I'm heading back to London. I can't understand whatever made you believe I would go along with this. I think you need a rest, Peter. Time to take stock. Get away from Westbourne Terrace. Well, you've got another thing coming. I thought you were my best friend. I see I was wrong. You are my worst enemy. wrong of you. It was wrong of me, too. Peter may not take it kindly, you barging into his house. Well, I've been trying for a month to see Peter and apologize and make amends. It was your idea for me to just show up at the front door. Oh, ring the bell again, will you? I know him and how suspicious he is. He's probably peeking out of an upstairs window and decided not to open the door. Well, he'll open it for you, won't he? Where are the Dietrichs? Don't you know? That's why he's sworn never to see you again. Well, what have I to do with them? Well, five weeks ago, when Peter got back from the train ride, both of them, the Dietrichs, had become ill and were taken to the hospital. In 24 hours, they were dead. Oh, well, I had no idea. Why didn't you tell me before? He blames himself. He wasn't here. He thinks they became uneasy and ill because he disappeared. It's taken me weeks to calm him down. And you still don't think he needs medical attention? No, I don't. He's happy in this house. Oh, this museum? To him, it's a shrine, a temple. I I'll ring once more. we come in and talk to you, Peter? Who? Who are you? <sighs> Maud Evelyn. I've been waiting for you. Where have you been? Peter? Maud Evelyn? Send that man away. I don't wish to see anyone. Peter, it's me, George. Don't stand out on the stoop, Maud Evelyn, dearest. Come in. Goodbye, George. How are you, Lavinia? Very well. And you, George? Much the same. I'm worried about you now that you've moved into his house. I'm perfectly fine. You've been happy with Peter this last month? Oh, yes. How is he? Very well. He's going into the antique business. I persuaded him to sell some of those antiques. He has quite a flair for that. Does he know you're meeting me today? I owe you an apology for what he said that day, George. Remember? Send that man away. Well, he didn't know who I was. But he was in such a state. I noticed that, Maud Evelyn. Anyway, no, I didn't tell him we were meeting here in the gardens. Why do you suppose he used to come to this very spot time and again to feed the pigeons? He still does sometimes. We sit here at the feet of Peter Pan. But why? He's never told me. And you're happy, aren't you, Lavinia? Hmm. The happiest I've ever been. He still calls you 
Maud Evelyn? Yes. Actually believes you are? Yes. Oh, my Lord in heaven. How long can you go on playing this dreadful game? Maud Evelyn, a girl who died in her teens years ago. Remember, he said he would never marry anyone else but me. Well, I've made that possible. You're married to him? Yes. We're married now. Well, what about the names? Didn't you have to give your right name to the registrar? Peter thought it was a good joke, that's all. And you think it's a joke? Acting out the part of someone else. Oh, but I'm not acting. I've only borrowed a name to make a man happy. What do you think would have happened to Peter if that world of his imagination had come crashing to his feet? Do you remember reading your Peter Pan, George? I didn't want to end up like Wendy, who saw Peter less and less clearly as time went on. I could not live in separate worlds and leave him all alone in Never Never Land. I think I misled you at the start of today's mystery theater. I warned of breakdowns and tragedies as a result of stress. I'll amend that now and say... This was rather a tale of the virtues of imagination, which in itself can create beauty, justice, and happiness. And isn't that everything anyone could ask for? Temperature right now at the airport, 34 degrees, in Boulder, 33, and at the KOA weather station in downtown Denver, 32 degrees. This has been the Night Report for Tuesday night, October 28th. This is Dick McDaniel saying good night for the Night Report news team. Stay tuned for the CBS Radio Mystery Theater. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Courage is to feel the daily daggers of relentless steel and keep on living. Yes. For some people, the battle of life must be fought every hour of every day. No rest, no reprieve, no leave of absence. And it's a conflict where one single loss can cancel out a thousand victories. You must leave, sir. An American millionaire... You're too tempting a target for revolutionists and bandits. What about the local police? The police? Many of the local police moonlight as bandits and revolutionaries. Or maybe it's the other way around. You'd better fly back to the States. When? This afternoon. But that's too early. I'm afraid, sir. It may even be too late. mystery drama, Silent Partners, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Marion Seldes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. A little rule, a little sway, a sunbeam in a winter's day is all the proud and mighty have between the cradle and the grave. Yes, that's the journey all of us must take from the cradle to the grave, even the proud and the mighty, from the same beginning to the same ending. Like the rest of us, all they get is a sunbeam. And if you look closely, it's no more golden than anyone else's. Has New York called yet? I don't know, Mr. Burley. What do you mean you don't know? The phone service seems to be out. Then get me the local, whoever it is, that's in charge of these things. I've already tried to reach him, sir, but it's only nine o'clock. Only nine o'clock? None of these people show up till noon. Yes, and then they go off on a siesta for the rest of the day. Come in. Oh, look who's here. 
Good morning, Mr. Burley. It's a miserable morning, and you know it, Mr. Goodlow. Now, what brings the American ambassador to my hotel? That is, if this hovel can be so described. Sir, I am not the ambassador, and you know it. I'm merely the consul here. Well, you carry the flag. Mr. Burley, may I speak to you in private? <sighs> Miss Tracy, why don't you go out and have yourself a cup of coffee somewhere? Yes, sir. I uh, didn't wish to alarm your secretary, Mr. Burley. I'm afraid your identity has been discovered. It is now known that you are the Sylvester Burley. How was it discovered? I don't know. I can't believe it. It's true. But nobody knows me down here. Not too many people know me anywhere. I am not the kind of man who seeks publicity. I try to keep my picture out of the paper. Nevertheless... Not more than three people even know I came down here. Mr. Burley... It's just a I... quiet trip to look around, to study the place. I understand. However, it would be... I really... brought only my secretary. Now, you notice she is plain, ordinary-looking, quiet. She doesn't attract attention either. The fact is, it's all over town. And so I shouldn't be surprised if an attempt will be made to kill you. To kill me? Or kidnap you, either one. What do you mean, either one? It would all depend on which group gets to you first. The bandits or the revolutionaries. Although, personally, I believe they're the same, but wear different hats as it suits their purpose. Why can't I get some protection from the local police? Because many of the local police moonlight as bandits or revolutionaries. What? Or it could be the other way around. Then what am I supposed to do? I suggest you leave for home. Nobody pushes me around. I'm going to get in touch with your superiors in Washington. I have already heard from Washington on the subject. They would like you to go home in order to save us all potential embarrassment. When? This afternoon. No, that's too soon. Actually, sir, it may be too late. Are you packed, Miss Tracy? Yes, sir. The luggage is already left for the airport. Oh, that must be the taxi cab. Just a minute. I haven't been ordered to leave, have I? No, sir. I mean, it was just a suggestion. Yes, sir. I don't have to take it. Well, that's right, except... You... Yes, Miss Tracy, you were about to say... <laughs> I don't wish to presume, Mr. Burley, but... Now that they know who you are, you couldn't accomplish anything here anyhow. I don't like the idea of being kicked out. On the other hand, I've been kicked out of better places than this one. So let's go. Buenos dias, senor. Senor, step inside my taxi, if it pleases you. Uh, how long should it take to get to the airport? How long? Yes. How long? Quien sabe. What do you mean, quien sabe? Can I read the future? Oh, everybody's a philosopher. Can we get started? Si, senor. As I recall, it's not too far. There's a good paved road. Si. But the road, she's uh, constructed all, all over the swamp. And uh, sometimes uh, the water, she uh, comes up. And then uh, one must wait for the boat. Well, is that what just happened? Is the road washed out? Oh, no, senor. I, 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 I do not think so. Well, then why are we taking a detour? Uh, detour? Yes, a detour. Don't you understand? Uh, no, senor. Uno recalto. Eh? Uno recalto. This is not the way to the airport. <laughs> that is right. Then stop this cab at once. For what purpose? We intend to get out. I am afraid, senor, that they would not permit such an event. They? Should the senor turn around, he will see a car to the rear of us. Inside are gentlemen with machine guns. And now, a similar vehicle is in front of us. I see my friend, Yerucha. What do you propose to do with us? As I stated before, senor, can I read the future? Where are we? I don't know, Mr. Burley. I know you don't know. We're somewhere in the jungle. I know we're in the jungle. I can look out this filthy window and see we're in the jungle. 
What are they going to do with us? Hold us for ransom, I suppose. Can you work your hands loose? No, I don't think so. Neither can I. How long are they going to keep us tied up like this? I don't know. Please, Miss Tracy, don't say that again. When is that desperado coming back? I don't know. Miss Tracy, you're fired. <laughs> yes, sir. No, no, you're not. It's just that everything's so disorganized at this point. You understand? Yes, sir. The one thing I cannot tolerate is disorganization. Disorganization is at the root of every failure in the history of the world. Yes, sir. Empires topple, corporations crumble. And you know why? No, sir. What have we just been talking about? Disorganization. Yes, sir. Now, what do you think, Miss Tracy? What do I think about what, Mr. Burley? About what? About this. Or does something like this happen to you on a regular basis? I mean, getting kidnapped by bandits and revolutionists is just ordinary, everyday routine, old stuff to you. No, sir. At any given moment, those men could walk in here and cut us down with machine gun fire. What do you think of that? I would rather not think about it. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking about? I know you're disappointed in me. You really feel you're entitled to someone better. Well, it isn't my fault. Miss Tracy, let's drop the whole thing. The fact is, if you wanted to spend your last hours on Earth with someone charming, witty, exciting, you obviously have chosen the wrong person, but it, it isn't your fault. I'm having trouble following you, Miss Tracy. Well, you didn't know at the time you'd be hiring someone you'd have to die with. All you thought was you were just hiring his secretary. Well, that's true, isn't it? All right, Miss Tracy. When you hire a secretary, she has to be plain and no ordinary looking and quiet. A person who doesn't attract attention. And do you know why she doesn't attract attention? Because she's dull. And she doesn't have anything to say. Why don't we talk about something else? Like what? We never converse with each other, Mr. Burley. That's ridiculous. We talk to each other all day. I said converse. We talk about sales and administration and acquisitions and meetings. And I see to it that your thoughts on all those subjects are rooted to the proper people in the proper places. When did we ever have a conversation? fact is, you never wanted conversation from me. Would you have been interested in how I felt about... about... About what? Life. Life? I've been your secretary for seven years. I replaced Martha Wallace, a woman very much like me, and I'm sure she replaced a woman very much like herself. And I'll be replaced by another carbon copy. Do you know my favorite color? Why should I know your favorite color? My favorite dessert? My favorite book? Movie? Play? You don't know anything about me. You don't even know where I live. Your address is on file in the event I should ever need it. Do you know about all the things that... that frighten me? Do you know the things that make me... Happy to be alive sometimes? Now, Miss Tracy, despite all this, you are an excellent secretary. Oh, yes, but I'm not your idea of a person you'd want to spend your last day on Earth with. Well, just let me say this. You're not my idea of the person I'd want to die with either. Oh, I'm sorry I said that. Miss Tracy, look. Look through the window. It's them. They... They're in a car. Yes, that cab driver is coming this way and he's carrying a bag. Wait, wait, the car is going away. He's coming in here alone. Yes. Now listen, listen closely. There must be food in that bag. He's coming here to feed us. Or, or, or to kill us? No, no, not yet. He's going to have to untie us so that we can eat. Now we must find an opportunity to overpower him somehow. But he's got that gun in that holster. We'll just have to take that chance. Now don't say another word. Ah, mis amigos, my friends. You have been comfortable here, no? No, definitely no. Ah, now we shall eat and we shall drink. Perhaps we shall even be merry. See, I have brought the food and the wine. Uh, first, I shall cut the bindings, no? Yes. Ah, but before we commence, be advised by me, your friend. You are our friend? The others wanted to kill you. Why? 
because they are foolish young people. They wish to make a statement. And you? I? I, Carlos Ortega Maria de Onesis Alajain, I'm a man of the world, as you are, Senor Burley. Uh, yes, I see. We are men of the world. And we speak the same language. And what language is that? Money. Does it matter if men say dollars, francs, pesetas, pounds, marks? Aren't we all saying the same thing? And what are we going to say to each other in this language, Senor Zalakayin? Pleasant things to make all happy. Oh, would you mind cutting these ropes, please? One thing first, Senor. Escape. It might occur to you that you are two and I am one. Even if I do wear a pistol. But all foolish ideas should be abandoned because of the jungle. Look outside and listen. Much of it is bird and monkey, harmless creatures. But if you listen closely, a jaguar and perhaps a puma also. What you cannot hear until it is too late. The python, the anaconda. That is what awaits you. And now I shall cut these ropes. And we shall have a party. Some party. The host has you in a frying pan and reminds you that if you don't like the heat, the fire is even worse. Yes, life has always been a consideration of alternatives. And so many times it boils down to making a choice between bad and worse. And that's what we're headed for. When I shall return with Act Two. What is man's essential nature? The question has puzzled a philosopher for centuries, and in our day, the psychiatrist cannot answer it either. Is it because our essential nature has become so bent? so warped, so altered by the customs of civilization? What happens to people when all the laws they live by are suddenly stripped away? You mean there are wild beasts out there? Why, of course, Senor. Try a bit more of this wine. Oh, uh, no, I, I really shouldn't. Oh, calm. It places the sparkle in the eyes. Oh, all right. Oh, where does the jungle go? Quien sabe? This is just the edge. Inside for hundreds, uh, thousands maybe, of miles. And savages, headhunters, cannibals, no one goes into the jungle. Where does it all come out? Somewhere it all comes out on the ocean. Ah, but why do we speak of the jungle? Which of us would be foolish enough to go out there... Let us speak of the international language of the world. Money, eh, senor? What sort of ransom were you thinking of? Something that will keep my young people happy. Senor, why have you come to this country? You know why? See, si. To discover the riches below the ground, in the waters, the trees, the mountains, no? Yes. And to buy them. Yes. They are not for sale. I am willing to pay a fair price. Fair? Who decides fair? Do you suppose I could have a, a, another drink of that? Ah, with pleasure. Thank you very much. You ask me, senor, who decides what is fair in this country? Yes. Perhaps good friends of mine one day soon. I see we will not sell the wealth of this country to foreigners. No? Never. That would be a betrayal of the people. However... Ah, however... Those of us who will be in command may need associates. Uh, how do you say? Socios commanditarios. Silent partners? Si. Silent partners. I didn't know you spoke Spanish, Miss Tracy. Yeah, I have hidden depths. Your glass is empty, senor. <laughs> that isn't my fault. Allow me. Silent partners. Yes. 
And how would the silent partners operate? First, they would provide money to help the cause. Uh Uh-huh, the cause. And then, they would have to receive much money and see that it is given a foreign... um, uh, uh, Senora, como se dice asilo? Hmm? Oh, haven. Ah, gracias. A foreign haven. Do you follow this, Senor Burley? Perfectly. Then we understand what is to be done. Oh, completely. Shall we drink to the new silent partners? Happily. Oh, wait, let me pour. Of course. For you, Mr. Burley. And now, if you'll hold up your glass, Senor Zalakayen. Oh, oh, please, I'm so sorry. It's not... Oh, my God, I spilled it all over you. It is not... Oh, no, wait, you just let me hear it. Get... Oh, Tracy, why did you hit him? Get his gun. His gun, move. You tried to kill me. Help me, Mr. Burley. I will shoot you both. Don't let him get that gun out of the holster. Wait, we can well, settle this. I will kill you. No, 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 we can I settle this, I tell you. you. Hold his arm. Don't let him, don't let him shoot. <laughs> Oh! <gasps> Is he? Yes. Is he? Yes, he's dead. Oh. What did you do? I, I did what you told me to. What did I tell you? You said we'd have to find an opportunity to overpower him somehow. I said he has a gun in that holster, and you said we'll have to take the chance, and... I tried to say something, and you said we'd have to do... I think I'm going to be sick. I was only following your orders, Mr. Burley. I pretended to be drunk. I was just waiting for a chance, and when it came, I took it. You were waiting for a chance? Yes, sir. Couldn't you see? Couldn't you sense that the situation had changed? I thought it was just a conversation. I was under the impression that you were trying to lead him on. Didn't you hear us make a deal? Mr. Burley... I was very busy waiting for the opportunity. I was very frightened, too. That's what I came to this country for. To find someone I could make a deal with, and you had to kill him. I didn't kill him, sir. We were all struggling for that gun, and it just went off. What are we going to do now? Now? Yes. How do we explain this to his friends? Well, we... We'll just say that there was an accident. Oh, sure. But it's the truth. They'll kill us. And we have to get out of here. Yes, and go where? Oh, we could try to find our way back to the city. We'd get lost in the jungle. We can't stay here. Why did you have to... Mr. Burley, you've never done a thing like this before. You're always a fair man, sometimes nasty, but fair. You've never blamed people for obeying your orders. Oh, shut up, Miss Tracy. Please don't talk to me like that. This has been very difficult for me. Man has just been killed. And it's going to get worse. Oh, how can it get worse? Do you hear that? What? S- sound of a motor. Somebody's coming. We have to get away. We can't go out there. We can't stay here either. Oh, no! Zalakaim! Oh, we have to go. Zalakaim! Why did you have to attack him? Do you want to pick up that pistol from the floor? I'd do it, but I don't know how to use it. That is a storm suddenly. A storm. But that's good. It'll help us get away. They won't see us. Not just a minute. And when they discover what's happened to him, they won't be able to find us. I am not going out into that jungle. Well, I'm not going to stay here and let those people kill me. Which way? I don't know. I think... West is over that way. Great. West is over that way. So east is over this way. North is over there. And south is over here. So what? Does it make any difference? Who knows which is the right direction? Well, let's just pick one and stick with it. Let's just sit down for a minute. I'm hungry. But that's why we better keep going. While we still have our strength. Oh, sure. And besides, we better keep walking while it's daylight. Because at night... Yes, because at night... The past two days and nights, it's been storming. The animals weren't interested in you or me, but tonight it's clear the animals all come out to hunt. Well, don't they? I think so. So how can we hope to survive? Uh, we'll climb a tree. Yes, uh, and so can a boa constrictor. You don't have to be so negative. I don't like your attitude, Miss Tracy. <laughs> then you can fire me. <laughs> Wish we could find something to eat. Well, they are fruits and nuts, berries, look... How do we know they're not poisonous? Let's, let's watch and see which ones the birds are eating. Say, that's very astute. 
Where did, where did you learn such a thing? I used to be a campfire girl. Oh. Then you know all about the woods uh, and the outdoors. I used to know how to build a fire. Without matches, you rub dry sticks together. Where could we find dry sticks around here? Are you watching the birds? What are they eating? They don't seem to be eating anything. Maybe they're just not hungry now. Well, maybe everything around here is poison. Can't be. The birds have to live on something. Is it possible that the birds could eat berries that would be poisonous to people? I don't know. Maybe we could kill something with that pistol. Kill what? Something we could eat. Well, then we'd have to, to, to skin it and clean it and cook it. You know how? Oh, we should be able to solve those problems. Miss Tracy, what are you talking about? Well, our ancestors did. They didn't even know as much as we do. If they could survive in an environment like this, why can't we? Because we are... Oh, what's the use? We just can't give up. I'm very tired. And I don't have my pills. I'm sorry. I packed them with your luggage. That's all out at the airport. What am I going to do without my pills? Well, you'll just have to do the best you can. My blood pressure's going up, Miss Tracy. I know it. I'm sorry. I don't even want to think about my hypertension. Well, that's good, sir, because you shouldn't. You should try to avoid all sorts of stress. Miss Tracy, are you insane? Possibly for the first time in my entire life, I really have something to be stressful about. I'm sorry. Well, you should be. Now, all this is your fault. Well, I'm sorry, too, Miss Tracy. I... I know I must be a ludicrous figure right now, but I can't help it. This is not my milieu. Do you understand? Yes. I mean, I know what to do with engineers and designers and bankers and government officials. I'm completely in charge. You know that. You've seen it. Yes, sir. I mean, we live in a highly specialized social order. And I simply happen to be outside my specialty just now. I would agree, sir. Somewhere out here, an illiterate Stone Age savage thrives in this place. But put him in a board of directors meeting. Could that be one of those jaguars? I don't know. I don't think so. Why not? Because I think I read somewhere that they don't make any noise. What is it, then? You have the pistol. Shoot at it. How can I shoot at it? I can't even see it. You can see it. It could be too late. Shoot at the sound. Maybe you'll scare it away. You hit it. What was it? I don't know. Do you want to go and see? No. Maybe you scared it away. You hear that? It sounds like thunder. I wouldn't say that's thunder. No. Neither would I. Zalakain, he said there were savages. Headhunters, cannibals. But this is the 20th century. Not out here. It stopped. Whoever it was, maybe they went away. Miss Tracy, look. Oh, God. Who? Who are they? Savages. What are those long, hollow tubes? I think dart guns. And they're aiming them at us. <gasps> Don't shoot. Listen. Friends. That's what we are. Friends. Hopefully these newcomers on our scene understand what the word friend means. Even so, there are those people who are not out to make friends under any circumstances. You must admit, we're being consistent in our story. Just when it appears that matters simply can't get worse, they do. See you at the third act shortly. The boy next door is a doctor and he's single. My daughter, what a girl. She's single too. I'll invite him for some donuts and my coffee. Maxwell House, I'm leaving it up to you. Maxwell House is... Good moment. Maxwell House is... Good coffee. Good to the last drop. Maxwell House. Get together with the great taste of Maxwell House coffee. Coffee you can count on. Good to the last drop, Maxwell House. 
One picture, they say, is worth a thousand words. So, let us save the words and give you the picture. Somewhere in a vast expanse of wild, unexplored jungle, we have our friends, Mr. Burley and Miss Tracy. They suddenly find themselves surrounded by a group of wild-looking, primitive people who are aiming dart guns and bows at them. Now, you are up to date. Don't shoot! We are friends! We... we want to be friends! What are they going to do? We just can't stand here. Someone's coming. He's bigger than everybody else. He must be the chief. You. He speaks English. Only one word so far. Come. Where are you taking us? Come. I think you irritated him. Sir, I merely wish to inquire. Come. Come. What are they going to do with us? It hasn't been too bad so far. They gave us something to eat. You must admit, it it was good. Yes, it was also fattening. Oh. You remember what Zalakayin said about cannibals? I don't think they're cannibals. No, why not? I think I remember reading that people only become cannibals when other food is scarce. There seems to be plenty of game, all kinds of fruits. Well, that makes all kinds of sense, too. Thank you, Miss Tracy. For what? For making me feel better. But while they may not be cannibals, they could very well be headhunters. Those drums. Just listen to those drums. I rather like them. You do? Yes. They remind me of... of discos. Do you go to discos, Miss Tracy? No. Why not, since you like the music? Oh, I don't know anyone who'd take me. How did you ever get to be my secretary? You hired me. No, what I mean is, how did you ever get into a situation where you would become a secretary to a Sylvester Burley? How did you ever become a Sylvester Burley? Oh, that's a long story. Mm-hmm. Mine's pretty short. I'd like to hear it. Oh, you've heard it before. Mama and Papa work hard to send the kids to college, and they all become doctors and lawyers. And the youngest one comes along, and Mama and Papa now too old, so she has to go to work. Puts in overtime for doctor's bills. No time for dates. No, oh, so she gets used to doing without. She gets to be 30. And... 35 and soon 40. You! Oh, uh, yes, sir. You, uh, you better stand up, Miss Tracy. You have come here. That, that's true. Yes, sir. We, we did come here. Why you come? Actually, uh, we, we're, we're lost. Lost? Do you know what lost means? Yes. Lost. Where did you learn to speak English? From missionary. Missionary? Is he around? Could we see him? Talk to him? What happened to the missionary? Maybe we better not ask. You too. You have come. That is absolutely correct, sir. My name is Sylvester Burley, J. Sylvester Burley, and I am chairman of the board of Burley Industries. And this is my secretary, Miss Tracy, Miss Margaret Tracy. We are a conglomerate, and we're into just about everything. You, man. You, come. Where? Come. Mr. Burley, what happened? Nothing. They took me to a big open space and they all stood around me in a circle. And what happened? Nothing. They just stared at me. That's all? I don't understand. Then uh, the chief, he just pointed at the hut and told me to come back here. But what are they going to do with us? Listen. The drums, but they don't sound the same, do they? I don't like it. You! Oh! Oh! You startled me! You! Come! Now, 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 look here, Chief. Come! 
You sit. Chief. Be Let... still. Uh, yes, sir. Missionary. Say love. Yes. Love. Absolutely, Chief. Love is what makes the world go round. Love. All people. That's true. I mean, you really have to love all people. All people. It's easy to love your own, after all. Other people... Well, that can be difficult. But that's what love is all about, isn't it? Listen. There are people who really don't deserve to be loved, but... Once you start drawing the line... Listen. Listen to what? Thunder God. Oh, yes, sure. Of course, the Thunder God. He speak. Certainly. Thunder God never speak at this time before. No? Thunder God speak only in season. Season. Oh, you mean rainy season. Thunder season. Oh. Why he speak now? Why? Why he speak with thunder and his wife with water? Why? Uh, I don't know. I know. Thunder God. Angry. Oh, oh yes. Well, yes, it's possible. Uh, Missionaries say we must love. So we do not kill when we see you in jungle. Oh, of course, it would be the wrong thing to do. Definitely. But thunder God, angry. Why? Angry at you. At me? At you and husband. But he is not... Be still. Why else rain and thunder now? It could be... Still. So he's wrong to love. Thunder God angry. We must kill. What did he say? The news isn't good. No, I had that feeling. We're going to be killed. When? Oh. Any time now. Well, I hope they wait till it stops raining. No. That's the idea of the thing. It's going to stop raining when they kill me. But suppose it doesn't. <laughs> we'll have won a moral victory. Uh-oh. Here he comes. You! Now listen, Chief, let's let's make a deal here. I mean, what does it take to let us go? Whatever it is, I can swing it, Chief. I can make you rich. Rich? Chief, you can become a millionaire. Millionaire? He doesn't understand. But I'm not going to be slaughtered here like some animal. I'm Sylvester Burley. Two weeks ago, I had a meeting with the President of the United States. No ignorant savage is going to push me around. Right to your congressman. Prepare. Prepare. For what? For Thunder God. For God and his wife, goddess of rain. Pray they will be pleased. Now, wait a minute, Chief. Chief, come back here. There's, there has to be something. There's got to be a way out. Do you want to save your life? How? What's it worth to you? Well, you can name your price. You know that. I wonder. I wonder if it would really be worth it to you. What is it? On the other hand, would it be worth it to me? I wish you would tell me what you're talking about. Right now, I'm not sure I know what I'm talking about. You are a great help. Come to sacrifice to Thunder God. Look, there are all those men with bows and arrows aiming at us. Gods are angry because two strangers in jungle. But we didn't do anything. Be silent. That isn't true. We did. We sinned. What are you saying? Chief, it's true. The God of Thunder and his wife, the goddess of rain, are angry, and I know why. I know why better than you do, Chief. 
Do you know why I know? I'll tell you. It's because I'm the sinner. Chief, I hear the thunder god and his wife talking, and do you know what they're saying? Ask me, Chief. Speak. They are not angry because we walked in their jungle. No? No. They love to have people walk in their jungle. Love. Remember love. They send the missionary here to tell you about it. They are angry because we tried to fool them. The way we fooled you. You fooled me? Yes, of course. Don't you remember you said the gods were angry at me and my husband? Yes. You thought he was my husband. He is not my husband. We are not married. You not man and wife? No. And that is why the gods are displeased. Because a man and woman who are not married walk together in their jungle. Together? Together. Is abomination. We are guilty. You are the chief. You can purify us. Make us man and wife. And so you satisfy the gods. Now, just a minute, mistress. Is it worth it to you, Mr. Burley? You speak truth. Make us man and wife, chief, and you'll see. The thunder god will become silent and his wife shall stop the rain. What if it doesn't stop raining? What have you got to lose? Sound drum for marriage ceremony. Look. The clouds. They're disappearing. The sun. You can see the sun. You're fortunate you were discovered by some friendly natives. More or less civilized folk. Otherwise... It was good meeting you, Mr. Goodlaw. My wife and I will never forget this place. My goodness, I didn't know Miss Tracy was actually your wife. Neither did I. I uh, beg your pardon? Well, in a way, we'd been married a long time, except we didn't know it. Uh, Yes. Well, your plane's about to leave. Uh, Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Goodlove. Why did you tell him I was your wife? After all, it wasn't a legal marriage. Well, it was approved by the god of thunder and the goddess of rain. (laughs) But suppose it hadn't stopped raining. Doesn't matter. You'd have thought of something else. Mr. Burley, do you realize this is the first time since I went to work for you that you ever gave me a compliment? We can legalize this thing back home. I'm not so sure. You mean you don't want to marry me? You don't want to marry me? I'm Sylvester Burley. Chief operating officer of $500 million conglomerate. Last week I had lunch with the President of the United States. <laughs> Is that what I really sound like? <laughs> Miss Tracy, I need your help. Oh, that's better. Margaret, please. I don't know what I'd ever do without you. Keep it up. You're doing fine. <laughs> The title for today's little exercise in human behavior might very well be How to Marry Your Boss, although I would hardly recommend such an extreme and strenuous tactic to everybody. The fact is, there is a bond between all people who depend on each other, and we never know whether it'll become stronger or weaker under the stresses and strains of our lives. On this, more in just a moment. I've never fancied myself as much of a cook, but I can bake a wonderful homemade pie. And my secret is Pet Ritz frozen pie shells. I found them one day in my grocer's freezer, and I've been baking pies ever since. I just fill a pie shell with fruit and pop it in the oven. 
My friends can't figure out how I can be such an average cook and bake such wonderful pies. But Pet Ritz pie shells make it easy. All you do is fill and bake with Pet Ritz frozen pie shells. Wherever the big news is made this fall, Sports Illustrated will be there to capture it. We've been there for baseball surprises from Kansas City to Philadelphia. We'll be there for the college and pro football battles from Pasadena to Pittsburgh. We'll be there as the Islanders and the Lakers defend their crowns. And as Duran and Leonard square off in a super middleweight rematch, there'll be big news this fall. Sports Illustrated will be there each week to capture it for 16 million readers. That's what makes it a great place to advertise. Sports Illustrated, America's Sports News Weekly. did choose to call our story silent partners. The Spanish term, as used by the unfortunate Senor Zalacain, socios comanditarios, carries another connotation as well. Bed partners, which implies a further sense of intimacy. I suppose what it really means is partners who share a secret. If so, each of us has many partners. If anyone, anywhere, at any time, commits a crime and we condone it or refuse to speak out against it, we truly become a silent partner. Isn't that why there is so much injustice in this imperfect world? Our cast included Marion Seldes, Mandel Kramer, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Shines like fire blazing in the night. Supreme of lordly wealth. Yes, gold throughout history has kindled the hottest, most ravaging fires known to humanity. It has burned away men, women, cities, entire civilizations. How can it generate such all-consuming heat, such awesome power? After all, it is such a pale, soft metal. Do you know how much gold there's said to be? A ton. I don't believe it. Do you know how much a ton of gold is worth at today's prices? It's immaterial. Don't you realize it's a wild goose chase? Yes. But at least it's for a golden goose. Our mystery drama, A Ton of Gold, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Earl Hammond and Ralph Bell. I'll be back shortly with Act One. ties that bind us to each other. And of them all, which are the strongest? Love? Loyalty? Fear? Custom? Some of us go through a lifetime without ever putting any of them to the test. A battered, travel-stained jeep bounces along the rocky desert road. We're in a high and lonely area of western New Mexico. Nothing much lives here except sagebrush, cactus, rattlesnakes, and a few Yahweh Indians. And one of them is a man of about 50 who is called Crazy Joe. Right now, he is sitting under a tattered awning of a ramshackle general store and filling station, watching the jeep off in the distance as it slowly comes closer. Now, what is this fella doing out of me today? Well, well, takes all kinds. Hey, Rosetta, you want to come out here? Hi. Can I uh, get some gas? Sure. Well? Well, what? I thought you said I could get some gas. Well, you can. When? When? Well, you're just sitting there. Well, I know I'm sitting here. I sure ain't going to sit out there in the sun. Yes, but uh, how am I going to get my gas? Mm. Rosetta, tell her how much you want. 
Senate, please, miss. Hey, mister. Yes, what is it? Smile. You'll live longer. <laughs> hey, why don't you get out of the sun, huh? If this young lady can put up with it, so can I. Oh, uh, oh I see. That's what's bothering me. Who you. says anything's bothering me? Well, you're thinking. Uh, here's this lazy, no-account, shiftless old bum sitting back and letting this poor, skinny little girl do all the work. Huh? I never said that. Well, I didn't say you said it. I said you're thinking it. You'd rather I did it. But if I did it, I wouldn't have no reason to hire her to do it, and she wouldn't have a job, and who'd support her five kids, huh? You? Could I get something to drink? We got cold beer and soda pop. I would like something without sugars, sweeteners, salts, some carbohydrates. Do you have any water? Rosetta, when you're finished, bring him a glass. Hey, uh, what's he got there now? Eight gallons? Except credit cards? Yeah, we'll take it inside and write it up, Rosetta. Hey, I miss. I mean, uh, Mrs. That little girl, she has five children? Number six on the way. She doesn't talk very much, does she? Well, that's because she's got nothing to say. How far am I from the Yahweh Indian Reservation? You're on it. Oh. I wonder if uh, you could help me. I'm looking uh, for a man of Yahweh. I don't know if he still lives around here. He may not even be alive. The truth is, I... Uh, well, I don't know if he ever existed. You know what I think? I think you're looking for me. You? You want a fella named Joe Raincloud, huh? Joe Raincloud? Yeah, also known as, uh, as Crazy Joe. You're Crazy Joe? Yeah. I can always tell when you fellas come around. What do you mean by you fellas? Treasure hunters. Oh, but I'm not a treasure hunter. Oh, no? I'm a professor of archaeology. Well, comes the same thing in the end. My name is Doughty, Dr. Edwin D. Doughty. Mention was made of you in a monograph written by a Professor Zellman. You're supposed to know where the Zamora gold is hidden. I do. If you guide me to it, I'll be willing to divide it with you. If I wanted to have the gold, I could take it all for myself. Now, couldn't I? Why don't you want the gold? You know why? There's a curse on it. <laughs> Come now. Everyone who's tried to take it away has died. Well, I don't believe that. Well, well, nobody believes it. Around here, nobody even believes the gold exists. That's why they call me Crazy Joe. You take my advice. You just forget it. Could I hire you to lead me to the gold? As long as you understand that you won't come back alive. <laughs> All right, I shall be ready to start in exactly one week. Oh, I'll be here. Yep. Here was the latest. And no way I could stop him. The idea of all that gold, it, I guess it just unhinges him. I tell him it's cursed by all the dead spirits of all the murdered Yahweh people. You can't take it away. But the minute you say words like curse and spirits, people figure you're a nut. So what happens to them? They die, all of them. And this one, uh, what's his name? Doubt is. Well, he's going to be next. Right now... He's gone home to make all the preparations for the trip. I hope he remembers to make out his will. But, darling, it will be quite an experience. I'm not sure I want such an experience. I need you. What for? To keep my notes and records. You have your assistant. Oh, Walter will be too busy with other details. Oh, is Walter coming? Yes, of course. Well, why do I have to go? I need someone I can trust. Absolutely. Ah, he's right on time. I'll get it. Walter, come on in. Good evening, Professor. This is Doughty. I have wonderful news. I found him. Him? Joe Raincloud. Crazy Joe. Oh. He agreed to guide us to the treasure. We're to meet him Friday morning. But it doesn't make sense. Walter, my mind is made up. Mrs. Doughty, do you know what he's talking about? A very hot, dusty, uncomfortable journey in the desert. A rumor of some ancient buried treasure. A fool's errand, without a doubt. My dear... Almost every archaeological expedition begins as a fool's errand. But this surpasses them all. A man of questionable sanity, a Dr. Zellman. Zellman was one of the most competent, trusted... He wrote about a revolt of Indian gold miners. A shipment of gold was being readied for transport to Spain. The Indians rose up in rebellion, seized the gold, and made their way deep into the wilderness, where they managed to hide it. Now, why is that so difficult to believe? What's hardest of all to believe is that this Indian, this 
Crazy Joe knows where the gold is hidden and hasn't taken it for himself. <laughs> he believes the gold is cursed. <laughs> Why? Because it brought death to so many thousands of Yahweh men, women, and children. Well, really, practically destroyed the tribe. And you believe him? Yes. How much gold is there supposed to be? Zelman says close to a ton. A ton of gold? Mm. Well, uh, how much would a ton of gold be worth? Today? Oh, 15, 16 million dollars. 16 million? Well, well, now that sounds interesting. Till now, we've been sweating in the tropics and freezing in the Arctic, looking for bits of stone and bone. Mrs. Dowdy, don't you realize it's a wild goose chase? Yes, but at least it's for a golden goose. And uh, this is my wife, Mrs. Dowdy, and my assistant, Mr. Walter Stafford. This is uh, Joe Raincloud. Uh, you can all call me Crazy Joe. Are you saying that gold is there? Yes, sir. You've seen it personally? Yes, ma'am. I uh, think we're ready. Ruth here, will you ride in the jeep with Walter? I'm sure it'll be more comfortable. Uh, Joe and I will follow in the truck. Before we go, it's only fair for me to tell you folks that you're not coming back. Why do you say that? You'll be dead. Edwin, what is this man talking about? Now, dearest, it's just a superstition. It ain't a superstition. It's fact. It's the curse that's been put on the gold by the spirits of the Yahweh people. <laughs> well, if that's the extent of the problem... I believe we had better start. Okay. But nobody can say they wasn't warned. Joe, how long should it take? Three, four days. You mean it's that far? Well, in a couple of hours, we're going to head up the mountains. Now, it ain't going to be a road like this. There ain't going to be any road at all, most places. I, I am sorry that you insist on going, Professor. I knew Zellman. Did you show him the gold? Yeah. Well, he came back alive to write about it, didn't he? He decided not to take any of it. Why? He believed me. He took my advice and he left it. Joe, gold does not have to be used for evil. Yeah? It can be used to do good. You can't prove that by the Yahweh people. Well, I intend to use it for good. Oh, that's so. I intend to establish a research foundation. Oh, I will take a modest type then, but I'm basically a man of simple taste. Well, how about your wife? Does she have simple taste too? Hmm? I can generally convince Ruth that I am right. And how about your assistant, this uh, Walter Stafford fellow? He is as dedicated to research as I am. Now, what do you think? What do I think? About our chances of returning alive with a treasure. You see, I don't completely rule out your story about the curse. You don't? I've studied primitive peoples like the Yahweh's all over the world. Primitive peoples, huh? I have every intention of placating the ancient spirits of your people. Uh, how's that? I will tell them that, that much of this gold will be used to better the lot of the remnants of the Yahweh people. Well, I am sure they'd be glad to hear that. So you see, Joe, I don't think I have anything to fear from so-called supernatural forces. Well, maybe he had nothing to fear from supernatural forces. But if I was him, I'd worry about natural forces. I looked ahead at the two of them in the jeep in front of us. The wife, the assistant, and I turned to look at the professor. Now, he was a man older than me, every bit of 60... The wife? Well, she could have been more than 35, 40 cops. The assistant? Maybe 30. Now, the two of them managed to give the impression that they didn't like each other, but the way they were sitting next to each other, I didn't seem to get that idea at all. Well, that night we made camp. After supper, the professor fell fast asleep. After a while, I dozed off myself. Now, did I dream this, or did I actually hear it? Walter? What is it? Can't you sleep either? No. Shall we go for a walk? No. Why not? Suppose he wakes up and sees we're missing. What if he does? He'd never suspect anything. Well, what about the Indian? If you ask me, the Indian knows already. How could he know? I think it's obvious to almost everyone except your husband. Walter... Why did you agree to come on the trip? If he'd gone alone, we could have had such a good time by ourselves at home. How can you even ask, Ruth? You know I'm completely dependent on his sponsorship. I know. And I hate it. 
Well, maybe. Maybe what? I need his recommendation for the teaching post, and that's all there is to it. If you had a a ton of gold, you wouldn't have to teach, would you? No. I would say not. And if I had a ton of gold, I wouldn't have to be his wife either. And on such statements of expectation, let us end our first act. So, what do we know? We know there is a deception in domestic arrangements as far as the professor, his wife, and his assistant are concerned. We know that there may be a considerable sum of money in the offing. We know that four people have started out on this expedition. Are you beginning to get the feeling that less than that number may return? Wait for Act Two. It was the celebrated Honoré de Balzac who claimed that it was impossible for most married men to keep their wives perfectly happy. Therefore, we find that many of them have what can be charitably labeled as assistance. Most husbands are blissfully unaware of this state of affairs. Professor Edwin Doughty has an assistant in his department of archaeology in the college. Little does the good professor realize that the assistant also assists him at home. But back to the narrator of our story, a certain Joe Raincloud. On the second day, we were in the mountains. Rough, rugged, rocky country. Now, I knew the trail. I'd been here before with other people. It was hard going. I'm pretty sure I was right about them, the wife and the assistant. And so I figured it was time to go to work. Oh, what beautiful berries. What are they, Joe? Uh, Hollandina. What's that? An old Indian name. What, what does it mean? Silent Vengeance. Silent Vengeance? Yeah. Very poisonous. Oh, and I was about to eat one. Well, it's a good thing you did. Why, why is it called Silent Vengeance? Well, it was used by the women. You know, a wife might suspect her husband was making love to another girl, but she wouldn't say nothing, but... One night, she might squeeze the juice of some of these berries into the old man's supper. And very soon, he'd just keel over quietly. You mean he'd be dead? Dead and gone. A Halloween of berry. <laughs> and it's such a beautiful, bright red color. So is blood. Joe? Uh, yes, Professor? You think we'll be there tomorrow? Tomorrow, next day. What's the difference? Gold's been there almost 400 years. Another day or two won't matter. I mean, there's a place where there's this ton of gold, and you're saying we'll be there tomorrow or the next night? Now, Walter, we've already agreed that gold exists. We haven't agreed, sir. I've come because, well, that's the way you wanted it. We're traversing the ancient road, are we not, Joe? Yeah. What road? The road of the rebellion, as Zelman termed it in his monograph. Uh, there was a medicine man of the Yawi people, and one morning he said, My brothers, too long have we lived as slaves. Let us die like men. And they turned on the overseers, and they killed them. You see, Walter, how each nation has a similar legend? Ours is no legend. Ours is the truth. Well, of course, Joe, of course. Well, here's, here's the one thing I don't understand. Why did the Indians take the gold? It had no value for them the way it did for the white man. Why not just make good their escape? Well, I'll tell you why. They kept the gold in order to destroy Garcilaso de Zamora. Now, he was the coolest of all the Spanish conquistadores. Garcilaso, the butcher. He had to return to Spain to report the loss of the gold. Well, King Philip didn't believe him. He thought it was a scheme whereby Garcilaso could keep the gold for himself. So, Garcilaso was hanged, drawn, and quartered, and the Yahweh people were avenged. Where is the gold right now? In a cave where the Yahweh people placed it, deep, deep in the ground. What what form is it in? Mm, just it was found in the mine. Dust. Just like all the people who mined it are now dust. King Philip of Spain is also dust, and his dreams of conquest are dust. With this gold, he could have created an armada that was twice the size of the one he sent against England. An armada that could have won. 
How do you know all this, Joe? Well, these are stories that every Yahweh learns as he grows up. You know, he hears them when his mother sings him to sleep. He hears them at the council fires. We, the Yahweh, the smallest, the weakest of all the tribes, we changed the history of the white man in Europe. We defeated the Spanish Armada. And we are avenged. Wait. Hey, fire's going out. <laughs> I'd better get some more wood. Well, do you uh, believe him now, Walter? I believe him. Yes, I believe him. But, but why is he leading us to the gold? I'd already spoken to the wife. Now it's time to see about the assistant. Was I right about him? I had to be right. There was no other way to look at it. Uh, hey. Hey, you want to give me a hand? What is it? Uh, it start the engine. I want to check on the radiator. All right. Yeah, all right. All right, all right. You can shut it off now. Was there a problem? Well, I'm just making sure that we're not going to have one. We ought to be there tonight, then. Well, if we don't fall off a cliff. Mm. Tell me something. Uh, what do you want to do with your share of the money? Hmm? My share? Yeah. Yeah, you and the professor and his wife. You decided how you're going to cut up the pie? Uh, no, I hadn't thought about it. Oh, who are you kidding? Huh? What do you mean? Now, there's a ton of gold out there, and you mean you haven't thought about how much of it should be yours? You don't understand. When we go out on an archaeological dig, we don't think of making, uh, keeping what we find. It all goes to a, a museum. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. As long as it's broken pots. Now, was it your idea that this ton of gold is going to go to a museum? Well, as I say, I, I hadn't thought about it. I guess he must have thought about it all morning. Because when we stopped to have us a little bite of lunch and tried to get out of the heat of the day, all of a sudden... Professor, about the gold. Uh, yes, Walter. What are we going to do with it? We're going to set up the Edwin Doughty Research Foundation. With the entire amount? Yes, of course. And none of us is to get any of it for our own use? Walter, that's certainly not in the scientific spirit. But this is gold. Yes, I'm aware of that. This gold does not belong to you to do with as you see fit. Walter, I'm afraid I don't understand. You understand, all right. Look, I am in charge of this expedition. Who elected you? Walter, I think you are forgetting yourself. No. Maybe I'm remembering. I mean to have my share. Your share? There's four of us. Joe doesn't want any. Okay. That leaves three of us. I think this is a pointless discussion. I'm going to take a third, whether you like it or not. A third, eh? It should be a half. After all, you and Ruth are husband and wife. Walter, I'm willing to forget this silly outburst. There's nothing silly about it. I'm going to get what's coming to me. I stretched out a canvas and the professor took his nap. I was about to relax myself when I noticed that the wife and the assistant were missing. They must have taken a walk. Where? Then I saw them. They were down the hill a little ways behind the truck. Now, if I moved carefully, I could get close enough to hear them without being seen. Walter, why did you irritate him? Mm, certain things had to be set forth and understood. He's determined to create this foundation of his. It will be the crowning achievement of his career. Where does that leave you? Me. Us. Walter. Darling. He's not going to do it. No, I heard that tone in his voice. He means it. So? Are we going to let him? I'm not. How can you stop him? I'm just going to take what I consider to be my fair share. He can't stop me. I'm afraid he can. That's impossible. I'm bigger and stronger. I'm half his age. But he has something you don't. What? A gun. A gun? He hates guns. He won't have one on an expedition for any reason. He's got a gun. I can't believe it. It's an automatic pistol. I saw him pack it away in his musette bag. You know, the one he carries with him all the time. Why? Why did he have a gun? It's an interesting question, isn't it? It only means I'm going to have to take it away from him. I knew about the gun. I had seen it in the bag as he sat beside me in the truck. 
Uh, things were right on schedule. Maybe even a little bit ahead. And I sneaked back up the hill. I figured I could use a little nap myself. And when I woke up, I saw the professor was looking through some papers. Think it's uh, time we got rolling? Uh, where, where's Walter? Down at the Jeep. When you folks want to get moving, I'll start bringing the stuff down. I'll be with you in a few minutes. I just want to go over these papers. Uh, Ruth, uh, would you take a few notes, please? Yeah, the others will be down soon. Will we be there by nightfall? Yeah, just about. You going to knock the old boy off? What are you talking about? I just asked a simple question. Of all the... Why? And it only needs a simple answer. Yes. No. Now, you didn't say either one. Maybe you're not sure yet. Now, the only thing is, a ton of gold can usually win any argument. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. Now, you should start thinking about a couple of things. This discussion is in very bad taste. Murder is always in bad taste. What are you going to do about her? Now, I know all about you and her. Two of you are cheating on him. You're crazy. Oh, that's right. I'm Crazy Joe. But she's a little older than you. Well, she's the boss's wife. Now, he don't take care of her in uh, certain ways. Uh, you know what I mean. Now, you're young. You're good looking. And it, it had to happen. But now what? If you kill him, you're stuck with her for life. Now, now she's okay for now. But when you own a ton of gold, you can spread those wings, huh? Mm. Can you imagine the kind of dames you can have? Now, she gonna hold still for it? <laughs> That's something to think about. No? It is definitely something to think about, yes. The act of murder is usually simple. A quick blow, a single shot, a sudden thrust, and the deed is done. The complications usually set in afterwards. And just when you believe that it's all over, you discover it has only just begun. Our third act will begin shortly. Unfortunately, we have many murders that are committed by criminals in the pursuit of their activities. It is also true that many more are committed by people who really cannot be considered as belonging to the criminal class. There are people who have never killed, who have never even conceived of killing, and who suddenly find themselves in a situation where they have lost all control, where the morality that has guided their conduct till now is suddenly swept away. How many times have I seen it happen? And I know I'm going to see it happen again. Well, we were getting ready for the last leg of the trip. That night, we would reach the cave and the gold. Now, she was sitting in the jeep, and the professor just called over the assistant. Walter, could you come over here for just a moment? There's the most interesting rock formation. So, you're going to kill the professor, huh? dare you say that? Oh, well, you dare to do it, I can dare to say it. What gives you the right to make such a monstrous accusation? Because it happens to be true. So, you kill him. Hmm? And then what? You'll have the gold, sure, sure. But you'll also have each other. Now, this young fella's not bad for now. <laughs> he ain't no live wire. Now, you're gonna have a ton of gold. Millions of guys will be after you. The kind of guys you always dreamed about. But what's the use? You and Walter are going to be stuck with each other as long as you live. We'd uh, better be getting started, uh, Joe. Uh, are you ready? Uh, oh, yes. Yes, Professor. I guess we are all of us ready. Is it much further? Well, it looks like it's just uh, about another mile. Oh, then uh, we're practically there. Yeah, well, I was hoping to get there before dark. Hey, hey, can I ask you something? Of course. Why do you have a gun? Gun? Yeah, the gun in your musette bag. Oh, uh, that gun. In case of uh, snakes or uh, wild animals? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, only if that's why you got it. I don't see why you don't wear it. 
So if you need it, you know, it's handy. It's not going to do you much good packed away in a bag now, is it? Oh, I uh, hadn't thought about that. Oh. Well, what, what do you plan to do? Kill them both? I'm afraid I don't understand. But uh, maybe you figure that uh, you have to kill them. Are you aware of what you're saying? It's the only way you could use the money the way you want to. Joe, I'm afraid you've taken leave of your senses. Maybe it has nothing to do with the gold. Maybe you found out about the two of them. Well, you have to know about them. You'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to see it. Maybe. Maybe I have been. Well, whenever it is, it's your own business. Uh, hey, just one little question. After you do it, what do you plan to do about me? <laughs> Wasn't a bad question. But these three people, they were so full of themselves, they didn't stop to think about me. Well, sooner or later, they'd have to think about me. And of course, I was thinking about me all the time. Suddenly, suddenly we were there. It was night. But there was a big desert moon, and the place was almost as bright as day. Well, we're here, folks. Uh, where is the cave? Uh, it's uh, behind those rocks. And how did the rocks get here? Hey, the cave is very high and hollow. I guess if you make a noise inside, you start vibrations and it uh, causes a rock slide. Well, let's start getting the area cleared. Why don't, why don't we have supper first, sir? I'm not hungry. Nor am I. Well, it's going to take hours. Well, the sooner we begin, the better. Uh, Joe, there are picks and shovels in the truck. Well, why don't you men start working and I'll prepare supper? Uh, you want to prepare supper, ma'am? Well, I know it's your job, Joe, but I don't mind. Oh, certainly not tonight. Come on, what are we waiting for? Hey, please. Now, listen to me for a minute. I told you I'd bring you to the place, and I did. I also told you about the spirits of the Yahweh people. If you'll forgive me, Joe, you're repeating yourself. No, no, I, I only want to say this. Whether or not you come back home alive is up to you. The curse of the gold is either inside you now or it isn't. If it is, save yourselves. Drive out the curse. <laughs> But they weren't listening. The gold. It was a fever. And a fever can kill. And that was the curse. But you couldn't talk to them. They worked and worked until the last rock was removed from in front of the cave. I kept watching each of them. She had built a fire. She was busy cooking. But I was watching her. Every move she made. And I have to tell you, she made some pretty interesting moves. And then... Finally, the last rock was pushed out of the way. We did it. Now let's get the lanterns and go inside. Now, why don't we eat supper first? Yes, that's, that's a good idea. Now, let's go inside first. Oh, but everything's hot now and, and, and ready. The gold can wait. Come on, sit down, everyone. I've made a delicious stew. Oh, that smells so good. I didn't know you were such a good cook. Well, I'm not really. It's just that you're very hungry. Oh, Joe, uh, would you pass me your plate, please? Uh, no, thanks, ma'am. I'm not hungry now. Are you sure? I can't persuade you. No, I'm kind of tired. Maybe later. Mmm. What a deliciously tart taste. I watched real close. The two men were packing it away. But she didn't eat a single bite. A delicious, tart taste, the professor had said. That was the Hollandina berry. That delicious taste would stay with you for maybe an hour. And it would be the last taste you would ever know. Finally, they was finished. I noticed the uh, professor put on his music bag. I guess that should have told me something. Are we uh, ready to enter the cave? Let's go. We'll each take a lantern. Uh, Joe, will you lead the way? No. No? No, I can't go in there. It's taboo for me. But you agreed to lead us to the gold. Oh, you, you'll find it. It's maybe 20 feet inside against the wall. You'll see the leather sacks all piled up. You'll also see the bones. What kind of bones? The people who went there before you. Oh. If they're bones, they're dead. What can they do to you? Water, Ruth, are you ready? All right, follow me. Uh, uh, I'll be waiting out here. And remember, don't make any loud noises. Any kind of vibration can set up a rock slide. I don't think they heard a word I said. They rushed into the cave. Well, I followed them as far as the entrance. For a moment, 
there seemed to be a chill by the side of the bones. But there was another sack that took first claim. The side of them leather sacks. The seams of some of them had rotted away, and the bright yellow dust was sprinkled in heaps all over the floor. I listened. The cave was so high, so hollow, you could hear every word. The gold. There's a ton of gold. We're being sold. Gold. Oh, don't, don't, don't shout. Listen, to what? I didn't hear anything. I thought I heard a rumbling. Joe's right. Better not make any noise. I can't get over it. There is a ton of gold. Yes, gold. And now it's time for us to have an accounting, Ruth. Walter? What are you looking for, Professor? There's no point in rummaging around in your musette bag. If this pistol is what you're after, I've got it. Walter! When you weren't looking, Professor. I see. Well, Walter, now what? You said it was time for an accounting. I want half of the gold. I see. And are you offering me the other half at the pistol point? No. The other half belongs to Ruth. The two of you then have decided to kill me. You have decided to kill us. That's why you brought the gun. Do you feel you can trust each other? She has already betrayed her husband. And you have betrayed your employer, your friend. It... It's funny. What's funny, Professor? Ah, I just... It's going to be your last joke. We'd like to share it with you. I can't. Oh, very well. It doesn't matter. It's hard to breathe. Ah. Ah, oh, pain. The pain. Do, do, do you have a pain in your stomach? Do you? A pain? <laughs> the joke. The last joke. It's a joke on both of us. What are you talking about? Is it hard for you to breathe? Don't you see? She did it. What? She poisoned us. Poisoned? That's the joke. It's on you. It's on me. She, she betrayed us both. She can't kill us. I, I can't move. I'm going to do... Professor. Professor Dowdy. He's dead. You killed him. Uh, and you killed me, too. No. No, I swear, Walter. Believe me. Well, not, not you. D- just him. I-, I did it to save your life. Don't you understand? He had the pistol. I, I didn't know you would steal it. I can't breathe. Don't point that gun at me, Walter. Please. My stomach. There's a fire in my no, stomach. No, 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 darling. You're imagining it. you me. It's just his way of, of working on your imagination to, to destroy us. I didn't poison you. Why would I? Because you want it all for yourself. No. Just like I want it all for myself. Please, Walter, believe me. No, Ruth. I, I'm dying. I know it. But before I die, I'm going to take you with me. Please, Walter, don't shoot me. Don't. Stand still. I'll only take a second. It won't even hurt. No! Goodbye, Ruth. (laughs) Goodbye. Walter! It's a landslide. No, no, we will be sealed up in here forever. Just until the next party comes along to look for the treasures of Garcilaso de Zamora. It's a ton of gold, and it's here for the taking. The problem is, you've got the curse of the ancient spirits of the Yahweh people. I'm not exactly sure that's the problem. The problem could be the curse that each of us carries. In some of us, it's right out there on the surface. In others, it's buried so deep, we hardly know we have it. 
until it's aroused by a desire we never knew before. I shall return shortly. I can't see germs. How do I know they're there? Oh, you know all right. Who are you? I am Sal Manone. And I am his pal, Arnie. Yes, yeah, germs live on meat and poultry and on foods made with eggs and dairy products. And when they're left out of room temperature for over two hours, we grow and grow. And you germs make food taste bad, don't you? Not necessarily. Yeah, we're sneaky. But after you've eaten food we've gotten to, <laughs> you'll know. Yeah, tummy cramps, headache, nausea, and also you can... Keep in nithers, you're starting to gross me out. Tough, kid. It's the germs creed to spread food poisoning on an equal opportunity basis. Yeah, to the high and the mighty and to you. Oh, my mom knows how to outsmart you germs. I keep food hot, I keep them cold. Never in between. Food poisoning, I keep my kitchen clean. For a free booklet, write to Food Safety, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington 20250. is there in that pale, soft metal that enables it to rule the world? Who made the decision that gold should be the standard of value for all of us? And why do we continue to abide by it? Our story concerned a ton of gold. But if you were alone, isolated by a severe winter storm with temperatures below zero, if your life depended on keeping warm, would you rather have that ton of gold? Or... A ton of coal. Our cast included Earl Hammond, Ralph Bell, Carol Tytel, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Is it illegal to change one's name? Ah, but it is suspicious. Now, madam, a hustle is a hustle. But to take advantage of a father's vulnerability... I am only trying to help. What you are doing is illegal. Is it? I only promised I would reach his daughter spiritually, Lieutenant. I approach you filled with the spirit of cooperation. This is a job for scientific police work. Has scientific police work yielded any tangible results so far? Let me contact her spirit. Contact her spirit? You have not been able to contact her body. (sighs) Look, I really don't have time for this kind of nonsense. Ah, Lieutenant, why do you fight me? Why do you refuse to open your mind to an infinite variety of other possibilities? Madam, I am telling you, watch your step. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.